Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, kiddo. Carter at Universal Adjustment. Jim, how are you? In a rush. I have to catch a plane to Tucson, Arizona. Lucky you. Nice there this time of no, year. No, no, listen. One of our brokers out there wrote a 50,000 straight life policy on a man named James Lansing. Lansing dropped dead two days ago. Uh-huh. And you'll never guess why. I'll bite. Why? Mr. Lansing starved to death. What? With a 50,000... 000... Honest. He died of malnutrition. Got the coroner's report from Tucson right in my hand. Well, if a man could buy a $50,000 policy, he ought to be able to buy himself a square meal. Yeah. Johnny, flight 203 leaves at 1045. You interested? See you at the airport, Jim. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Expense account item one, $178.13. Cost of plane ticket, Hartford to Tucson. I shaved, showered, packed, and got out to the airport in time to have breakfast there. Jim Carter found me at the cashier's cage. Hey, kiddo, you won't need a coat out there in that desert country. As usual, Jim Carter was bigger than I thought. A man who stands six foot five always is. A little ruddier, a little more blustery, but as efficient as ever. I wrote a special delivery airmail to the insurance commission in Arizona this morning and explained it worldwide. They wrote the policy. We're holding up payment pending investigation. Well, you could have told them that in person. We'll be out there as soon as the letter. Well, I like to be formal on these things, especially with the state commission. Besides, I'd just soon let them think we'll get around to a routine investigation later in a week or two. In other words, you didn't tell anybody we're coming. No, I didn't. Maybe we can work it better this way. The faster we move in and find out what's what and aren't bothered by anybody, the better off we'll be. Hey, give me your ticket, will you, John? Yeah, sure. Here you are, pal. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, that commission is going to get formal sooner or later and ask a lot of questions. Mainly, why doesn't Worldwide honor the claim and pay off the beneficiary? So we'll have to skedaddle and get ourselves some good answers for him. Yeah, you know? sir. Hey. You may board the plane. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. Has anybody asked that question yet? Well, the beneficiary, sure. Uh, James Lansing's sister, named uh, Arlene Kennedy. She called the broker, and he referred her to claims division at Worldwide, and she called them long distance, and then they called me. I told her to put her off for a while, telling her it was just routine. I see. Is she going to be tough? Yeah, she could be, Johnny. I understand she has money of her own, and she has some influence in and around Tucson. Oh, a lot of money? Yeah, and trust. She's very comfortably fixed. Yeah, watch yourself, kiddo. This, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's pretty upset by the whole business. Can't blame her for that. James Lansing died on the street with no identification on him. By the time police found out who he was, a routine PM had already been performed to determine cause. You know, the county was going to bury this guy? With $50,000 worth of insurance? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Oh, excuse me, lady. Yeah, the post-mortem never had happened unless Lansing dropped dead on a public street. Yeah, I see what you mean. So I requested the coroner's office in Tucson to hold the body until we can get something done. Better fix your seatbelt, sir. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. First thing that occurred to me when I saw the PM findings was that it might not be James Lansing at all. Chronic heart condition, lung history, debility. Doesn't sound like anybody worldwide would insure. Lansing took a physical before the policy was issued, didn't he? Of course he did. See, have you got any material on his insurance examination? Sure. Right here. Standard form. James Lansing was 100% okay when the policy was issued a couple of years ago. Malnutrition, lung history, chronic heart... How could he get in that bad shape in two years? <laughs> That's a pretty good question, Johnny. I bet the answer is going to be great. Yeah. What's the examining physician's name? Uh, I see. Examining. Oh, here it is. Uh, Dr. Carl Mayhood, Suite 932, Valley National Building, Tucson. He's our first job, Johnny. Hey. Cute stewardess. 
Yeah. Well, back to business, kiddo. It was a long trip, and I spent most of it going over the material on Jim Carter's briefcase. By the time we circled Tucson Airport at 4.45 in the afternoon, I had the facts pretty well in mind. Expense account item two, 350, cab fare, Tucson Airport to the Pioneer Hotel. Jim Carter and I took adjoining rooms. I unpacked my clothes and got on the phone. A Sergeant Younger, Tucson Police, had made the DOA report on James Lansing. Yes, he was in. Yes, he'd be glad to talk to me. I left Jim Carter contacting the state medical board. Glad to meet you, Mr. Dollar. How do you like Tucson? Well, I've been here two hours, Sergeant. The weather's certainly nice. About like this all through the winter months. It's a little warm in the summer, though. Yes, sir. Um, now this Lansing matter. Yeah. There isn't really much to tell you, Mr. Dollar. One of the cars answered the call. A man was found dead in the doorway of a jewelry store about four blocks down the street. Uh-huh. This was the uh, day before yesterday, Sergeant? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went down to the scene and called the coroner's office. No identification on him, so we started to check him out. It took us a little while. By the time we got a make on him, the coroner had already performed an autopsy. Yeah, I understood that was about the way it was. Say, so tell me, how did you identify him as Lansing? One of his prints matched up on our cards here. Lansing was booked on a traffic beef a year ago. Otherwise, we'd still be trying to make him. You're sure it's Lansing over in the morgue? Yeah, we're sure. His sister came down and identified him. The name of Kennedy. Yes. Well, what did Mrs. Kennedy have to say about the cause of death? Nothing. That malnutrition bit didn't do a thing for her. Huh? Not a thing, no, sir. We all thought Lansing was some sort of a transient. You know, just some old bum until we identified him. Uh-huh. Any witnesses to see him die? No, we haven't found any. According to the coroner, he'd been dead an hour or so before anybody noticed him at all. Happened early in the morning. I see. Say, did uh, Lansing have any other business down here other than that uh, traffic violation? Nope. All right. Uh, who do I have to see to get into the morgue? Well, I'll phone the coroner for you. Won't be any trouble there. You want to go over now? No, later on, maybe. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? Death was from natural causes. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Then no matter how much you investigate, you people are going to have to pay off. Well, aren't you? Maybe. We just have to be sure of one thing. What's that? That we insured the right man. By the time I finished with Sergeant Younger, it was six o'clock. I phoned the hotel and Jim Carter, busy and efficient as always, had already gotten the vital statistics on Dr. Carl Mayhood. Northwestern University Medical School, 1940. Army Medical Corps, 1941 to 45. Dr. Mayhood's license to practice medicine in Arizona was issued in June of 1946. Married, two children, income and practice, according to Carter, was average. In person, Dr. Mayhood was a tall, blonde man in his late 30s. He looked like he needed a week's rest and a few laughs. Day and night. You have an alarm clock around the house, Mrs. Garland? Well, use that. Yes. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Dr. Mayhood, my name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. I represent the Adjustment Bureau handling a claim for worldwide insurance. Well, what does that mean? I'm an investigator. So? July 14th, 1953, you examined a man I'd like to get some information about. I hope this won't take too long. Uh, was it an insurance examination? Yeah. The man's name was James Lansing. Do you happen to remember him? James Lansing. No, I can't say that I do remember him, Mr. Dollar. What about him? Well, I'd like to show you the standard examination form first. Is this your signature? Hmm. Is that your signature, Doctor? I suppose so, yes. I don't know. Aren't you sure? Well, how many people are certain of their signatures? It looks like my signature, Mr. Dollar. I can't say for sure if it is or isn't. All right, what about these? Are these notations on the form in your handwriting? I would think so. I don't know. It, it looks like my handwriting. I can't say. According to this form, you gave Mr. Lansing a complete physical and pronounced him sound. That's my job as a doctor on these insurance examinations. Anything unusual about that? Mr. Lansing died two days ago, Doctor. There's nothing unusual about that either. 
Did they send you all the way from Hartford so I could tell you to go back there and buy a book on heart disease? You can get them anywhere in the country. The simplest kind. Not even a doctor's book. Read it. Know it. And don't take up my valuable time. Now, let me have that. Sure. Hmm. This patient Lansing was 41 years old. If he had no heart condition when I examined him two years ago, and obviously he didn't, according to my findings, it's entirely reasonable to assume that he could have developed heart trouble in a very short while, even the day after I examined him. You people gauge those things in your premiums. Why do you bother me? Are you finished? Huh? I take it you've had yourself a tough day, Doctor, and you don't want to be bothered with anybody. Now, look, I'm not here to bother you. you Just from what's on this sheet and what's happened, you're in enough trouble to get yourself involved in a police investigation. I'm here to try to avoid all that for you as well as me. And please don't lecture me on heart trouble, incidentally. We know the statistics by age, race, color, climate, state, religion, occupation, geographical area, and sex. It so happens we don't have to go into that, Doctor. James Lansing died of malnutrition. Hmm? I said Lansing died of malnutrition. I'll be talking. Coroner's report. Look for yourself. Hmm. Well, he should know. Now, was it possible for you to overlook that condition at the time you examined Lansing? If he'd been suffering from malnutrition in any degree, I would have discovered it and noted it. According to the coroner's findings, James Lansing had been ill several years. The lung and heart condition existed at least ten years. Can you explain how you were able to pronounce him physically fit, doctor? No, I can't. Well, how about this, the angina condition? I could have missed that, but it's unlikely with the degree of aggravation noted here on the coroner's report... Have you had much experience reading chest x-rays, Doctor? Of course. The lesions reported by the coroner. If there had been any lesions on Lansing's chest, I would have reported them. I can't explain that either. Well, now you understand why I'm here. Certainly. I wish I could help you. You can. Just let me see your file copy of the examination. And the x-ray you took at that time. I'll have my nurse look them up. I don't keep files over a year old up here. We have a place down in the basement. Okay. I'll have them for you tomorrow. What time tomorrow? As soon as possible. I'd like to have them first thing, Doctor. You're kind of on me, aren't you? That's right, Doctor. I'm kind of on you. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lansing fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 is a good price for a killing. Most anybody will listen for that kind of money. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Mayhood, I sent you a copy of Lansing's insurance examination this morning. Did you get it all right? Yes, I did, Doctor. Thank you very much. Just looked it over. And I take it everything's all right. It's an exact duplicate of the one sent to the insurance company, and that part's okay. But it doesn't straighten out matters on this case. I'm not concerned with your case particularly. 
I just hope you're through bothering me, Mr. Dollar. Not quite. Well, what does that mean? I want another hour of your time, Doctor. I want you to go over to the coroner's office with me and look at Mr. Lansing's body. What for? To identify it. I've got to know if he's the man you examined or not. About an hour? Doctor, I can get an injunction. All right. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Or was it a fraud? Expense account item three, $10, loan. To Jim Carter, who was working with me on the case. Thanks, buddy. I'll pay you back as soon as I can cash a check. Been so busy, I haven't had time. How's your doctor friend? Well, I'm going to pick him up pretty soon and go over to the coroner's office. I want him to look at James Lansing and see if he's the same man he passed on the insurance examination two years ago. Either we insured the wrong man or Dr. Mayhood examined the wrong man. I don't know which. How have you done so far? Well, besides what I told you yesterday about Dr. Mayhood? Yeah. Well, he's in healthy financial shape. Not good or bad, but, you know, healthy. His house halfway paid for, he owns one car outright, and has eight months to go on another one. All of which doesn't mean anything if he phonied up an insurance examination. Yeah, that's true, kiddo, that's true. You know, I've been thinking, this would have worked, but James Lansing died on the street and the city performed an autopsy. Death, malnutrition. For a private physician, without an autopsy hanging over him, it could have been heart failure or most anything. Jim, I think we can do whatever we want around here. Step on anybody's toes, make any kind of noise we like. With this kind of situation to investigate, we don't have to be careful. Easy, Johnny. Lansing's body's in the morgue. There's no doubt that it's him, Exhibit A. But we aren't sure that his $50,000 policy was issued legitimately. What are you getting to? Call the state insurance commission, Jim. Let them know we think this is a bad one from top to bottom. Let them know that so that when the beneficiary starts to complain, they can tell her. It might scare her and whoever helped her into being more ridiculous than they've been already. I'm going to hold off, Johnny. Why? Until I see how you and Dr. Mayhood make out at the morgue. Expense account item four, two dollars, cab fare. From my hotel to the Valley National Building. I picked up a scowling Dr. Mayhood and we drove over to the coroner's office. Mr. Dollar, this is a waste of your time and mine. Sorry to inconvenience you, Doctor, but it's necessary. I suppose so. And I suppose you have a job to do. But I have a job, too. Mr. Franks, the insurance broker, telephones me and says he's sending over a man for a physical. I do the physical. It's immaterial to me whether the man I examine is qualified for insurance or not. My job is to examine him. It's up to the insurance company to determine... Yeah? Johnny Dollar, this is Dr. Mayhood. I believe Sergeant Younger phoned. Yeah, yeah, this way. Dollar, it's up to the insurance company to do what they want to about the examination. I understand all that, Doctor. Then don't ignore it with your high-pressure tactics. Because examination is the only part I have to do with this business. I examined a man named James Lansing two years ago. You have a copy of my findings on that examination. I stand on them. And don't forget it. I don't forget for one minute. Nor do I forget that what you found and what an autopsy surgeon found are completely different opinions on Lansing's physical condition. Here we go, boys. There's the body. Pull the sheet back, please. Yeah. Well, Doctor? I called my lawyer after you called me today. I won't be intimidated, Mr. Dollar. You aren't being intimidated, Doctor. You're being asked to cooperate. Then maybe I don't like the way you ask for cooperation. My attorney will be in my office to represent me if you bother me any more about this. You want to look at this body? Your attorney can't refute what's already been established, Doctor. You pronounced James Lansing in good physical condition two years ago. An autopsy report shows that when he died two days ago, he was in very bad physical condition. So bad that two years ago he couldn't possibly have gone through a careful examination in your office without some of the symptoms being detected by you. Where is your medical degree and what responsibility? Oh, why don't you shut up and take a look and tell me if you've ever seen this man before? I won't be spoken to that way. Just a minute. I'll get an injunction and I'll charge malpractice and negligence if I have to. Oh? On what ground? You're being stupid, doctor. 
All you have to do is look at that corpse and tell me if he's the man you examined in your office two years ago. Well? I don't know whether I've seen this man before or not. Well, does he look familiar in any way? I can't say. I might have examined this man. I don't know. This is James Lansing, Doctor. The name you filled in on your physical examination for the insurance. I know that. Is this the man you examined? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It was two years ago. If I see a man for three hours in the course of a physical examination, am I expected to remember his face or any details about him two years later? Is there any way you can determine whether or not this is the man you examined in your office? No. Not that I know of. Is there any way you can determine it? Believe me, Doctor, I can try. And I did try. That afternoon, over the protest of Dr. Mayhood, I took all of the personnel connected with his office down to the morgue. A nurse, a receptionist, the x-ray technician, and a laboratory worker. None of them recognized the body of James Lansing. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call to Jim Carter, who'd spent the day preparing the necessary forms for the insurance commission and gathering data on Lansing's beneficiary. You think Dr. Mayhood was in on it? He's too mad, too belligerent, Jim. You don't sound too sure. Well, and maybe he just strikes me as an inept doctor. Well, let's say Mayhood's way down on my list. He examined a man who said he was James Lansing. It could have been anybody. All right, we'll let it go that way for a while. Any ideas? I'm on my way out to Lansing's old address. He had an apartment on the other side of town. I want to see how he's lived out there. Still want me to go ahead with the insurance commission? Yeah, go ahead. The manager at James Lansing's apartment house happened to be a woman named Anita Regan. She also happened to be willing to go back down to the coroner's office with me and view the mortal remains. There you are. Oh. Have you ever seen this man before, Mrs. Regan? Yes, yes, sir. That's, that's Mr. Lansing, apartment 34. You're positive? Oh, yes. I've seen him every day for almost two years. Okay. Want to smoke? I want to get out of here. Oh, sure. I don't know why I'm acting this way. He doesn't look any different now than he's looked before. I've seen him stretched out like that a hundred times. One? I mean, almost like that. Out, stony. Only I guess it's because I knew he was just drunk then, not dead. Oh, I see. He was crazy carrying on the way he did. <laughs> Feels good to be out in the sunlight again. Yeah. I'll take that smoke now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Lansing used to get up around 10 every morning. He'd look awful, but he was always kind of nice, polite, you know. He'd be regular as clockwork. He'd walk past my door and tip his hat and go right down to the store and come back in a little while with a sack of groceries, a bottle of milk for his cat, some donuts for himself, and some booze. Uh-huh. And then he'd just lock himself up in his apartment and stay there all day, drinking. Real alcoholic, huh? Well, I'd say so. At least I wasn't surprised he starved to death. He can't live on whiskey. He was fried to the ears by noon every day, as long as I knew him. Mr. Lansing didn't work then. Well, I think he tried to sell real estate once, a long time ago. Oh? But how could he? I understand he was a retired engineer or something like that. He pays rent? Oh, yes. Always seemed to have enough money to get along. Did he have any family, Mrs. Regan? Well, I know he's got a sister living in town somewhere. What about his friends? They seem to do all his drinking alone. Say, you're from the insurance company. You should know about his family. Apparently, there are a lot of things we don't know. Hmm? A man named James Lansing moved into your apartment house two years ago. He didn't work, but he had enough money for his rent and his liquor. He also had enough money to buy some expensive insurance. Very expensive. Somehow, he passed an insurance examination, and then he suddenly died. No one, nothing. Just one beneficiary. Mr. Dollar, you don't suppose somebody just gave him enough money to get along so he'd drink himself to death, do you? That's one way of looking at it, Mrs. Regan. Oh, that poor man. That poor, poor man. I spent another hour with Mrs. Regan gathering as much background as I could about the last two years of James Lansing's life. I also spoke to the janitor of the building and two of the tenants. 
They all verified the fact that Lansing had been drinking heavily for better than 18 months prior to his death. No one seemed to know why. Jim Carter had an answer. I talked to our man in L.A., Johnny. Lansing lived there before he came to Tucson. He had several arrests for drunkenness, never married. One time he made his living as an engineer. Finally, he got fired for drinking on the job. <sighs> yeah, it's just one of those chronic cases. First arrest was back in 1939. How's the beneficiary holding up? The sister? Yeah. Well, Mrs. Kennedy was pretty upset when the insurance commission notified her we were in town making an investigation, indignant, put out, things like that. She wanted to know how long it would take. This all comes secondhand from the insurance commission. Uh, Johnny, mm -hmm. a broker named Hillary Franks sold a policy. Well, what have you got on him? Hillary Franks has represented worldwide insurance in this area for 17 years. Uh, <laughs> You're stalling, kiddo. Sure, I'm stalling, Jim. Because we're right down to the meat of it now, and it makes me sick. There's only one person who stood to benefit by having James Lansing insured. That's the beneficiary, his sister, Arlene Kennedy. So? Jim, you know as well as I do, somebody else had to take the physical examination in Dr. Mayhood's office. Someone had to help her arrange that. Someone had to help her get Lansing's signature on the policies. She couldn't have pulled it off by herself without gumming it up. She had to have expert help. Hillary Franks. Yeah. Hillary Franks. 17 years broker, worldwide insurance company. Okay, the salesman's the first one to come under suspicion in a case like this outside of the beneficiary. So let's get on with it. All right, Jim. Uh, one thing. What? Hillary Franks knows we'll be looking at him, and he knows he's under suspicion. That worry you? A little bit. After 17 years in the business, he should also know where we're going to be before we get there. If he did something as dumb as try to work a $50,000 fraud on his own insurance company, he might do something even dumber. If so... Well, what's the 38, Jim? Here. From now on, Johnny, you better carry this. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, tomorrow there's a bit of excitement when a pair of thieves start a falling out. Matter of fact, a lot of excitement. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Arlene Kennedy. You called my home, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes, Mrs. Kennedy. I'm with Universal Adjustment Bureau. We're investigating the matter of James Lansing's death. Your what? We're investigating your brother's death before we take action on your claim as his beneficiary. Under the circumstances, we have to do this, Mrs. Kennedy. I'd like to talk to you about it, if I may. How would you like to talk to my lawyer, Mr. Dollar? Sure, if you think it's necessary. I'd rather talk to you first. Why? Well, frankly, the insurance company isn't satisfied that this is a legitimate claim. You mean you're not satisfied? All right, then I'm not satisfied, and I represent the company in this matter. Look, we won't get anywhere this way, Mrs. Kennedy, if you'll just... <sighs> Tonight, 
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Tucson, Arizona, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. $50,000 worth. Expense account continued. Item 6, $10, car rental. To get to Catalina Vista, where Arlene Kennedy maintained a $55,000 home. It was a warm, sunny day, incredibly clear. I enjoyed it in my drive. However, I can't say I enjoyed Arlene Kennedy. That's as far as you need to come. What? You must be the Mr. Dollar I spoke to on the phone. If you didn't get the idea on the phone, I'll tell it to you again. I don't want to talk to you. Now, please get away from my home. We'll have to talk sometime. I don't think so. I know so, Mrs. Kennedy. I must ask you to take your briefcase and get out of here, Mr. Dollar, now. I'm sorry you feel that way. Look, my brother Jim drank himself to death. I don't know why. I just know he did it. He's dead. I'm his beneficiary. Why don't you pay me what you owe me? We will, Mrs. Kennedy, if the circumstances are right. So far, though, we have reasonable doubt. Uh, and this investigation is for your benefit as much as it is ours. I can hardly believe that. When we've satisfied ourselves one way or the other, your claim will be settled. The whole situation's cut and dry. I'm afraid it isn't. Mr. Dollar, I've had enough of this. I'll turn the matter over to my attorneys. Mrs. Kennedy, I don't carry this briefcase to impress anybody, but I thought it might interest you. I have in it a copy of the physical examination your brother took two years ago when he applied for his insurance policy. I have a copy of the coroner's report and the results of the autopsy. I don't care what you have. Then maybe you'd just be interested in the conclusion. We have to discredit one item or the other. That's why we can't take any action on your claim yet. Goodbye. Wait. What is it you want to know? I haven't seen my brother in well over two years, three years. I can't tell you a thing about him. Were you on good terms with him? Of course I was. I was the only one he had in the world. He left me his insurance money, didn't he? Did he leave you anything else? He didn't have anything else. I understand there was a trust in the family. He spent his a long time ago. I understand you're a widow, Mrs. Kennedy. I don't see what bearing that Do you has. have any dependents? No children, that's what you mean. The money from the policy would have gone to you alone. Let me correct you. The money will come to me alone. I don't know what you people think you can do trying to weasel out of this payment, but I've already spoken with my attorneys, and they've advised me to sue for an immediate settlement and damages. Perhaps I can save you some fees and your attorney some time, Mrs. Kennedy. Where can I contact them? Never mind. You'll find out soon enough. I hope you won't allow them to go so far as a courtroom without speaking to me. We'll see about that, too. I don't need your advice. Now, look, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'd tell them. You can pass it on to them. Your brother could have died quietly in his bed one night, and any doctor would have pronounced him a heart failure, and your claim would have been honored without delay. But James Lansing made the mistake of dropping dead on a public street, and the police took over, and before he was properly identified, an autopsy had been performed. And I intend to sue the city for that kind of liberty. They had no right to... They had every right. An unknown man dead on the street from unknown causes. Now, don't be childish. Because of that autopsy, we know your brother couldn't possibly have passed an insurance examination two years ago or ten years ago. Not with the amount of bad health he'd collected. But he did pass it. The insurance company accepted him as a client. They issued a policy, and you can't deny it. Jim came to me the day after he took out that policy and told me I was his you beneficiary. You said he... You said you hadn't seen him for well over two years. He took the exam a year ago last July. All right, I saw him that one time. Look, I'll lay it right on the line, Mrs. Kennedy. We don't think your brother ever took that physical examination. What? Someone else went up to Dr. Mayhood's office and took it for him. Someone who could pass it. Mrs. Kennedy, we aren't fools, and we don't like to be fooled. Now, we're going to find out who that someone was and how it was done. We're used to all sorts of tricks in this business and all sorts of bluffing, too. You can sue us for a settlement. You can sue us all over the place. With what I have right now, I'd be willing to meet you in a courtroom. I'm talking facts to you, Mrs. Kennedy, and I wish you'd talk them to me. Get out of here. Get out of here, you cheap snooper, before I call the police and have you thrown out. Some more expenses. Item seven. Six dollars. Lunch. For Jim Carter and myself. We'll pass the cream, Johnny. Thanks. Well, what do you think, Jim? 
Mrs. Kennedy? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say. She's going to make it as tough as she can for us, judging from her attitude toward you this morning. How does the commission feel? Well, they feel very badly that something like this has come up. They've requested us to act with discretion and to act swiftly. There's certain the entire matter can be settled without legal action. She passes sugar. Uh Uh-huh. Are they going to cooperate? They aren't going to do anything until we show cause. They did mention that their action will take place in ten days, so that means we've got ten days to write such a statement. Tell me what you've learned about Mrs. Kennedy. Well, she was widowed five years ago. Her husband was a lawyer. He left her 40000 in insurance and 15000 in debts. Her family, the Lansings, had money at one time. Enough so that she gets one half of one-tenth of one percent of an oil company out on the coast. It pays her about seven fifty a month. She managed to clear her house out in Catalina Vista and drive a Cadillac. But she could use $50,000. Of course she could use $50,000. Everybody could. Johnny, when are you going to start on the insurance agent? Hillary Franks, I've already started. If I know my Mrs. Kennedy, she won't call a lawyer or anybody else right now. She'll talk to her agent, Mr. H. Franks, and he'll have to come to us. I don't have to go to him. Johnny. When you buy a radio and it goes bad, you call up the store. They didn't manufacture the set, but you complain to them just the same. Same thing with insurance. You don't call up the company, you call up the agent who sold it to you. Hillary Frank has to call me, Jim, just to look legitimate. I hope you're right, kiddo. After lunch, I went back to my hotel room and opened up the file Jim Carter had collected on Hillary Franks. Hillary Franks, age 56, college graduate, married, two children, wife deceased, income good. No record of any kind for any offense. Highly thought of by worldwide insurance officials. The 17 years with the company sort of got me. He started as an agent when he was 39. This is Henry Franks, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I understand you're in town on a little investigation for the home office. wonder if we could have dinner. As a matter of fact, I was going to call you, Mr. Franks. The policy I'm working on was written by you. Yes, I understand that. Mrs. Kennedy, the beneficiary, called me today. Seemed very upset. I thought perhaps we could discuss it over dinner. Anything wrong with right now at your office? Why... Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you very much for coming over. I was surprised when Mrs. Kennedy called me about this matter today. Surprised to learn that you were in town. Were you? Um, she said you'd been over to her home this morning. That's right. (laughs) Well, just what is this all about? We have reason to believe Mrs. Kennedy is a party to an attempted fraud, Mr. Franks. I gathered it was something like that. I've been writing policies for worldwide insurance for 17 years, Mr. Dollar. And this is the first time anything like this has ever happened on one of them. I believe you, Mr. Franks, and your record. But there's a first time for everything. Uh, Yes. I'm here to find out all I can about the circumstances under which you sold the policy to Mrs. Kennedy's brother. Nothing unusual about it, Mr. Dollar. I think there was. Eh? James Lansing was a bachelor... He lived in a fairly nice apartment on the other side of town. No dependents. Now, what made James Lansing a prospect for life insurance, Mr. Franks? Well, it's more of a personal thing, really, I suppose. My wife and I were interested in buying a home a couple of years ago. There was one we liked in Catalina Vista. The real estate agent happened to be James Lansing. That's how we first became acquainted. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. Franks and I saw Lansing, oh, two or three times. Had dinner together, you know. And I managed to sell him the policy. I understood he was an engineer. He had been at one time in Los Angeles. And he was only engaged in the real estate business here for a very short time. Really a matter of a few months. I see. Did he do very well at it? I don't think so. I don't think he worked hard at it. You see, he had a fairly comfortable income from money left by his father. You uh, didn't buy the house from him? No. Too much? No, Mrs. Franks died rather suddenly about that time, and I had no need to buy a home. But out of the association, you interested Lansing in buying insurance from you? Yes. What kind of a man was he? What do you mean? Well, uh, just your opinion, Mr. Franks. Well, just a client, Mr. Dollar. I, I looked at him and treated him just the same as any other client. But you saw him socially several times, had dinner with him. Do you do that with all your clients? I might. Uh, remember, he was trying to sell me something, too. Ah, oh, sure. <laughs> How'd he look? What? Well, pale, thin, emaciated, what? Oh, he looked fine to me. Did he drink much? Well, uh, I don't recall. Think. It's important. Well, uh, I don't recall. Then I'll recall for you, Mr. Franks. 
Lansing did drink a lot on those occasions. As a matter of fact, he was soaked up most of the time. Oh, now, that's not true, Mr. Dunn. You know as well as I do, he was an alcoholic in Los Angeles, and he was an alcoholic here in Tucson. He died of malnutrition, a direct result of his alcoholic condition. Well, uh, I'm not a doctor. I had no way of ascertaining that. You don't have to be a doctor to smell booze, Mr. Franks. Did you ever meet his beneficiary? You mean his sister, uh, Mrs. Kennedy? Uh, no, no. Uh, I think I told you she telephoned me today. Never met her at all? Uh, no. Mr. Franks, I'm going to leave you for a while, and I want you to think about all we've discussed. When I come back, I might ask you the same questions again. And I'll expect some different answers. Anything you say, Mr. Duncan. Hillary Franks, 17 years insurance broker, was a bad liar. He was worse than that. He was a stupid, awkward, unprepared liar with no idea of what he was up against. He knew I was going to get him and get him good. And he didn't know what to do about it. I almost felt sorry for him. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, a bad liar turns into a pretty good gunman. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Carter, Johnny. Hi. How'd you make out with Hillary Franks? And the agent who sold the policy? He's worried, he's scared, and he's already doing everything wrong. I left him about an hour ago to think things over. Ah, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's fighting back. What do you mean? Her lawyer served notice on us an hour ago to pay up on the policy or else. Just a bluff. Yeah, but this wasn't. She got a court order and made the coroner release her brother's body. She took it right to the crematorium. Exhibit A is a pile of ashes by now. Uh-oh. Our next step is to contact the State Insurance Commission and have them order us to pay off or show cause. We'll have to act fast. Maybe I'd better go back to see Mr. Hillary Franks. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. 50000 and by now, I was sure it was fraud. Expense account, item number eight, $5. Stenographic services. 
I dictated a hastily composed letter to the State Insurance Commission advising them that Worldwide was withholding payment on the claim of Mrs. Arlene Kennedy pending a complete investigation of the circumstances of her brother's death. I enclosed copies of the original physical examination and the coroner's autopsy findings, pointing out that in our opinion it was impossible for James Lansing to have successfully passed an insurance examination in the first place. I enclosed copies of statements from the examining physician, Dr. Mayhood, and the members of his office staff, all of whom were unable to identify the body of James Lansing. Expense account item 9, 52 cents, postage. I sent the letter to the state capitol special delivery in the hope it would arrive there before Mrs. Kennedy's lawyers took the anticipated action. After that, I drove back over to the office of Hillary Franks. He was the same as I left him an hour before. A little shaken, but still unable to realize quite what was happening. Yes, Mr. Dunlap? Mr. Franks, I wonder if you've got anything to say to me. Nothing, Mr. Dunlap. I was hoping you might want to make a statement. Oh, about what? Mrs. Kennedy's attempting to defraud your insurance company. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Dollar. I sold her brother an insurance policy. I don't even know Mrs. Kennedy. There are a lot of things about this you say you don't know. Do you want me to lay it on the line? If you like. All right. Someone else had to take that physical examination for James Lansing two years ago. I think you arranged for someone to do it or you helped Mrs. Kennedy arrange it. I think James Lansing was insured on that basis. I think he was insured with a clean intent to defraud. Lansing's health wouldn't permit that kind of insurance. Right now, our Los Angeles men are looking into Lansing's activities there. Somewhere along the line, they're going to turn up a medical history that'll show Lansing was already dying when he came to Arizona two years ago. Now, do you have anything to say, Mr. Franks? No. I think you're being very foolish. If it isn't clear how serious this can be with you, it's noted that you arranged for Lansing's physical examination. There's nothing incriminating in that. How well do you know Dr. Mayhood? Oh, slightly. The physician is supposed to be an impartial third party. When a client has to be examined by a physician for insurance purposes, I send him to Dr. Mayhood. That's all. Dr. Mayhood sends me a Christmas card every year. I sent James Lansing to him. Just like any other? Just like any other. Oh, you worry me, Mr. Franks. You don't object to my questions or get ruffled when you're caught lying. I've given you time to think and time to make a statement regarding your part in this matter. I resent all this, Mr. Dollar. I've been an insurance broker for a good long time, and no one has ever questioned my integrity. And I think that's what you've been banking on, Mr. Franks, your reputation. Well, I've been questioning it ever since I got here, and I still question it. You couldn't have known James Lansing without being aware of his drinking habits. I'm sorry for you, Franks, but there had to be collusion here with a beneficiary, Mrs. Kennedy. And you're the logical party. Uh, Dollar... You arranged for someone else to take that examination for Lansing. Somebody who could pass it. Now, I've given you a chance to talk to me, but you refuse. Now we'll see how you like talking to the police about it. What? I'm going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. Dollar, I'm you... going to charge you with attempt to... Fraud and collusion. And I'm going to swear out a warrant for Mrs. Kennedy, too. You're going to... Go! Go! Oh. In the three minutes it took me to recover from the blow from the paperweight and get my breath inside of me and my feet under me, Hillary Franks was well out of the way and out of sight. About that time, Jim Carter walked in. Hey, what happened to you? Hillary Franks. He got scared, swung a paperweight at me and beat it. Well, if he's playing rough, I don't want to take any chances. No, I'll put that phone down. He hasn't admitted anything yet. Smacking you on the side of the head is admittance enough for me. No, I want a statement. I think I can get one. You have to find him first, and he's running. He won't run far, Jim. What makes you so sure? Hillary Franks doesn't know how to run. It was exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon, then. At 3.25, I was back out in Catalina Vista knocking on a familiar door. And the same familiar things began to happen all over again. What do you want? I'm here to tell you about the trouble you're in, Mrs. Kennedy. Hillary Franks gave it all away. Gave what away? Who's Hillary Franks? What are you talking about? About that insurance policy that was written up and issued in your brother's name. You're the one who stood to gain most by your brother's death after having someone else take an insurance examination for him. But you had to have help to pull it off. Hillary Franks helped you. For what reason or how you got him to do it, I don't know. 
But I do know a man with a 17-year record as insurance broker is ruined. You're crazy. I don't know anybody named Hillary Franks. Now, get out of here. Oh, stop it, will you? I told him how he stood in this matter a half hour ago, and he socked me with a paperweight and beat it. I've had about enough of you. But he isn't going to run far. Principally because he doesn't know how to run, Mrs. Kennedy. He'll cool off, and he'll begin thinking about all this business in a new light. A few minutes ago, it dawned on him what he'd done. He kicked his whole lifetime right out the window. He'd been found out. He's lost all around. And he's going to be mad about that. And you're the one he's going to be mad at because you got him into it. I told you, I don't know anybody named Hillary Franks. That's the last time I'll say it. He'll probably want to kill you, Mrs. Kennedy. What? I said he'll think about all this and he'll probably want to kill you. Do we talk now? I don't see why. I've done nothing wrong. Who did you get to take that physical for your brother? I don't know what you're talking about. You got your brother drunk enough to sign the insurance papers, didn't you? I had nothing to do with my brother taking out life insurance and naming me his beneficiary. That was his business. Now that he's dead, it's my position to receive the payment. That's all. (sighs) Okay, Mrs. Kennedy. We'll get it all from Hillary Franks. Yes, why don't you do that? In the meantime, I hope you sleep well knowing what you've done. You'll never be able to prove any of these things you're saying. Never. And for 24 hours, it looked as if Mrs. Kennedy might have been right. There was no way to involve her unless we had a statement from Hillary Franks. And he was still missing. I set up a watch on Mrs. Kennedy's house, and Jim Carter kept an eye on Hillary Franks' place. About 10 o'clock that night, Jim Carter drove up. Hi. Hi. Any action? No. Mrs. Kennedy has been in all the night. No one showed up. Mm-hmm. How about Frank's place? No. No one there when I left an hour ago. You'd think he'd come back for a suitcase or some money or something. Yeah. Hey, Johnny. Mm-hmm. I call in the police. Oh. <sighs> When they were worldwide, I filed charges of attempted fraud and collusion against him. They issued a warrant half an hour ago. He's on an APB and all the local bulletins. Well, I suppose you had to do it, Jim. Yeah. We'll let the police handle this part from now on, huh? How about Mrs. Kennedy? We'll keep an eye on her, too. Did you file any charges against her? Not yet. We need a statement from Franks. Jim. Yeah? What would you do if you were Hillary Franks? I'm going to try to grab an airplane. Maybe go down on a gallus, cross the border. Look up a friend, borrow some money. They get out and keep traveling. <laughs> what? He won't do anything like that. Won't he? He'll find himself a place to sit down and think. In the end, the cops won't find him. He'll find us. Want to bet? By the next morning, the police had still been unable to locate Hillary Franks. I left Jim Carter in the room on a long-distance call to the insurance commission advising them of the events up to date, drove out to Hillary Franks' office. I noticed two police officers loitering across the street as I walked in the front door. Yes? How do you do? Are you another policeman? No, no, I'm not. Have they been bothering you a lot? If you aren't a policeman and you know all about this, what do you want? I want to help Mr. Franks, if I can. I'm Johnny Dollar, Universal Adjustment Bureau. You're his secretary? Yes. How long have you worked for him? Twelve years. Do you like him? What? He's always been a fine man. I don't believe any of these things about him, and I don't see why... What's your name? I think he said Maria? Maria Vano. Maria, I'm not going to ask you any questions about Mr. Franks. I know enough about him now for my purposes. The rest he can tell me himself. Maria, I may be able to help him stay out of jail. I can do that if I talk to him. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm at the Pioneer Hotel. Remember that. But Mr. Dollar... I don't know whether he's phoned you yet or not. A man like that's going to need help, money. I'm not asking you if he's contacted you. But listen to me carefully. If he does phone you or contact you in any way, ask him to phone me. If you ever respected him, or if you want to help him now, please ask him to telephone me. Thanks. (laughs) 
I drove back to the hotel and waited for results. Another 12 hours went by. Ellery Franks was still missing, and Mrs. Kennedy was still refusing to admit anything. Finally, about 11 o'clock that night, my phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Hello. This is Hillary Franks. Where are you? Never mind. Dollar, they know all about me back at the home office, I suppose. Yes. I'd like to explain some things to you so you can pass them on. I'd like the people back there to know why I did it. Well, before I leave town... You won't get far. The police are looking for you. Oh, I can get away, all right. Mr. Franks, worldwide doesn't want to prosecute... The notoriety would be bad for them. If you'd make a statement, sign it, I think I could talk them into dropping the whole matter. Maybe we'd better get together. Come on over. Oh, no. No, I'm not that crazy. Do you know how to get to the San Javier mission? I can find it. In 15 minutes? Right. And a dollar? Yeah? It's right out in the open. If you bring the police, I'll use a gun. I bought one this morning. All right, Mr. Franks. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 worth of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Carter, Johnny. Anything on Hillary Franks? He just telephoned me two minutes ago. What? I'm on my way to meet him now and try and make a deal. I told him if he'd give me a statement about the attempt to fraud worldwide on Lansing's $50,000 policy, I'd do my best to have them drop charges. Well, you didn't make any promises, Johnny. I couldn't make any promises, Jim. But I'll do my best to see that the charges are dropped if he gives me that statement. Well, if he gives you that statement, I'll help you. Where are you meeting him? At the... At a place near here. He knows every cop in the area is looking for him. Yeah. Be sure he doesn't give you a bullet, kiddo. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar in Tucson, Arizona to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of... Well, it was a case of 50000 insurance to one Arlene Kennedy. Unless I could prove my point in the Lansing fraud. Expense account item 10, 10 bucks, cab fare, from my hotel to the Mission San Javier to talk to Hillary Franks, the insurance agent with no future ahead. I used a taxi cab instead of my rented car because I didn't want to waste time searching around for the mission. It was a few miles outside of town over rough and broken desert roads. An ancient missionary church standing stark against the moon-filled night. Here we are, mister. Good. Here. Keep the change. 
Uh, don't you want me to wait for you? No, I'll come back okay. Not many places to call a cab from out here. Yeah, I know. One of the Padres, your friend? No, no, I'm new around here. You all right, mister? Hmm? You feel all right? You're loaded or something? No, why? We're coming out here at midnight. Well, it's just a whim, friend. Don't worry about it. I have a sure would. Mister? Yeah? You gonna meet somebody here or something? Why? I just saw a guy standing over by the bell tower. Oh, thanks. Good night, man. Franks had a 38 pointed right at my chest. In the bright moonlight, I could see that he was still wearing the same clothes he'd had on two days before in his office. He needed to shave, and judging from the circles under his eyes, he hadn't slept much. He was pale and shaken. A gun wobbled in his hand. Anybody with you? I came along. Did you tell anybody you were meeting me? Jim Carter. He's been working the case with me. Did you tell him where? No. Hey, look, you don't need that gun, Franks. Put it away. I just came here to talk with you. All right. Thanks. Want a smoke? Thank you. Why did you talk to Carter? What did he say? He said he'd help me try and have the charges dropped against you if you give us a statement. Now, you have two of us on your side, Mr. Franks, if you want to cooperate. Do you? I want to straighten out what I can, Mr. Dollar. Well, now's the time to do it. What was your deal with Arlene Kennedy, James Lansing's sister and beneficiary? I met Arlene Kennedy right after my wife died. I guess I was very low. Well, that's perfectly natural. I became interested in Arlene because we had a great many things in common. So I thought. I mean, she was a widow and had no one except her brother, James Lansing, in Los Angeles. And we went together, and eventually I asked her to marry me. But she laughed at me. Why? I guess I'm not an exciting man, a witty one, or even an interesting one, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Kennedy made me feel as though my whole life had been hopeless, useless. Raising children, selling insurance. She made me feel as though I'd miss a great deal in life unless I married her. What is it? What do you want from me? What do you want from life, I'd ask her. And she'd only laugh. Laugh at me. Go on. I, I just can't tell you how desperate it made me feel. I, I loved her, Mr. Dollar. I, I wanted her. Did she ever answer your questions? Oh, many times. She pointed out that her trust funds pay her over $700 a month for life. And she knew that my commissions and salary as a broker came to about the same. Oh, Mr. Dollar, we could have lived very comfortably on that kind of income. But Arlene talked of traveling, of Europe, of clothes, and, oh, I don't know, things her family had been able to afford for her once many years ago. And she said she wouldn't marry unless we could look forward to that kind of life. She wanted $50,000 in cash instead of money just trickling in every month. That's about it. When did she get around to the proposition, her brother's insurance? Her brother came here from Los Angeles one day. The doctors there gave him a year or two to live. Oh, yes, he was pretty shot. Been drinking for years. He'd used up all his money, oh, a long time before. He asked Arlene to help him. She paid his apartment rent and gave him enough money for liquor. And then one day, one day she came right out with it. She said she was investing in him. And he was a good risk. Because she knew he'd die. That's how she put it to me. Mm -hmm. Arlene said all I had to do was see to it that her brother had a nice, fat policy. He was going to die. Why not cash in on it? I must have been crazy to even think about it. How did you work it? I mean, how did Dr. Mayhood pass him? I paid a man $100 to go to Dr. Mayhood's office and take the physical for Lansing. What was the man's name? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't tell you that, Mr. Dollar. He's not involved in anything. All right, we'll let that go. Once you arrange for Lansing to become insured, you and Mrs. Kennedy just planned on waiting for him to die. That was the general idea in view of what the Los Angeles doctors had said. <sighs> Once I'd done it, I mean, gotten him insured, it was too late to turn back. 
Did you want to turn back? Yes. What did Mrs. Kennedy say about backing out? She thought I was weak and afraid. Oh, then things weren't so good between them. Oh, they never were, Mr. Bellick. The idea was to wait for Lansing to die, collect the 50000 and get married, huh? I suppose so, yes, but... But once he was insured, she talked less and less about our getting married. You're leaving something out, Mr. Franks. Huh? Didn't she tell you exactly what kind of a position you were in? Didn't she fix it so that you couldn't make a move? Legally, she'd done nothing wrong. It was you who had arranged for the physical, you who had made the application for insurance in the name of her brother. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, she was clear about all that. And she told me so every time she felt like it. When you write down what you just told me and sign it, we can hold it over Mrs. Kennedy's head to prove attempted to fraud and collusion. Now, would you do that, Mr. Franks? Yes. Then I guess we'd better get back into town. <sighs> All right. Come on, Mr. Franks. We walked three miles over to the highway, flagged down a car, and got back to the hotel about 2.30 in the morning, got Jim Carter out of bed. Enclosed fine notarized statement of Hillary Franks explaining his part in the matter regarding policy 678JN23L. Before he was finished, Carter had already telephoned the Tucson police, telling them that the charges were being dropped against Franks and that he was no longer a fugitive. Then he placed a long-distance call to Worldwide's president in Hartford. Jim Carter, sir. I want to ask you not to prosecute Hillary Franks in this matter. Yes, sir, he's given us a complete statement about the whole thing. I don't think we have to go any farther than that. Well, look, the guy made one mistake. The first one in 17 years, he suffered enough for it already. Yes, sir. Dollar feels that way, too. Yes, sir. I think it's okay, Mr. Franks. All right. I thank you. What are you going to do, Mr. Franks? Well, sure, I'll never sell insurance again. I, I think I'll close up and just move away. Far away. Thank you. Poor guy. Oh, let's clean up the rest of this and get out of this town. Sure, Johnny. Hillary Franks pulled out of Tucson that afternoon. When Mrs. Kennedy was shown a carbon of the enclosed statement of Hillary Franks, she instructed her attorneys to withdraw the suit against Worldwide. Expense account, item 11, $75, hotel and board while in Tucson. Item 12, $402.15, plane tickets, Tucson to Hartford for Carter and myself. We were scheduled to leave at 1.30 in the morning. Two hours before plane time, I dropped by Mrs. Kennedy's house to have her sign a release of all claims on the insurance company. And for other reasons. and I did what I could for her. I phoned the police and told them to bring an ambulance. After that, I began looking around. I found a dark stain on the window still leading outside of the back of the house. On the floor, a blood-stained letter opener. There was no gun in sight anywhere. I decided if I had been stabbed with a letter opener, it would be easier to try to make it out the back way than risk the street that was bound to be full of policemen any minute. I was right. <laughs> Hillary Franks was on a ledge of rock that rose above the back of the house. I ducked behind some cactus plants. Get away from me! You know I won't. You know I wouldn't when I let you walk out this afternoon. Johnny Dollar! That's right. Now put that gun away and come on off that ledge. Get away! Go away! You missed by a mile. You don't know anything about shooting a gun. Come on down. Stay where you are. Don't do anything foolish. I'm coming after you. I'll, I'll shoot! Good shot, Dollar. Can you walk? No. Why did you do it, Mr. Franks? I came back to see her tonight. She laughed at me. Said if we had gotten the insurance money, she 
She was planning to run away with someone else. Oh. She just used me all along. Mrs. Kennedy was dead when the police got there. Hillary Franks died en route to the receiving hospital. Item 13, 15 bucks, hotel, one more night in Tucson. Expense account total, $1,121.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a quick trip to New York, to the bright lights, the glamour of Broadway, with its theaters, its actors, and, uh, yeah, some very bad actors. You might even say killers. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Vivi Janice, Jean Tatum, Hi Everback, Barney Phillips, Russell Thorson, and Howard McNear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Don Wilkins, Johnny. Prime Mutual Limited. Oh, hi, Don. Thanks for the Christmas present. Well, just don't take out the cork near an open flame. Yeah. Uh, say, do you know anything about a guy named Mel Pryker? Nothing good about him. Why? Got himself killed last night. Murdered. Pryker was born to be murdered. Maybe so, but not at our expense. We're holding a $100,000 policy on him. Wow. Who's the beneficiary? His uh, partner, Nick. Shern. Nick Shern? You picked a fine pair of rats. Yeah, I know that now. The New York police are holding Shern, but they've got no evidence. Go down there and check it out for us, Johnny. If Nick did the killing, we're off the hook. Any witnesses? One, apparently, the head checker in that nightclub of theirs. What's her story? I wish I knew. She's disappeared. We've got to find her, Johnny, before some of Nick's hoodlums find her. Don... Maybe they already have. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the Nick Shern matter. Item 1, 2280, transportation to New York, tips and incidentals, and taxi fare to the office of Lieutenant Ed Rafferty, Homicide Division, the man in charge of the case. Oh, hiya, Johnny. How have you been? Not bad, Ed. How's the homicide business? Terrible. Did you look at that teletype? Shoplifting. Five complaints right in a row. The week before Christmas, that's all we get. Shoplifters. Mel Pranker wasn't shoplifting. Oh, you working on it, Johnny? Yeah, the insurance angle. Nick Shern's the beneficiary. A hundred grand policy. Oh, you got a tough one, boy. Shern killed him all right, but I don't think we're going to be able to stick him. Come on in the office. Hey, 
You know what that kid of mine wants for Christmas? Marilyn Monroe? Oh, oh, next year, Johnny. He's only ten, you know. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. No, he, uh, he wants a motorbike. Can you tie that? Ten years old and he says he needs a motorbike. <laughs> Have a chance. Okay. Well, look, I know a factory representative here will make you a good deal on one, eh? Oh, now, forget it, Johnny. No, I was 14 before I even had a pair of roller skates. And then I had to buy them myself. Yeah, you know, kids are spoiled today. That's the half of what's wrong with them. Uh, ah, there's a file on the case. What little we've got. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, how'd it happen, Ed? Uh, you mean, how do I think it happened? That's good enough for me. Mel Pryker and Nick Schoen were both in the rackets for years, as you probably know. Yeah, I've heard rumors. Well, a while back, they teamed up and opened a string of supper clubs. That's where Pryker got it. In their main club, the Chez Collette. Strictly legitimate, huh? Well, more or less, I guess. They could afford to be. The dough they were making and arguing over, according to the word around. That's the reason for the killing, the way you see it. Sure. Nick figured if half was good, all the take would be twice as good. And the insurance on top of it. Uh-huh, you're a fast one, Johnny. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, several people heard the shots about 2.30 in the morning, it was, right after the club closed, but none of them bothered to report it. The cleanup crew came in at 3 and found Pryker's body. He was lying in his office, shot twice, gun on the floor beside him, no prints, with his own gun, and it was kept there in his desk. Where was Nick Shearn? Well, we picked him up an hour later at another one of their clubs. The manager was with him, and, uh, oh, Benny Stark. Now, he was... Benny, to... yeah, I know. Trigger man for Nick's mob in the old days. Fifteen years overdue for hanging. <laughs> That's our Benny. Anyhow, they, they both swear that Nick was there from 1.30 on. Uh-huh. What about a paraffin test, Ed? Positive, clear to the elbow, and you can throw it out the window. What do you mean? Earlier that evening, Nick spent two hours at a shooting gallery uptown, firing a pistol. Ooh, smart, huh? He really planned for it. He really did. But without a witness, we haven't got a chance. I understand there was a witness. Some girl who was mixed up in it. Easy, Johnny. You're talking to a Rafferty. Mm, so the girl's Irish. Miss Kathleen O'Dare. Old country, back three generations. County Kildare. <laughs> then naturally, she's as innocent as a newborn babe. Naturally. Then how does she figure? Well, a taxi driver who knows her said that he saw her leave the club five minutes after the shots. She denied it, said that she left at closing time. Well, now, in my book, she was lying. Scared to talk, huh? Paralyzed. And with plenty of reason. You know Sharon's reputation. Mm. Well, what about the cab driver? Now, I changed his story. He said it might have been some other girl he saw. Oh, no, no. Tell me, Ed. Let me guess. <laughs> uh, that's right. His name's O'Toole. Yeah. And I forgot to mention that Kathleen's pretty. Naturally. Anyhow, I let her go. I had to. And when I went around to talk to her this morning, she'd flown the coop. Any chance I'm a next boy's grabbed her? I don't think so. It looked more like she came home, packed in a hurry, took her kid, and blew. Kid? Yeah, eight-year-old daughter. Irish and a mother, too. I was on sacred ground. Oh, I was fingering me gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, Johnny. Would you find her? She may be able to break Nick's alibi, and it's our only chance. And it might be her only chance. Nick Sharon's not the boy to leave a loose end lying around. I know. I've got 30 men checking bus depots, airlines. And no luck, huh? In this mess, this time of year, I'm a hard-boiled cop, Johnny. I've got no Christmas spirit. I'm glad it only comes once per annum. Well, there's not very much to go on, that's for sure. I'll see what I can turn up, Ed. Check with you later. All right, that's fine. Oh, oh, oh by the way, Johnny. Yeah? Uh, about that friend of yours. What friend? Uh, the guy with the motorbikes. Uh, how, how would I be getting in touch with him? Oh, yeah, his name's Ralph Sterner. He's in the phone book, office in the Mackley building. I'd boil cop. <laughs> well, uh, they're kids only young ones. Yeah, sure. Now, you find that O'Dare girl. Find her, keep her alive, and get her to talk. How long have I got to find her? Uh, what do you mean? Nick Shearn. How much longer can you hold him? Johnny, he was turned loose an hour ago. So that was it. A lot of maybes, a lot of questions, and a lot of pressure. A job to be done and done fast. Find one Kathleen O'Dare, former hat check girl at the Shea Colette. Keep Nick Sharon's hoodlums away from her and persuade her to talk. And three to one, Nick was looking for her, too. He was free now, on the loose. And he might be anywhere. Only the way it turned out, he wasn't just anywhere. He was in one particular place. Johnny. Park right smack in front of the precinct station. Over here, Johnny. He was sitting in the back seat of a sedan, and his trigger man, Benny Stark, was at the wheel. Been a long time, hasn't it, Johnny? About five years, as I remember it, Nick. 
It was that warehouse robbery over in Queens when you got away with $40,000 worth of furs. Uh Uh-uh, you've forgotten. I was acquitted on that one. Oh, yeah, I know. After they pulled the only witness out of the East River, his feet in a bucket of cement. Just coincidence. I've never seen him before. You've seen Miss O'Dare before. Sure I have. She works for me. She's a good kid, Johnny. So I hear. Well, I wouldn't harm a hair on that girl's head. She'll be relieved when I tell her that. Get in. I want to talk to you. No, no, no. Sorry, Nick. I like it fine just the way it is. In the car, I'd be outnumbered. You got me all wrong, Johnny. I don't play that way anymore. What about Benny? Has he reformed, too? Well, if that's what... <laughs> Benny, go take a walk. Yeah, boss, but... I said go take a walk. Okay. Get in, Johnny. What's on your mind, Nick? You were uh, working on this case? Yeah, I'm on it. Why? That's what I figured. I was talking to my lawyer in there and saw you go to Rafferty's office. I guess the insurance company's going to try to welch on that claim. It's your party, it? Nick. You talk. I got a better idea. What's that? You know, it's real nice out in Las Vegas this time of year, Johnny. A man can have a lot of fun out there for the next month with maybe $10,000 to play with. What man are you talking about? You. I don't have $10,000. You will. 30 minutes from now, if you say the word. Oh, Nick, you're lucky we're not standing out there on the sidewalk. In a car seat, I haven't got room to swing. You're still a fool, huh? I don't know. Why don't you write me about it? You'll have plenty of time. Up there in the death cell. Suppose I didn't make any claim on that policy. Then you wouldn't have any reason to stay on the case. No sale, Nick. A hundred grand is a lot of money. I'd want to find out why you didn't make a claim. You know why. You're out to pin this on me, and so are the cops. A man with a record hasn't got a chance. You should have thought of that before you killed Mel Pranker. Want to know something, Johnny? I didn't kill him. Well, I'm betting you did. What do you care who killed him? You're not shedding any tears over it. No, but I'd sure hate to see you get away with it. And I'd hate it even more if anything happened to that girl. Kathy O'Dea? Now, what could happen to her? She just might fall in the river. She probably thinks she's safe as long as she hides from the police and refuses to talk. She doesn't know you very well. You had me all wrong, Johnny. You know, you hear a lot about peace on earth, goodwill toward men around this time of year. Well, I don't have much goodwill toward the kind of rat you are. And I figured there'd be more peace on earth if you weren't on it. Push me and maybe that's what'll happen. Well, at least that's fair warning. Yeah, that's fair warning. I'm going to tag you for this, Nick. You can count on it. Expense account item two, $2.40. Taxi to the east side rooming house of Kathy O'Dare. I didn't have much hope of turning up anything. Ed Rafferty and his men had already been through the place inch by inch. But it was the only starting point I had. The landlady was out and a uniformed policeman let me into Kathy's flat. I spent an hour and a half and got nowhere. I went through her mail, bills, advertisements, casual notes from men she'd met at the club. But nothing personal, not even a postcard. There were no pictures, photographs of Kathy or her daughter anywhere in the flat. She made a clean sweep, then left in a hurry. And obviously, she didn't mean to be found. But I had to find her, and fast. It was dusk when I left. The street lamps were on, and the colored Christmas lights in the windows of on the block. Snow was falling in big, soft, gentle flakes, and there was a holiday feeling in the air. It was neither the time nor the setting for murder. Make contribution, son? Give a little something to help poor? Oh, sure. How's it going this year, Santa? Oh, it's better than usual, but it just seems there's never enough to go around, no matter how... Well, bless you, son. Thank you kindly. Don't mention it. Good luck, Pop. Thank you, son. Well, the city ought to clean the streets better. I've been waiting for you. Sorry, Benny. It's not my day for punks. Get some friends who want to talk to you. Start walking, Johnny, down the alley. Uh Uh-uh. It's dark down there. Start walking. This ain't just my hand in my pocket. It better be, Benny, with two cops standing up there on the porch watching. What are you talking about? There ain't no cops. I smashed him in the mouth and knocked him flat. Followed it up and kicked his gun. He rolled over, came to his feet, and rushed me. I was hoping he would. Uh, No, no. He have that coming, son? He had it coming. Well, he, he sure did get it. Yeah. Hey, you know something, Pop? I think Benny wants to make a contribution to help the poor. Well, 
He ain't saying no. <laughs> oh, he's a good boy, at the moment at least. Here you go. That ought to help some. Three, four, five hundred dollars. What did world do the most good? Well, Merry Christmas, son. Happy New Year. Yeah, same to you, Pop, and many more of them. Hey, taxi! There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the next Shern Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old lady with a broken arm, a shivering girl, and bullets in the snow. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Gottler speaking. Gottler? I'm Kathleen O'Dare's landlady. Oh, yeah. And that's word you wanted to talk to me. That's right. I'm trying to find Miss O'Dare. Do you know where she is? You a friend of hers? I think I will be once I meet her. I'm an insurance investigator. I want to help her. That's what the other one said. The... What do you mean? What other one? The fella that come up here a while ago, short, mean-faced. The Benny Stark, was that his name? He didn't say, Mr. Dollar. I guess he was too busy. Busy? Doing what? Breaking my good right arm. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shern matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $2.30. Taxi to Mrs. Gottler's rooming house, the place Kathy O'Dare had called home until she disappeared. Hands up. Mrs. Gondler. That I am. Uh... Well, look, I'm Johnny Dollar. I talked to you on the phone. It's all right. You can put that gun down. Well, I guess it's you all right. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I've only got one good arm left, and I'm aiming to keep it. Pull up a chair. Thanks. Oh, kind of rough boy, huh? Uh, I'd have showed him who was rough if I could have got a hold of my gun. I'd have blasted him. Christmas week or not, I'd have blasted him, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I know how you feel. And me with all these presents to wrap. How can you wrap presents with one arm? That is being a paper hanger. Well, I'll be glad to help out, Mrs. Gottler. I won't guarantee what they'll look well, like. Well, I sure do appreciate it. And don't worry about their looks. I got to get them wrapped, it's all. Oh, let's see now. Uh, this paper goes on that one. Oh, all right. It's a water muffler for my nephew over in Brooklyn. You know them terrible winters they have over there. Oh, yeah, they're frightful. Of course, it may be better this year. The Dodgers won the pennant. Ah, nothing but luck. It won't happen next year. <laughs> you never know. 
Hey, tell me something, Mrs. Gottler. How come Benny worked you over? Hmm? Why did he break your arm? Here. Stick this card on it huh? as soon as you get the ribbon tied. Oh, okay. No time of year like Christmas, I always... Well, he wanted to know where Kathy went. When I said I didn't know, he jumped onto me. Said I was lying. If I could have got hold of that gun... Where uh, did she go, by the way? You aiming to break my other arm, Mr. Dollar? With all these packages to wrap? Hey, hold your finger on that knot. Tie it tight now. Them postmen in Brooklyn are always busting things open. I know. Well, that's one down. Where did you say she went? Oh, I didn't. No, this one I'll deliver myself, so it don't need to be wrapped so careful. All righty. Kathy lit out of here in the middle of the night. You think I'd sit up 24 hours a day spying on my rumors? You might, if the rumor happened to be one of your special favorites. Who told you that? What's the difference? She was, wasn't she? Kathy was everybody's favorite. Anybody that ever met her. Oh, you'll meet them as make remarks about a girl that works in a nightclub. But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Dollar. Kathleen O'Dare is a finer lady as you'd ever care to find. And I would care to find her. Well, good luck to you, then. And if you do, let me know where she is. You helped her pack, didn't you? No, how did you know that? Here, here, here. That's about as good as I can get it. Be careful when you deliver it, though. It's not tied very tight. I didn't know, Mrs. Gottner. I was guessing, but it figured. Kathy was scared half to death when she packed up and left here. All she had on her mind was to run and hide... She wouldn't have thought of stripping that flat, taking out every bit of personal identification. Somebody had to help her. Now, where'd she go? I don't know. Look, look, you don't get the idea. I'm on her side. She's up against a rough deal and doesn't even know it. You've got a sample of the way those boys play, and that was only a sample. With Kathy, it'll be a whole lot worse. They're looking for her, and sooner or later they'll find her. Her only chance is for me to get to her first, so you... I'm not lying, Mr. Dollar. I don't know where she went, and that's the truth to help me tried to get her to tell me, but she wouldn't. She said if I knew it would be dangerous for me. I helped her pack, yes, but I don't know where she was going. Well, that's that, I guess. I don't know where to turn next. She apparently didn't have any other close friends. I don't even know what she looks like. I've never even seen a picture of her. I was hoping you well, could... Well, if that'll do you any good, I've got one right here in my sewing basket. One what? A picture. What did you think? Give it to me about a year ago. She'd never had many taken, but here it is. Thanks. Real pretty girl, don't you think so? Yeah, she's lovely. Well, at least I'll be able to wreck... When was this taken, Mrs. Gabler? Now, how should I know? Three or four years ago, I guess, before she came here to the city. This photographer's address, the name of the town, is that where she came from, Brambury, Michigan? Well, yes, that's her hometown, Brambury. I'd forgotten the name of it. And she was just talking about it a week or so ago. She wanted to go home for Christmas, but she said she couldn't see. Mr. Dollar, do you think she might? Maybe. It's the most likely place a scared girl would run to, home. Anyway, it's worth a chance. Mrs. Gottler, uh, I love you. Why, well, Mr. Dollar? Why, Mr. Dollar? Expense account item six, $88.35. Hotel and Incidentals in New York and transportation to Brambury, Michigan. Brambury turned out to be a lumber village, half hidden among the pine-covered hills. It was a little bigger than a wide spot in the road, but not much bigger. A foot of new snow had fallen within the past 24 hours. A fluffy white blanket lay softly on the trees and the housetops and filled the deep hollows in the frozen ground. Men in bright red flannel shirts drove horse-drawn logging sleds through the forest trails. And their shouts sounded sharp and clear, a crystalline tinkle in the icy air. Brambury looked like the place where Christmas was invented. It was beautiful. And very quiet when it came to putting out information. I found it out first when I tried the local telephone operator. Number, please. I uh, just checked in here at the hotel operator. There doesn't seem to be a phone book, so... That's why. Traveling people going through. Oh, uh, souvenir hunters, I suppose. How's that? Uh, look, I wanted to call the O'Dares. Could you put... Not O'Dares. There ain't but one. That's old Mike. Oh, and that's the one I want to call. Would you mind ringing him? Oh, do no good. He ain't there. He's slabbing up at number four mill today. Well, actually, it's his daughter I want to talk daughter? to. Daughter? Yeah, that's right. Kathleen. Do you know her? Just growed up with her, is all. Oh, well, would you mind... You a friend of hers? No, I've never met her, Where but... Where are you from? I came here from New York, What's but I... Johnny Dollar. Now, would you please ring Kathleen? She doesn't live and... here. She lives in New York City. I know where she lives. And what give you the idea she'd be up here? I'm psychic. You're what? Look, where can I get in touch with her? I wouldn't know anything about it, Mr. 
dollar, and I can't give out that kind of information. You better go on back to New York and write her a letter. Let me talk to your supervisor. Supervisor? Well, I'm all there is, so I guess that's me. Start talking. Forget it. You're welcome. I got the same kind of runaround from the hotel proprietor. As soon as I mentioned Kathy, he suddenly forgot his own name, age, and the time of day. One thing's sure, this town took care of its own. I wondered if the law in Brambury would take the same attitude. I decided I'd better go find out. As it happened, I didn't have far to go. On the sidewalk in front of the hotel, the law came to me. Just a second there, mister. Hmm? I'd like to have a little talk with you, if you don't mind. All right. It's quite a change to find somebody here who wants to talk. I understand you just got in from New York. Here on business? Look, you know why I'm here, but now everybody in town knows. Got any identification on you? Yeah. Have you? My name's Martin. Dan Martin. I'm the deputy sheriff in charge of this part of the county. Oh, then you're just the man I was looking for. Is that so? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I'm looking for a girl named Kathleen O'Dare. Do you know where she is? What do you want with her? I'm working on a murder case. She's a witness. Is there any kind of a charge against her? No, I just want to talk to her. What makes you think she's here? Are you a friend of hers, Mr. Martin? I've been in love with Kathy since we went to grade school. I'd be willing to die for her. Does that answer your question? All right, let me put it this way. You think you're helping her by hiding her out. All of you think so. But you're wrong. You're helping her right into her grave. Kathy doesn't figure it that way. She's scared. She doesn't know what she thinks. I know these boys who are after her. They don't play kid games. And sooner or later, they're going to find her. So if you love her, and if you know where she is, you better take me to her before it's too late. I don't know. I don't know what it is Kathy's mixed up in. I didn't want to ask her. But I know it isn't the police she's afraid of. And I don't think it's you. No, at the time she ran out, I wasn't even in the picture. I'm on her side, too, Mr. Martin, and I've got to see her. Go talk to her father, old Mike. See what he thinks. He's not at home right now. Yeah, I know. He's out at number four mill. How do I get there? The county pickup truck is parked down the block. The tire chains bit into the packed snow and pushed the four miles of logging road behind us. It was late afternoon, and the sun had dropped behind the timbered slopes, throwing a pale sheet of cold yellow against the western sky. Here and there, a few scattered lights were coming on, in the windows of the village and the bunkhouses of the lumber camps. Bright white smarks against the darkening shadows. Emptiness, loneliness, and somewhere in it, a frightened girl in hiding. A girl who'd run away from the city of a hundred million lights and from an unsolved murder. Dear was winding up a job working at the big slabbing saw, and I stood by and waited for him to finish. Good night with you, Mr. Dollar. This is the last one. Okay. Well, that's the last of it now until after Christmas. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right, Mr. O'Dare. My name is Johnny. Never mind, I know all about you. Dan Martin phone. Said you was on your way out. Mr. Dollar, the answer is no. I see. I've had it over since Dan called. Before I'd have anything happen to Kathy, I'd rather see ten murderers going home. Now look, hiding out won't help. As long as Nick Shearn is free, Kathy's in danger. He can't hurt her if he can't find her. I found her, Mr. O'Dear. Just by luck. There's not one chance in a million of... Sounds like a car. Ooh, the tarnation to drive out here this time of the evening. We walked over to the big doors. The car had stopped about 20 yards away. A man got out and turned toward us. I was standing under the dock light, so he recognized me before I got a good look at him. He jumped back in the car and went for his gun. Benny Stark. Get back, Mr. O'Dare. It was too dark to get a decent shot. I tried once more. And missed, and the car disappeared behind the trees. Mr. Dollar, who was it? Was that one of them? That's right, Mike. They found her. The 
There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a lonely vigil in the snow, a killer prowls the night, and a lovely lady vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dan Martin here. I was up the street when you Listen, called. Listen, Sheriff, they've traced Kathy O'Dear here to your nice little town of Brambury. Who has? Nick Shearn's boys. One of them, a trigger man named Benny Stark, came out to the sawmill hill a few minutes ago. I traded a couple of shots with him, but he got away in a car. Did he head north or back toward town? Toward town, I think. You can't see the turnoff from here. All right, Dollar. You're packing a gun. Will you take the pickup truck and block that turnoff? Hold it until I can get somebody out there to relieve you. Right. How many deputies you got? Deputies? Uh Uh-oh. What about volunteers? Is this Benny Stark the man Kathy's afraid of? He's one of them. Then I'll have volunteers. Twenty men within a half hour, armed with deer rifles. And every one of them a dead shot. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment: the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item eight, three dollars sixty cents for two packs of cigarettes and a pint of Applejack borrowed from the foreman's locker at the sawmill. I figured these as standard equipment for holding down a roadblock at ten degrees above zero, and Mike O'Dare agreed with me a hundred percent. Well, I'll tell you one thing: they can make it out of corn, rye, barley, make it out of gold if they want to, uh, but they'll never come up with anything better than what they make out of apples. <laughs> here, here, have a short one, Johnny. No, no, thanks. I'll save it for later. Well, I'll just. Uh... It's got the taste of Indian summer in it. You ought to see this country around that time of year, Johnny. Breaks your heart, it's so beautiful. Well, it's beautiful now with the snow on. And it would be more so if there wasn't a killer running loose in it. Johnny, I want to ask you something about my daughter. And I want you to answer me honest. All right. It's no use trying to fool you. She's here all right. I know. But she hasn't told me what it was that happened in New York. What she ran away from it. Somehow I figured it was just as well not to ask her. Your sheriff, Dan Martin, said practically the same thing. Dan's been in love with Kathy since he was 12 years old. He's a good man. Solid. So I figured. Anyway, she was scared. Scared half to death. And she'd come home for help, so we tried to help her. What was it you wanted to ask me, Mr. O'Dare? You mentioned a murder case, Johnny. You didn't give any of the details. Just said that Kathy was a witness. Is... Is she mixed up in this murder? And you wanted an honest answer. All right, I'm not sure. I see. That's why I wanted to talk to her, get her story, the truth. I realized from the start she might be guilty. I don't think so, but it's a possibility. You may as well know about it. I guess you realize it wouldn't make any difference. Not to me or to Dan. Oh, yeah, I figured. 
In other words, you're with me as long as I'm trying to protect her. But you'll fight me if I find reason to think she's guilty. That's about it, Johnny. Well, at least we know where we stand. And I hope it won't come to... What's the matter? Car coming. Light on the trees there at the bend. Yeah. Do you suppose maybe... Probably not, but you can't tell. Better get behind the truck just in case. You'll have to shift into low to edge past us. Let me get that spotlight on. I, I guess I'll just have another quick one. <sighs> that wind cuts right through your bones. It's a dark-colored sedan. It might be him. Funny. I'd been hoping for two months that Kathy'd come home for Christmas. And I didn't figure I'd be out here in the woods, hiding behind a truck, waiting to shoot it out with somebody that wanted to kill it. It's a crazy world. Keep your head down, Mr. O'Dear. Yeah. Mm, just the driver by himself, wearing a dark hat. I don't know. You know, that kind of looks like... Huh? Why, Carly, it is. What? That's Ted Perkins, old wreck. No doubt about it. When did... All right, you better wave him out past. He probably thinks we need help. Okay. Hey, it's all right, Ted. It's Michael there. Go ahead, go ahead. We don't need anything. Yeah, we're well, all right. Thanks anyway. Well, there's one thing about people around here. They mind their own business and don't ask no questions. And they don't answer them often either. How's that Applejack holding out? Only three cars came out from the village. And each time a long moment of tension while we waited to identify the occupants. But all of them were townspeople. Benny didn't show. One truck came down the logging road from the back hills loaded with dwarf spruce and fir. <laughs> Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We were waiting for an assassin. But the truck only carried Christmas trees. The night was crystal clear with bright stars hanging low on the blackness. But it kept turning colder and colder. And to leave on the Applejack didn't help much. And the wind, too, changed gradually and blew fitful and gusty and strange. Eh, it's going to storm. Come a blizzard, maybe. Not tonight. Tomorrow sometime or tomorrow night. I know this country. I know the signs. Uh, there's an odd feeling in the air, all right. There's an even odder one in my leg. Log rolled over on it pretty near six years ago. Bothers me some in the winter. Till that horse, though, right before a storm. Well, that's kind of a handy thing to have. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. Like one time when Kathy was little. When her ma was still alive. God rest her soul. We had a big measles epidemic here in Brambury, and every night Kathy used to add a line to her prayers. She'd say... And please let me catch the measles so I can stay out of school like the other kids. <laughs> now she's wanted as a witness in a murder case. And somebody's prowling out there in the dark trying to find her and kill her. Little Kathy. Who never harmed anybody in her whole life. Some things just don't make sense, Johnny. Some things never have. There was another time once when men like Benny were prowling in the dark trying to find a little child and kill him. And he hadn't harmed anybody either. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so it was. I like you, Johnny. Kathy will like you, too, and little Jill. Oh, oh there's a pair for you. That kid looks more like a mother did at her age. Another car coming, Mr. O'Dare. Yeah, so there is. And this just might be the one. Maybe. I sure wish that Applejack hadn't run out. But it was only a couple of men Deputy Martin had sent out from town to relieve us and take over. Big men, calm and quiet, wearing plaid Mackinaws and heavy lace boots and carrying Winchester 94s over their arms. They told us Benny Stark had been seen. He'd come up from the west, driven onto one of the roadblocks unexpectedly. In a flurry of shots, he'd broken through. The men couldn't understand his persistence. They thought he'd run for it, get out of the area once his presence was known. I didn't bother to explain, to put him straight, but I knew Benny had never run, not now. He was a trigger man, a professional killer with a reputation at stake. And he had his orders to silence Kathy O'Dare. A half hour later, we'll be back in town, turning into the main street around the village square. Strings of colored lights and a tall pine in the center of the square blinked and sparkled as they swayed in the wind. 
Around a hundred cars and trucks were parked in the street and in the lot behind the town hall. And the sound of singing drifted out from inside. They're practicing carols and things for the big doings on Christmas Eve. Ain't it beautiful? The men at the roadblock had given a description of Benny's car and the license number. It was just barely possible. Got something in mind, Johnny? Yeah, let's take a look through those parked cars. I don't know. If it was me, I sure wouldn't be hanging around here. I'd stick to the tall timber. Yeah, but you're not a city boy, Mike. Tall timber is foreign soil to Benny. He's only comfortable when he's close to a crowd. He the fellow that's supposed to have done that murder? No, it was the man he works for, a cafe owner, ex-gangster, a man named Nick Shearn. Let's check that lot around at the side. I don't think he'd show here in front. He'd be taking a big chance showing anywhere. In a town this size, people know each other. It's his job to take chances. And he probably doesn't realize... Wait a minute. That sedan against the building with the side window broken. Seven, eight, two, one. That's his car, Johnny. Yeah, wait here. I eased my gun out of the holster and started toward the car. There were no lights in the lot, only the soft glow reflected from the packed snow underfoot. And the car itself stood in the dark shadows next to the building. I couldn't see whether anyone was in it or not. The singing seemed to swell louder as I approached. I moved slowly, watching for any sudden movement. (sighs) The car was empty. It was time, past time, to talk to Kathy O'Dare. And with the pressure tightening the danger close to home now, her father was ready to take me to her. We drove over to Dan Martin's house where it turned out Kathy and her daughter were staying. Dan's mother had been looking after her. Dan was there when we arrived, busy on the phone. Yeah, I know the car all right. The one Jed bought last spring down in Bay City. Seven, three, nine, two. Uh, Where was it parked? All right, keep an eye out, Charlie. So long. Benny Stark has stolen himself another car, huh? Took Jed Warden's station wagon. Well, what for? That was a better one he had. Charlie says the steering gear was sprung. I guess it happened when he crashed that roadblock. But how's Kathy and the young'un? Oh, fine. They're asleep upstairs. Uh, Mom's next door helping Mrs. Barton stuff a turkey. Johnny, you, uh... You figure it could wait till morning. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Dare. I've got to talk to her tonight. All right. I'll go wake her up. Mr. Dollar, no matter what she's done, don't hurt her any more than you have to. As far as I know at the moment, Dan, all she's guilty of is withholding information. And most people would have done the same thing. Nick Shearn's a rough boy to tangle with. She was scared, that's all. Lost her head. She never did belong in a city. She belongs right here in Brambury. This is her kind of life. Why did she leave? Well, we argued one day, and she said she'd show me. So she ran off and married that fellow. He treated her bad. Finally, he left her. But she was too proud to come back. She wouldn't have come back now if she hadn't have been so scared. Well, maybe it'll work out now. She ought to stay. Her kid ought to grow up here. Learn the outdoors and the woods like Kathy used to know it. Why, she roamed through those hills like a young Indian. Knew every trail in that forest. Every timber camp and trapper's cabin from here to the ridge. I remember one time the two of us were up toward... Dan! What's the matter? What is it, Mr. O'Dear? You said... You said Jill and Kathy were asleep upstairs. Ain't that what you said, Dan? Of course that's what I... Mike. What's happened? They're not up there. They're not up there anywhere else in the house. They're gone. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the next Shern matter tomorrow. Tomorrow. A little girl who believes in Santa Claus, a big girl who believes in very little, and both of them facing death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, 
Bailey, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mike O'Dare, Johnny. Any sign of Kathy? No, the boys at the highway turnoff haven't seen her or Benny, either one. Not a soul out that way in the last hour. What about there at the sawmill? Nothing, Mike. No fresh tracks on the logging road, no sign of her. And the worst thing is, it's starting to snow again. Yeah, here in town, too. Dan Martin just phoned. No luck. She hasn't shown up at any of the roadblocks. She's she's around somewhere, and we've got to find her. We will, Mike. And it's got to be fast, Johnny. There's a blizzard coming up, and that gunman Benny Stark is around, too. Maybe he's already found her. Maybe he even took her from the house, her and Jill both. Maybe she didn't get scared and run. Maybe it was him. Maybe he's... Mike, stop it. it. That kind of thing is not going to help any... Well, what is going to help? I don't know, but I've got a half-baked idea, and I may be right. Stay there at the house. I'm coming back to pick you up. And one thing you can do while you're waiting... What, Johnny? Pray. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Bramberry, Michigan, to the home office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shern matter... Or more important, find Kathy O'Dare. Item 12 on expense account, $4.90. A tank full of gas for the county pickup I'd borrowed from Deputy Sheriff Dan Martin. The falling snow was thickening now, and the wind was rising and steadying in the northwest. The night had all the makings of a blizzard. And wherever Kathy and her daughter had gone, we had to find them before it hit. It was 10.14 p.m. when I pulled up at the side porch of the Adair house, and Kathy's father came hurrying out to the truck, leaving the door open behind him and buttoning his heavy mackinaw as he ran. Any news, Mike? Not a thing. All right, get in. Shut the door. Yeah, yeah we'll get a foot of snow before morning, with a zero wind behind it. Now listen, Mike. I think we can forget any idea that Benny found her and got her out of the house. In that case, she wouldn't have taken your car. He's already got one. I know. I thought of that. And he wouldn't have given her time to dress herself in jail the way she did with heavy clothes and snow boots. And she wouldn't have taken the rifle. Then what has happened? She knew I'd be there to talk to her sometime this evening. I think she lost her nerve, couldn't face it, decided to run again. Maybe so, but where, Johnny? That's what I want you to tell me. What? No, I don't mean you knew what she was going to do and where she was going to go or then help how to... do you think I can tell you? Look... Kathy knew about the roadblocks Dan Martin set up to trap Benny Stark, knew where they were. So if she didn't want to be seen, then naturally she'd avoid them. She couldn't, not if she wanted to get away, take the highway to Flint or Detroit. She'd have to pass one of them at least. But she hasn't passed any of them, so she's still in this area. And I don't think she ever meant to leave it. But then... Dan Martin said Kathy used to spend a lot of time in the woods when she was growing up. He said she knew every back trail in these hills, logging camps, trappers' cabins. She did. She used to worry that Dickens ought to be the way she... Yeah. Now, where would she go, Mike, if she wanted to hide out back in the hills somewhere? There's a lot of places. Chippewa Canyon's one. Three or four timber camps abandoned in the winter. Some cabins along the... No, no, she couldn't make it. There's a roadblock before you get to the turn off there. It's got to be some place she could reach without being seen. Well, there's... There's Barker's Flats. Oh, but that's 12 miles by foot trail. She wouldn't try it in this weather, not... Not with Jill along, anyway. Then there's... 
Lake Pine. No, it's over the other way. Pine Lake Road. Where's that? Runs northwest of town. Not much better than a wagon road. Dan didn't put a block on it because it dead ends at the lake about five miles out. What's out there? Nothing at the lake. But you can go on up Pine Creek about four miles on foot, and there's some cabins. Maybe a waste of time, Johnny. Let's get going. Expense account, item 13, $6.90. One dry cell electric lantern, an extra pair of batteries picked up at the Bramberry Hardware Company on the way through town. The falling snow, driven by a bitter cold wind, formed a dense curtain in front of our headlights. And from the turnoff all the way up the narrow, twisting road to Pine Lake, I had to keep the truck in second gear. There were car tracks in the road, all right, several of them. But they were covered now by the new blanket of snow. And it was impossible to tell whether they'd been made earlier tonight or a week ago. The road ends a couple of yards past this next turn. And we'll soon know. There's four or five side turnoffs. Clearance where where you can park. We'll have to check all of them, I guess. All right. That draw there on the right. That break there in the trees. That's that's where the Pine Creek Trail starts. I will swing in it. Mike, I guess we won't have to check those turnoffs. Huh? Is that your car over there under the trees? Yeah. That's it. I left Mike waiting in the cab while I went over to look inside the car. It was empty, abandoned. And there was no note, no clue of any kind to tell where Kathy had gone. I raised the hood and felt the motor block, ice cold. The car had been here for some time. I flashed the lantern on the ground and followed the faint tracks made by two pairs of snow boots. They entered the deep draw that led back into the hills, the start of the Pine Creek Trail. I snapped off the lantern and stumbled through the snow back to the truck. What did you find, Johnny? It's them, all right. They've headed up the trail. I found tracks in the snow. Well, then we'd better get started on No, no wait. I'll go after them, Mike. You take the truck, go into town, find Dan Martin. Bring help as fast as you can. That storm's getting worse. No, you don't. I know the risk. Starting up that trail with a blizzard coming on. And if you think you're going to protect me by sending... Knock it off, Mike. There's no time, and you're wrong. I'm not protecting you. I'm protecting myself. What do you mean? That bum leg of yours. I don't want you on my hands, too, along with the girls. All right, Johnny. I'll go after Dan. And hurry, Mike. I'm depending on you. Yeah. Good luck, Johnny. See you, Mike. I stood there in the snow watching the headlights of the truck move away. Finally, they swung around the bend and disappeared. And I suddenly felt more alone than I ever had in my life. I'd gotten rid of Mike deliberately, sent him away on purpose, because I hadn't told him everything. I could see no point in tearing his heart out. There was another car parked on beyond Kathy's, nearly hidden by the trees. Jed Horton's station wagon. The car that had been stolen by a killer named Benny Stark. It took me half an hour to cover the first mile, and the storm kept getting worse. The beam of the lantern penetrated a bare 30 feet ahead of me before it was smothered out in the white blackness of the night. After a few hundred yards, the tracks I was trying to follow had nearly disappeared, snowed over and blotted out. I gave up looking for them and stuck to old Mike's description of the trail, following the left bank of the frozen creek. The drifts were deeper down along the creek bottoms, and the going was rougher. But I didn't dare leave it to look for better footing. It was my only landmark. The trail itself was buried. And any man who lost his way tonight and wandered off into one of those side gullies would wander straight to his death. An hour passed. Then an hour and a half, or two hours maybe. I lost all track of time and distance. The wind cut through my clothes and the numbing cold crept into me deeper and deeper. Gradually, the walking, stumbling, breathing, even thinking became automatic and without feeling. The world itself seemed to narrow down to a tiny circle close around me. And all beyond was chaos, blackness, and roaring storm. I tripped over fallen logs and floundered back to my feet, dropped my lantern and recovered it, broke through the crusted drifts and struggled for footing, and kept on moving. In the weird nightmare of the blizzard, I could hardly recognize reality when I came face to face with it. When a beam from my lantern touched him, crouching by a tree a few yards away, 
I could barely accept him as being real. He'd been watching my light as I approached, waiting for me. It was Benny Stark with his gun leveled and aimed. Don't be a fool, Benny! Drop that gun! A curtain of snow swept between us then, blotting out the sight of him. I was grateful. I turned and stumbled on into the storm, moving in pitch darkness now, except for the ghostly glow from the snow-covered ground. The second shot had smashed my lantern, and I had nothing left to go by but instinct and luck, and they weren't enough. Within 15 minutes, I was hopelessly lost. That's when I started hearing the music. Miles from no place where there couldn't be any music. Except inside my head. The cold and fatigue were finally doing their work. I knew the signs. The next step was to start wandering in circles, smaller and smaller ones. And the last step, to drop exhausted and go peacefully to sleep. Peacefully and permanently. But the sound kept growing louder. And I moved in the direction it seemed to be coming from couldn't be just illusions. It had to be real. Hello! Hello there! Then suddenly, only a few yards away, a brilliant blaze of light exploded from the darkness, and it seemed that a golden-haired girl was standing in the middle of it, and for a moment my sanity tottered. Who's out there? My golden vision was wearing blue jeans and a flannel shirt and was holding a rifle. She looked exactly like the photograph I'd seen of Kathy O'Dare. And the blaze of light came from an open cabin door. Who is it? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, thank heaven. Hold it, Miss Dare. It's Johnny Dollar. Are you getting warm now? I don't think I'll ever get warm again. You will if you don't move away from the stove a little. The back of your shirt is starting to smoke. Yeah, I, I thought I was beginning to feel something. How's the firewood? There's plenty. And plenty of food. And a radio. If I hadn't heard that music, I'd have blundered right on past this cabin. We've got everything. We can hold out for a month if we have to. I hope we have to. What about your daughter? Is she all right? Sure. She's fine. The picnic for her. A camping trip. She's sound asleep back there in the lean-to. Dreaming about Santa Claus, I suppose. Wish I could. How did you find me, Mr. Dollar? Oh, hunch. Guesswork. I was born under a lucky star. I wasn't. Oh, I don't know. I think you've been pretty lucky, considering everything. More so than your landlady back in New York. Mrs. Grappler? What do you mean? Betty Stark went to see her. Tried to find out where you were. When she wouldn't tell him, he broke her arm. Oh, no. Oh, the poor woman. Oh, it's a rough game, Miss O'Dare. Trying to play it cozy with a mobster like Nick Shearn. You know, of course, that he sent Benny here to find you. He'll have a hard time finding me in this place. He did find you. What? Maybe he followed you from the house or saw you drive through town. Anyway, I ran into him back down the trailer ways. I thought I heard shooting a while ago. You did. He tried to ambush me. He thought he had the drop and he wouldn't give up. I had to kill him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the showdown. Victory, and then disaster. When a visitor to the little town of Brambury turns out to be death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
from Hollywood, it's time now for Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Spell it. J-O-H-N-N-Y-D-O-L-L-A-R. That's not right. You forgot to capitalize. Hey, you're right, honey. Let me hear you spell your name. Okay. Capital J, I L L, Jill. Capital O, apostrophe. Apostrophe. I never can say that. Capital D, A R E, or Dare. Of course, my last name's actually something else. I forget. But my mother says I'm really an O'Dare. Not the least doubt about it. I can see it in a minute. <laughs> I like you, Johnny Dollar. And I kind of like you, too, Jill O'Dare. You think my mother's pretty? I think she's lovely. Then why don't you get married to her so I can have a daddy? Well, that's, um... Well, it's certainly something to think about. And, uh, not a bad idea. Now, I'll well, be quiet before you wake her up. I'm already awake. And with a plot like that being hatched, I think I'd better stay awake. Is there coffee, Johnny? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location a small cabin in the timber outside Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment? The Nick Shurn matter. Expense account, final page. Item 15, $1 million for a certain feeling. I realize, of course, that the amount of this item is somewhat unusual and may be cause for mild criticism by your accounting department, unless the accompanying report includes an adequate and detailed explanation. Therefore, to avoid unnecessary correspondence and delay, I am attaching said explanation herewith. Here's your coffee, Kathy. Thanks. How long did I sleep, Johnny? Oh, a couple of hours. It's around four in the morning. The storm hasn't let up at all, has it? No, oh, it's worse, if anything. Jill, honey, it's four o'clock in the morning and your eyes are just about to fall out. Now you go back there and go to sleep. Do I have to, Mommy? You have to. Run along now. Mr. Johnny Dollar and me were having a lot of fun till you woke up. <laughs> well, that's life, sweetie. Night now. Good night, Jill. Good night. Proud of her? I'm crazy about her. That's what you mean. She's a great little girl. She's the only thing I ever did in my whole life that turned out right. That bad, huh? Johnny, it's no good. I know why you're here. I know what you expect from me, and the answer's no. You're jumping the gun. I haven't asked you anything. You will. You haven't done all this for nothing. You're going to ask me to come back to New York and testify against Nick Shearn. I might ask you to tell the truth... Is that just another way of wording it? I didn't see anything, hear anything. I don't know anything about it, and I have nothing to say. So Nick Shearn gets away with another murder. I wouldn't know anything about that. And sooner or later, of course, he'll kill you, too. He sent Benny Stark out to do it, and Benny missed. But he's got other boys, or he might even handle the job himself. Why? By now he ought to know that I'm not going to tell. But there's always that chance you might change your mind. And Nick's a gambler, but he likes the odds on his side. He doesn't take chances. Whenever he can, he stacks the deck. I wish I could help you, Johnny. But I don't know anything about it. I left before it happened. How long have you worked for Nick Shearn? Known him? Two years. I'm not wide-eyed about him, Johnny. I've heard what he's been... What he may even still be, a gangster, hoodlum, racketeer, but that's none of my business. The club was, was legitimate, my job there was on the level, and he never got out of line once. And no doubt he's always been kind to his mother and loves dogs and children. I wouldn't know, except children. He's crazy about them. He was always buying something for Jill, asking about her. And he also shot and killed Mel Pricker. I couldn't say. I see. Well, you're letting a lot of people down. People here in Brambury that you grew up with, people that love you, your father, Dan Martin. What have they got to do with it? You know, it's a great country up here. I'd like to spend more time in it. And it's big country, big and beautiful and dangerous. Like that blizzard outside there. 
It's not the kind of country that turns out cowards. Cowards? Your father said something yesterday. That some people belong in cities and some don't. And that you're one of the second kind. He was right. The city's made a coward of you. You don't understand. And they know it. Old Mike, Dan, all of them. Of course, they'll never mention it. But you're letting them down and they know it. And you know it, Kathy. They don't have a daughter to think of. It's not her fear we're talking about. It's yours. All right, I'm scared. I've got reason to be. It's easy for you to talk. You don't know what fear is, what it can do to you. I don't. It can push you and drive you and make you do things you hate yourself for. And it can destroy you. How would you know? How would any of them know? Who haven't felt it, who haven't been there. Kathy, you're not alone. We've all been there. It's not the fear that's important. It's the courage you bring up to fight it. I've tried. I've... I've nearly gotten crazy trying to think it out. But it always comes back to one thing. Jill. She's what counts. Nothing else matters. And if you love her, teach her to grow up without fear. Sacrifice anything if you have to, even your life. But teach her courage. There's nothing greater you could do for her. (laughs) It's all right, Jill. It's all right. It's all right. I knew what was right, Johnny. I knew all the time. Sure, sure. Of course you did. All you needed was a little push. Want to tell me about it now? I... I was there at the club that night. When it happened, I stayed after closing. I had some presents for Jill, and I wanted to wrap them before I took them home. Nick and Mel Pryker were upstairs in the office. Nick was there? Yes. I could hear them arguing. They didn't know I'd stayed, and then... Go on. I heard Mel yell out. He said... No, Nick, no. And then I heard the shots. Yes? I didn't even think. I ran up to the office. Mel was lying on the floor, and Nick was standing there with a gun. He told me to get out and to keep quiet. If I wanted to keep on living. That's it, huh? Yes. Will you make a statement to the police, testify at the trial? Yes. Oh, good. Will you help me, Johnny? Will you stand by me? You know I will. You've got to because I'm scared. I'll be scared all the way, but I'll do it if you'll help me. I'll help you, Kathy, all the way. Why don't you curl up here and get some sleep? Come on. Maybe now I can sleep. It's going to be all right. Thanks, Johnny, for giving me the push. Oh, sure, honey. You know something, Johnny? I'm with Jill. I like you, too. She went to sleep with her face against my chest. And after a while, little Jill came tiptoeing in and curled up on the other side. And I sat there holding them both, thinking and waiting for the dawn. So that's what I mean about a million-dollar feeling. True, it wasn't my little girl or my big girl, either. But for the moment, at least, well, that item still goes. I'll still tag that feeling at one million dollars. are you there? And I was sorry when the storm was over and a rescue party came out from town. Because I felt I'd had one moment in a lifetime that I'd never find again. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. When the snow lay round the The big event of the year in Brambury was the Christmas Eve show in the town hall. There was music and a pageant and singing, and everybody took part in it, from the youngest kid in town to the toughest old grizzled lumberjack from the back hills. Jill was in the children's chorus, and old Mike was to operate the spotlight, so they went on ahead. I took Kathy. And since she wasn't quite ready to face people yet, we made a point of getting there late. I didn't care when we got there, as long as I was with her. We slipped in quietly and took seats at the back of the room. The string group from the high school orchestra was playing and no one noticed us. Not even old Mike, Kathy's father, who was working the spotlights. I hope Jill does all right. She hasn't had any time to practice with us. Oh, she'll do all right. We'd been there about ten minutes when somebody else came in and slid into the one seat between us and the door. I didn't look around until I felt Kathy stiffen beside me. Oh, no. 
It was Nick Shearn. Nobody gets excited now or makes any sudden moves. We just sit here quiet like. He slid his hand over to feel inside my coat under my arm. Now packing around, huh? Perfect. I'd left my gun at Kathy's house. Old Mike had been dubious about it, but with Benny dead, I'd seen no reason to carry it. And after all, it was Christmas Eve. All right, now we're going to ease out of here now without attracting no attention from anybody. You're crazy, Nick. You're crazy. Shut up. And just don't forget one thing, now. I'm not holding this gun on you. Same right at the middle of Kathy's bank. Let's go. Johnny. No choice, Kathy. Come on. The back of the room was dark. Nobody paid any attention. Somebody was always leaving or coming back in. Come on. I got a car over at the side. Johnny. Watch it, dollar. We'll be right back, Mike. Just going to get some air. All right, Johnny. But don't go running out before I give you your present. Huh? Here. And don't uncork that until you're ready for some serious business. All right, I'll... I'll... Re- Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it. Good luck, Johnny. Yeah, come on, let's get away from here. Johnny, he's going Take to... Take it easy, Kathy. Wait for me! Oh, what... Oh, no. Jill, go back! I want to see Uncle Nick! Why'd you tell me you were coming here to hear me sing Uncle Nick? Well, I... Uh, listen, Pick me Jill... up. Please, Uncle Nick. Take your hands out of your pocket and pick me up. Uh, look, Jill, you run along now... Who's that? Dan Martin. He's a deputy sheriff, and he's a dead shot. Better do like she says, Nick. Take your hand out of your pocket and pick her up. Uncle Nick? All right, reach in my pocket, Johnny, and take my gun. Later, Kathy and I walked around outside. We could still hear the children's chorus singing inside. Jill saved our lives tonight. No, she saved Nick's life. What do you mean? That present your father gave me, up there at the spotlights. He could see what was happening, and he thought real fast. That present was a gun. Then you... I had Nick covered from the time we stepped off the porch. I'm glad he didn't move. I'm glad it happened like it did. Yeah, so am I. I thought we'd never see those stars up there again. You kept hold of yourself, Kathy. You showed a lot of courage. No. But maybe I can learn to show it. I was just thinking, Johnny, looking at the stars up there. There was fear in the world then. Two thousand years ago. And he had courage. Expense account item 16, $230.40. Incidentals in Brambury and transportation for two adults and one child. Brambury to New York. Expense account total, $486.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. From all of us here on the program. And God bless you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Don Diamond, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Sam Edwards, and Ken Christie. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. This is Pauline Morris at Victor Turner's office, Continental Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pauline. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Uh, Johnny, Mr. Turner asked me to get in touch with you and find out what you're working on at the moment. Why, nothing. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Well, good. Would you be interested in handling a case for us while you're there? Oh, Pauline, I'm going to New York on a vacation. Well, this shouldn't take too much time, and... Johnny, it's really one of our most important accounts. Well, how much commission can I figure on? Do you want the truth? Sure. Practically none. Oh, fine. Why does Turner foist these things on me? Oh, I guess it's my fault. I told him I thought you might do it as a favor to us. For Mr. Turner or Continental Adjustment Bureau? No. For you? Okay, what is it? Well, Wait, uh... better still, why don't you tell me about it over dinner? Say, at the Crystal Room? Oh, I'd love that. I've been wanting to go there for months. Hey, you know something? I've been waiting for an excuse to take you there for years. Eight o'clock, Pauline? Eight o'clock. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. It started quite pleasantly. Oh, no, Johnny, let's go back to the table and eat. I'm tired of dancing. Yeah, but once you sit down, you'll start talking business again. Well, of course. I will. I do have a job to keep. Okay, okay. Frustrating girl. (laughs) Besides, the sooner you clear up this case, the longer you'll have for a vacation in New York. I said okay. Hey, I sit down. Thank you. All right, Miss Morris. Let's have the bad news. Well, the insurance company is Delaware Eastern Liability, New York office. Yes, ma'am. Their client who filed the complaint is a large dress manufacturing company. Uh, Century Styles Incorporated. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and if you can manage to pick up one of their latest creations in my size while you're there, I love you forever. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's dance. No, no, wait. The auditors found a deficit in their books, $4,285. Well, naturally, the head of the company wants a settlement. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's... And, Johnny, your biggest problem will be Mr. Elliot. Mr. Robert Elliot, who I understand is something of a personality problem. He can't be any more of a problem than I'm having with you. Now... Let's dance. Expense account item two, $28.63. Train fare and incidentals getting from Hartford to Manhattan. With me, I took all the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Century Styles with Delaware Eastern Liability and Trust. I arrived at Grand Central at 2.05 and was checked in at the New Western by 2.30. Air brisk, sky clear, weather cold. Expense account item three, 10 cents, phone call. To Robert P. Elliott, Century Styles Incorporated. Mr. Elliott said he would be happy to see me, so I went right over and found a four-story building that housed two floors of factory and two floors of offices. The factory was the usual crowded, noisy collection of machinery and people. The general offices overstuffed and overheated and overcrowded. Girls, girls, you must get ready. Come on, girls. Now everybody. The Sam Hill. Jenny, you'll just have to reduce. How can we fit you when the pins keep popping out? Uh, pardon me. Uh, I'm looking for Mr. Elliott. You are. True. Well, I'm Robert Elliott. Oh, you must be Mr. Dollar. That's right. Stand by, Jenny, sweet. Please, these pins. We all suffer for our art child. Now, bear up. I'll deliver you soon. This way, Mr. Dollar, to a quiet corner. Mr. Elliott was small and wiry, wearing white warachis, green slacks, a corduroy jacket, and a flower print shirt of no identifiable color. As I followed him across the large and elegant showroom floors, I couldn't help stealing glances at the merchandise, animate and inanimate. Everything I saw was strictly high class, a group of goddesses. Mr. Elliott led me through a pair of swinging doors into an office with a carpet so thick I couldn't see my shoe tops. A desk in Russian gray sprawled in one corner. My office, Mr. Dollar. Mm Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you're here, that the insurance company heeded my call. Well, I hope we can help you straighten this matter out. Well, it's scandalous. It's truly scandalous. Five thousand dollars. Really? Uh, the complaint said four thousand two hundred and eighty-five, Mr. Elliott. Well, that's almost five thousand. Besides, I like to deal in round figures. 
Brett Narnby to my auditors, and they said that you are the a very important investigator in insurance circles. Well, I'm flattered. Did they happen to leave a copy of their findings? Yes, they did. They most certainly did. But before I give it to you, I must explain how awful this situation is. Uh, please do. Well, you've no doubt heard of Patricia's things. No, no, uh, I don't think... Uh... Uh, Patsy's things? Why, of course... Oh, you're just joking. I am Patsy's things. In fact, I made Patsy's things. It's our highest priced line, you know, evening dresses. Oh, you don't say. I definitely do. Oh, the nights of thankless work that go into creating just one gown. One supreme gown for the season. Oh, I'm sure. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it's... Well, it's a thankless task in one respect. You... But that's a different story. What I'm trying to say is that this loss is devastating me. I mean it. I must. I simply must have an adjustment immediately. Well, the insurance company sympathizes with you, Mr. Elliott. We'll try to adjudicate it as quickly as possible. Oh, that's comforting. That's very comforting. Oop. Rob Elliott here. In my opinion, hats are just not important this year. Yes? No, 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 no. Positively no. No advance layouts on the new line. Not until later. No, not tomorrow. No, I can't. I simply cannot. Oh. Anything wrong? Well, that's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to explain. This matter simply must be handled with all dispatch, Mr. Dollar. You see, my firm operates on a... On a... Shoestring? Well, <laughs> spider's hair would be more apt. Five thousand dollars. Mr. Dollar, that comparatively small loss is stopping me from showing my new line of patsy's... The evening dresses. Yes, yes. I must show them before months end or I'll lose my entire opportunity for profit. So, you see, I must have compensation for the loss. I think I get the picture, Mr. Elliot. Oh, uh, there. That, 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 that was the newspaper calling, and it's terrible. They all want advanced viewings of my new line, and I simply can't afford to. I, I can't afford to pay my help to produce the models. Mr. Dollar, for three agonizing months I worked. Frantically, I drew, I cut, I stitched. And not one warp over for my creation will be exhibited, can be exhibited, unless this matter is settled. Then suppose we get down to business. Well, the business is that some ruthless brigand pussyfooted off with my company's money. Well, do you have any idea? I don't. I don't have... No, no, no. Not so much as a footprint or a strand of hair. And, Mr. Dollar, if you don't find out who it was and return my money, I'll be cremated. Professionally cremated, that is. Why, I might even have to join the Foreign Legion. Well, don't worry, Mr. Elliott. If your loss is verified, and apparently a reputable auditing firm has already done that, I can assure you that the insurance company will reimburse that loss in the time it takes to get a check made out and in the mail. Oh, good. I'll be forever grateful. Well, while you're in this mood, would you mind me having a little closer rundown on what happened? Well, the auditors simply uncovered a shortage, that's all. I know that much, Mr. Elliott. May I see their report? Yes, of course. There. Isn't that binder an atrocious green? <laughs> well, if you say so. I'd like to keep this, Mr. Elliott, to verify my report. Of course, Mr. Dollar, anything, anything at all. Just save me. I left Mr. Elliott in a fainting condition, went back to my hotel and studied the auditor's report. The obvious conclusion after an hour's reading was that the funds had been embezzled by someone in the bookkeeping department. A series of crude erasures and bad fumblings indicated that whoever had done it had been something less than expert. In fact, he or she had been almost idiotic. The next morning, I confirmed my own findings with Mr. Brett at the auditor's office. We uncovered the loss two days ago and advised Mr. Elliott to contact his insurance company first. Sure. Dollar, any reservations on your part? No. No, Elliott's got a legitimate loss here. I'm sending in my report today. He should be compensated in another two days. And he'll be relieved to know about that. <laughs> I know. I met him. Well, what's your next step? Well, we'll pay off Elliott so he won't have heart failure. But, of course, we'll try to make recovery. I noticed the losses were in book series F6 through G10. Yes. Did you talk to personnel over there at his place? Mm-hmm. A fellow by the name of Forbes handled that series for them. Uh -huh. And the accounting office, of course. Oh, yes. Yeah. Been with Sensory Styles for five years. Where is he now? Well, he's still there. Huh? Mm-hmm. I thought it was kind of funny, too. A fellow pulling a crude job like this and not trying to run out. No, he's still working for them. Oh. Well, maybe he isn't the one at that. Forbes was in charge of those books. I don't see how it could possibly be anyone else. No, neither do I, Mr. Brett. May I use your phone? Oh, sure. Help yourself. I noticed all the money was stolen in the last four weeks. Yes. You'd think he'd at least have strung it out. Greedy, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Hello. District Attorney's office, please. My name's Dollar. I want to talk to someone about a warrant. Embezzling funds, grand theft. Oh, hold it, please. Forbes. What's his full name? Uh, Sheldon Thomas Forbes. Thanks. Sheldon Thomas Forbes, bookkeeper at Century Styles Incorporated. Hmm? Good. I'm on my way. 
expense account item four. Three dollars. Cab fare to the offices of John L. Gregory, deputy district attorney. I explained the situation to Mr. Gregory and furnished him with the auditor's report. An hour later, I was back at Century Styles with our friend, Mr. Elliott. Well, if it has to be, it has to be. There he is. Forbes? Hmm. Third desk. Sheldon Thomas Forbes was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular, not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected would swipe $5,000. Oh, Mr. Forbes? Yes? This gentleman would like to see you. Oh, I feel like Brutus. Oh, why don't you run along, Mr. Elliot? I'll handle it from here. Oh, thank you. Hello? Sheldon Forbes? Yes. My name's Dollar, Continental Adjustment Bureau. We represent Delaware Mutual Liability. They cover this firm for losses by theft and fire. Uh Uh-huh. Two days ago, the auditing firm of Brad and Iron Beach located a loss of almost $5,000 here. Naturally, the matter came to our attention. I'd like to talk to you about it. Why me? There's every indication that the loss has occurred in the particular accounts you've been handling. Uh Uh-huh. You do handle books F6 through G10? Yes. Will you step over here a minute, please? Sure. Would you look at this, please? Your figures? Yes. Your handwriting? Uh Uh-huh. Your entries and your initials? Yes. Well, what do you have to say? Nothing. Look, you know why I'm talking to you, why I came to you first. Yes. Still nothing to say? Nothing. Well, aren't you being a little silly? Why? I stole the money. You've proved it. What am I supposed to say? You admit it. How can I deny it? Okay, we've got that much covered. Well, look, my company's interested in recovery of $4,285. Do you understand? I think so. Oh, now, Forbes, come to your senses. What do you want to do? Go to jail or do you want to give the money back? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Oh, no, I don't think it's funny. I doubt if you will. I've got 16 cents in my pocket. Will that help? Where's the money? I haven't got it, Mr. Dollar. You'll have to take me to jail. Shall we go? Okay. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Forbes Matter tomorrow. What makes a man steal? Everybody's tried to answer that question at one time or another. Tomorrow I'll take a crack at it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Rob Elliott here, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Century style? I know, Mr. Elliott. How are you today? Terrible, Mr. Dollar. I feel terrible. I'm calling from the district attorney's office. You there about Sheldon Forbes? Yes. I had no idea I'd have to act. 
They want me to sign a complaint. Well, that's pretty usual, Mr. Elliott. Forbes admitted taking the money from your firm. He's guilty as charged. You're the injured party. They want to get on with the prosecution. Oh, dear. So you do whatever they say, Mr. Elliott. Well, will it affect my payment at all? A payment of the claim? No, not a bit. Your check's on the way to you right now. Oh, that's a relief. Now, how about you? Are you going back to Hartford? Uh, Should I thank you now? You can thank me, but I'm not going back. What? My job's just beginning. I have to recover the money for the insurance company. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter theft of nearly $5,000. Expenses continued. Item four, I think it is. $10 deposited on a rented car. First stop, Central Division Headquarters, where I was informed that Sheldon Thomas Forbes had been formally arraigned and was being held in the city jail. Second stop, an address on 56th Street. Second floor next to a dental laboratory. And on the door it said, Edward Gumby, attorney at law. And below it said, walk in. So I did. Uh, Hello out there. Mr. Gumby? Yes, sir. Come on in. It's warmer in here. Edward Gumby was standing in front of a gas heater in the inner office, which consisted of nothing more than a telephone, a desk, and a dozen law books. He was a medium-sized man, about 40 or so. A little tired, a little seedy. But he had a nice grin. Dollar? Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Gumby. You don't owe me. I'm with Continental Adjustment Bureau, representing Delaware Eastern Liability in this Forbes matter. Oh, yes, 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 of course. I understand you're representing Sheldon Forbes, is that right? Well, I don't know whether it is or not, Mr. Dollar. I happened to be in magistrate's court this morning when Forbes was arraigned. I took him on because he didn't have counsel and the court appointed me. I don't know whether he took me on or not. Uh, sit down, sit down. Oh, thanks. <sighs> New York is the coldest city in the world. Absolutely the coldest when it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Look, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, Mr. Gumby. Time? <laughs> I've got time, boy. That's all I've got. What's on your mind? Your client, mostly. He's admitted guilt. But, of course, we're interested in recovering the money he stole. $4,285. Yeah. Well, I can't blame your company for that. Well, prosecution could probably be stopped if we made recovery. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. I thought I'd tell you this um, in case you had any influence on Forbes. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Dollar. It's very understandable. But as I say, I was court appointed. I really haven't talked to him yet. So I'll have to confess I don't have any influence with him at all yet. Struck me as a nice sort of chap. Mm-hmm. Don't quite get it myself. Probably an explanation for it. Married once, I understand, and widowed right after the war. He worked for Century Styles about five years. Have you talked to the police yet? No. I understand they're going to work on it today. Maybe they'll have a little more information for you about the recovery. (laughs) Probably find the money in an old sock or something like that. That's the way these things generally run, you know. I agreed with Mr. Gumby. That was truly the way these kind of cases usually ran. And I was a little surprised that afternoon when I spoke to the officers at the city jail. They reported that a complete search of Forbes' apartment and automobile unearthed nothing like the missing money. They further reported that they had found no reliable evidence of any material possessions that the money could have been spent for. My next stop, city jail. He won't tell you anything. Hmm? Kept his trap shut all the time he's been in here. As far as we've been able to find out, no previous record, no background. We're checking his prints with Washington. I don't know about this one. You know, the ex-cop-wise. Know what I mean? Won't give a police officer the time of day. That means he could have been in before. On the other hand, it could mean he's just scared. That too. Well... Well, now what? Take it easy, Forbes. This is Mr. Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, Forbes. Hi. See you later, Dollar. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. Just give a yell when you're finished. Right. 
Hey, treating you okay? Swell. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody. That's all. You now you're acting like a baby, Forbes. You'll have to talk to somebody. Don't lecture me, Mr. Insurance Investigator. I've had all the lectures I want from myself. I don't know why you're here. I, I thought we settled our business yesterday. The whole thing's just a technicality. I've been arraigned, they've got my confession, I'll go into court, and they'll give me the business. Well, what are you doing in here, anyway? It's a swell day to be outside. Yeah, it is. Want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Well, why are you here? To help you out of this mess, if you'll let me. It's <laughs> funny. Not a bit. Why should you want to help me? Well, it's not because I have any use for you, mister. You're nothing to me but a guy who stole a pile of money. My job is to get it back. $4,285. Oh, that's... Yes, that. Now, how about it, Forbes? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? That, that I'll go to prison? That's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. Oh, it's too bad about your insurance company. No, it's too bad about you. You're being foolish. A hold or partial recovery can have a great deal to do with what happens to you from now on. Three years is the minimum sentence, you know. Twelve years maximum. Now, is it worth it? Sure. Sure, it's worth it. And I don't want to be foolish anymore. But I have been foolish. I took it and I spent it. Every dime of it. There's no way to pay it back. What did you spend it on? It uh, doesn't make any difference. It may make a lot of difference. You can redeem it, turn it back. Oh, no, I can't. Why did you take the money? All right, look, your salary's close to a hundred a week. You're single. Wasn't that enough to live on? Why don't you get out of here? I don't have anything to tell you. Ever been in trouble before? Huh? Under another name in another state? No, They no. consider backgrounds like that when a man comes up to be sentenced. Forbes, this is your first offense. I know, I know. Are you trying to shield someone? Why don't you go away? Have you been trying the market? Did you gamble it? No, no. Get... Just leave me alone. I won't tell you a thing, If you bought something with it or gave it to someone, if it can be recovered in some part... No, no, I tell you. Just go away and leave me alone. I'd like to. Believe me, I would. You're a thief, Forbes, and you're going to get what's coming to you, but I can't leave you alone. Listen. No, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be very honest with you. Eastern Delaware wrote a comprehensive policy on century styles promising to indemnify them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. In case you didn't know, Forbes, an insurance company won't take the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell. Sitting in a jail cell feeling sorry for himself where there's cash to be recovered. Now, you swiped it within the last month. You have something to show for it somewhere, somehow. Whatever you spend it on or whoever you spend it on, remember that that money is the same as stolen property. A car, a diamond ring, or something. Now, if you give it to someone or spend it, when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable, and we mean to redeem it. All right, now, what do you have to say? This won't do you any good. Don't, don't try to bulldoze me. I'm no punk caught crawling into a drugstore window late at night. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk to you about this. You or anybody else. I can't make it any clearer than that, do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the lousy money, I've admitted that. I did a bad job of it. You caught me. I confessed. And you've got me. Now, what more is there? That's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Forbes. Go away. Just go away. On my way out, I saw his attorney, Edward Gumby, on his way in to see Forbes. I waited around the sergeant's desk. Accidentally on purpose, I glanced at the admitted visitor's register. Only two people had contacted Forbes since his arrest, Gumby and myself. That struck me as odd. I glanced at his folder named No Close Relatives, named no one, in fact. I was thinking about that when Gumby came out from his visit. Gumby looked worn out. Uh, hiya. Hi. How'd you do? Not so good. Hey, tell me something. He asked you to contact a girl or anyone? Nope. 
I don't think he has a girl. I don't think he has anybody. You want some coffee? Yeah, good idea. We slushed across the street and found a diner. Expense account item five forty-two cents. Coffee and sinkers for Ed Gumby and myself. I think you're going to strike out, dog. I already have. And I think I have too. Huh? You know what I've been talking to him about in there all this time? The same thing as you, restitution. But he won't open his mouth about it. He did say one thing, though. He wants me to waive a jury trial and go up for sentencing. What? Yeah. Plead guilty and take it. He's sure to get at least three years. What can I do? Yeah. Got any ideas? Oh, I've got a lot of ideas, Dollar, and all of them make me sick inside. That boy's not a criminal. He took that money because he was desperate about something. You know that from the awkward way he took it. He spent it on something and he won't talk about it. But now he's about to ruin his whole life, in spite of what you or I or anybody else tries to do for him. All he has to do is give back the money or promise restitution or call up a friend and borrow it. With his clean background, the court had listened to a mercy plea. You told him all this? I told him. I told him and you told him. And what does he do? He waves his right. I tell you, I'm going to hate to file this waiver, but I've got to do it. Yeah, and how you feel? More coffee? No. No, thanks. Dollar, you know what Forbes is? What? He's something I call a... A calendar job. A calendar job? Yeah. 33 years old. Now, now think about that. Born with one war just ended. Raised in a depression and then bangled. Another war. You might say the first 25 years of his life, nothing but war and depression. Or the effects thereof. A calendar job. And apparently it's what he wants. But, Mr. Dollar, I'm going to hate to see him go to prison. You know something, Mr. Gumby? So am I. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? A sudden twist in the case that throws all the usual theories right out the window. The unexpected. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ed Gumby, Mr. Dollar. Attorney for Sheldon Forbes. Oh, hello, Mr. Gumby. How are you? Oh, I don't know. The hearing's been set for 2.30 this afternoon. Okay, I'll be there. No need to, particularly. As I told you yesterday, he requested me to waive trial and plead guilty. Well, won't he be sentenced today? No, this is just a preliminary hearing. He'll probably be sentenced before the week's out, though. The court will simply consider the waiver and inform him of his rights today. Oh. Anything I can do? No, I don't think so. I'm going to try to talk to him again and get him to reconsider the waiver. I doubt if I'll have much luck, but I'll try. All he has to do is return the money he stole. 
Well, buck up, Mr. Gumby. If he won't return it, maybe someone else will. Hmm? What do you mean? I'm going to try and find out what he did with it. My company wants it back, sure. But we also want Forbes to have a fair chance. You're pretty decent, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. Embezzlement and a very frustrating case. Expense account continued. Item six, $3.50, lunch. For myself and a Mr. Arnold Haven, head of the accounting department for Century Styles Incorporated. Mr. Haven, a tall, balding man in a dark suit, had ulcers. His poached egg and dry toast didn't interest him too much. Uh, and what's going to happen to Forbes? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Haven. That depends on several things. Right now, I have to tell you that it looks like he'll go to prison. Worse than that, it looks like he wants to go to prison. He's waived trial. Prison. That's too bad. Too bad. I always liked Sheldon Forbes. You, uh, you hired him, did you, Mr. Haven? Yes, I hired him. He was a good man right from the start. He did his job, and he did it well. I never had a complaint against Forbes. Why do you suppose he stole the money? You've got me, Mr. Dollar. We paid him the going rate. That's a good salary for accountants. He seemed happy enough with it. Whether he knew he was in line for substantial raises. Uh Uh-huh. I could understand it in a way if he had a family and heavy responsibility. Or if he played the market. Or if he gambled. But Forbes, he just baffles me. Yeah, baffles me too. Huh? Oh, yes, of course. Well, the people around the office, they're they're pretty upset about this. Any particular people, Mr. Haven? Everybody. But anyone in particular? A girl, for instance. Oh, oh, a girl, yes, I see. No. Did he go out with any girl in your office? No, no, most of them are married. No, at least as far as I know, Forbes didn't go with any of the girls there. He kept to himself. Oh, he might have lunched with one or the other now and then, but... No, no, he more or less kept to himself. Uh Uh-huh. Well, the reason I asked you, Mr. Haven, is that what little I've been able to find out about his personal life isn't very helpful. My company wants the money back. We're willing to give him a fair break if we can get it back. He's pretty stubborn about cooperating. Yes, we know about that, Mr. Dollar. But how can we give him a break if he doesn't want us to? And we can't find out anything about him. Look, if there's anything you can think of, any any reason he might have had for taking the money... And I've racked my brain. I can't think of any reason. I... Oh. Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. I did notice a change coming, Forbes. It was about a month or six weeks ago. Oh, it was nothing, really. It was just, a, I guess, an anxiety about him. Well, he took all the money within the last four weeks. Would that correspond? Roughly, Yes. Well, that's a start. I hope. I returned to the accounting offices of Century Styles with Mr. Haven and spent two hours questioning different members of his staff regarding Sheldon Forbes. His habits and his personality were pretty much the same as Haven himself had described them. Expense account item seven, four dollars, gasoline. I put a tank full of gas in my rented car and went over to an apartment on 59th Street where Sheldon Forbes had lived. According to the penciled note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Kanopka was the manager. Yes, what is, please? You're Mrs. Kanopka? Yes. What do you want, mister? I understand Mr. Sheldon Forbes lives here, is that right? Oh, yes. Bad. Bad. I hear he still monies. Bad. He, he not in, uh, in uh, jail, I think. Yes, I know about that, Mrs. Kanopka. I'm from the insurance company, and we're involved in this case. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. I wonder if you'd help me. I fix dinner for my husband. He's come home from work. It so... won't take long. Uh, what I do? Well, I, I want to know about Sheldon Forbes. What? The works, Mrs. Kanopka. Did he drink, gamble, 
Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? He always pay his rent. You are policeman? An insurance investigator. Uh, please, uh, sometime else. Maybe you speak to my husband. He speak much better than me. But it's important now. I talked to Mr. Forbes on telephone. He called me from jail. He said, I no have to answer any questions. No, no, you don't have to answer any questions, Mrs. Kanapka. But I'd sure appreciate it if you would. My husband home pretty soon. You ask him. You can help him, possibly. Now, would you like to help him in this trouble? All right, mister. But how I know these things you ask about uh, men who live here? Well, well, look, how about his friends? Who visited him? I, I cannot say. No visitor. Was he a good tenant? No trouble. Like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor. Mr. O'Sullivan always drunk. Called police twice. Mr. Forbes, no drink whiskey. Uh huh. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Sure. He had a girlfriend, didn't he? Oh, I think you mistake. I know I ever see girlfriend here. All right. How long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe. Ever since he moved in here to this place. But no girl? No. Well, how'd he spend his time? Work. He worked very hard. No, I mean, besides working at the office, how else did Forbes spend his time? I... Been... Oh, he poor feller, that one. Huh? Sure, he steals money, but he poor feller just the same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Mr. Forbes, he quiet and, and he think. I know he live up in that little room quiet and think. He does all time think. No whiskey, no girls. Oh, he paints sometime, listen to music, think. Oh, my husband didn't burn. Please, you go. Well, uh, just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment if I can. No, no matter. Here. You bring back key, please. Sure. Thank you, Mrs. Kanopka. The apartment Sheldon Forbes called home was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court onto another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was threadbare and dusty. A small ironing board and iron attested to the fact that Sheldon Forbes laundered his own shirts. Other small evidences of frugality were about the premises. A hot plate and a can of souring cream. Two suits of clothes, neatly brushed and pressed, but inexpensive. The record player and a collection of a half a dozen good albums were the only sign of material accomplishment. The painting materials, easel, canvas, and oils were also inexpensive. No liquor, no jewelry, no expensive clothes. Nothing that cost $4,285 or anything like it. Oh. Here's your key, Mrs. Kanopka. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I thank you. Well... What you think? I think he's had a very lonely life here. Oh, Doc. Yes. Lonely is the word. Lonely. Um, oh, wait. Has he got a car? In back through alley. Thanks. It was a Ford. Vintage of 1946. Tightly locked up. The paint was scaling away, the tires worn down, the mileage 77,000 miles. He certainly hadn't blown the money on a fancy car. Now I felt completely frustrated. Expense account item 8, 79 cents, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 79er, a place I learned where Sheldon Forbes frequently took his evening meal. The restaurant manager, a man named Alexander Dupolis, Remembered Forbes and he liked him. A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street also remembered him as the young man who bought a roll there every night. Probably the roll to go with a lonely cup of coffee in his room the next morning. She liked him, too. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Sheldon Forbes that didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, he wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. I dropped in at the city jail about 7.30, and I was surprised to find lawyer Edward Gumby sitting on a bench, briefcase in hand. Dollar? Hello, Mr. Gumby. Nothing new, huh? Well, that's the way it goes, I guess. We had some action today. Oh? Yeah. The hearing was this afternoon. Man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against Forbes and make the charges. Uh Uh-huh. 
I spent the whole time pleading with Forbes not to go ahead with the waiver. Did I miss anything? No, he wouldn't open up at all. Just said he'd spent the money. I couldn't talk him out of the waiver, so it went through. When will he be sentenced? They set the date for Friday. I don't know whether they'll get around to it or not. I'd like to talk to him again. Has he been moved yet? No. I thought he'd be transferred to the sheriff's office. Well, ordinarily he would, but since he waived trial, they announced bail. It's proper procedure in cases like this. Gives him a couple of days to straighten out his affairs. What? Somebody bailed him out? I did. Oh. Has he left yet? Uh Uh-uh. Won't get out till eight. That's when the shift changes. Think it's worth trying to see him? Yeah. I think I'll stick around, Mr. Gumby. I gotta find out something about this case. An hour later, when Sheldon Forbes emerged from the doorway and turned right, I was following him. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one and stayed right with him. When he got out at the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door, I was standing by the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came back out, hailed a cab, once more I followed. This time, I followed him to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. Forbes? Forbes? Hey, Forbes, it's me, Johnny Dollar. I want to talk to you. It took me a few seconds to understand what it was. I got a couple of whiffs of it coming from under his door. Forbes! The room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes, and Sheldon Forbes was stretched down on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. (laughs) When I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a switch in the case that starts a real chase and a race against time. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the police operator. Are you the party who called for an ambulance? Yes, didn't you get it? It's on the way, sir. I'm calling to verify the circumstances. Attempted suicide by gas. Yes, sir, we have that. The victim's name... Sheldon Forbes, F-O-R-B-E-S. Forbes? And your connection, sir? Relative, perhaps? No, no relation. Insurance investigator, I just found him. Will you please remain there until the officers arrive? Are you kidding? I asked you, but... Oh. Oh, well, thank you very much. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. Sheldon Forbes pleaded guilty to a $4,285 embezzling charge. He waived jury trial and was awaiting sentence when he was bailed out of jail, went home, and turned on the gas. Thirty seconds after I dragged him from the apartment, I called the police emergency squad. In a matter of minutes, they arrived, and a couple of interns were working on Forbes with a pull motor in that dingy, dirty, badly lighted hallway. There was no telling how much gas Forbes had breathed in, or for how long a period after he went into his apartment the gas jet had been open. Hand me that hypo, Al. Thanks. Swab. Okay. He, uh... He alive? Barely. You the fellow who found him, mister? Yeah. Hard to say what can happen on these kind. That shot I just gave him should produce some reaction. Hmm? This your place? His. You know who he is? His name's Sheldon Forbes. Nice looking guy. Well, I'll need that. Yeah, thanks. I think we're getting somewhere now. Hey, look, can I help? No. Well, you better hand me one of those, too. I'm going to be pretty sick if... Oh, hey, good. He's, he's catching on. Yeah. Let's have a little increase, Al. Up it just a little. Okay. Hold it there. The intern and his assistant worked quietly and methodically. There was nothing I could do but stand and watch. After about a half an hour, the color of Forbes' skin seemed to me a little more close to normal. His eyes were still closed, though, and he showed no signs of movement. I waited. Okay, Al. You can kill the pull motor. Uh, getting some pulse now. Respiration, too. Will he make it? Uh, it depends, mister. If he has any kind of heart condition, it'll be tough. We can tell more when we get him into a hospital. Nothing more we can do for him here. Okay, Al. Have the boys load him up. Let's get out of here. <coughs> Uh, now, mister, uh, you say he's a friend of yours? Just someone I knew. He's got you to thank, in case he makes it. Where'll he be? We'll take him over to Bellevue. All attempted suicides get over there. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Any idea when that'll be? No telling. Better phone in first. Police will want to talk to you. You give identification to headquarters when you're called in? Yeah. Yeah, that's the third one tonight. What is it, the weather? Not for him. My job is to handle them, but I wonder why they do it. Oh, well, this guy's got a problem. He's out on bail, goes into court Friday to be sentenced. Embezzling charge. Oh. Seemed like a nice guy. Good look at. I think he probably is a nice guy. Well, I thought you said he was an embezzler. I did. Well. Be sure and call in. Yeah, sure, doctor. Thanks. Good night. The uniformed officers outside the apartment house questioned me thoroughly regarding the circumstances of the attempted suicide. I told them what had occurred and gave them my business address for reference. They asked me to ride over to the station with them and verify the facts. I did. All of that took about two hours. When I was finished, I put in a call to Bellevue. No change in Sheldon Forbes' condition. Expense account item 9, 280, one theater ticket. That's what it cost me to see the last 15 minutes of a fairly bad musical play at the Empress Theater. When it was over, I walked around to the stage entrance. Hey, didn't quite get that, mister. Dollar. Dollar? Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Uh-huh. Well, uh, what can I do for you? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight, a man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. A lot of people talk to me here. That's my job, talking to them. One man in particular. His name is Sheldon Forbes. I uh, don't remember nobody named Forbes. Well, maybe he didn't give his name. He was a tall man, about my size, 30 or so, dark hair, clean cut. Wore a tweed suit. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Beats me. 
Did he come here to see somebody in the show? Is that it? He might have. I don't know. Well, how do you know he came here? I followed him. I saw him. Huh? It's a business. My business. I'm an investigator. Oh. oh. Wait now. Did he have a hat on tonight? No, no, he didn't. A uh, short haircut? Yeah, do you remember? Sure, sure. What's he done? Struck me as a nice young fella. He's been around here a lot of times. Sheldon Forbes, yeah, yeah. I didn't recognize the name at first. Would you mind telling me why he comes around here? Comes here to see Betsy Walker. One of the girls in the show. Betsy Walker, is she his girlfriend? No, don't think so. Uh, it's like this. He comes here asking to see her, and she never sees him. You get it? Yeah, I suppose so. Well, who is she? Oh, she sings here. Dances a little. Pretty girl. Have you ever seen her with Forbes? Well, I I can't say. I guess not. Is she still here? Huh? Betsy Walker, is she still here? I'd like to talk to her. Well, she wouldn't be here this late. She finishes her bit in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? No. Oh, oh, no. No, no. I'm sorry, boy. I can't tell you that. All right. Well, where can I phone her? Can't tell you that either. Uh, now, uh... Why don't you drop around tomorrow? It's important tonight. Hey, look, would you do me a favor? Depends. What is it? Would you telephone Betsy Walker? Tell her my business and ask her if she'll see me. Well, suppose I can do that all right, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Take a chair there. I'll see what I can do for you. The doorman did all right. Expense account, item 10, $2.65, cab fare. I gave up my rented car and had the cab driver find the address Betty Walker had given. It was a rather nice apartment in a rather nice part of town. It was almost one in the morning when I got there. She met me at the door, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown with coal cream on her face. Miss Walker? Uh, you must be Mr. Darling. Yes. Uh, now, just wait a minute. Do you mind if I see some kind of identification or something like that? Oh, no, no. They are... Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, <laughs> you'd be surprised at some of the things some men will try. Come in, please. Thank you. I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the doorman at the theater. Yes. I didn't know quite what to make of it. Goodness, are you really an insurance detective? Uh, yes, and I'd appreciate you letting me see you tonight, Miss Walker. Sit down. Can I fix you a drink? No, no, thanks. Uh, Frank mentioned something about Forbes. You're here because of him? Yes, Miss Walker. I understand that you know Forbes. No, uh, not exactly, that is. Uh, there's some reservation in the way you say that, Miss Walker. You know his name. Yes, I, I know the name. Uh, can I ask you what this is all about? Routine investigation. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Sheldon Forbes? That's what I'd like you to tell me. Well, first about my name. Forbes was at the theater earlier tonight asking for you. I understand he's been around there quite a bit. Yes. I really don't know how to tell you this, Mr. Dollar. I've only seen that man once in my life, honestly. He's... Oh, he's really quite impossible. I just... Oh, dear, this is so embarrassing to try to explain this. Maybe I can save you some embarrassment, then, if you'll answer one question. Sure, why not? Did Sheldon Forbes ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, uh, that cigarette box on the table there. And the lighter to go with it. Hmm. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? Yeah, very. Also expensive. What else? Well, um, let me think. Um, oh, no, no, that wasn't from him. Oh, uh, that was the lamp over there. Mm Mm-hmm. And a first stole. May I see it? I'm afraid I gave that away. You did? I gave it to my kid sister who was visiting me last week. I already had one. Oh, I see. What else did he give you? I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night for the last month. You only saw him once and he gave you all these gifts? Dear, I I know how that must sound. I just... Look, it started a month or so, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Sheldon Forbes. So? 
Well, I'd never heard of anybody named Sheldon Forbes, and I just tore the card up. But every night after that, I kept getting orchids and the card. And then the gifts started to come. The cigarette box first. That's when I saw him. Uh-huh. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. But the gifts still kept coming. Flowers, invitations. I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, and I didn't know where to send them. Some I gave away, and some I've kept. I didn't want his gifts. He was nice, but I... Well, I just didn't want anything to do with him. When I did meet him, he was so different than what I had imagined. I mean, well... Gee, I've had my share of stage door Johnny's, but this man was... Well, he just couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. He told you that? He didn't have to. Those gifts... Well, he didn't have money, Miss Walker. He worked for $82 a week as a bookkeeper. You must be mistaken. I'm afraid not. He stole the money to buy you all these things. Well, for heaven's sake. For heaven's sakes, and you caught him? Yeah. Forbes tried to commit suicide earlier this evening. Suicide? Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He's refused all along to tell anybody what he did with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. Oh, but it's crazy. We had nothing. He's just a name to me. He means nothing to me. Yeah. But apparently you mean something to him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, proof that $4,285 worth of unrequited love can spell three years of prison. But sometimes there's an angle. In this case, a rather startling one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Betsy Walker, Mr. Dollar. I'm up and around. Yes, thanks for calling. Have any time this morning? I think so. If possible, I'd like to come over to your apartment again and take an inventory of the gifts that Sheldon Forbes sent you. That'll be all right, sure. About an hour? Sure. Um, I couldn't sleep much last night thinking about all this. I mean... He stole that money because of me. You mustn't feel that way, Miss Walker. He knew what he was doing. You had no part in the theft. I have the gifts. Well, we may have to take those away from you. I don't mind that. I... You said he tried suicide. How is he this morning? I just talked to the hospital. He's going to be all right. But he has to go to prison? Yes. (sighs) Funny world, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. 
More expenses. Items 11 to 16. $78.40. Cab fares, meals, accounting services, legal services, cab fares, and more cab fares. I made a comprehensive inventory at Betsy Walker's apartment and spent the rest of the day tracking down the places where the items had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Total, $2,780 worth of gifts. Bought with stolen money. Betsy Walker also told me that Sheldon Forbes had made appointments to meet her at various times at very expensive restaurants in New York. She had never once kept any of these appointments, but a check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that Forbes had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. His restaurant bills came to $835. The florist bill, $670. Total amount spent, $4,285. Total amount stolen, $4,285. Century Styles Incorporated footed the bill in his unsuccessful courtship of Betsy Walker. Hello. Hi. Remember me, Forbes? Sure, insurance man. Well, what now? How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Same reason you'd save a man who was dying. Huh. You know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions you wouldn't answer. I met Betsy Walker. What? My job, Forbes. I had to. How did you know about her? I followed you night before last. When you got out on bail, I saw you go to the theater. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You have no right to involve her in any of this. Why didn't you think of that a month or so ago? It's the company's money you've been spending on her. I had every right, as unpleasant as it is. I suppose she knows all about me now. Huh? That's right, all. Boy, I sure must look like the prize sucker of all time. <laughs> Stand handed her a laugh. She didn't think it was one bit funny. And Forbes, I don't think it's funny either. Then what are you standing here for, lording it over me? I'm not doing that at all. I'm just here to let you know how things are at the moment. All right. How are things? Well, first off, we took back all the gifts you gave her. Dirty scum. Don't get mad at me, Forbes. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money and try to impress her. You did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me, but it means something to my insurance company. They still want it back. And they'll get as much back as they can. Well, swell. Good for that. What do you want now? Your signature. Hmm? I think I trace most of it down. You want to look this over? Go ahead. Uh, those figures about right? I suppose so. I didn't keep track. Approximately? I suppose so. You're pretty thorough, aren't you? We have to be. Will you sign this? No. It'll help to clear up our book work a little. What difference does it make now? We've got you cold. Okay. What difference does it make? Give me. Okay, thanks. That's all it means to you, isn't it? Hmm? Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents that were stolen, Forbes. Remember that. You wouldn't let me forget it. No, I wouldn't. You did the dumbest thing in the world. You stole nearly $5,000 trying to make an impression on a girl who didn't want to have a thing to do with you. You went about it wrong from top to bottom. You've acted like the great stone face ever since you've been found out. You wouldn't bother telling me about it. I had to go out and find out myself. Off the record, Forbes, what'd you do? See her on the stage one night? No, at the office. Office? Your office? No, not exactly. Ellie was having a showing for some buyers from the West Coast one day a few weeks ago. For those kind of showings, he hires models from the agency. Betsy's listed with one of the agencies. You know, she acts and sings and models. Oh, sure. Well, I happened to be upstairs when the showing was going on. A lot of publicity people there taking pictures and so on. And I saw her. She was wearing a black... A black dress and her... Her hair was soft. She's got a smile like all the sun risings. I... Sound silly? Not at all. It's just that I never in all my life saw anyone like it before. Yeah. I don't know how it is with other guys, but she was for me from then on. I, I couldn't get her out of my mind. I found out her name, and then I found out she worked in that show at the Empress Theater. Yeah. All I had was her name. I... I didn't know how to go about meeting her. I I just didn't know. You figured a little money might attract it to you. I've heard that's the best way to do it. That's one way. Not the best way, kid. Probably not. The best way I could think of. 
What did you think about taking the money? I thought I'd be able to stick it back. Well, I guess I really didn't think much beyond just meeting her. Having her look at me the way I... I wanted her to look at me. <laughs> what? It was the wrong way to go about it, sure. But then did you ever think of my alternative? Hmm? I thought of it. I pictured myself knocking on a door one night, and I could see her answering it. I'm Shelley Forbes, Betsy, I'd say. Clothes don't make them. And I'd say, while well, she sort of took in my tweed suit and the only coat I've got to my name. Listen, I'd say, I got an 8 by 10 apartment over on 59th Street. The halls always smell like cabbage, but I'm a heck of a fine guy. And I drive a 1946 Ford that misses a little, but it's good enough for us. And then I'd say, why don't you toss on your mink, and we'll go over to my dump, and we'll have a bottle of beer, and I'll tell you how much I love you. How about that? <laughs> Some alternative, huh? She makes more money in an hour than I make in a week. I couldn't even afford to keep her in cigarettes. <laughs> Lord, I... I wanted her like nothing in my whole life. She might have taken you up on it, Forbes, if you'd put it that way. Yeah? What makes you think so? She wasn't impressed by any money or any gifts. <laughs> More than that, I met her. She's a pretty nice girl. Yeah. Up until the time I talked with Sheldon Forbes in the hospital, I'd always had my doubts about love happening at first sight. After my talk with him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering... If I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Expense account item 17, $4.90. I sent a wire to my home office telling them that the recovery would be in the amount of something like $2,500, obtainable on the redeemable gift items recovered. After that, I went back to my hotel. I was surprised to find Betsy Walker waiting in the lobby. Dollar. Why, hello. I was afraid you might leave town. I wanted to talk to you. Sure, you just caught me. I was going upstairs and pack. What is it? Could we have a drink or something? Sure. Expense account item 18, two dollars, two drinks. For Betsy Walker and myself at the hotel bar. It was midday and there wasn't much action. She sat across from me, ordered an old-fashioned and asked for a cigarette. Sure. What'll happen to him? Forbes? Yes. Oh, he'll be sentenced Monday. They canceled the Friday scheduling because he was in the hospital. He'll go to prison? Yes. Have you seen him since he tried to kill himself? Just left him. I guess he feels awful. Yeah. I told you I haven't been able to sleep thinking about all this. Well, about him, I guess. Mm hmm Would he have to go to prison even if all the money was returned? Only half of it's redeemable, and the rest, florist bills, restaurants, and so on, just gone. How much does it come to, Mr. Dollar? Uh, short about 2000 roughly. If, well, if you had that money, what would happen to him? Oh, it'd be up to the court. I, I'd say he'd have a good chance of getting off if he changed his plea. Could I get him to change his plea? <laughs> I think you could get him to do anything. I want to pay it. You what? I want to pay that other 2000 for him and get him to change his plea. I'll make up the whole thing. Hey, now, look, Miss Walker, I, I know your motives might be the best, but you aren't responsible in any way for this man's actions. He stole money because of me. He tried suicide because of me. And now he's going to prison because of me. But you had nothing to do with it, no part of it. You may think I'm 22 years old. I'll be 29 next month. I'm not much of an actress or a singer or anything else. But I've been around this town and I know my way around. And I met all kinds. Whoever he is, whatever he's done, he's the first man I've ever known who actually went out on a limb for a girl he loved. I'm the girl and he's the man. You're serious. I probably won't remember his name a year from now. But that poor, stupid, wonderful dumbbell. He doesn't belong in any prison. He ought to get married to some nice 
girl somewhere. I want to help him get out of this trouble. Can I? That's it. After all, he's given me something. Call it faith in mankind again if you like. What's the kiss for? What you just gave me, Betsy. Faith. Expense account item 19, $48, hotel. Item 20, $37, meals. 21, $15, miscellaneous. 22, same as item 1, $28.63, fare back to Hartford. Total cost of investigation, $363.51. Remarks? She got Forbes to change his plea. She paid back the additional money. He comes to trial next week. He might get a suspended sentence. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a trip south of the border where the flashing eyes of a dark-haired senorita spells plenty of, well, believe me, romance and trouble can go hand in hand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Sandra Gould, Jack Edwards, Herb Ellis, James McCallion, Parley Bear, John Stevenson, Howard McNair, Bob Bruce, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Walt Albright, Johnny. Trinity Mutual Limited. Oh, hiya, Walt. How's your health? Terrible, since you ask. I got asthma, Johnny. Again? I thought we agreed that... Yeah, I know. I get suspicious. I get asthma. Happens every time. Cure me, will you? What's the case, Walt? Man named Eddie Kalin, C-A-Y-L-I-N, out in Los Angeles, died yesterday. $5,000 policy, double indemnity. What did he die of? Mysterious circumstances. Well, that's usually a fatal disease, all right, That's but... it, Johnny. That's all I know. Mysterious circumstances. The body was identified by the widow. I see. Our salesman out there can probably help you. He issued the policy only six weeks ago at the request of the widow. Uh-huh. Six weeks, one premium paid, check signed by the widow. Hey, tell me something. Would the beneficiary happen That's to be... That's right, the widow. Oh, this asthma's killing me, Johnny. You gotta do something about it. All right, Walt. Just call me doctor. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Kalen matter. Item one, $198.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford to Los Angeles. I had
hadn't arranged for anybody to meet me when I arrived at L.A., so I picked up my bags and headed for the taxi stand. Mr. Dollar, please, uh, wait a second. He was a small man, nervous and fluttery, with a shiny pink nose and a face like a little white rabbit. I was watching for you out on the ramp, but somehow you must have slipped by and... You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? Yes, I'm Johnny Dollar, but I don't think I... Uh... Uh, Welch, Presley Welch. I'm the... Oh, yes, you're the district salesman here for Trinity Mutual. That's right. Well, how are you, Mr. Welch? <laughs> well, I'm out of breath at the moment. <laughs> From running, you understand. You see, I'm troubled occasionally by asthma. You too. Oh, do you have asthma, Mr. Dollar? No, it's a friend of mine in Hartford. Oh, in Hartford? Oh, well, you don't say. Yes, in fact, I came out here just to cure it for him. Out here? Oh, this is the worst place you could have come? Oh, you see, the smog here is so... Ba- oh, no, oh, I do believe you're joshing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I am at that. Come on, let's add to my expense account with a cup of coffee. Oh, do you really think we should? Oh, why not? Let's be daring. All right, let's. I always say if the company can't afford it... Come on. If Presley Wells sold insurance the way he answered questions, it was amazing that he hadn't starved to death years ago. He skidded around the field, flip-flopped overhead, and buzzed the tower, all verbally, of course, and for 15 minutes he didn't touch a wheel to the ground. But when he did finally land, he came in with a swoop. I do hope you'll accept my apologies, Mr. Dollar, for causing all this trouble, because the whole thing is my fault, of course. I don't see how... Unless you murdered Eddie Kalin. I may... Oh, why, I, I scarcely knew him. <laughs> a perfect alibi. Oh, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. Oh, I'm just joshing. What I meant was, I wrote the policy. And I knew better right when I did it. Oh, uh-huh. what do you mean? Well, Mr. Kalin was quite facetious about the whole procedure. When I tried to point out the retirement security factors in our multiple endowment plan... He actually laughed. You don't say? Yes. He said all the security he'd ask for was... Two aces up and one for the kicker. <laughs> well, what about Mrs. Kalin? What was her attitude? Well, she was quite serious about it. Wasn't she the one who actually applied for the policy? Well, not technically. The beneficiary can't, you know. It's against the rules. Yeah, I know, but didn't well, she... Well, she was the one, yes, that called me and asked me to come out and talk to her husband. And he finally signed the application. But he seemed to regard it as a joke. He only did it as a favor to her. Uh, something of that sort. And now it's turned out to be a $10,000 favor. What kind of a woman is she, Mr. Welch? Well, she's quiet, well-mannered, quite charming, I thought. I, I must confess I felt a good deal of sympathy for her in view of her husband's incessant flippancies. A real happy fellow, huh? Oh, positively frivolous, Mr. Dollar. And I should have been warned by his attitude. You know, insurance is a serious business. Oh, sure. But Eddie Kalin didn't laugh himself to death. Oh, oh my. Oh, he died in the fire when his automobile company... <laughs> Oh, laugh. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Say, tell me, how well did you get to know the Kalins, Mr. Wells? Oh, hardly at all. I saw Mr. Kalin twice, once at his apartment the evening I sold him the policy, and, and then two weeks later at my office when he came in to sign the paper. And Mrs. Kalin? Only once, that evening at their apartment. She phoned me earlier in the week. And you haven't seen her since her husband's death, huh? No, no. I phoned to express my sympathy, but she wasn't available. She hasn't filed a claim yet. No, but I knew she would, so I took it on myself to notify Hartford. I I just can't help feeling guilty about this, you know. Yes, so you mentioned. Yeah, not that I really am, of course, but, uh, well, you understand. It's, uh... Oh, sure, I understand. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll keep in touch. Watch out for comedians, Mr. Wells. Watch out for who? Oh, oh, comedian, watch out. <laughs> Expense account item three, $6.35. Taxi fare to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel and a second taxi to the West Los Angeles Precinct Police Station. The case wasn't being handled by any of the usual departments, Bureau of Homicide, Missing Persons, and so on. The man in charge was Detective Sergeant Jose Reynosa, unattached, working out of the Central District on special assignment. Pull up a chair, Mr. Dollar. When I talked with him in his office, Reynosa told me the reason for it. Yeah, it's a funny deal, Mr. Dollar. The facts in the case could point a lot of different ways. But the way it stands right now, they just don't add up in any direction. At least not quite. Do you mind filling me in on some of those facts, Sergeant? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Last Thursday morning at 4.20 a.m., we got a call relayed through the fire department to investigate a burned automobile out on the Palos Verdes headland, uh-huh. up in the hills above the harbor. The car was lying in the bottom of a ravine below the road, and it was a total loss. Apparently, the gas tank had burst and flooded the whole interior. Oh, what do you mean, apparently? Well, the upholstery may have been deliberately soaked with gas. The arson squad isn't sure. I see. 
That's why this case doesn't quite fit in any niche, Mr. Dollar. Might be homicide, might be arson, missing person, or only an accident. We're not sure yet. Anyway, there was a body in the driver's seat, burned to a cinder. Unrecognizable. But we did recover a few personal effects. A signet ring, a keychain, wristwatch with a strap burned off, a wallet badly scorched. Mm-hmm. I noticed the keychain has a metal tag with the address stamped on it. Yeah, that and a part of the driver's license were the only leads. Eddie Kalen, Argus Terrace Apartments up on Sunnyway Drive above the strip. So we went up there and we ran into a second surprise. What do you mean? Nobody home. We attained access, found the place in a mess. There'd apparently been a fight, a chair and a couple of lamps were broken, and there were bloodstains in the living room. What about Mrs. Kalen? Located her the next afternoon. She'd been spending a few days at a friend's cabin up at Arrowhead. Does the friend confirm it? She was there alone. Had her own car. Mm. Yeah, she might have come back to town that night. But we got nothing to prove it. Or disprove it. Right. Just another one of those maybes. That's all this case is. A collection of maybes. Yeah, I see what you mean. Tell me, Sergeant. Just who was Eddie Kalen? Eddie Kalen, uh, male, Caucasian, height 5'11", weight 175, complexion olive, hair medium, brown eyes, gray, age 34, birthplace now, Chicago. What was he? What did he do? He called himself a promoter. Done a lot of things. Small-time agent for a while, handled a few singers and dancers, vaudeville and nightclubs. Been a bookie off and on, but mainly he was a gambler. Oh, and there's another maybe for you. Now, how's that? According to rumor, that he was in an all-day poker game. It broke up only a few hours before we found the car. The game was supposedly run by a big-time gambler named Topo Leanley. And the word has it that Eddie cleaned up something over $60,000. And there was no money found on the body? Nope. Have you talked to this, uh, Topo? Sternly. We had him in here for four hours this morning. He never heard of Eddie Kalen. Wouldn't know a poker deck if he saw one. Spends all his spare time raising petunias and driving his dear old mother to church. (laughs) Like that, huh? (laughs) Like that. So there's another one for you. Maybe Topo didn't like the idea of losing 60 grand, decided to get it back. Or maybe the widow wanted the insurance, or it could be that somebody else took a crack at him. And it's possible, of course, that Eddie mailed the 60,000 to a blonde in Milwaukee and just ran off the road by accident. Yeah, it's possible. But I don't think so. I don't think it was an accident. I'm always getting cases like this. It's the kind they always put me on. Officially, it's because I'm a college man and majored in criminology, but actually, it's because I'm a Latin, Mexican ancestry, and they know I get certain feelings about a case. Hunches. Uh Uh-huh. And how do you feel about this one? It's hokey. Real hokey. And it's murder, not an accident. But beyond that, Ken Savi. Why don't you poke into it a little, see what you can find. Then maybe we can talk it out some more over a bottle of Muscatel. Yeah, good idea. (laughs) Uh, where can I find Mrs. Kalen? Oh, the widow? Well, that's a good starting point. <laughs> She's out at their apartment. There's the address. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, just one other thing, Sergeant Reynosa. When you gained access to the apartment, I assume the door was locked. Uh, yeah, it took a little effort. Uh, what kind of a lock? Uh, automatic uh, night latch? A spring cylinder? No, it was an old-fashioned warden bolt. Had to be locked with a key. Mm-hmm. What are you getting at, Mr. Dollar? Or oh, hunch of my own, Sergeant. Uh, let's save it for the Muscatel. See you later. Expense account item four, two dollars. Taxi to the Kalen apartment in West Hollywood. It was shortly after dusk by now, and the lights were coming on all over the city. It was a cool, clear night. Los Angeles at its best. As we swung off the Sunset Strip and started climbing up into the hills, I looked back across the basin toward the dark mass of the Palos Verdes headland that bounded the far side of the great carpet of lights. Three nights ago, a man had died over there in the darkness. And in a few minutes now, I'd be talking to his widow. Or at least to the woman who claimed to be his widow. Keep the change. The Argus Terrace apartments, like most of them in that section, sprawled up the hillside above the street. Six or eight apartments on as many different levels, all opening onto a central patio filled with walks, steps, and banks of tropical plantings. The Kalen's apartment was at the top, and I was still 50 feet from it when the door opened and a man came out and hurried toward me. I stepped back against the shrubbery and waited for him. Good evening, Mr. Welch. Oh. Oh. My. Oh, it's you. Your second visit to Mrs. Kalen? Second? 
Oh, yes. Yes, it is. I, I imagine you've been notified, too. Notified? Well, yes. I got a wire from the home office in Hartford this evening. That's why I'm here. Well, Mrs. Kalin has filed under the double indemnity clause of the policy. A claim for $10,000. She has, huh? She, she hopes it can be paid immediately and without any trouble. Well, I don't like to dash a lady's hopes, Mr. Welch, but I've got news for the widow. News? The claim won't be paid immediately. And before this is over, there's going to be a lot of trouble. Oh? In fact, Mr. Welsh, if my hunch is right, this claim is not going to be paid at all. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lovely girl lies, cries, crosses her heart, and hopes to die. And a killer fires from the dark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Kalin. I think Mr. Welch told you I'd be around to see you. Oh, yes. You're the special investigator the insurance company sent out. That's right. Mind if I come in? All right, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. And through here. Your company didn't waste any time, did they? Sending you out here, I mean. No. No more than you did in filing your claim. I have a right to it. With Eddie gone now, I, I need the money. I see. Sit down. Thanks. How many keys are there to that door? Keys? What do you mean? Your front door. How many keys do you have? Just one. Of course, Eddie had one. Why? What difference does it make? Just about enough difference to hang somebody. Cigarette, Mrs. Kalen. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, to the home office, Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Kalen matter. Expense account continued. That's quite a dramatic statement, Mr. Dollar. Are you prepared to name that somebody who may get hanged? Not at the moment. Could it be that you don't have a name? Mm, That's possible, of course. That you're just fishing, so to speak? Bluffing? Now, why would I do that with you? I don't know, frankly, but you must have come here for some reason. Yes, I wanted to ask you a few questions. And you'd be smart to answer them under the circumstances. What circumstances? The only one I know anything about is the tragic one of losing my husband only three days ago. You have my sympathy, Mrs. Kalin. Sergeant Renosa questioned me for hours. There's nothing more to answer. Will you go now, please? All right, if you say so. Your unwillingness to cooperate will undoubtedly prejudice your claim for the insurance. That's all you care about, isn't it? 
Finding some excuse for not paying off the policy. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Kalen. I'm not crooked and neither is the company. If a claim is legitimate, they pay it, always. I'm sick of being under suspicion, of being accused. I'm not accusing you of anything. All I'm after is some information. And if you refuse to give it... Good night, Mrs. Kalen. No, wait. Wait, Mr. Dollar. Yes? Don't go. Come back, please. I'm sorry. I've been under such a strain on edge. Forgive me. That's all right. Forget it. I didn't mean what I said, but I've answered so many questions. And to go through all of it again, well, it seems so pointless. Yes, I understand. But I've found that people say things to me sometimes that they forget to say to the police. They're uh, more relaxed, I guess. Don't feel they're on the spot so much. That's true. But I thought it was just me. Oh, no, you're not alone. I remembered something like that after I talked to Sergeant Renosa. He wanted to know where Eddie hung out, mostly. Bars and so on. I could only think of two. What are the names of the bars, Mrs. Kalen? Uh, the, uh, the Eloines on Beverly Boulevard and the Brass Monkey Inn down on the Strip. What difference does it make? Eddie wasn't killed in a bar. No, but he probably met people there, talked to them. You see, it's a matter now of trying to reconstruct his life step by step, right up to the moment he died. You'd be surprised how much bartenders see and hear. And remember. I suppose they do. All right, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to answer any questions you want to ask. Good. One thing, though. I wasn't expecting visitors, of course, and... I wonder if I could have just five minutes to change and freshen up a little. Oh, well, that's unnecessary. I won't be here long. But I'd feel better, really. Do you mind? No, no, of course not. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Pour yourself a drink, Johnny. I had the drink and waited and got ready to brace myself. <laughs> I've been through this before. Attack plan number two, a common garden variety. When you can't beat them, join them. And when the joiner is a lovely woman, the maneuver usually starts with some paraphrase of, uh, slip into something more comfortable. Why don't you have a drink? And a sudden switch to first names. And it always ends up with you and I against the world. And, uh, couldn't you forget just one little mistake? The little mistake being something like arsenic in a husband's coffee. Yeah, an old familiar pattern. And a first resort, just as often as a last. She was gone 20 minutes, not five, but it was time well spent. A carefully casual touch with a hair. Makeup skillfully softened. Perfume. And one of those frothy nylon jobs designed for that special evening in. Bugle call. Charge. Like another drink, Johnny. Uh, thanks. Uh, I still have some. I think I could use one. Would you mind? Sure. What do you have? Scotch and soda, please. Thanks for being so patient. I feel better now. More uh, comfortable, huh? Something like that. Easy on the soda. Right. There you are, Mrs. Keelan. Thanks. Would you do something else for me? Oh, I'd be happy to. But I don't know your first name. Touche. All right. What are your questions? How do you think it happened? I don't know. Not some enemy, because Eddie didn't have any. Just friends. Too many friends. Who are some of them? There's only one who really fits the definition, who, who's really lasted. His name is Pete Steimer. Pete Steimer? Where can I find him? You can't. Or at least the police haven't been able to. Nobody's seen him since that night. He's had nightclubs off and on, and in between he makes books. What about those other friends, the ones who don't last? <laughs> they drift in, drift out, depending mostly on whether Eddie had any money at the moment. Of course, there were women. Oh. Uh -huh. Showgirls, mostly dancers, strippers, so on. Know any of them? Hardly. Ever hear any of their names? I always made a point not to. Otherwise, I'd have killed him long ago. Did you kill him, Mrs. Kalen? No. Did you love him? That's a good question. I think I'll have to pass it, though. I don't really know. I feel all hollow. Smashed up inside. 
over what happened. And yet there were times I'd have killed him myself if I'd had a gun. But there were other times, too, when it was so crazy sweet you wanted to die. Because you knew it'd never be like that again. Yeah, that's the way it was with Eddie. Mad, mixed up. Like watching a ten-ring circus from the front seat in a roller coaster. That's why women flocked around him. That's why they always ran from him later. You didn't run. Can I have another drink? Oh, sure. Were you trying to run when you went up to Arrowhead by yourself? Maybe. We had a fight. I ran out and told him I wasn't coming back. And only three days later, over the radio, I heard where he'd been found dead. Burned up in his car. There you go. I guess they call it shock. I still can't really believe it, even though I know it's true. Well, I guess you should know. I understand you're the one who identified the body. I identified a wallet. Burned black. A wristwatch, a ring. All of them things I'd bought for him. They told me there wasn't anything that could be called a body. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Kalen. I know this is painful it's for all you. It's all right. Like I said, I, I can't believe it. Not really. Do you have any other reason for not believing Eddie is really dead? I mean, besides just a feeling. No. No, of course not. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, it was just a question, that's all. Forget it. But I... Let's should've... get back for a moment to another question. You said you were sure it wasn't some personal enemy who killed your husband. Then what do you think? Well, the same as the police, I guess. They said Eddie won a lot of money that night from some gambler named Topo Leanley. You don't know this Topo Leanley, huh? No, but I suppose that's why Eddie was killed. The money wasn't found, so I guess it was robbery. Did you know about the money? Well, it all happened while I was up at Arrowhead, anyway... If Eddie ever had any money, I'd be the last one to know about it. He always spent his money where it would show. Where he'd get something for it. Laughs, bells, whistles, balloons going up. But not at home. Never. Yeah, I'm well, sorry. I... Forget I said that. I hate women who sit around drooling with self-pity. Like you said. I didn't run. I guess maybe I did love him, Mr. Dollar. Is there anything else you... No, no, I guess not. At least not tonight. And you look a little beat. Yes, I'm afraid I am. You go around trying to keep up a front, but it's been rough. Yeah, I imagine. Well... That business a while ago, fixing myself up a little. This robe. I just had to do it. There are times when a woman has to feel like a woman. In order to feel anything... Even sane. I guess you wouldn't understand, though. And I'm afraid I gave the wrong impression. No. I think I do understand. Now. And I also think I owe you an apology. For what? For walking in here with a preconceived opinion. For being rude. Being wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgiven. Forgotten. And... Come back again, please. Regardless. I might. On one condition. Yes? Your first name. Would you mind? <laughs> it's Lila. Thanks, Lila. Good night. Good night. I caught a flash of movement from the corner of my eye and whirled around just in time to see somebody slip off the corner of the terrace and edge into the shadows of the shrubbery. I stepped off the porch and moved toward the dark hedge of banana and scrub palm. I was watching for a sudden attack, but nothing happened. Then I heard a slight sound on the next terrace level up the slope, a rustle of bushes, an accidental scrape of a shoe on the cement walk, and I slipped along the walk. I stopped at the head of the steps and listened. Nothing. The only way out of the patio to reach the street was to come past me. I started searching. But even though I was on guard when the attack came, it caught me off balance. All I could see was a dark shape and a glint of metal and an upraised fist. I grabbed the arm and twisted and drove my left into his stomach and again... He rolled to his knees and raised his right hand, and again I saw the glint of metal. I jumped for him, grabbed his hand, twisted it back, and at the same time I swung my foot and kicked him in the jaw. Johnny! Johnny, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Call Sergeant Reynoso, will you, Lila? He was out 
cold. I turned him over on his back and struck a match to get a look at him. He was a big man, stocky, bull-necked, blonde-haired. I slid my hand inside his coat and fished out his wallet and opened it. His name was Topo Lili. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, we meet a Latin doll from Santa Monica, an erudite bartender, and a Terpsichorean ecticiast. And they're all in the cast. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Reynosa, L.A. Police. Oh, hiya, Sergeant. Any luck? Nothing. This Topo Leanley boy's been in jams before. He's a tough cookie and we don't scare him a bit. What's his story? Says he was walking through the courtyard of the apartment house when you jumped him from the bushes. Oh. Claims he thought it was a stick-up and fired that shot at you in self-defense. What was he doing there in the first place? Calling on a girlfriend, only she'd given him the wrong address. Sure, well, we can hold him overnight for carrying a concealed weapon, but that's about all, Johnny. He'll make bail in the morning. Well, fine. Let him. Things aren't adding up, and it's got him worried. He's afraid he's being double-crossed, and he's fighting mad about it. On the loose, maybe he'll be a help to us. How? Maybe he can find Eddie Kalin. What are you talking about? Eddie Kalin's downtown in the morgue on a marble slab. Sergeant, want to bet? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, to the home office, Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment to Kalen Matter. Expense account continued. I was following a hunch, one that had started when Sergeant Reynosa said the police found the door of the Kalen apartment locked on the night of Eddie's death, locked with a key. And now the hunch was stronger. The way Leanley had acted, Topo Leanley, the gambler from whom Eddie had won $60,000 that night. Things like Lila Kalen had said about her husband, they all added up. But it was still only a hunch, not proof. And proof I had to have. And at the moment, the only chance I could see of getting it was to backtrack on Eddie Kalen. His hangouts, his contacts, his missing friend Pete Steimer, his movements during the hours before his car was found blazing at the bottom of a canyon in Palos Verdes. In a way, what I had to do was bring him back to life. Expense account item six, $14.10. Transportation two and incidentals at a dim little hole-in-the-wall bar out on Santa Monica Boulevard called the Cafe Eloines. <laughs> It was an out-of-the-way clip joint dedicated to the mood Caribbean, complete with palm fronds, drinks, and coconut shells, and a lovely little hostess with a beautifully developed and well-rounded Latin accent. You would like a nice table, amigo? Oh, this one's fine. But I would like a nice talk. 
Uh, sit down, honey. Let's get acquainted. Well, maybe for a few minutes. My name is Pepita. Of course. What else? I'm Johnny Dollar. <laughs> That's a funny name. Oh, I'm a funny guy. Will uh, Will you buy me a drink? Uh, is that the gimmick here? Gimmick? Well, what do you order? A champagne cocktail? See. Si. For which I pay two bucks. It's made with ten cents worth of salt. Turn. You get a one dollar kickback. Isn't that the way it's played? Are you with the vice squad? No, forget it. Relax. Hey, look. I'll do better than buy you a drink. What are you doing after you're through here? No. No, Dex. When I quit work here, I go straight home, amigo. And I live with my mother. Oh, well, that's a very good arrangement. Cheaper that way for both of you. But here's ten bucks. What I want from you is some information. About a customer who comes in here a lot, or used to anyway. Eddie Kalin. You know him? You are not the police, or you would not give me ten dollars just for talking. Sure, I know Eddie. What do you want to know about him? When did you see him last? On Thursday, the day before he was killed. How did he act? What did he say? Anything out of the ordinary? Oh, he said he loved me madly, passionately, devotionally. And if I do not love him too, he will kill himself. Just like ordinary. He was lying, of course. But he always was such exciting to listen. Then he buy me champagne cocktail and borrow from me the money to pay for it. <laughs> Quite a boy. Que hombre. He was, how you say, he was the most. Yeah. How long was he in here that night? Quien sabe. One hour, perhaps? By himself? No. With his amigo, with Pete. Pete Steimer, huh? Pete. Have you seen Pete since then? No. I do not think nobody has seen him. What do you think's happened to him? Who knows? Maybe he is too sad for Eddie dying. So he is hide out someplace all by himself. Mm, well, it's a theory. Did Eddie seem worried that night? No. Scared? No, not scared. Nothing special on his mind, apparently. No, just like always. <laughs> just like Eddie. You know. No, I never met him. Oh? Then, then why you ask this question? Oh, just a routine business matter. What about women? Women? Yeah, other girlfriends of Eddie's. And next to you, of course. Oh, next to me. With Eddie, every girl was first. Well, what about the nightclub here? Any of them come in here, work here? Oh, Eddie was too smart for that. In each one place, only one girl. That way, no trouble. Eddie was smart. Yeah, he was the most. He... What about girls in other places around town? Do you know any of them? No. I do not know any, but... Uh... But you've heard rumors. Well, there is a place which is called the Brat Monkey. Ah, oh, yeah. They have girls there which, um, how you say it, they, they take off some clothes and go jump around with the music. Strippers? Well, strippers. Well, somebody has always make jokes with me about one of those strippers. They say Eddie has had the big thing with her. <laughs> They think to make me mad, but there's no difference to me. I know how Eddie is. Do you know the girl's name? Ah, uh, the very silly name, which she has made up. It's Marty Midnight. Marty Midnight. She has black hair like me, but mine is natural black. Oh, yeah, sure, I figured as much. It's very beautiful. Muchas gracias, Johnny. Well, thanks for some pleasant conversation. You are leaving now? Yeah, what? But maybe you, you will come back. No? I wasn't planning to. At uh, one o'clock, I am through working. If you will come back. No? Mm, no. We wouldn't want to worry your poor old mother, would we? Keep her waiting up. What are you talking about? My mother is living in Havana, Cuba. Expense account item 7, $23.40. More transportation and some more of those incidentals. This time at the Brass Monkey Inn. That name had come up twice now. Eddie Kalin's widow had mentioned it first. So I figured I'd better have a look at it. The Eloines had been a fairly quiet place, dimly lighted with a big play on that mystery of the jungle routine. But the Brass Monkey was a pony of a different tint. At the Brass Monkey, they let down their hair and really lived. The chorus line was on and at it when I arrived. And strangely enough, the girls were all dolls. Pert, young, lively. Seven of them from left to right. 
But not one of the seven had midnight black hair. I leaned against the service bar and waited for the bartender to come down out of the clouds and notice me. And he finally did. Oh, sorry, Buster. Just couldn't see you for looking at you. Oh, that's all right. Who'd bother with a customer at a time like this? Another art lover. Man, man, I'll tell you true. There is the cream of the crop. Seven shining sisters. The Pleiades, brother. The absolute up-top zenith of the entire enthusiastic firmament. Well, you'll have to drink. Scotch over ice. Checo. I read a lot. That's where I get all them big words. Always try to better myself. Get ahead, man. That's the thing. Yes, so I've heard. So I read all the time. And I got a system, too, a shortcut. You know all them books you see around? You know what they're full of? Well, opinions vary. Words. And you know where they get them? From the dictionary. So I don't mess around. I go right to headquarters. The only book I read is the dictionary. You what? Sure. Read it through twice. And now I'm clear up to J on the third time around. You know what a Joss house is? Yeah, it's a Chinese temple. I, uh, think I need that drink now. Oh, I'm sorry, Buster. Here you are. Say, you're pretty smart yourself. Oh, I'm a pedant. Pedant? That's with a P. Nah, nah, I won't get to that for another three months. Uh, That's a buck even for the drink. Here you go. Keep the change. Well, thanks. I, uh... Hey, this is a 20 you give me. Yeah, I know. See, well, Buster, the answer is no. I can't fix you up with one of the girls. Uh Uh-uh. All I want is some information. Like what? Like where is Marty Midnight this evening? Oh, that I wouldn't know. She hasn't been around since, uh, well, not for the last four or five nights. Since Eddie Kalem was murdered? Is that what you're about to say? Police? Insurance investigator. The company I represent issued a policy on it. Eddie Kalen with insurance? Yeah, he took it out about two months ago. Who's the beneficiary? His wife. Well, well, I never met the gal, but I guess she's got something common. She must have took quite a beating off of Eddie. Man, oh man, that cat could really operate. So I gather. You happen to know where Marty lives? Nah, she moved a few weeks ago, after she took up with Eddie. I don't even know her real name. Hey, is the manager here? I'm the manager, Buster. I hired him, fired him, and in between, just look at him. <laughs> oh, man, what a life. <laughs> you know a friend of Eddie's named Pete Steimer? Sure I know. He hasn't been around either. Disappeared that same night, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that was a bad night all around. There was another guy dropped out of sight, too. A, a hood named Mike Kelso. One of Topo Leanley's boys. You know Topo? He comes in all the time. He's a... Uh... Hey... Hey, wait a minute. You must be the cat that broke his arm. <laughs> well, congratulations, felicitations, and happy days. I'll have a drink myself on that. Ah, real popular boy. Huh? Oh, the most. I understand he got his start by leaning out of his baby carriage and shoving his mother under a car. Was he in here that night? Well, sure. That's where Eddie met him. I told Eddie to stay clear of that game. Was I right? And you think that's why he was killed for the $60,000 he won that night? Buster, that's the type of question I never answer. And that's exactly why I stay so healthy. Well, you don't have to answer. That's where all the logic points. Eddie met Tom Bolini in here that night and was invited into one of Lini's big-time poker games. Eddie was lucky, plenty lucky, and Lini got hit hard. He decided he wouldn't stand still for it, so he and his muscle man, Mike Kelso, went around to Eddie's apartment, beat him up, got the 60,000 bucks, took Eddie out to the Palace Verdes Hills, ran him off the cliff, and set fire to his car. Any reason why it couldn't have happened like that? No, no. But there are a lot of loose ends. Like what has happened to Pete Steimer and Marty Midnight? Scared silly, hiding out. Mike Kelso. Same thing, he's sweating it out, waiting to see which way the wind blows. Or there's whispers around that he double-crossed Topo and ran out with the dough. Could be. But I keep remembering that door. What door? To Eddie's apartment. It was left locked with a key. So what's it got to do with every... Uh-oh. The police. I'm raided again. Hey, Red, dump that water bar whiskey down a sink. Jackie, get back there and tell the girls to cover up. Now, take it easy. You cats just keep your seats. Everything is copacetic. Relax, relax. It's not a raid. That's Sergeant Reynosa. He's handling the Kalen case. Buster, a cop's a cop no matter what he's handling. Now, shake it up, Red. Turn on that water in the sink and dump it all in. What the devil are you doing here, Johnny? Having a drink? What's up, Sergeant? I'm looking for a girl who's supposed to work here named Marty Midnight. So am I. What's your reason? Suspicion of murder. What? 
The guy was killed in her apartment about an hour ago. The neighbors heard the shots. And it's real crazy, Johnny. It just can't be, but it is. We got a fast check on the fingerprints. You know who the guy was? Sure. It was Eddie Kalen. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a stakeout, a manhunt, and a tired intern breaking his heart to keep life in a broken body. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny? Well, that's strange. Is this Mrs. Kalen? Lila? Yes, someone from the police department asked me to call Sergeant Reynosa at this number, but I didn't... Yeah, Reynosa was trying to reach you, but your phone didn't answer. Well, I was just letting it ring. I was trying to get some sleep. Then the officer came by. Where are you, Johnny? What's happened? We're at the apartment of a girl named Marty Midnight. Ever hear of her? No, why? Lila, you better brace yourself, honey. You've got another shock coming. Shock? What do you mean? Your husband didn't die in that burning auto. Eddie's... Eddie's alive? No, no, not now. He was shot to death an hour and a half ago here in Marty's apartment. Who did it? I don't know yet. Hang on to yourself and I'll come by and see you as soon as I'm free here. Will you, Johnny, please? Promise. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, to the home office Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Kalen Matter. Expense account continued. The homicide squad was finishing up its work when Sergeant Reynosa and I got back out to the apartment of Marty Midnight, star stripper of the Brass Monkey Inn. Eddie Kalen's body had been photographed, checked, measured, fingerprinted, examined, sketched, written up, and reported on. Taken out finally under a white sheet. I held the door open for the morgue attendants to get out with their silent burden and stood watching them wheel the stretcher down the walk and load it into the waiting ambulance. A light mist had started to fall, and a damp, cold blanket of fog was seeping down from the dark hillsides of Griffith Park beyond the road. There was a feeling of finality in the air, of the end of things. And for the man who died twice, it was final. Yeah, there was no doubt about it this time. Eddie Kalen was dead. I am tired, Johnny. Just plain dead dog tired. Yeah, it's getting to be a long night. Sit down and start talking. Any, uh, particular subject, Sergeant? You know what subject. You weren't surprised when you heard Eddie Kalen had been alive all this time that it wasn't his body in the wrecked car out in Palos Verdes. How come, Johnny? Why weren't you surprised? Because I was expecting it. Why else? No, you gotta do more talking than that. Well, it started with a hunch. And the hunch started when you told me you found the door of Eddie Kalen's apartment locked. When you went there that night, he was supposed to have died. Yeah, I know. Locked with a key. You mentioned that, but... Well, that was the important part. If it had been a door with a night lock or a spring latch that snaps when you pull it shut, it wouldn't have been anything. It still doesn't, as far as I'm concerned. All right, look. 
There was evidence there'd been a fight in that apartment that night. We assumed that somebody had knocked Eddie unconscious or killed him there in the apartment, then taken his body out to his car, driven it out to the Palace Verdi's headland, and set fire to it. That's right. Then at the time that somebody left the apartment, the heat was on. Mm -hmm. They had a body on their hands. Maybe someone had heard the fight, called the police. They had to get out fast. Yeah, sure, but... Under those circumstances, can you imagine anybody taking the time to go through Eddie's pockets to find his door key and bothering to stop and lock the door behind them? Now, it's illogical. Except for one person, Eddie himself. How do you figure? With him, it would be just a matter of habit, locking the door as usual when he left home. All right, Johnny, I see your point. Then how do you call the play that night? About the way we were tagging it, up to a point. Eddie won 60,000 bucks in that poker game with Topo Leanley. He went home, either alone or with that friend of his, Pete Steimer. So? So Topo had no intention of taking that kind of a loss. So he sent his trigger man, Mike Kelso, to recover the money. The fight was between Eddie and Mike. Only Mike was the one who lost, not Eddie. Then you figure Eddie put Mike Kelso's body in his car and drove it out to Palace Verdes and set fire to it? Sure. With Pete Steimer's help, probably. Well, it's possible. The body was practically destroyed. All we had for identification was the wallet, watch, keychain, and so on. They could have been planted. I think they were. It was a sudden idea, spur of the moment. But Eddie was ripe for it. There he was, with $60,000 in his pocket, but a dead man on his hands. And as far as his wife was concerned, I think the chance of shaking her and not sharing the money was just an added inducement. So he and Pete arranged for the body to be identified as his, and Eddie just disappeared. And holed up here in his girlfriend's apartment. Why not? He and Pete both. Apparently the three of them were planning to jump the country, judging by that forged birth certificate you found in there on the breakfast table. Only it didn't work out that way. Well, Eddie's dead. Really dead now. Pete and Marty have disappeared again, and the 60 grand is missing. Find them, and you find the money. Johnny, it sounds like the same old story. Big money, big temptation, and a falling out among friends. That's the most likely. Of course, there is one other possibility. What's that? Topo Leanley. Was he out? Yeah. How come? It's a rough combination, Johnny. Good lawyer on his side and a poor case on ours. He was sprung two hours before the neighbors reported the shooting here. The anonymous neighbor. Well... It could be, then. But I'm still betting it was Pete Steimer or Marty Midnight. I'm not betting anything anymore. The way things stand now, it's anybody's guess. His own gun, no prints on it. You pays your nickel and you takes your choice. Well, at least the field narrows down. Well, seems like we got a visitor. Probably one of the uniform boys on duty outside. Yes? The policeman outside say for me to come to you. I am Jeanette Dubois. Oh? Well, what can I do for you? Uh... I am the person who reports the shooting on the telephone. Come on in. Oh, merci, monsieur. How come you refuse to give your name when you phone the police? Uh, you are Captain? Sergeant Reynosa. This is Johnny Dollar, Mr. Bois. Oh, he is also police? He's working with us on this. Now, why wouldn't you give your name when you reported the shooting? Oh, I, I am very sorry, monsieur. You see, I have not been in this country too long, and, and I am afraid that I will be implicated. So I do not give the name at first. But finally, I, I think it over, and I call my friend the consul. And he say I must come to you immediately. And he's right. So you heard the shooting, huh? Oui, monsieur. I, I was po walking past in front. I, I live three places down from here. All of a sudden, there is bang, bang, bang. And I am scared to pieces. And I can imagine. Then the door of this place is slammed open very quick. And I jump in the shadow behind a bush. A girl start to come out, and then she stop in the door. What did she look like, Miss Dubois? Well, it is too dark for telling good, but I have seen her before. I know from her hair, very long, black. Marty Midnight. Was well, that the one, the girl who lives here? Oui, monsieur. I did not know her name. All right, what happened then? She stand in the door for a second. She is wearing a, a how you say it, a white raincoat. She is holding something in her hand. This thing she wipes with the raincoat all over. Then she throws it back into the room. Was it a gun? I think so. Then she pulls the door shut and runs down the street. I am too scared to think what to do for a minute. Then I hurry home very fast and I telephone to the police. You didn't see anybody else around the place or in the street out in front? No, Monsieur Dollar. I watch from my window until the police have come. Nobody else has come out or go in. I see well, Sergeant? She won't get far. Girl with her looks draws too much attention. We'll pick her up before morning. 
Uh, thank you for your information, Miss Dubois. In view of your cooperation now, I think we can forget about you not telling us all this sooner. Does that mean I can go now? Yes, just leave your name and address with the officer outside. Oh, merci, monsieur. Au revoir. That kind of surprises me. I could figure the two of them together ganging up on Eddie. But apparently it was just morning midnight. All on her own. It's been done before, Johnny. They're not the weaker sex, no matter what the book says. I know. But the fact never fails to amaze me. It shouldn't. You must have been on some of the same kind of cases. I... The devil. Come on! The patrolman stationed at the back entrance of the apartment when the house told us what had happened. He'd surprised somebody, a man, he thought, lurking in the bushes beside the house. The prowler fired a shot and ran. He paid no attention to the order to halt. The patrolman had fired twice, missed. The fugitive had escaped into the dense underbrush of Griffith Park just across the street. Sergeant Reynosa spotted men quickly along the edge of the brush, set up a portable spotlight in the squad car, sent his other car up an access road to block off the ridge line, radioed for reinforcements. Within five minutes, a 15-acre area of the slope was surrounded and blocked off. Well, what do you say, Johnny? Should we go in after him? Yeah, looks like we'll have to. He seems to be the shy type. Call it. Who do you think? I'm putting my money on top only, Lee. Good bet. Let's go. Keep that crowd back out of the way. All right, good bet, girl. Couldn't be any darker in here. Oh, wetter. Hey, shoot your flash over there toward the right. No, it's an old stump. All right, we've got you surrounded. You better come out with your hands up. If you try to resist, you'll only make it tougher on yourself. You hear something then? No. It was over to the left, I think. Let's take a look. Watch yourself, Johnny. He's thrown lead once already. Yeah. There. Back of that tree. Hold your flash steady. There. I see you. Come out with your hands up. It's your last chance. I'm warning you. Got no choice, Johnny. He's down. Come on, Sergeant. Well, what do you know? It wasn't Tom O'Leary. It was Eddie Kalin's friend, Pete Steimer. Expense account item nine, one dollar for a newspaper, two packs of cigarettes, and a cardboard carton of hot coffee purchased from an all-night diner across the street from the Queen of the Angels Hospital. I took them up to the police emergency ward, room 612, pulled a chair up in front of the window, and sat down to wait. Pete Steimer was still unconscious, still hadn't been able to speak a word since he dropped to the ground with Sergeant Reynosa's bullet in his chest. So I waited. Outside, the cold mist was still coming down steadily. The night was pretty far gone. It was less than three hours before dawn. A nurse sat silently beside the bed. The only sound in the room was the hoarse, slow breathing of the wounded man. After a while, the nurse left the room for something, and he seemed to rouse slightly at the sound of the door. Uh, 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 uh. Where... Where am I? Take it easy, Pete. Don't try to talk. Eddie. Is... Is... Eddie here? No, he's not here. He ought to be here. It's... It's always been like this. Relax now. It's, it's all right. Eddie... Always runs out and and leaves somebody else to to easy now, easy. Somebody else to face the music. Pete. And those were his last words before he went to face the music. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a quarry run to earth, a strange alibi... 
and a shocking twist at the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Reynosa, Johnny. Oh, I was just going to call you. Has he talked yet? Pete Steimer is dead. When? A few minutes ago. He almost regained consciousness for a few seconds, and that was all. There's no chance to question him. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah, he might have been able to clear it up for us. I think maybe it is cleared up, Johnny, or will be at least in the next hour. What do you mean? We picked up Marty Midnight. When? Where? A few minutes ago at the bus depot with a ticket for San Diego in her hand. I haven't talked to her yet. They're holding her downtown headquarters. Why don't you meet me there? Fine, right away. Looks like the wind-up, Johnny. I hope so. I really hope so. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, to the home office, Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Kalen matter. Expense account, final page. Item 12, $1.60. Taxi from Queen of the Angels Hospital to police headquarters and interrogation room 9. The police clerk showed me to the observation anteroom and left. I paused for a moment and looked in through the one-way mirror window. Sergeant Reynosa was already there, and the girl, Marty Midnight, sat facing him across a plain wooden table. He was glancing through the arrest file and apparently hadn't started to question her yet. She was younger than I'd expected, not over 22 or 23, and she was obviously scared. But her face was set and ruddy, sullen, defiant. I tapped on the door and the jail matron let me in. Oh, come on in, Johnny. Hey, take that chair, if you will. Thanks. When do I get to see a lawyer? You go under the name Marty Midnight? That's right. I said What's when... your real name? How long have you been in Los Angeles? Where'd you live before that? Uh, you see we got hold of here, Johnny? Yeah, I see. One of those wise ones, or so she thinks. If you're ever arrested, keep your mouth shut. Somebody told her that back along the line. She thinks it's good advice. I want a lawyer. Don't talk. They can't pin anything on you. She believes it. She'll probably still believe it right at the door of the gas chamber. I haven't done anything. You've got to let me see a lawyer. It's a law. You'll see one at the usual time. I know that law, too, Marty. And you're not being deprived of any of your legal rights. What's your real name? Well, then I guess we'll have to contact your folks and see if they have any influence. Contact my folks? Who are they? Go on, tell me. Well, let's see. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. and Mrs. John R. Jack Lyon of San Diego at 426... How did you find out? And your name is or was Jean Luann Jack Lyon. Don't let my folks know, please. I- I'll talk, Sergeant. I'll answer anything you want to know. If you just won't use my real name. If you won't let my folks find out, please... Suddenly, she was just a frightened kid. Not a hard-boiled little chorus pony, a nightclub stripper. But only a scared girl who didn't want her folks to find out. 
She kept her head down, and she answered Reynosa's questions, her eyes lowered like a repentant school kid who had been caught playing hooky. Then I remembered. The charge here was murder. Did you know that Eddie Kalin was married when you started going around with him? Not at first. And later you found out, but you kept on going with him. Well, he said he was getting a divorce. He said he'd been trying to get free of his wife for six months, but she wouldn't let him. Did you believe that? Well, yes. I, I don't know. I, I didn't until he came here that night. He said we're going to run away to Mexico together. The night he killed Mike Kelso? Yes, but I told you I didn't know about that until two days later. And it was self-defense, honest. Mike was trying to hold him up to get back the money Eddie won in that poker game. It was self-defense. Then why did Eddie go into hiding? Well, I told you that, too. It was his chance to get away from Lila and... Where were you going when the police arrested you over there in the bus station? San Diego. To my folks. Nobody here ever knew me by any name except Marty Midnight. I, I didn't think you could trace me. And you didn't want to be traced. Well, of course not. I came back and saw the police car at my apartment and... Then I knew you'd found Eddie. I didn't want to be mixed up in it. Why'd you kill him? Marty? K kill who? Eddie. It wasn't Eddie. It was Mike Kelso. Eddie's the one who killed him in a fight. I told you that. It was... Oh, but you know it wasn't Eddie. You picked him up at my apartment, didn't you? Yeah, sure. We picked him up. In a basket. What? He's across the street from the morgue. Why'd you kill him, Marty? I didn't kill anybody. I didn't know Eddie was dead. I was coming home and I saw the police car. I thought you'd found him, that's all. I didn't know he was dead. I didn't kill him. You gotta believe me. I didn't know anything about it. Honest. Honest. Marty Midnight. Sharp, hard, tough. A striptease dancer who'd been around knew all about it. Marty Midnight. A scared, sobbing little child. Honest. Cross my heart and hope to die. Well, maybe she would. I left a few minutes later, and Sergeant Reynoso walked out with me to get a breath of air. It was a cold, gloomy night with a gray dawn just ahead. Three people were dead. And in the great stone building we walked out of, the machinery was grinding away, getting ready to take the life of a fourth one. Well, I guess I'd better get back inside, Johnny. Yeah, all right, Sergeant. The lab boy's making a paraffin test. You know, it's too bad. She's just a kid. Yeah. I was hoping it'd be Topo Leanley. That I'd love. He's long overdue. Well, he's still on the loose. Uh -uh. It's a kid up there. You know it and I know it. And anything else is just wishful thinking. That witness saw her leave, saw her wipe off the gun, throw it back into the apartment. Yeah, I know. Well, where'll you be, Johnny? The hotel? Oh, not for a while. I'm going to stop by Lila Kalins. At this time of night? Oh, she'll be waiting up. I promised her I'd see her and tell her what happened. She's, uh, taken quite a beating out of this mess. Why did they do it, Johnny? Why did dames fall for a guy like Eddie Kalin? Philosophy? At this time of morning? <laughs> I'll see you later. Expense account, item 13, $2.80. Taxi fare to the Argus Terrace Apartments to talk to the widow and beneficiary, Lila Kalin. Johnny, come on in. Thanks, Lila. I've been sitting in here in front of the fireplace all night long. I'd almost given you up. Well, a lot of things happen. Oh, man, I'm really beat. Coffee or a drink? Coffee, I guess. Black. Is it, is it all over now, Johnny? Well, it amounts to that. They've apparently got the killer. Who? That girl he was hiding out with, Marty Midnight. She's a striptease dancer. Why? Why did you do it? The money, I suppose. They haven't found it yet, but they will. Here's your coffee. Oh, thanks. I feel sorry for her. Maybe because I feel sorry for myself or anybody who ever got mixed up with Eddie. Why do we do it, Johnny? Why do we go blind when a guy like that comes along? I don't know. You tell me. I wish I knew. Maybe a girl I met yesterday evening had it tagged. She said she knew Eddie was always lying. But he made it sound so exciting. He did. I had four years of it. Never knowing when he'd walk out and not come back. Never knowing who he was with. Knowing only one thing for sure. That he was lying to me every hour of the day. 
Now that it's over, I wonder why I went through with it. But he did make it sound exciting. Well, the best thing you can do, Lila, as soon as it's cleared up... Who can that be? This oh, it might be Sergeant Reynosa. I told him I'd be here. Hello? Oh, yes, just a moment. You were right. Thanks. Yeah. Hold on to your hat, Johnny. It's wide open again. What do you mean? That paraffin test. Negative. What? Marty Midnight hasn't fired a gun in the last two days. She was telling the truth, witness or no witness. So it looks like Topo Leanley's a boy. Sergeant, the wait. Huh? What was Marty wearing when they picked her up at the bus depot? Why, uh, well, the same thing she was when you saw her. Skirt and sweater. Did she have a coat on? A uh, short jacket. What are you getting at? Hmm. Hey, Johnny, you still there? Uh, sorry, I was thinking, and it figures. Sergeant, can you come out here right away? To Lila's place? Why? It's important. Believe me. All right, Johnny, right away. What was it, Johnny? Lila with the cool black hair. It's beautiful. What? Thank you, Johnny. Pepita has black hair, too. And Marty Midnight. Eddie only liked dark-haired girls. But Marty didn't have a white raincoat. I'll bet you do, though. What? Where is it? Here in the closet? Johnny. Uh-huh. What's this all about? A witness saw a girl leave Marty's apartment right after the shots. But it was dark, and all the witness could make out was the black hair and the white raincoat. What do you mean? The witness saw the girl wipe off a gun on the front of her coat, then throw it back into the apartment and run. There are smudges on your raincoat, Lila. It's grease off the door of the car. Supposedly, you haven't been out of this place since I talked to you yesterday evening. But it hadn't started to rain then, and the coat's damp. Why did you kill him, Lila? You're out of your mind, Johnny. It's no use, honey. Reynos is on his way out here. They'll make a paraffin test and prove you fired a gun. They'll probably dig up the taxi driver who took you out there. They'll search the place here, find the money. Was that it? The money? Was that why you killed him? No. I didn't mean to. When I went out there. Yesterday evening while I was talking to you, I suddenly wondered if it might not have been somebody else's body in that car. I knew about Marty Midnight, of course. I knew about all of them. After you'd gone, I went out there. Waited until I saw Pete Steimer leave. Finally, Marty. And I forced my way in. So... Eddie was furious. We argued and fought. Eddie drew a gun on me. He threatened me. We struggled... So that's going to be a pitch, huh? Plea of self-defense. That's it, Johnny. (sighs) Self-defense. Well, good luck. You'll need it. Expense account item 13, $263.35. Incidentals, etc. in Los Angeles and plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $596.85. End of expense account. End of report. Remarks? So the question still stands. Why do they do it? Why do girls go blind when the Eddie Kalins walk in? You might ask a strip teaser down in San Diego. But don't look for her under the name of Marty Midnight. She's Jean Luann Jackline now. A quiet kid. Lives at home with her folks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the case of a beautiful girl who refuses to see the man she loves as he really is. A killer. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Lucille Meredith, Alma Lawton, Gloria Blondell, Howard McNear, Harry Bartell, Peter Leeds, and Byron Kane. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. 
Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Oren Vance. Oren Vance? Yeah, you sent me up to Arsenic seven years ago, you remember? Huh? Oh, yes, I think I do. Uh, you know, I thought a lot about coming out and killing you, Dollar. Mm-hmm. But instead, I'm going to do you a favor. Yeah? Yeah. I think maybe you and I can work out something. You know, this sounds like double talk to me. Don't you give me any routine, Dollar. I heard them all. I'm calling you with information. About the Todd case. Todd? I don't remember. Well, look it up. It cost your company $75,000. Hey. Hello? Vance? Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. Attention, Mr. Don Freed, Chief Investigator Claims Division. Since your office authorized me to conduct certain inquiries based on new information supplied by Orrin Vance, I am billing you accordingly. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. Expense account item one, one dollar and eighty-five cents. One phone call to Don Freed in Wilmington, Delaware, to discuss the burglary that had occurred six months before in the Long Island home of Norman Todd. The case was a complete stalemate. The police and the insurance investigators had been unable to locate the thieves or trace any of the loot, which included jewelry, silver, and wearing apparel that had been taken from the residence. I requested Don to forward whatever details they had, along with an accurate list of the stolen items and complete descriptions. Expense account item two, two dollars, cab fare. To and from the office of International Adjustment Bureau, where I refresh my memory concerning Orrin Vance. A good look at the files, and I remembered him well. Back in 1947, he'd been involved in a well-engineered swindle of the Seaman Clothing Company. Almost got away with it. And it was my investigation and testimony that finally put him behind the bars. Hi. Huh? Vance? Yeah. Oh, hello, Dollar. You haven't changed a bit. You have. Yeah, sure I have. You took seven years of my life away from me. Did you do what I told you to on the phone? People like you don't tell me what to do, Vance. (laughs) Come on in. Oh, sure. Thanks. Nice place you got here. Yeah, I like it. Sit down. Tell me what's on your mind. Look, Dollar, don't treat me like a con, huh? Even if I am one. I'll sit down, yeah. I'll have a smoke with you. I'll talk with you. Okay. Okay, have one. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, It's just that everybody, everybody's doing it. Treating me like that. Even my wife went over to see her the first day I got out. You know what? She wouldn't let me in the house. She gave me $40 and told me to go out and get a decent job. (laughs) Work hard, she said, and in six months, if everything is okay and you're not in any trouble, you can come home to me and the kids. And if not, she says, I'm going to divorce you. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to say? Offer me a seat. Invite me to sit down. I'm a human being, too. Sure. Thanks again. Well? 
Why, I thought about it a lot. You know, if you hadn't been out to get me eight years ago, I, I might have had you over to dinner. Maybe we could have been friends. Yeah, maybe. Now, what's this all about, Vance? Uh, okay. I can't get a job. I'll have to go in business for myself. I need a steak. That's why I called you. Go on. Now, did you do like I, like I asked you to? Look up the Todd case? I call Wilmington about it. There's nothing new happening. I'm happening. That's something new. And I can help. For a price. All right, go on. But I want my name out of the picture. Could you fix that? Probably. But I'd have to talk to the police sooner or later. All I'm asking is your promise to keep my name out of it. Otherwise, it's no go. Well, tell me something about it before I make any promises, Vance. Fair enough. You got a list of the stolen items? Not yet. Won't be here until tomorrow. Now, when it gets here, you'll find it was a mink coat in that lot. I think most of it was jewelry, but it was a mink coat. Labeled from Zellerback Furs in New York. And the inside lining carried this serial number, 27356. All right. Take it easy, Vance. Expense account item three, $2.50. Another long-distance phone call to Wilmington and Don Freed, who verified that the serial numbers furnished by Oren Vance fitted those in the stolen mink coat. I explained how I'd come about the information at hand, leaving out any mention of names. Freed talked with his boss and phoned me back a half an hour later. You can go ahead and work on it, Dollar. There's a $5,000 reward posted. $5,000? We'll split it between you and, uh, and your friend, if anything worthwhile turns up. Okay? Uh, suppose it's nothing. Okay. Swindle sheet, too. All right. Okay, Vance. You're in business. How does it work? You tell me where the coat is and who has it, and I'll handle it from there. If it turns out to be anything, you'll get paid for it. All I've had so far is talk. I'll tell you where the coat is and who has it. But before I do that, you give me a check. What? A check for 2500 You date it two days from now. It'll give you a chance to look into it and see if I know what I'm talking about. And you can stop payment any time within two days if my tip doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'll have the check and bye-bye. Where to? Homewood, Indiana. My plane leaves in an hour. I may want you around for some questions. No, I'll give you the tip. That's all. You ask somebody else the questions. Well? Okay. What's the matter? You afraid? Sure. Haven't you noticed? I'm a stool pitcher. I noticed, and it worried me. But I arranged for him to have the post-dated check in return for which he gave me a name and an address. Gloria Tierney, 1231 East 57th Street, New York City. Expense account item four, $3, cab fare to the airport. I saw Orrin Vance off on a westbound plane to Indiana. Forty-five minutes later, I boarded flight 37 for New York. Expense account item five, $18.85. The cost of getting me from Hartford to New York. I checked in at the New Western and went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station where I asked if Gloria Tierney had a record. A check in the police files revealed that she was not listed. About seven o'clock, I had a bite to eat and then I walked over to the 57th Street address, a small apartment building. Hello. I'm looking for Gloria Tierney. Oh, you have the wrong apartments right across the hall. I was over there. No one answered. Well, she must be out. I'm the manager here. Would you like to leave your name? I'm Johnny Dollar. But I wonder if you could tell me where to find her. No. No, I can't. But I'll be glad to give her your name and ask her to call you. Well, that sounds fair enough. I'm at the New Western Hotel. Oh? You're from out of town? Yes. An old friend of Gloria's? No, no. I'm uh, just on business. Well, I'll tell her you came by. Good, fine. By the way, uh, how long has Miss Tierney lived here? Mm, about a year. Why? Oh, I uh, just wondered. Thank you. Johnny Dollar, New Weston Hotel? Oh, that's right. Wait a minute. Here, take my card. Insurance? Sort of. The apartment house manager, it said Ethel Stromberg on the mailbox, smiled politely and closed the door. I went outside the building and took a plant across the street. I waited around for about three hours and saw no one go in or out of the building. I went back to my hotel. About midnight, the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Hello, 
Mr. Dollar, please. Hi, Mr. Dollar. You left word for me. I'm Gloria Tierney. Oh, yes, Miss Tierney. I intend to leave town, possibly in the morning, so I thought I'd better call you tonight. I hope it isn't too late. Not at all, Miss Tierney. What's it all about, Mr. Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator. I'd rather tell you about it in person. As I said, I expect to leave town tomorrow. Is it important? I think so, yes. Could I see you tonight? Well, I don't know. I could be there in 15 minutes. I don't understand. I'll come right over. Well, all right. I was there in less than 15 minutes, but things weren't all right. As a matter of fact, things looked all wrong. Gloria Tierney's apartment was darkened. She didn't answer when I knocked on the door. I tried it. The door was locked. You who? Hmm? Now, look here. I don't think you have any right to bother Gloria. Oh, it's you. Hello, Mrs. Stromberg. Well, where's Gloria? I don't know. You don't know? She was waiting to meet you. Ah. Well, out here in the hallway. She came in tonight, and I gave her your message. And then she went in and called you, and then came back out and said you were coming by. Yeah, well, she's gone. Well, that's funny. Hey, tell me, did you hear anyone out here? No. Well, maybe she went down to the drugstore. Drugstore's closed. Well, yes. Uh, she'll probably show up. Yes, probably. You look worried, Mrs. Stromberg. I am. Gloria didn't seem like herself when she came in. Oh, what do you mean? Well, she was nervous and upset. I think she'd been crying. I don't know. Uh-huh. Oh, I hope she's all right. Yeah, so do I. You're sure she isn't outside waiting for you? No, I didn't see any. Well, I'll look again. Do you see her? Not a soul. Had she been drinking? No, of course not. What was she wearing, Mrs. Stromberg? Oh, she had her coat on. Her mink coat? Yes. Well, how'd you know about her mink coat? A friend of mine. I'll take a look around out here. All right. Oh, wait a minute. I'll come with you. You know, of course, she might hey, have got... Wait a second. Look, is that Gloria? Why, yes, I think so. Something's wrong with her. Yes. The girl crossing the street in the mink coat weaved slightly from side to side. As I got close to her, I could see she was a pretty girl in her late 20s, blonde hair, dark eyes. She hardly looked up as I came up to her. Just stopped and stood there, weaving slightly. Miss Tierney? Yes, yes. Well, can I help you? I'm Johnny Dollar. Please. Oh, come on. We better go inside. Y- yes. What is it? He, he struck me. He, he what? He struck me. <laughs> And I... Oh, Mr. Dollar. There, come on. Careful now. Sure. Oh. Easy. Easy now. Thank you. Thank you very much. You okay? Yes. Look out! That car! Uh, what? That car! No! All three slugs had hit her and she fell back into my arms. By the time I could reach for it and get my gun out, the black Cadillac and whoever was driving it were out of sight around the corner. And there'd been no light on the rear license plate. Oh. Easy now, easy. Mr. Dollar, those were shots. Oh. What <gasps> Mr. Dollar? Call the police, call the police, quick. But I... Oh. Yes, right away. You know, let's see if we can... Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Don't try to talk, Gloria. Don't try to move. We'll have help here in a minute. Oh. Oh. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Todd matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the same old business of murder, but with a brand new twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dan Mapes, New York Police Department, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hi. I just went over your statement to the officers who went to the scene of the shooting. Pretty rough business. Yeah. How's the girl? She hasn't regained consciousness. Well, we've got to get on with this, Dollar. There's some questions I want to ask you. Sure. Glad to do what I can. Where can I meet you? What's the matter with right here at headquarters? Okay. Say, in about an hour? Make it a half an hour. I said I want to get on with the case. Uh, Room 212, Sergeant Daniel Mapes. Okay, Sergeant. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. A burglary that occurred six months ago, but the murder try occurred only a few hours ago. Expense account item six, $16.40. One telegram. From me to Chief Investigator Don Freed, Four State Insurance. I explained events up to date and requested that Freed contact their New York office and employ counsel for me in the event the New York police chose to hold me as a material witness in the shooting of Gloria Tierney. Ah, uh, we aren't going to hold you. Why should we? I don't know. Why should you? Sit down. Take it easy. Okay, thanks. So, uh, you're a freelance insurance investigator. Yeah, that's right. Working for a four state out of Wilmington, huh? That's right. Okay, suppose you give it to me. Well, you got it right in front of you there in that report. I told it to the investigating officers right after the shooting last night. Uh, now you tell it to me. All right. I made an appointment to meet this girl. She called me about 12 o'clock midnight, and I went on over to her apartment. Uh huh? She wasn't around when I got there, so I waited and talked to her landlady. A few minutes later, I saw her coming across the street. I went over to meet her because she looked like she'd been hurt or something. Hmm. I walked her back across the street. Somebody pulled up in a car just as we got to the curb. It says here, Black Caddy, 1955 Coupe de Ville. Yeah, I didn't pay too much attention. What was the license number? Couldn't tell. It was blacked out. Okay, go on. There was a man in it. I didn't see his face. Didn't even notice him, really. He... Well, he just started shooting. The girl was hit three times. I was trying to help her, and he got away. Well, what else? That's it. Okay. Tell me why you were in here yesterday afternoon, checking to see if this Gloria Tierney had a record. I was about to contact her. I wanted to know if she'd ever been in trouble. Now, tell me what you're working on. The Todd case. Todd? Yeah, a burglary out in Long Island about six, seven months ago. I had reason to believe the girl might be able to help me on it. Hmm. Because of what? Because of her mink coat. Well, I'm glad you answered that way, Dollar. The coat's in the lab now. They're looking it over. We found it listed in our stolen property files. So far, your story's okay, but believe me, it isn't over yet. Huh? Tell me more. We know about the coat. We want to know about the girl who was wearing it. <sighs> Sorry, I can't help you. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we sent them off to Washington. She's still unconscious. She's in pretty bad shape. She can't talk. You can. What's her angle? I don't know. You don't know who shot her. You didn't get the license number. You just stood there and let it happen. All you were interested in was your mink coat. Look, I... Is that what you're trying to tell me? I might be through trying to tell you anything, pal. Don't get smarty pants with me, Dollar. I got myself a shooting to straighten out. I'll straighten it out any way I can. What else did she have in the Todd business? You tell me. Nothing. A small diamond ring on a little finger. It's not on the stolen property list. Tell me, Dollar, did your insurance company pay off this claim? Yes, the whole thing. About 75000 75000 That's right. Well, at least you got the coat back. Even if it has got three bullet holes in it. Maybe we'll get a line on the whole job. If she regains consciousness. Meanwhile, you can sit here and tell me about your tip. What? Who put you on to Gloria Tierney? No, no, I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Why not? Because I promised not to disclose any names. Oh, for... I can tell you this much, though. The man who told me about Gloria Tierney couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the Todd case. He was in prison when it happened. Let's have his name so I can check it. He's in Indiana now. He's got a name in Indiana. What is it? Sorry. You going to sit there and tell me he gave you a name to start with and that's all you bought? Yep. Suppose I told you I don't believe anything. 
And I think I'll hold you for a while until you forget about whatever deal you made with an ex-con. Well, suppose I told you that a lawyer for my insurance company is on his way down here right now just to see that I get treated right. <laughs> What's funny? You. You insurance guys. You know what? You give me a pain. Right here. We went on like that a little while. Then I accompanied Sergeant Mapes to Gloria Tierney's apartment. A full crew of technicians were there giving the premises a complete check. Mapes dispatched two sets of detectives to cover the neighborhood for possible witnesses to the shooting. Another pair began to cover the apartment house itself. I went with Mapes to talk to the manager, Mrs. Stromberg. She looked white and shaken. You remember, Mr. Dollar? Yes. Hello, Mr. Dollar. How's poor Gloria? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. And we're still pretty much in the dark about all this, Mrs. Stromberg. Where is she? What hospital? I'd like to go see her. Maybe there's something I can do. The best thing you can do is try to help us find out who shot her. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Well, thank you. Oh, what an awful thing. She... Well, what's it all about? Why would anyone want to shoot Gloria? We hope we can ask her that question. Right now, we're going to try to find out all we can, and maybe you can help us. Well, I hope so. What can I tell you? Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. Yesterday, you told me you'd known her for a year. Yes, ever since she moved in. All right. Was she a nice girl? Of course she was a nice girl. Quiet, minded her own business. Where does she work at? Well, I don't know. I mean, Gloria doesn't work as far as I know. Who pays her rent? She always gave me a check. Who gave her a check? Well, I really don't know. I... Don't you know anything? What's the matter with you? Well, I'm trying. Mapes, no. why don't you go sit down? All right, I'll sit down here. Mrs. Stromberg, what can you tell us about her? Do you know where we can contact her family? Think about it. Well, I don't know. I know they live in California somewhere, but that's all I do know. She talked about them now and then. Uh-huh. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Well, for instance, the man who drove the black Cadillac last night. Oh, I never saw that car around here before. Did she talk about her friends to you? Why, no. Well, she's a pretty girl, young. Boyfriends? Oh, yes, she did talk about them now and then. Do you suppose one of them had something to do with this? Mrs. Stromberg, some guy pulled up in a black caddy last night and pumped three slugs into her. She acted funny before that, according to you. Run out when she was supposed to meet Dollar here. Don't you know if any of her friends drove a car like that? No. You know this, but you don't know that. What kind of a friend were you? What? What kind of a friend were you? That girl's lying in a hospital right now. She's got a slug here, another one here, and here. They've operated twice. You weep and holler and stand around wringing your hands about her, but you won't open your mouth about helping us find who did it. Now, let's start with that car again. You've got the front apartment here. You can see the street from those two windows. Have you ever seen that black caddy here before? Yes. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Whose is it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know his full name. Well, what do you know about him? His name is Bill something. <laughs> Bill something. Yes. That's a big help. What does he look like? Where does he work? What does he do? I don't know. I really don't know. She never introduced me to him, but she talked about him. She'd say, Bill's coming by tonight, or Bill did this, or Bill did that, but she never mentioned his last name. But he drove the caddy. Yes. Now, what does he look like? I told you, she never introduced me. I heard that part. But I know if someone young and fresh and pretty like Gloria Tierney lived across the hall from my wife, my wife would be at the window every time she heard the bell ring or heard a car drive up out front. She'd want to see who was buying her the candy and flowers, who was knocking on the door. Isn't that so, Mrs. Stromberg? Yes. I mean, no. <laughs> yes. Well, what do you mean? Uh... Now, look. For the third time, what does this guy Bill look like? Well, he's tall and very dark. Tall? What does that mean? Tall like me? Tall like Dollar? Tall like what? Like Mr. Dollar. How old? How'd he dress? What kind of bill? Easy, easy, Mapes. Why don't you go through that offering me to sit down part now? All right, all right. I was wrong about you, Mapes. I admit it. Well, maybe I was kind of wrong about you, Dollar. Hardly anybody ever admits anything these days. Okay. I'm sorry I'm raising my voice, Mrs. Stromberg. But tell us about the man, all you can remember about Bill. Heavy, light? A husky fellow, and he dressed very nicely, too. What color was his hair? Dark, I think. He always wore a hat. How about his eyes? I don't know. Uh -huh. About how old would you say? Oh, 30, maybe 35. I, I'm not very good at ages. 
How often did he come here to see her? Oh, once or twice a week. Gloria's been going with him? Yes. Did she ever mention where he works or what he does? No. No, she never mentioned that. Do you have any idea how long she's known him? How long she's been going with him? Well, I have no idea. I just know he's been coming to see her ever since she moved in here. This, uh, Bill. Would you say he had money, Mrs. Stromberg? Yes, I'd say so. He drove that big, expensive car and always dressed so nice. And, of course, he gave Gloria that coat. The mink coat? Yes. Hmm. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Gloria would usually run across the hall and show me when he gave her something. Mostly they were small gifts, candy, and things like that. But I don't remember if he ever gave her any jewelry. Did he ever bring any friends here? I don't know. All right. Was Gloria going to marry him? Oh, she never talked about it. You sure about that? Yes, she never said, and I never asked. Why? Why not? Well, I don't know. I never asked her. I wanted to, but I never asked her. You think right away I've been a busybody watching that girl and so on. Well, yes, I watched her from time to time, and I was her friend here. But there are some things we just didn't talk about. There sure were. Well, as you ask me questions, I realize how much we didn't talk about. I can't tell you where she came from or where her family is or who Bill is or what she planned for the future. I just know she was a nice, decent, honest sort of a girl. Yes, we got that impression, Mrs. Stromberg. Anything you want to ask, Dollar? No, no, no. My uh, apologies again for raising my voice. Thank you for the information, Mrs. Stromberg. Hmm. Come on, Dollar. Okay. Goodbye. 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 Well, you got it out of her. Yeah, but I don't trust her. It took too much work. Are you really as tough as you look? Sure. <laughs> You're a good cop, Mapes. <laughs> Thanks. I like to have somebody mention that every five years. Well, better get out this guy's description. Yeah. Now, there's a hall phone right there. Uh-huh. Well, we sure haven't got much to go on. Communications, please. Yes, yeah, Dan Mapes. I uh, want an APB out on... What? Oh, I'll give it to you later. Johnny, the uh, hospital phoned in two minutes ago. Gloria. Yes. They think she's dying. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Todd matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, I take some lessons from a good policeman on how to find out what has to be found out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Dr. King, Police Emergency Hospital. You left word for me to call you, Mr. Dollar? Yes, sir. I'm with Sergeant Mapes. Has there been any change in Miss Tierney's condition? No, sir. No, none. Do you think she'll make it, Doctor? It's hard to say right now. Sometimes they rally. Sometimes not at all. Doctor, it's very important that we see her. 
I don't know whether it'll do any good, Mr. Dollar. We want to question her. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, why don't you and Sergeant Mapes come on over to the hospital? All right, sir, we'll be right there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Todd matter, the burglary that resulted in a shooting. On a tip from an ex-convict named Orrin Vance, I came to New York to question one Gloria Tierney. My information was that she had in her possession an expensive mink coat, part of a $75,000 burglary at the Todd home on Long Island. Gloria Tierney was shot and seriously wounded by an unknown gunman before I was able to question her about the coat. A description of her assailant and how she had obtained the coat were still to be ascertained when Sergeant Dan Mapes and I arrived on the second floor of emergency hospital. Mr. Dollar? Yes. Oh, I'm Dr. King. Oh, yes, this is Sergeant Mapes. How right. do you do? Has she managed to talk yet, Doctor? No, and she may not. I see. Now, before we go in, I hope both of you will carefully frame only your most pertinent questions. Two minutes is about all I can give you with her. Sure, Doctor. Uh, well, better put your cigarettes out in that. Oh, oh yeah. Ego facultate mihi ab apostolia sede tributa indulgentiam plenarium et remissionem omnium peccatorem tibi concedo. Father Deering wanted in his word. Yeah. Et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. All right, Father? Yes. Hmm. Mm. Is she conscious? Oh, just a minute. Yes? yes? She can hear you, I'm sure. You want to go ahead? Oh, I suppose so. Has to be official. Are you Gloria Tierney? Is Gloria Tierney your name? Yes. Do you understand that you're seriously hurt? Do you understand that? Yes. Can you tell us how you came about these injuries, Miss Tierney? Miss Tierney. Bill. Bill. Bill shot you? Yes. Well, what is Bill's full name? Where can we find him? Bill. Where can we find him? Who is he? <laughs> Doctor? Watch out. Nurse, hand me the hypo. Rick! No? This might help. Sorry, fellas. Nothing more I could do. Gloria Tierney died at 3.35 in the afternoon without revealing the full name of the man who had shot her the night before. Expense account item seven, six bucks, drinks. Myself and Sergeant Mapes. Well, we're sure of two things. Are we? Yeah. His name's Bill. And this is the worst whiskey I ever tasted. Uh, there ought to be a law. I think there is, Sergeant. I'm going to ask you something, baby. Outside of the fact that that girl up there died a few minutes ago and was wearing a stolen mink worth $11,000 that you've been wanting to get your hands on, what about her? How does it strike you? She looked like a nice girl. Yeah. She looked like the best kind of girl ever made. What else? What would someone like that be doing in a stolen mink coat? Exactly. What would she be doing with a stolen mink coat? 
Outside of having herself a time with a guy named Bill who gave it to her. You call that having herself a time? I'd like to get drunk. Every bum in town's named Bill. <sighs> this is bad. Terrible. Worst stuff I ever drank. You can say that again, baby. Worst stuff I ever drank. Waiter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bring us two more of the same. Only make them double. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. <laughs> I'm glad to see you aren't fussy, Dolly. Not a bit. Not a lousy bit. You know, I looked at you when you came in my office and I said to myself, I got a wiseacre on my hands. Mm -hmm. I got a wheeling, dealing wiseacre who's got himself a little tip and he's going to keep it all to himself. I said, why do I have to put up with this kind of trouble? Why don't I just toss this bum in the cooler and go about my business? I'm a copper. I got work to do. Why fool with an insurance stick, I said. <laughs> but I'm very happy to see you aren't a fussy fella, baby. Very happy. All right. You made a speech. Now I'll make one. Go ahead. Well, I stood in a hospital room and I watched a human being die. Oh, it's part of my job. Part of your job, too. But for myself, I don't like it. If I have to go into why every man's death diminishes me, I'm going to fall all over myself because I never could go into that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know what you mean. But I'll say this. That girl that died in there was... Well, she was the kind of girl I could have kept right on seeing. Yes, I'd like very much to have knocked on her door almost any old night. Sergeant, I would have liked that more than I could tell. She wore a stolen mink coat. Remember? I remember. I remember. But I can sit here and feel bad about it, can I? You sure can. I'll feel bad with you. Eh, look at them early eaters, Dollar. Coming in to drink their dinners. Don't change the subject. I have to. <laughs> we got work to do, pal. Yeah. Here we are, gentlemen. Oh, as long as it's here. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers yourself. <laughs> oh. Well, there ought to be a law. You said that. I remained with Sergeant Mapes the rest of the day as he continued his investigation of the death of Gloria Tierney and the Todd burglary. The apartment where she'd lived finally yielded some information. Here. There it is. Letters from a Robert J. Tierney in Riverside, California. Looks like her father, maybe. Yeah. I'll have the business office down at headquarters notify him. Hey, what's this? Huh? Picture. Mm -hmm. Nice looking guy. Yeah. Love Bill. <laughs> he loved her all right. Anybody identified this yet? That uh, Mrs. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time you got? Half past. She said she'd be here at six. Hey, Sergeant, did you get anything on the bullets? Well, they didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army Colt. Old model. Pretty good for killing and what gun isn't? Oh, you're right. Hello? Oh, hello, Mrs. Stromberg. We've been waiting for you. Come in. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Do I have to answer any more questions? Oh, a couple, if you don't mind. I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Gloria. Did you ever find out about her family? We're going to contact them right now. Seems they live in Riverside, California. Yes. Yes, I believe that's what she said. I want to ask you one question, Mrs. Stromberg. Take a look at this picture. Yes. Do you know him? Oh, yes, that's Bill. The man Gloria Tierney's been going out with these last few months? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac? Yes, the Cadillac. Oh, I wish I could tell you his full name. Did he do this terrible thing? It looks like it, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear. Have you arrested him yet? We haven't found him yet. Well, I hope you do. I hope you clear this up. I left word for the office to get me here. What about her things? Hello. Her family will probably take charge as soon as they're contacted. Oh, that poor girl. That yeah. poor girl. Uh -huh. So alone now. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Stromberg, did Gloria Tierney ever mention to you that she'd been married? Married? Gloria? Yeah. Why, no, she never mentioned it. Was she? 
Married in the state of New York in 1951. Divorced in 1953. Routine check of vital statistics. What was her husband's name? Bill. Bill Powers. Sergeant Mapes requested immediate file checks on William B. Powers, the ex-husband of Gloria Tierney. From it, he learned he had no criminal record in the state of New York. His home address was up in Westchester County, one of the suburbs of the big city. I drove out there with Sergeant Mapes. Oh, what's this all about? Do you know a woman named Gloria Tierney, Mr. Powers? Well, sure. We were married once. Why? She was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. A glory? Yeah. Are you sure? We're sure. Shot? Oh, oh what, 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 what happened? How could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I can't believe it. Glory, it did. Have you seen her lately? What? Have you? What? Uh, yes. I saw her last week. We had a drink together. Are you sure it's Glory? We'd make sure before we came here with news like that. That's right. Mr. Dollar here isn't a policeman. He's an insurance investigator. Miss Tierney was wearing a stolen mink coat when it happened. Stolen? Are you sure? We're sure. We checked everything, well, Mr. Glory Powers. would never steal anything. She was a fine girl. A wonderful girl. A fool to ever let our marriage go on the rocks. Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? We'd like an identification. What? Oh, uh... Yes, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll get my coat. Excuse me. Want to smoke, Johnny? Yeah, thanks. Well... He isn't the bird in the picture, Johnny. No. Not at all. Still, he... What is it, Johnny? You checked the driveway out there? No. Take a look, the side window. Uh-oh. Yeah. 55 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Sure is, Sergeant. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Todd matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, you find one killer and you find them all. And then... Then you have to start all over again. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Long distance operator, Wilmington, Delaware is calling you. Okay. Go ahead, please. Johnny? I do. Well, this is Don Freed. What's happening there? Your expenses are running away up and we haven't gotten a report from you. I've been too busy. What's that supposed to mean? That's supposed to mean that the tip I got was good and it was bad. Yes, Gloria Tierney, 1231 East 57th Street, had a mink coat that was stolen from the Todd estate. No, she didn't tell me much about it because she got herself shot down in the street last night. Yes, I'm working with the police here trying to find out how she comes by the coat. But what I want... Listen, an hour ago I went out to see an ex-husband of hers. His name's Bill Powers, and he seems to be the bird we're looking for. You know what he did? He cried and blubbered all the way down to the morgue. 
And he's in there right now making a positive identification. I don't blame him for crying. So what's new with you, Mr. Expense Account? Boy, you're a real man-eater today, aren't you? I sure am. Bye. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. Expense account item eight, 20 cents, aspirin. I bought them in a drugstore across the street from the morgue. I figure I needed them. On the way down in the police car, the ex-husband of Gloria Tierney gave us a very little information about her activities up until the time of her death. After he made the identification, we all walked across the street. Expense account item nine, 30 cents, three cups of coffee. Sergeant Mapes, Bill Powers, and myself. Powers cried a while, then straightened out somewhat. I hope you get whoever... Whoever did this terrible thing, Sergeant. I hope you'll get him real fast. You sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Gloria? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. We hope you can, Mr. Powers. Oh, you. You're just interested in that coat she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I think that's a pretty fair way to think right now. But it's not very practical since we already have proof that it is a stolen fur and that she was wearing it. Yeah. How about some more coffee? That's cold. What? Oh, no. Look, we're just trying for the facts of the matter, Mr. Powers. I saw Gloria Tierney. I know what kind of a person she was. We have to start somewhere. You can understand that. Yeah, I suppose so. Now, you told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Even though you were divorced a year or so ago? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know she's been going with someone else, too? Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Bill Chambers. Is that his name, Bill Chambers? Well, yeah, I don't know him, but she talked about him a lot. Here. Take a look at this picture. Is this him? Yeah, that's him. I thought you knew. You're sure this is him? Oh, sure. The picture was in her apartment. I've seen it there. One day I asked her who he was, and Gloria told me about him. Oh, well, what did she tell you about him? She just said she was going out with him. Oh, well, she told me that he asked her to marry him. She said he had a lot of money. Anything else? Oh, uh, I don't know. Does she happen to mention where he works? No. What kind of work he does? No. Do you know where we can get in touch with him? No, no, I don't know that either. I, I can't help you. I only know she's been going out with him. Hmm. I don't get this. You and her were divorced, but you kept on seeing her. And she got this new boyfriend. And she told you things like that? Yeah. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Why'd you bust up? Oh, oh this and that. Kid stuff. I suppose... It was spat over well, this and that. I don't know what exactly... Anyway, we were going to straighten it out. We were going to be married again. Oh, what about this Bill Chambers? No, she didn't want to marry him. She wanted to marry me again. She told me. When? Day before yesterday. She said she... She said she would marry me. Now she's dead. You know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Uh, oh, was she... A Cadillac. How do you know that? Oh, she told me about his car. Another thing, I went out and I bought one myself just like his. I thought it might do me some good with her. We were crazy, weren't we? Where were you last night? Home. Can you prove it? Oh, yeah. Home. All night. I was home while she was out... Getting yourself killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. Twenty-four persons more or less fit the general description of the suspect. It took two days for Sergeant Mapes and his men to track down all the leads. Neither Mrs. Stromberg or Bill Powers could identify any of them. 
An all-points bulletin was issued describing the suspect in his car. Same results, nothing. On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two items that had been taken in the Todd burglary. Uh, there they are, Jenny. Uh-huh. Watch and a ring. Todd lost a watch and a ring with a lot of other stuff. Base numbers in the watch check out. The ring's engraved. Uh-huh, yeah. Now, where were they picked up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor bought them yesterday. A man who signed the buy book used the name James Agenian. Phony? Yeah. Gave an address on Polk Street. That was phony, too. We got a good description from the proprietor. Fitz Chambers, right down the line. Oh, then he was still in town yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. But this stuff's been on the hot sheet for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. Probably trying to raise money to get out of town. What I was thinking. Well, if he keeps on trying to raise money and unload all these things, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. Johnny, we're going to get this, baby. Sergeant Mapes. Where? Okay. He does need money. Huh? They found his car. He used car lot up in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 55 Cadillac for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported that Chambers seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification on William Chambers. Oh, what do you know? William Charles, William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron. One, two, three, seven aliases. Real name, William Charles. Male, Caucasian, age 33. 178, 61. Now, let's see. 14 arrests, two convictions. Both car thefts. Hmm. Quite a boy. Well, we got a real tag on him now. Shouldn't be long before we pick him up. Hmm. Doesn't look like a killer, does he, Jenny? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search for William Charles continued. Associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All denied knowledge of his whereabouts. In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with a Todd burglary were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Expense account item 10, $3, one telegram to four state insurance in Wilmington. Explaining our progress in the case and listing the recovered items. Johnny Dollar. Are you interested in finding Bill Charles? Who's this? My name's... Never mind. Do you want him or don't Sure you? I want him. I'm at Traft's restaurant on 42nd off Broadway. Can you meet me? Yeah. Fifteen minutes. I'm in a gray suit, pinstripe. I'll be sitting alone. I'll watch for you. Expense account item 11, 75 cents, cab fare. From my hotel to Schraff's restaurant. A small, pretty brunette woman in nice clothes was seated at the table all alone. She looked more like a housewife on a shopping tour than someone who might be connected with a bandit and a killer. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Okay, sure. There's a reward posted for William Charles, isn't there? For that Todd matter? That's right. $5,000. Well, I get it if I turn him over to the police. Not all of it. Half of it goes to an ex-convict who tipped me off in the first place. Half? Yes. You don't seem very anxious to get him. Oh, we're anxious. But that's the way it is. This other half of the 5000 is spoken for. I want to get something else straight. What happens to me? What do you mean? I've known he had a part in that Todd matter for a long while. I haven't said anything. Does that make me a party to it or something? I don't know. Well, this is going to get me in trouble. If I have to spend the money for lawyers to keep out of jail, I don't want any part of it. All right. My company will cover that part. Now, where's Charles? Not so fast. I better have something in writing. Something that says your insurance company will pay me a reward and give me help if I get in trouble. I'll talk to them. I'm thinking of the future. I'm going to have one once this is over. Are you? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, how long will it take you to arrange this? Oh, about an hour. I can do it by phone, I guess. That'll be fine. Who are you? Melva Charles. His wife? Yes, that's right. $2,500. Not much for a husband. He's not much of a husband. He was once, but then he had to give away a mink coat and spend time away from me. I see. I doubt it. You people hardly ever see anything. We try. You make the arrangements. I'll meet you again in, say, two hours. Two hours. I gave her a 50-second start before I left the table. When I got out on the street, I was just in time to see her climb into a cab. 
I was trying to hail one to follow her when a black coupe pulled up to the curbing. Come on in, baby. Hey, Mapes. Get in. The light's changing. That is Melba Charles in that cab up there. Yeah, that's who she said she was. She wants to sell you her husband for the reward, doesn't she? Yeah. What's the delay? She wants to be sure she'll be handled right, the money and all. Say, how did you get in on this? <laughs> Very dirty trick, baby. Everybody my men questioned about Charles mentioned your name, where you were staying, and what interest the insurance company had in this matter. Somebody was bound to look you up, especially Mrs. Charles. So we've kept an eye on you. Now where are we, Sergeant? Her name was Melva Thaler before she married Charles. Her old man had a pot of money back in Minnesota. But she couldn't keep out of trouble and got herself disinherited. Money's always been her problem. Isn't it everybody's problem? Not the way it is with her. You should see her record. How much you offer her? Half. The other's spoken for. $2,500. Well, Charles is no good to her now. If he sticks his head out, he'll get caught. So she might as well cash in what she can on him. Hmm. Nice people, eh? Swell. Uh-oh, she's leaving the cab. Get down to the corner and park. Can you see her? She went into the apartment building. Let's go. Which apartment, Johnny? Here we go. Right. Now where? Beats me. Just a minute, Johnny! Now what? Before I went down, I heard it go off a couple more times. It must have been six inches from my head. My eyes couldn't see, and my feet couldn't move. But I could hear. Johnny! Hold on! Hold on, baby! There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Todd Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, there are times when $75,000 worth of stealing isn't worth a plug nickel. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, baby. Dan Mapes. Glad they gave you a telephone in your room. Yeah, that's the only thing good about it. Well, hospitals are designed to make a man impatient. You're a pretty lucky fella at that. Let me tell you about your operation. Yeah, please do. You stopped two slugs. They pried one out of your neck and another one out of your rib cage. Missed your heart by a snake's whisker. I was luckier than Gloria Tierney. Yeah. Yes, you were. I'm on my way up to see you. Don't run out on me. Oh, fat chance. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. Expense account item 11, $3.05, breakfast. I got mad at the nurse when she brought in a bowl of hot cereal and a glass of milk. So I bribed an orderly to slip across the street and get me a tray of bacon and eggs. I was just finishing, same when up came Sergeant Mapes. He looked haggard and tired and worried. You nearly got it for good, baby. I got enough of it. You sure did. What do you remember, if anything? Well, we tailed Melba Charles to an apartment house. We stepped inside, and somebody began trying to kill me. And that's when I left town. Yeah, it was quite a mess. Coroner had a real job in his hands. Yeah. Hey, how about you? Not a scratch. Coroner, did you say? Yeah. Melba Charles got it. Her husband stuffed a butcher knife in her back. Oh. That was for trying to sell him out to you. Yeah. Yeah, maybe he thought he was worth more than 2500 Maybe. A man named Henderson, who happened to be walking down the hall at the wrong minute, took three in the head. He was dead before he hit the floor. A woman on the street got hit, not too bad. Two people outside, just getting into a car, got cut up pretty bad when bullets smashed their windshield. You keeping track of all this? I'm trying to. This all happened after we got there, huh? Yeah. You see, when you and I walked in there, William Charles had just finished killing his wife. He saw us and began pumping. You got hit, and I pumped back at him. You get him? Yeah, but not till he had shot up everybody else. He's on the floor above you, hanging on by a hair. He knew his ticket was up, and he just didn't care. It's my fault you're here, baby. I'd I'd have rather cut off my arm than get you in on this. What do you mean? I'll tagging you and going after her. I didn't use my head. You know what? What? <laughs> I still think you're a pretty good copper, Mapes. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Here, I uh, brought you a book of poetry. Poetry? Read. Take it easy. We'll be talking again soon. I felt awful. Sergeant Mapes dropped in later that afternoon, but I was half asleep. Vaguely, I remember they wheelchaired me down the hall for x-rays and lab tests. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, the morning paper. The story of the shooting was splashed all over page one, and the solution to the Gloria Tierney killing in part. Slugs from William Charles' gun were matched with those that had killed Gloria Tierney. No mention was made of any loot from the Todd burglary being found in the Charles apartment. Between back rubs and sleeping pills, I worried about that. I didn't worry too much about the fact that William Charles, killer, gunman, burglar, was dying in the room directly above me. About midnight, Mafe showed up with a wheelchair. There we are. Now, you all ready to go up and see what he has to say? Yeah, sure, I guess so. I still have to finish my job. Uh, let's take it easy now. All right. Hey, a week. Is it? That won't last long. There. Now, here we go, baby. It was the second time within a week I'd been in a hospital room with a dying person. The first one had been a young and beautiful woman who had been shot by the man who now lay dying of police bullets. What did they... What did they say? You know what they say, Charles. You haven't got a prayer. Uh, I didn't mean to kill Gloria. I didn't mean it at all. I want you to know that. You took a lot of pains to do it. I was there, remember? Yeah, I remember. Sorry. Been doing pretty good with those... Those house jobs at Todd Place, another one in St. Louis. Doing all right. Enough to buy a nice car, live in a decent place, get around a little bit. Work all along. I met her. I liked her, wanted to marry her. I did. Really did. You already had a wife. You think I'm kidding? I gave her a mink coat, didn't I? Thought that it cinch. She didn't want to take it. Told me she was going to marry some other guy. Some guy she'd been married to before. I got mad. I came back that night, let her have it. At all? <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's it. That's it, mister. You take it or leave it. How did you meet her? 
Mutual friend. What friend? Ah, uh, none of your business. All right, this is my business. Where's the rest of the stuff? What stuff? The stuff you took from the Todd place. <laughs> Where have you got it? <laughs> oh, what's funny? You, you think I'd tell you that? Oh, what's the difference now? Uh, <laughs> Come on, what's the difference now? Oh, it's a laugh, you know. You know what? I'd die before I tell you. <laughs> He died, and he didn't tell me. Not a word. Later, a private ambulance took me from police emergency hospital to my hotel room. Three days after that, I was able to get back on my feet. I went right down to MAPE's office at headquarters. How do you feel? Uh, better now. Boy, you sure look lousy. Here, sit down, baby. All right, thanks. <laughs> Should you be out of bed? Yeah, sure, sure. You're lying and you know it. Oh, I suppose so. Well, how's it going? You mean have we located the rest of the stuff? No, not a lick of it. <laughs> Funny guy, wasn't he? He had his last laugh. Well, you shouldn't be worrying about this stuff now. You ought to be taking care of yourself. I am. I'm sitting here helping you worry. I'm not worried about anything. You're worried about the same thing I am. Where's all the rest of the Todd stuff? Oh, uh, it'll turn up somewhere. Why, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Stromberg. I read about what happened to you in the papers. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, well, I'm better now. Well, come in. Come in, please. Thanks. Say, you, you'd you better sit down, Mr. Dollar. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Uh, do you have any bourbon? Why, yes, I think so. All right, so. I'll take that. Well, all right. Is water okay? Yeah, sure, fine. Should you be out of bed, Mr. Dollar? You know, everybody asks that. No, no, I shouldn't, and yet I should. Well, here you are. Oh, thanks. Well, here's cheers. You remember the night Gloria was shot? Of course, very well. You know, I've been worried about that night. Huh? Uh-huh. Remember I came over here and I told you I was in the insurance business and you said you'd have her call me when she came in? Yes. Well, I remember pretty clearly you said you'd have her call me when she came in, not if you saw her come in. Yes, did I? Uh Uh-huh. You saw to it that she called me, Mrs. Stromberg. You also saw to it that she wasn't here to meet me when I got here. She was out, out there somewhere. Because by then you knew I was an insurance investigator. I don't understand you, Mr. Dollar. What are you trying to say? You sent her out so he could take care of her, and you were waiting in the hall for me. Waiting for you? Why, no, I happened to see you, and I wondered You wondered what kind of cock and bull story you could give me to get rid of me. That's silly. They sound that way. That's a good drink. But not so silly if you knew that coat she was wearing was stolen and that I was after it and her. How would I possibly know that? Because you introduced her to one of your friends one night and he went overboard for her, and eventually he gave her that little present... Are you saying that I had anything to do with Gloria's trouble? Yeah. Why, that's silly. Oh, here's something sillier. A small-time burglar and thief lay on a hospital bed yesterday and wouldn't tell me how he met Gloria Tierney. Oh, he was a real gallant one, this bird. He killed an innocent girl because she was wearing a mink coat might tell me who gave it to her. Mr. Dollar. He shot up two or three people in an apartment, including me. He got shot himself. He knew he was dying. But a simple thing like telling me how he met her wouldn't come out. He wouldn't tell me that for anything. Now, where could he meet her? Was he her kind? Did he go in the same circles? Did he? Nah. He was introduced by a mutual friend, Mrs. Stromberg. You, the manager of the apartment house. No. Something else he wouldn't tell me. What happened to the rest of the loot from the Todd burglary? Two things he wouldn't tell me. He didn't have to when I sat down and thought it out. You've been working with him right along. You've been keeping all the stuff here. That's fantastic. Not so fantastic at all, Mrs. Stromberg, when you think that his wife, and she was a girl who'd do anything for money, they tell me, was willing to sell him to me for 2,500 bucks. (laughs) 2,500 bucks. When there's still over $60,000 worth of loot from the Todd burglary lying around. She didn't know where it was. But you do, Mrs. Stromberg. Well, if you say I do, I do. Now what? 
Let's go down to Sergeant Mapes. Oh, no, I... I'd like a good excuse to use this. Yes. Suppose you would. If I can't charm you or plead with you, can I buy you? You could have prevented her death. You practically ordered it. What is it you want? You. Behind bars. <laughs> You're silly. But I'll go. For a while, it did look silly. Mapes and his men searched the apartment house from top to bottom and found no trace of the Todd loot. That is, until they found a movable cement block in the basement. Well, the Todd matter ended with a 90% recovery of the stolen items. About $70,000 in dollars and cents. In lives, Gloria Tierney, one innocent bystander, and William Charles. For me, let's see. Expense account item 14, $162.30. Hotel and board, one in New York. Item 15, $17.40. Airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Item 18, $230. Miscellaneous. Expense account total... $1,095. Remarks? Nil. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a music lesson on a priceless Amati violin. Music and mystery and danger. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Vivi Janice, Barbara Fuller, Shirley Mitchell, Lawrence Dobkin, Frank Gerstel, and Marvin Miller. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual. Harry, what are you doing in town? I'm not. At least not in your town. But you've got a case for me. Do you know anything about violins? Oh, don't tell me. So he opened up his fiddle case and out came a submachine gun, that it? John, that technique went out with prohibition. Now, seriously, this case contains a genuine Amati. Good. What's an Amati? One of the finest, most expensive violins ever made. This one was insured for $30,000. Was? Yes. Now, someone has to find it for us. What's more? Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item 1, 1240, train fare and incidentals to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I took the train because Harry Branson didn't seem to be in any particular hurry, and I kind of like a slow look at the countryside this time of year. 
When I got to Philadelphia, I checked in at the Bellevue Stratford, shaved and showered, then went over to Harry Branson's office in the Security First building on Walnut Street. You deceived me, John. I thought when we talked long distance that you'd be here right away. But instead of flying down... Old Sobersides Branson Possibly hadn't a changed a bit. Time. I Hair a little grayer than the last I time I'd seen him, perhaps. I hear further from but still the same me. serious lad who always anything, acted he as though he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Uh, I feel a deep personal concern over the whole matter because it was a man I put in this office myself who issued the policies, both of them. Two policies on this fiddle you were talking about? No, John. One on the Amati violin, $30,000. Yeah. And one on Ricardo Amerigo himself for $20,000. Who is Ricky? Who? Well, isn't that what you said his name is? I'm sure I didn't mention anyone but... Oh, 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 Ricardo Amerigo, yes, yes. Well, uh, where's he playing? The Purple Cat or uh, maybe Wee Willie's joint over on... John, this this man is a concert violinist, or was. He's disappeared. Now, please, no more levity. (laughs) Sorry, Earl. It's Harrison. Sorry, Harry. All right. I'm quite all right. Now, I I realize that you have quite a sense of humor, John, but in a matter as important as this... Yeah, sure. Now, let's have the story. (laughs) Very well. A few years ago, Ricardo Amerigo was one of the world's leading concert violinists. As famous in London, Paris, Rome, as in the concert halls of this country. Uh Ah, such virtuosity, almost unbelievable. I shall never forget one evening here in our Academy of Music. He had just finished a perfectly brilliant Vinyovsky. Amazing technical performance. Yeah, well... And uh, for an encore, he played Sarasate Sapatiado. Even more brilliant. Harry... Uh, but the audience wouldn't let him leave the stage. Ricardo Amarigo... Has disappeared. Oh, oh, yes. And you're in a hurry to get on with the case. I'm sorry. Now, thinking of his superlative performance that night carried me away for... <clears throat> yes, he, he's dead. Disappeared. And the violin? No trace. Dead? He didn't say that before. I know. You see, there's no proof of death. No body. Disappeared. Well, uh, don't let me shock your finer sensibilities, Harry. Murder? We have thought of that, of course. Who's we? The Port Morris police. Port Morris, New Jersey, that is. Oh. Yes, you see, since Amerigo's car went through the bridge rail, crashed right through it and plunged into the river stream... Trying to tie Harry down to pertinent facts that would help me in my investigation was, uh, well, futile. At least three times during the next half hour, he went off on glowing descriptions of violent recitals he had known. Heifetz, Selman, Chrysler, and so on. But he did come up with one of two things I wanted. First, Amerigo and his fiddle had been driving down from Philadelphia to some spot on the South Jersey seashore. Crossing an old wooden bridge over a little stream, an inlet from the ocean, the car had smashed through the guard rail and gone to the bottom of the inlet. The car, of course, was found. Amerigo and his violin, no. Second, and just as important, the name of the beneficiary of Amerigo's policies. Item two on expense account, one dollar even. Taxi to the Harnell Building, also on Walnut Street, in the office of Peter Corbin, Amerigo's booking agent. The building was plush, but Corbin's office was about as bare as I'd ever seen. An old beat-up desk, a battered filing cabinet, and a couple of straight chairs. That was it. Come in, Dollar. Come in. Sit up. Sit up. Corbin was chewing the stub of a cigar that he'd forgotten to relight for at least a couple of days. We made with the usual howdy do's Well, your man Branson told you exactly right, Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo's sole and only beneficiary. Well, isn't that a bit unusual for a man's agent to be his heir? Or uh, was it because you were all personal friends? I'm going to give it to you straight. <clears throat> I brought Amerigo over to this country. Myself, my own sole expense. I actually gave him the build-up. I started his whole entire career. I kept him on top, all at my own expense. Well, didn't you collect a regular agent's commission on his own? Oh, sure, sure. Plenty more. Why kid about it? Sure, while he was working. What's that supposed to mean? Bottle. What? Yeah, started hitting the bottle. Bad, not good. And believe me, the word gets around fast. Instead of making me money, himself too, because he started costing me money. But you see, he never saved anything, even when he was earning big. You know how these artists are. Yeah, I've heard. Well, it's the same with all of them. He got in debt actually up to his ears. And nobody, no with no family, no relatives, nobody to pull him out. Nobody but me. Big-hearted corp. So you had him take out a lot of insurance and name you as beneficiary? Well, that was his idea, actually. Of course, he always did have the Amati insured. That's his violin. Oh, uh, so I learned. Oh, you know about violins? No. Oh. Well, but the life insurance, that was his own idea. Double indemnity, all that sort of stuff. Double indemnity? Oh, yeah. But guess who had to dig up the moolah for the last couple of premiums? <laughs> Big-hearted yeah. Corbin. You're right. Not a bad investment, though, was it? What? Hey... A couple of thousand in premiums, and you stand to collect plenty. If we can find proof that he's dead, and if we can't recover the... I don't like that, Dollar. I don't either, Corbin. It doesn't smell good. Oh, you think me, his own agent, actually rigged something like that for one of my best friends? 
You think that... Listen, wise guy. Even if I did have any any of a such idea, it'd be crazy. Anything actually is as is, is, is obvious as that. Well, sometimes the most obvious is the best cover. Oh, get out of here, Dollar. Unless you want somebody to start collecting on your insurance. Even if it isn't you, huh? Get out! So help me. Yeah, pretty obvious. And every time you open your mouth... Oh, oh no, you don't. Why is it that people who telegraph their punches are always the first to start swinging? Uh, I don't know. Anyhow, I left Corbin to pick himself up and start thinking about some alibis he might need. And in the camp back to my hotel, I did a lot of thinking myself. Sure, the obvious off times is the best cover-up. And yet it might be too obvious. Far too obvious. Branson here? Johnny Dollar here. Oh, uh, John, good. Listen, at least there'll be no double indemnity to pay in the Amerigo matter. For accidental death, that is. You see... Wait a minute. About an hour ago, you weren't even sure he's dead. Did somebody find the body? Uh, no, unfortunately, but I've just received a call from the Port Morris police. They completed their examination of Amerigo's car. Uh, after they pulled it out of the creek, of course. I hope so. John, they found conclusive evidence of murder. Harry, I'll call you from Port Morris. <laughs> Expense account, item two. Subway, ferry, train, and bus fares to South Vineland, New Jersey. South Vineland, because Ed Bowles lived there, and I knew that if anything, anything at all happened in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, Ed would know about it. Retired and raising some of those wonderful South Jersey sweet potatoes and peaches with plenty of hired help, he amused himself by moseying around, getting to know everybody and everything that happened in his section of the state. He had an insatiable curiosity and money enough to keep it satisfied. Hi, you conniving, chiseling son of a gun. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to get here. What took you so long? Hey, what was that conniving, chiseling crack, son? We're still on expense account, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Sure, but... and so help me, nobody in history ever had the knack of padding out an expense account the way you can. And collect those fancy commissions on top. I, when I was a private investigator... Who is retired? <laughs> You call this retired 270 acres of sandy soil from which to try to wrestle the poor oh, living? Oh, no, wait a minute. That, that Cadillac El Dorado out front, that belongs to one of the hired hands. 983 right? peach trees. And that isn't that a landing field I see out there through the window? A lot of sweet potato land to be cultivated. Well, yes. Hey, why didn't you fly down or let me know and I'd have picked you up? Look, with all the time I have on oh, I my I thought hand, you said you were very yeah, busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long are you going to stay so I can figure out where we'll go or what we'll do? Ed, I'm on a case. Well, sure. Ricardo Amerigo and his priceless fiddle. Oh, no. It was easy. When I heard about him going over the bridge, I contacted Barney Peters of the Port Morris PD. From Barney, I learned all about the next of kin. It, his agent, that is. Pete Corbin. Right. And that boy at Philadelphia Mutual, Harry Branson. And I knew Branson wouldn't call anybody but you in on the case... So, here you are. Still a private eye, aren't you, Ed? <laughs> Gotta have some way of killing time. And I suppose you have the whole case solved. Yep. Well, according to Harry Branson, who heard from the Port Morris police just before I left Philly, it was murder. Oh, you point killer. I thought I'd be the one to tell you that. No, sorry. The cops knew it first. Second, I told them. Huh? Yeah, I showed them where somebody'd used a hacksaw on the steering arm of Amerigo's car when they dragged it out of the creek. Ah. Ah, so that was it. Yep. And who wielded the hacksaw? Well, Pete Corbin. Who else? Why? Who else stood to benefit by Amerigo's sudden trip to the great beyond? Oh, no, no, no. It's too easy, Ed. What's more, he's the only one who had constant and complete access to Amerigo's car. Why, he not only mothered little Ricky, clothed and fed him and kept him in booze, but he paid his rent, swept out his apartment, serviced his car. No, it's too easy. And Johnny... That car was even kept locked in Pete Corbin's own garage. And Corbin had the only key. Where did you learn that? From Corbin's landlord. By phone, of course. Said he thought Corbin did that so Ricky couldn't go out driving when he was drunk. And me? I think it was the other way around. He'd only let him drive when he was drunk, huh? Instead of a good chance of smashing up what would look like accidental death. So that Corbin would collect the double indemnity. It's open and shut. <laughs> Any proof, Sherlock? Ha! Ah, just get to Corbin, throw it all at him, and break him down. Maybe he'll even find the hacksaw tucked up his sleeve. Ah. 
Too easy. Any bets that it isn't Corbin? Yeah, yeah, I'll bet you. You name it. My commission on the case. I'll match it. Oh, and uh, plus your expense account. Look, Ed, I want to see that car and the bridge and the creek, anything else I can find. Sure, sure, I'll fly you down there. Then we can go on over to Atlantic City, hit some of the night spots. Your treat. You know, so we can build up the expense account enough for me to collect plenty. Ed Bowles had been a pretty good investigator in his day. Seldom gone off half-cocked. Yet all his evidence was purely circumstantial. And where was the body? What's more, Pete Corbin acted anything but scared. Or so I thought until I put through a routine call to Harry Branson. He was worried. He had a right to be. Pete Corbin had packed a bag, jumped into his car, and disappeared. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a soggy day in a soggy South Jersey swamp. And a discovery almost too good to be true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Barney Peters, Fort Mars Police. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Thought you and Adam Bowles were coming over here to look at the evidence in the murder of Ricardo Amarigo. We are. Ed's out warming up his plane. That's why I answered his phone. We got a visitor here in Port Mars. Who? The guy Ed thinks did the job. Pete Corbin, Amarigo's booking agent? That's right. In Port Morris? That's right. Well, are you holding him? I can't. No legal reason to, in spite of Ed's suspicions. Well, what's Corbin doing there? I don't know, unless Ed's right about him. Huh? And Pete knows you're on his trail. Well, what's that mean? What could mean he's down here gunning for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Port Morris, New Jersey. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Item three, one dollar even. For whatever it was, the local druggist recommended to pull my stomach back together after the flight in Ad Bull's private plane from Ed's farm in South Vineland to Port Morris. In a sense, I'm glad we flew. In a car with Ed at the wheel, we'd have been all over the road. As it was, we were only all over the sky. A oh, beautiful day for flying, isn't it, Johnny? Can't you hold a straight course, Ed? What's the matter with this ship? Oh, not a thing. I like to weave around a bit. I like the feel of it. You know, all that power under you. Yeah. 
sure you're not just trying to scare me into welching on our little bet? I'm going to win that bet, Johnny. Your commission on the case, plus all that goes on that well-padded expense account of yours. You just get busy and find the body. Why don't you forget your dark past as a private eye and stay retired? What? And leave an old friend like you floundering around with a case that's... Hey! You don't watch your steering will be floundering around in those salt marshes down there. Sorry. But can't you see, Johnny, Pete Corbin, Amerigo's agent, has to be the heavy. He's the beneficiary of Amerigo's policy. Amerigo owed him a lot of money. Too easy. And Pete's the only person we know of who was with Amerigo constantly. We got motive, opportunity. Too easy, I tell you. But I wonder what under the sun Pete's doing in Port Morris. Ah, uh, that we'll be finding out. We'll land there in a couple of minutes now. The little town of Port Morris was set on the edge of one of the wide salt marshes that border a lot of the South Jersey shore. Just a vast expanse of salt hay and dented with little coves and inlets. Soggy, swampy country. Ideal breeding place for the famous Jersey mosquitoes. And I guess for me, the ideal breeding place for trouble. Sergeant Barney Peters met us at the mucky little landing strip just outside town. And we headed out on a narrow, muddy road across the marshes. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. If I were you, I'd try to pin down this Corbin. Where is he now? Back in town. Got Alf McCracken keeping an eye on him. Alf support you so Amerigo crashed through the bridge that night, you know. Barney, I still wish you'd cooked up something to hold him. But what, Ed? Sure, Ed. Every bit of evidence you think you've got on Corbin is purely circumstantial. What else have you got to go on, John Boy? Oh, we'll see. We'll see. After I have a look at the bridge Amerigo busted through in his car. It's just up ahead a bit. Crosses the Lucky Hole Creek. I'd also like to know who could have... Well, I'd like to know what could have happened to his body. To that $30,000 Amati violin. You'll see. Just keep in mind that there's a mighty big flow of water in the creek from the tide coming in and going out. Hmm. Tell me, Sergeant. Johnny, I checked it. Huh? Tide had just turned, was on its way out to the ocean at the time Amerigo's car went over the bridge. Right, Barney? That's correct, Dad. Right now, though, it's probably about as low as it'll... Whoa! What's the matter? Just pulling over to let this car that's coming pass us. Otherwise, one of us might shear off into the swamp. Yeah, these roads weren't meant for two-way traffic. John Poole's coming pretty fast for a road like this. He isn't careful. Hey, look, Pennsylvania plates. Huh? He's right. That's Corbin's car. Corbin, huh? Swing across the road, block him. Wait! Son of a gun. Now, where's Corbin, all right? Well, then swing around. Go after him. On this road? You'd slide off into the swamp so fast... By the time we go on up to the bridge and turn, he'll be halfway back to Philadelphia, blasted. Well, we had the bird in hand and didn't know it. What are you going to do now, Johnny? Just exactly what we started out. To You're do. losing valuable time. Now, if I were still oh, in this... Oh, Ed, why don't you stay retired? We drove slowly on up to the bridge, stopped and got out. And although the tide was almost low now, it was easy to see how that rush of water would easily carry a violin or a body or most anything right out to sea. Or could it? The tide was running the same way when it happened. Out. Yeah. And the current was a lot stronger than it is now, so you can imagine what it would... Huh? Yeah. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, that, uh, that big bird nest, whatever it is, down there at the side of the creek, 50, 60 feet. Oh, that's just where the reeds and hay got matted up. It does look like... Hey. Yeah. If that isn't a fiddle case propped up on top of it... Sure looks like sure one. Sure it is. Sure. The tide was higher then. The fiddle stuck in those reeds. Wait here. Why not, Johnny Jones? You come back here. Dollar! Dollar's like quicksand. Stay out of it! Are you done? Fool! It was come like quicksand, too. You'll never make it! Black, glowy muck. And I sank into it up to my knees. I almost had to swim through it, hanging on to it, pulling myself along by the reeds and bulrushes. But half of this case hung on that $30,000 Amati violin, and I wasn't going to let it slip out of my hands. A couple of times I dropped into soft holes, almost up to my shoulders, but somehow I kept going. Pulled the fiddle case off the pile of matted weeds and started back. But it used up most of my strength. With only one hand to pull, to pull myself along to... Ed! Ed! Johnny! Johnny, try and grab this rope! Here! Can't breach! Try it again, Ed. Try it fast. Try it again. Johnny, use the violin case. You keep your float. I... I'll try. You all right, Alan? Alan! Here, Johnny! 
I hadn't passed out. So help me, I hadn't. Not entirely, that is. Or I'd never have been able to grab the line that Ad Bulls threw to me. Needless to say, I took a lot of kidding from Ad and Barney Peters on the drive back to Fort Morris. Especially since I didn't really know what had happened until I came to in the back seat of the car clutching the fiddle case. Jerk. If you'd held onto the rope with the death grip you have on that violin case, we'd have got you out of that muck before you swallowed half the salt water in that inlet. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll say this for you, Mr. Dollar. You don't give up easy. The fiddle. The $30,000 Amati. At least I had half of this miserable case in hand in my hands. There'd be no insurance collection on that violin. And then I saw it. Well, what's the matter, Johnny? You passed out again? No. No, Ed. You should have cleaned me up before you piled me into this car. What? Look. Well, what is it? Piece of shirt. Ricardo Amerigo's shirt. Is that? Yeah, look. Monogram on the pocket, R.A. And what looks like bloodstains. Hey, you're right. Where'd you get that? I must have picked it up when I picked up the fiddle. Well, at least it proves that Amerigo went down with his car. There's no doubt of it. What I didn't tell him was that the piece of cloth from Ricardo Amerigo's shirt was fastened to the violin case. Deliberately put there. But by whom? By Pete Corbin, Johnny. That's your man. Are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Beneficiary, confidant, caretaker of both Ricky Amerigo and his car... Who else could have sawed through the steering bar that made the car run off the bridge? And a guy who was smart enough to have it happen in this godforsaken salt marsh. Now, just a minute, Ed. Okay, Barney, in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, where he expected nobody to find car or body or even the fiddle until long after the insurance claim was met. Thanks to a tide that'd carry everything out to sea. For indeed, my friend, if your deputy, Alf McCracken, hadn't actually seen Amerigo's car slip through the bridge rail... It... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. If Pete Corbin had planned this whole thing, he would have made sure the corpus delecti would be found. Johnny, that's why he had the accident happen where somebody saw it. Yet that somebody, Alf McCracken, didn't see the fiddle float away, didn't see the body float away from the car. Oh, stop it, John boy. You know as well as I do that this whole thing was engineered by Corbin. All right, tell me, investigator, what was he doing down here today? Lord knows, and I don't care. Probably to plant that piece of shirt. Johnny, I've given you all the help I'm gonna on this case. From now on, you either follow my tip and lose your bet to me, or you don't, and give yourself a black eye with insurance Foy. company. Johnny. Oh, uh, yeah, Barney. That's a good detective. He'd have to be to retire on that nice farm of his over in South Vineland. He even broke a burglary case for me once here in Fort Morris a couple of years ago when I couldn't break myself. Ah, pastime. But you've got guts. I like you for it. Thanks a lot. And to me, the Pete Corbin theory looks, well, too easy. Oh, not you, Barney. That's what I've been trying to preach to that stubborn egghead sitting beside you. I'll lend you a suit of clean clothes, and you can chase this thing down the way you want to, without the dubious help of somebody who's just trying to win a bet from you. Traitor. And if I were you, I'd hunt up a few other people who knew Ricky Amerigo besides his press agent, Pete Corbin. You are a mind reader. Gentlemen, I have only one thing to say. And, Johnny, it's addressed to you. When you finally find that Pete Corbin done it, you know where to send the check to me. At Port Morris, we learned that Alf McCracken had lost track of Corbin when the former dropped in at Osborne's Oyster House for a dozen and a half show. Hadn't even seen him take off in his car, much less leave in a hurry after spotting us on the road to Lucky Hole Creek. I took advantage of Barney's offer, borrowed a suit of his clothes, and accepted a ride from him to the crossroads of Woodbine where I could get a bus back to Philadelphia. Sure, half my job was done. I'd recovered the $30,000 Amati violin. But I could still hear the oh-so-pleasant voice of Ad Bowles, ex-investigator, not so retired. You know where to send the check to me, Johnny boy. Expense account item five, $4.95. Bus fare from Woodvine to Philadelphia. And believe me, it's a long bus ride. As soon as I got to my hotel and changed into my own clothes, I called Harry Branson at the insurance company. Mr. Branson here. This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Branson. Yes, Mr. Uh, 
John. Yeah, I'm back at my hotel, music lover. And I've just won the $30,000 Amati. What? Yeah, I got the fiddle for you. Oh, thank heaven you recovered it. Uh, what of Ricardo Amarigo? Uh, later. Do you want the Amati? I'll be right over. Where is it, John? Where is it? Right here, Harry. Right here. Case, bow, and all. Oh, thank heaven. And by some miracle, it's dry as a bone and all in one piece. Voila. Oh, thank heaven. John. John. What's the matter? This? An Amati? Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the results of a poker game. And believe me, there are times when the cards can be really stacked against you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Yeah, Pete Corbin, Dollar. I found your message when I got in, but I don't know why I'm returning your call after that lacing I took from you. Well, at least you haven't run out on us. Why should I? How would you like to explain what you were doing in Port Morris, New Jersey yesterday afternoon at the scene of the so-called accidental death of your client, Ricardo Amarigo? Oh, yeah, I, th I, th I thought that was you I saw in that car down there. It sure was. Are you in your office? Yeah, that's right. I thought you wanted well, to stay know. there. I do want to know. That and a lot of other things. I'll see you in about an hour after I've made another call. Okay, okay. I'll be here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of further expenses during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item six. $33.75. Dry cleaning and new shirts, socks and so on, including one pair of shoes to replace the ones I lost in the South Jersey swamp while rescuing what I thought was a priceless Amati violin in a muddy tidewater inlet called Lucky Hole Creek. But when I showed it to Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual, well, at least he promised to have an expert look it over and pass final judgment. That's the reason for item 7, 85 cents, taxi to Harry's office in the security first building. Oh, come in, John, come in. Hi, Harry. Well, what have you found out? Nothing yet, but I should hear from the violin man any minute. John, I do hope I was wrong. Let's sit down. Thanks. Harry, I could have committed mayhem when you told me that fiddle I picked up in the swamp isn't the Amati. 
To think you nearly drowned retrieving it. Oh, brother, that's putting it mildly. But I'm sure Foresto will know. Foresto? Uh, Foresto Sir Negliario, uh, however he pronounces it, the violin man. He really an expert? Well, he's the one who okayed the $30,000 policy on Amerigo's violin. Uh, let's just hope this one's it. Did you learn anything in Port Morris? Only confirm what you'd already learned from Sergeant Peters down there. That someone had sawed through some steering connection on Amerigo's car before it crashed through the bridge. Yeah. Still no sign of the body? Nope. Oh, uh, a man named Adam Bowles called. Oh, he's an old friend. Used to be a private detective and just can't get it out of his system. Oh. Well, he called me, you know. I know. And I must confess, John, that I'm inclined to agree with him. That Peter Corbin, Amerigo's agent, did it? Agent and beneficiary, John. And apparently the one person who knew Amerigo well enough... I said it to Ad Bowles until I was blue in the face, Harry, and I say it again. Too easy. But who else? I don't know. That's what I came back here to find out. All the evidence... Circumstantial evidence. The kind of man that'd be a fool to let pile up against him if he really was guilty. Hmm. Even so... Harry, let me do it my own way, huh? What if this Corbin tries to skip out? Then will be the time to... He's getting Yes. Uh, Mr. Sherney Arrow to see you, sir. Sherney Arrow. I, I knew that was it. Uh, send him in. Our man is here, John. Foresto? Yes, uh, sure. Oh, well. Uh, come in, uh, <clears throat> Foresto. Meet Mr. Dollar. Yes, yeah, How do you do, Mr. Dollar? You brought the fiddle? Yeah. Uh, right here on the desk. Well? Um, thank you. I'll open up the case. Well, is it? Mr. Branson, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure. Well? Well, Mr. Cherniero? Cherniero. Look, you've only got to look. Now that I have cleaned away some of the mud and the salt from the swamp where it was found, we're lucky it did not do any real damage to change the appearance. But nobody could tell the way you gave it to me. Well, how about now that you've cleaned it up? Yes. Ah, you see here. The shape of the F holes. The curve to the belly. Yeah. The beautiful shape. The signs of age. And above all, here, you see, the label. Label? Through the F hole, you can see it. There. Nicolo Amati. Then it is Amarillo's. See. Si. You're sure, Mr. Chaniero? Hmm. The label says. And Foresto says. Well, look, I talked with a fiddle player in the orchestra at my hotel last night. He told me there are literally thousands of imitations of every important violin ever made. Shape, size, label, and all. Now, listen, Foresto. Yeah. Tell me the truth. Do you really consider yourself an expert? Well, I'm, uh, I'm a seller of violins in my store. Violins, harmonicas, ocarinas, victrolas. How good are the violins you sell? Oh, so good ones. Some as high as $65. Harry, do you mean to tell me... With all due apologies, Foresto, do you mean to tell me he was your authority for a $30,000 policy on Ricky Amarigo's violin? Well, of course, a representative from the Wurlitzer Collection in Chicago verified Foresto's opinion at the time. Gee, we are Wurlitzer know every good violin in the world. Yeah, Harry, let me have it. I'll give you a receipt for it. I'll bring it back when I'm through with it. Whatever you say, John. I assume you want to check further on the authenticity. And you are right. John. Yeah. To put it bluntly... You've still not accomplished very much insofar as Amerigo himself is concerned. With this fiddle under my arm, I think maybe I will. See you later. Maybe Harry had been right in the very beginning. Maybe I should have known a little more about music, or more specifically, violins. Or maybe I should have left this aspect of the case to someone else and concentrated on the disappearance death of Ricardo Amerigo. Maybe I... Uh, well... Expense account item eight, 80 cents. Taxi to booking agent Peter Corbin's office. All right, Dollar, let's not waste either your time or either mine. You want to know what I was doing? That's right, Corbin. The Amati. I found it right where you planted it, in that swamp near Port Morris. You actually found the tank to... What do you mean where I planted it? What else were you doing down there in the South Jersey swamps? Is that where you found it? Well, you ought to know. But frankly, Corbin... I think you overplayed it a bit when you tucked part of one of Amerigo's monogram shirts there with it. I don't know what you're talking about. Actually, I mean it. Then what were you doing down there? And, brother, you better make it good. The same thing you were, trying to find out what happened to Ricky Amerigo. I tell you, Dalla, I was his best friend. It's a true fact. If his fiddle was down there, too, I didn't see it. I wish I could believe you. 
By the way it looks from here, you were willing to have the Amati violin found lying out there in that salt marsh because you couldn't get rid of it without exposing yourself. It didn't put any money in your pocket the way you figure Amerigo's death will. The way it looks from here, Dollar, that's where you're wrong. Yeah? Yeah, actually wrong. If Amerigo's dead, I collect in his insurance as his beneficiary. That's what the policy says, but believe all right, me. All right. But you think I wouldn't collect on the Amati fiddle, whether it was found or if it wasn't found. That's where you're wrong. What are you talking about? Because I'm also a beneficiary to his will. How do you know? <laughs> because I'm not only the sole and only heir in his will, I'm also the executive of... Uh, yeah, executive of his estate, too. Oh. Yeah. So if I was the heavy, what would I take a chance leaving a $30,000 fiddle laying around in some swamp? Hmm? Cover up? $30,000 worth? All right, what did you do with a hacksaw? You mean somebody sawed up the fiddle? Oh, no, let me see. No, 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 easy, will you? Somebody sawed partway through a steering arm on Amerigo's car to make it crash. Murder? Well, that's a pretty fair question. Oh, no, oh, no, darling, no. Oh, no, who would murder a nice, sweet guy like Ricky? Maybe he was a drunk, maybe he hit the skids, but he had no enemies. He couldn't have. Okay. Please. Maybe he was just a drunken bum, worthless. He threw away a concert career, but he was still... He was a gentleman. An actual gentleman. And he was a sweet guy. Nobody could have murdered him. Oh, no, no, darling, not Rick. Pete, Pete, would you... Who was it? Tell me, huh? Who was the lousy punk? I'll kill him. Okay, Pete, I believe you. I don't care whether you believe me or not. Will you tell me who done it? Pete. Rick. Pete, will you listen to me? I'm listening. Now, look here. Look here and tell me. Is this Ricky's Amati violin? Yeah, that's... That's it. Ah, oh, poor Ricky. Poor drunk. You're lover. sure? I'm sure. All right, Pete, I'm going to give it to you straight. All I ask is you now tell me, me will you? Would... We don't know who killed Ricky Amerigo. We haven't even found his body. The Port Morris police are still trying, of course, but it... It could have been carried by the tide through that in, inlet, the Lucky Hole Creek, right on out to the sea. Or, of course, it may appear somewhere along the creek. It'll take weeks to search that swamp thoroughly. Now, Anyhow... If they do find him, I want to see he gets a decent burial. Will you promise me? Okay, I'll try, but listen, will you? Because of the sawed-through steering arm, his death was made to look accidental. Double indemnity. And you're the beneficiary. He not only wasn't making you any money because his drinking kept him off the concert stage, but he owed you money, plenty. Now, that's a motive... As for opportunity, who else had as All much right, as you? Nobody, nobody, nobody. But I love the poor guy. I try to keep him alive you to get him back me, in his own. You told me, and I believe you. But the fact remains that the insurance company, the police, even a pretty smart private detective I know, all figure you for number one suspect. And they hope to accumulate enough evidence to move in on and you. And you're with them, no, huh? No, no. What? Yesterday right here you sure, told me. Sure, I know I did. But I've had time to think it out. Now, pinning it on you is just too easy. Much too easy. I'll say it to your face, Pete. You're no metal giant. But only another fool would let circumstantial evidence like that pile up against him and then commit a murder like that. I may be wrong. Lord help you if I am and find out. But I think you're clean. I swear I am. I'm going to play it that way unless I find solid reason to change my mind. Because, Pete... Yeah, Johnny? You're the one person who can help me in this case. Uh, I'll do anything. Uh, actually, anything. Just ask me. All right. Now, first, tell me where you were last Friday evening when Amerigo's car made that dive off that bridge. Alibi? That's right, brother, and you can be sure I'll check it. At Willie's. All right, who's Willie? Willie? Willie Elliott. So he's a saxophone player. He's one of my clients. He was a friend of Ricky's, too. Well, where can I find him? What's his address? Uh, I'll write it down for you. We had a four-handed poker game. Who else in the game? Uh, well, Jerry Goldsmith, 120... He know Ricardo, too? Oh, yeah. Composer, conductor, violin player. Fiddle player, huh? Yeah. Who was the fourth? Uh, Eric Snowden. Who's he? He's a fiddle maker. He lives at his shop. I'll uh, write that down. Fiddle maker, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah, he was the sole and only man Ricky would ever let touch his Amati for repairs and fixing up, you understand? Who else were good friends of Ricardo's? Ah, uh, <laughs> while he was making it, plenty... Lately, nobody. You sure? Oh, nobody, Johnny. I know. Of course, he hung around a lot of bars. He, he was a regular. Give me a list. Well, let's see. There's a little place over on Pine Street called the Yellow Lamp. Yeah. Expense account item 93370. A quick sandwich for Pete Corbin and myself and a flock of phone calls to Pete's poker pals. Just to make sure they were in and available when I could get around to see them. 
I had to phony up an excuse for seeing each of them. A friend of Pete's just in from out of town suggested I give you a call, that sort of thing. And apparently it didn't arouse any suspicion. At least it was a start. And for the first time, call it a hunch or whatever you like, I felt I was going to get somewhere in this case. As it turns out, I was. Believe me. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a trio of musicians. The question, which one's story was playing a little flat? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You? You are investigate. Hello? What'd you say? Who is this? You are investigate Ricardo Amerigo. Yeah, that's right. I'm investigating the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Who are you? Hello? Hey, listen, do you have some information? A tip on the case? Who are you? Hello? Hello. Hey, what is this, a gag? Yeah. Or is this supposed to be some kind of a cockeyed threat, a warning for me to get off the case? This is no gag. Hello? Hello? Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of further expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item 10, $21 even, for drinks, for me alone. And believe it or not, I'm cold sober. But the least I could do was buy one at each of the bars on the list Pete Corbin gave me. A list of all the places Ricardo Amerigo used to hang out before his disappearance in a South Jersey swamp. In spite of all the circumstantial evidence pointing his way, I still wasn't convinced Corbin had engineered an accident to kill Amerigo. Pete had also given me a list of Amerigo's closest personal friends, three of them. I told them I'd see them later. Meanwhile, I hoped to learn something helpful from the places where he apparently spent most of his time during his last few months on this earth. But the result can pretty much be summed up at the last bar on the list, the Hangover Club. Hey, uh, cost you 80 cents. Here, keep the change. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's just like I tell you, mister. You come in here, buy a few drinks, sit and drink them, leave. Well, uh, didn't he ever talk to anybody? <laughs> Not even me. Just hit Aaron and get plastered. Told one of his friends to come in and drag him away. Who? Oh, did you know any of them? Oh, sure. Willie Elliott, saxophone player at the Crystal Room. Oh. 
Who else? Jerry somebody, fiddle player. Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, they're on my list. Huh? Anybody else? No. Oh, yeah, wait, well, sure. His agent, Pete Corbin. Yeah, that's... Hey, if you knew that, why'd you ask me? I've heard the same thing exactly 20 times so far today. Yeah, well, I'll say this for them. They must have loved Amerigo. They might have fought and argued with him when they caught him in here, but it was all for one thing, to try and straighten them out. But, mister, he was too far in. Yeah. Yeah, shame for a talent like him, concert violinist. To hit the skids the way he'd done, but nobody couldn't seem to help. The story had been exactly the same in every bar on the list. Apparently, the only friends, the only associates that Ricardo Amerigo had had were those Pete Corbin had named. Expense account item 11, 110. Cab fare to the apartment of William Elliott over on Callowell Street. Same story. No new names of friends or even acquaintances. He and Corbin and Goldsmith and the old English violin maker, Eric Snowden, had known Amerigo for years, good times and bad. Had all tried to help him, straighten him out, were deeply grieved over his death. Item 12, 570, cab to a suburb called Lenark to see Jerry Goldsmith, where I'll admit I expected to get the same story, the same names, no more, no less. This time I took the Amati violin with me. Hi. Who are you? I'm Johnny Dower. Oh, yes, you called. Come in. Friend of Pete Corbin's, you said. Uh, sit down. Mr. Goldsmith, I'll get right to the point. I'm an insurance investigator, and I that came in... That violin case. That that looks like Ricardo's. It is. And and the Amati? Yes. Oh, thank God. I found it down on the South Jersey swamp where Amerigo's car plunged off the bridge. It had been lying there, hidden by the marche for several days. Is it all right? May I see it? Well, one reason I brought it along was so you could substantiate identification. I make no bones about it, Mr. Dollar. I coveted this violin like nothing else in the world. I've played many fine instruments, strads, guanieri, even this, my stainer. I see. But Ricardo's Amati, it... There was something between that violin and myself that could exist for no one else. Not even Ricardo Amerigo when he was at his greatest. And when he started his, his terrible downfall... You, uh, wanted it even more, huh? Yes, more than anything else in the world. Enough to kill for him? <laughs> Mr. Dollar, I should kill you for even thinking such a thing. I loved Ricardo. Okay, sorry. The fact remains, somebody saw it through a steering arm on his car. Oh, I still can't believe that. No one could have killed Ricardo, no one. Only three others beside myself even knew Ricardo these past few years. Corbin, Elliot, and Eric Snowden. Pity him, feed him, clothe him, try to fight him away from the liquor that had ruined his brilliant career, yes. Even hate him at times for what he'd done to his life, but murder... I'm sorry. May I? Sure. It, uh, is the Amati. Yes, yes, I know it as well as I know my own. May I play it? Sure. What's the matter? I don't know. Mr. Dollar, it, it isn't here. The tone, the, the brilliance, the response, it isn't here. Something's wrong. You're sure this is the Amati? Oh, of course I'm sure, but something's wrong. Something's happened to it. It, it, it isn't the same. Well, you think the dampness of the swamp might no, have done... No, no, you can see. It's, it's all right, but... But it isn't. Well, I I don't know anything about violins. There are no cracks, no marks, no damage. Uh, well, even the sound post. But you're sure it's Ricardo Amerigo Zamati? Yes, yes, I told you so. I couldn't possibly be mistaken. But something is... Mr. Dollar... Well? I, I don't know. You know something? I don't either. I'm afraid I left Jerry Goldsmith rather abruptly and in a rather distressed condition. But I had plans, and the sooner I could carry them out, the better. 
Item 13 on expense account. 420 taxi fare back into town at the shop of Eric Snowden, violin maker. The only man who'd been allowed to touch Ricardo Amerigo's Amati, except, of course, for the music store owner who'd cleaned it up after I found it in the swamp. Yeah, it was possible he had done something to it that would destroy its tone. But for some reason or other, call it a hunch if you like. I hope not. Snowden's shop was located on a colorful little side street. Really not much more than an alley called Eisminger Street. Right in the middle of one of the busiest sections of the city, surrounded by skyscrapers, office stores, and all the traffic that goes with them. This one little alley. Except for Snowden's place, the tiny buildings packed side by side are all residences. Left over from years gone by when this was a residential section. And still unspoiled by the bustling activity around them. Thank you, Mr. Romandy. And I'll be sure to hear you at the Academy of Music Saturday night. Uh, sir, sir. Mr. Snowden? Uh, yes, I'm Eric Snowden. But that, that violin case... I'm Johnny Dollar. I fought you. Oh, please come in. Uh, Mr. Dollar. That's right. It's Ricardo Amerigo. It's been found. Uh, uh, please let me... Mr. Snowden, I'm an insurance investigator. Part of my job has been recovery of this violin. It's possible loss was the most heartbreaking thing I ever contemplated, but you found it. I uh, think so. You think? I don't understand. Well, here, take it. Examine it. Yes, but uh, not here. Come, we'll go up to my workroom on the second floor, where I can check it thoroughly. I'll lock this front door so we won't be disturbed. Now, come with me, please. I can't believe it. It's so wonderful you found it. It would have been a terrible loss to the world. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, you're not a violinist yourself? No. I'm afraid the only violin music I know is what I hear in... Uh, now, here we are. Well, quite a shop. Most of the finest violins in the world have been here, one time or another. The Stradivarius of Yasha. It was quite a shop. The violins the of... The walls were lined with fiddles in the making Christ, and with tools. Some familiar and some that were... Time, Wait a minute. Hacksaws. A couple of them small and delicate. Boy, but one a big one and dirty. As Eric Snowden turned away to open the violin case, I ran my fingers over the blades. And there was grease on one. Excellent grease. Now here. Well, Mr. Snowden? Yes, Mr. Dollar. This is Ricardo Emerigo's violin. You're certain of that? Eh? Do you think that I, of all people, wouldn't know? Mr. Dollar, aside from Ricardo himself, I am the only person who has touched this magnificent instrument for years now. I must confess, I resent your least question of my judgment. All right, I'll be honest with you. I don't pretend to know much about violin, so I had somebody play it a while ago. Sacrilege. All right, be that as it may. It didn't sound to him or even to me like a $30,000 violin. And whom did you permit to lay hands on this priceless instrument? A friend. He should be horsewhipped. Only an artist. A great artist should be permitted to handle a thing like this. But I suppose you uh, understand that, Mr. Dollar. I don't suppose you... Well, go on. Mr. Dollar, someone has tampered with this. Oh? Of course it doesn't sound right. Did this friend of yours presume to be a violin maker, too? What do you mean? The sound post, the placement of the bridge. Of course it doesn't sound right. Now, now why does somebody have to... Do you want to answer that? Uh, no, no, let them wait. This is more important. No wonder you or your friend or anyone else question the validity of this instrument. Hey, whoever that is down there, he really wants you. Look here, a simple adjustment here and here. Oh, bother. Go ahead, I'll wait. All right, I shall be right back. It was a quick suspicion when I spotted the hacksaw on the wall, and I couldn't forget the warning over the phone. While Snowden waited on his customer, I poked around the shop some more, looking for goodness knows what. And I found exactly nothing. No doubt Snowden was telling the truth. Until I started to sit down to wait for him, and as I pulled over a stool, I knocked open the door of a cabinet next to his workbench. I started to close it again, and then I saw it. Hanging there on a the hook was a violin. I grabbed it out of the cabinet and held it under the light beside the one in Amerigo's case. I held them up together. It was unbelievable. The shape, the color, the markings, nicks on the little pegs you tune them up with, the... Spot of stain on the scroll, even a tiny, almost indiscernible scratch on the back. An old pencil mark on the inside near the label. 
It was impossible, but it was true. These two violins were absolutely identical. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, it's a wind-up. But believe me, a wind-up with a real twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John? John, this is... Don't tell me. Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, listen, John, I know you found his Amati violin. Are you sure? But Ricardo Amerigo himself, nothing. And after all, there's not only the $20,000 policy on him, but... What do you mean, am I sure? Are you sure it was Amerigo's Amati violin I found? Why, of course... What do you mean? What if it wasn't? What if it was just an imitation? John, stop it. That's imp... What do you mean? That $30,000 well-insured fiddle I picked up in the South Jersey swamps may be a phony. Oh, no. For heaven's sakes, come over here to the office and tell me... Oh, if... take it easy, Harold boy, until I've had time to find out a few things. John? See ya. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company... Following is a final accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. When Ricardo Amerigo's car was hauled out of a swamp somewhere near Port Morris, New Jersey, there was no sign of his body. Only a sawed-through steering arm on the car that indicated somebody had done him dirt. However, I did find the fiddle, the $30,000 Amati that had helped him become one of the world's top concert violinists. Anyhow, with a fiddle under my arm, I ended up at the shop of violin maker Eric Snowden for final confirmation that it was the genuine Amati that I'd found. This Eric confirmed. However, while we were in the second floor workroom of his shop on Eisminger Street talking about the fiddle, somebody pounded on the street door downstairs. Oh, bother. I I'll be back in a moment, Mr. Dollar. And that's when I accidentally, and so help me it was accidental, I knocked open the door of a cabinet and discovered another violin, identical in every respect with the one I'd found in the swamp at the scene of Amerigo's accidental death. Okay, so I did exactly what you would have done. I put the one in the cabinet into Amerigo's case and the one from the case into the cabinet. One of them was the genuine Amati. But which one? 
I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but he was so insistent, I thought he was one of my, uh, shall we say, better clients. As it turned out, it was just a youngster who wanted to see one of the new G-strings. A youngster? <laughs> oh, I see you're joking. But now, let me take this magnificent instrument, readjust the sound post and bridge so that... No, it... no, wait, Mr. Snowden. Eh? Uh, it's later than I thought. There are some things I must do immediately. Suppose I come back here later. Very well. Meantime, I shall make the adjustments on the Amati to restore it. No, story. no, I've got to take it with me. But I don't understand. There are a few things in this case I don't understand right this minute, but uh, I hope to before very long. Uh, Mr. Dolly, you talk in riddles. Why don't you leave the violin? No, thanks. Me? I'll see you later. Uh, but, but please be careful with it. If anything should happen to that priceless... Don't worry. Nothing will happen to it. I found that I'd almost spoken too soon. For I pounded down the stairs, across the floor of the store, and out of the door, without the caution the book says one should exercise when leaving a suspect in a case. I'd no sooner got out on the street. It was a flower pot big enough to have killed a horse in its fall from the upper story window ledge. Oh, no. Good heavens, wait, Mr. Dollar. That was an accident. But I, I didn't wait. Expense account item 14, 10 cents. Phone call to Harry Branson at the insurance company to have the police put a man on Eric Snowden's shop immediately to make sure he wouldn't try to skip. Item 15, 750 for a cab to the house of fiddle playing Jerry Goldsmith out in Lanark. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Goldsmith. I didn't expect you. But you left in rather a hurry earlier. Sorry, I had to keep a date. Hey, look, Jerry. When I was here before. You still have the violin? Yes. Yes, when I was here earlier and you played it, you didn't seem to think it was really Ricardo Amarigo Zamati. No, no, I, I didn't say that. At least Well, I... at least it didn't sound like it when you played it. Yes, Mr. Dollar, that's right. Oh, now, think a minute. You were a bit upset, excited, uh, whatever you want to call it, when I brought it to you. Yes, that's true. Nevertheless, And I, I think you were also afraid I might have suspected you of Amerigo's murder when you admitted his violin was the one thing you wanted more than anything else in life. Except, of course, to have Ricardo straighten out. Become himself again. Become the artist again. Deserve to have this... Well, I don't know. Whatever I say seems to make it sound like a... I don't know. I know, look, Jerry, calm down, will you? I'm not trying to pin a murder rap on you. Calm down and do something for me, will you? Why, yes, of course. What? Here. Have you had something done to it to restore the tone it used to it have? It hasn't been touched by anyone else since I laid my hands on it. But I want you to play it again. Yes, of course I will. But didn't you say that some old fool with a music store cleaned it up? Jerry, it hasn't been touched by anyone else since I laid my hands on it. Now play it. All right. Go ahead, Jerry. It's, it's the Amati. A beautiful, wonderful... Funny. I never realized what a violin could... Can you hear me, Jerry? Yes. Yes. And to think it's taken something like this to lead me to a killer. Expense account item 16, 420. Cab to Philadelphia Mutual, the office of Harry Branson. But if you're right, John, you mustn't go out there alone. Don't you understand if he's the man who planned the murder of Ricardo Amarigo? He wouldn't stop... Yes, yes, I had the police put a man out there to cover his shop. But, John, I still think... It's... Expense account item 17, $1.60. The buck was a tip for going through a couple of red lights. Back to the shop of the violin maker, Eric Snowden. Mr. Dollar. Hi, Mr. Snowden. I'm afraid I left you rather abruptly a while ago. You mentioned it, Mr. Dollar. It's you. I, that, that, that near accident when you left that flower pot. I, I don't know how it possibly could have shifted on the window ledge up there. On the third floor window ledge of this little combination store, workshop, and home of yours. That much I did notice while I was ducking it. 
If it had come off a second-floor window, you know I might have suspected you of giving it a helpful shove. Oh, good heavens, Mr. Dollar, you can't possibly mean that. All right, forget it for the moment. Uh, but how can Let's you... go up to your workshop on the second floor. Come on. Well, well yes, of course. Uh, but uh, may I ask why? I want to show you something, and I think you know what. No, I certainly don't. Unless something has happened to the Amati. Oh, something certainly has. You damaged it since you were here. No such luck. Uh, you... Mr. Dollar, please, what are you talking about? Okay, here. Now tell me the truth. Is this Ricardo Amarigo's Amati violin? Yes. Yes. I've told you so. You're sure? Uh, of course I'm sure. You know something? You aren't. But I am. What? Now open that cabinet there beside your work table. What for? Because I tell you to. But, but I... Uh, just what are you getting at, Dollar? Are you going to open it or shall I? No. Get out of here. This is my shop, my place. You you can't do this sort of thing to me. Would you rather the police did? They're on their way. The police? But I... Well? There's no need to open it. Ricardo Amerigo Zamati is in it. Well, that's where you're wrong. This is the Amati. In this case, the one in the cabinet is the identical copy of the Amati that you made. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Why, Snowden? Because the loss of this priceless instrument would have been unthinkable. $30,000 insurance on it. Oh, money doesn't buy a violin like this. It must be played by an artist, by many artists, like the artist Ricardo was. So, so when Ricardo disappeared... Or was murdered? When Ricardo disappeared, I had to make sure that the Amati would, would still... I didn't murder him. Isn't this the hacksaw that cut the steering rod on his car? Well, Snowden, isn't it? Yes. Uh, no, I and mean... And because of it and your crazy plan to keep the real Amati, you and you alone are going to take the rap for Amerigo's murder. No, no, please. Ricky! No Rich? use, Harry. That's right, Mr. Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo. You're what? The dirty, drunken has-been that started all this. Sawed through the steering rod on my car, wrecked it in the swamp, left some of my clothing there. That phony fiddle was my idea. Not to collect the insurance on it, not that alone. But to make sure it could come back again. Be played again by somebody that deserved to play it. The way I... The way perhaps one time I deserved to play it. But Ricardo... A man disappears, murder, or whatever. There's a fuss about it for a while and it's over. But this, no, no, this must live, this violin. You will now. The world will be the better for it. But you, and this apparent murder... The insurance was my last hope of paying back Pete Corbin, my agent, and the others who tried so hard to straighten me out. Pay back some of the money and the heartbreak they spent on me. Or... Let your insurance company pay him back. Because I never could. I couldn't even leave my hiding place here in Eric's house. Because I knew that sooner or later he'd pity me enough to give me more of the drink that's been all I've been living for. Eric, God bless him. Eric knew, of course. But only he. Be kind to him, if you can. Ricky. That's all, Mr. Dollar. Oh, Unless, will you buy me a drink before you call in the police? Expense account item 17, 850. One bottle of the best I could buy before I called in the police. Item 18, hotel in Philadelphia, miscellaneous fare back to Hartford. Total expense account 182.65. Remarks? No insurance payment necessary on either the Amati or the man. And I guess he really was a man. More than he knew. What the courts will do about him and about Eric Snowden, well, the courts will do. And I'm glad I have to have no part in it. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Somehow I think I have a little better appreciation for music now than... Oh, well. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Duke Red Matter. A racehorse that could only be stopped by a killer. And the killer didn't stop with horses. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Victor Perrin, Barney Phillips, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Herb Vigran, and James McCallion. Musical supervisor and violinist, Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Niles Pearson, Johnny, at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, how are you, Niles? Worried at the moment. Can you help me out? I don't know. What's on your mind? $65,000 worth of horse flesh. Ever hear of Duke Red? Yeah, I think so. The Futurity last year? That's the horse. Johnny, Columbia Indemnity is going to have to settle a claim on him. Why? Duke Red was seriously injured and had to be destroyed. Did you say 65000 Yeah. No wonder you're worried, Niles. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. Expense account item one, $197.80. Airfare and incidentals getting me from Hartford to San Francisco and a town about 40 miles south of there called San Pietro. At the San Pietro Hotel, I learned that the Abbott Ranch was some five miles outside of town but that the Abbott Stables maintain offices in San Pietro. Hello. Hello. I'd like to get in touch with Mr. Abbott. My name's Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Abbott's never here. He's mostly out at the ranch. You'll have to see him there. Oh. Well, uh, is there any place in town I can rent a car? Not that I know of. Bus? Afraid not. What's your business with Mr. Abbott? Insurance. I'm here to adjust a claim of his. Oh, yes, Duke Red. Could I see Mr. Abbott's business manager? Uh, Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe isn't with Mr. Abbott's office any longer. Oh, now, that's funny. He was with Mr. Abbott's office three days ago when he notified us that a claim was being filed in this manner. I got it right here on paper. Oh. Well, you might as well know. Mr. Abbott and Mr. Monroe... Ended things. Mr. Abbott let him go. Mm, I see. Who's in charge now? No one at the moment. Maybe I can put you in touch with Mr. Abbott at the ranch. Good. Nine four three three, please. 
smoke? No, thanks. Hello, Cully. This is Judy at the office. Is Mr. Abbott there? When do you expect him? Thanks. Out for the day, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> I'm not doing very well, am I? I wish I could be more helpful. Well, maybe you can. Uh, this man, Monroe. If you could tell me where I can get in touch with him, I'd appreciate it. Didn't you understand? He doesn't work for Mr. Abbott any longer. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, he did notify us about the claim. Evidently, he's aware of the circumstances in the matter, and that's what I'm here to talk about. I see. Well? Mr. Monroe isn't in San Pietro any longer. He moved out of town on Tuesday. But where? He didn't leave a forwarding address, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Where's the laundry going to send their bills? How about the finance company? He just left, and that's it. You want to know something? I don't get it. <laughs> She dropped her eyes, mumbled something about having work to do, and uh, we left it at that. I put it in the back of my mind and asked someone else about this, Mr. Monroe. Then I got busy solving one of my immediate problems. Expense account item two, $50. Deposit on a 1940 Terraplane station wagon I managed to rent from a man who ran a filling station. Idea was $10 a day plus gas. Item three, $5.08, a tank full of gas. The terraplane bucked a little, but it got me outside of town about four miles to the office of a tall, lanky man who never took his hat off. Dr. James Gorey, veterinarian. All the way from Hartford, Connecticut, huh? Yes, that's right. And having sunshine like this back there now, I'll bet you you're here about the Duke, huh? Duke Red, yes. The people who wrote the policy want me to look into the matter. Hope there's nothing wrong. Is there? No, a matter of procedure, Doctor. Mr. Abbott's filed a claim for $65,000 indemnity, the loss of his racehorse. Mr. Monroe, who handled these matters for Mr. Abbott, is no longer around. Uh, yes, I understood they quarreled. Yeah. Mr. Abbott isn't around at the moment either, so I came to you. I don't believe I understand this. If Ben Abbott's bought that much insurance, he's sure got a right to file a claim for damages. Well, it's just good business to get the facts, Dr. Gorey, that's all. Quite a bit of money involved here. Yes. Red was worth lots more than that, though. Oh? That horse would have won over $500,000, in my opinion. Full racing terminal. Yeah, well, it's too bad about all this. I understand from Mr. Monroe's correspondence that uh, you treated the animal, Doctor. Yeah. Um, yes. I take care of most of Ben's stock when they're here. When he's not on the road racing. Uh-huh. I'd like to know exactly how the accident happened, Doctor. There was, uh, something about a piece of machinery? A tractor with the blades up. Huh? Uh, Duke Red stumbled back into it hard. Cut through his right hamstring all the way to the bone. I see. Do you make out a report in a case like this? In any case, Mr. Dollar. An animal's just like a human. This one more valuable than most, I guess. Any of them liable to get sick or hurt sometimes. Here's the report. Thanks. They're pretty careful out there with all those animals. Naturally, they constitute a considerable investment on Ben Abbott's part. Yeah, sure. Oh. Most of the tendons cut, huh? Yes. Them as wasn't severed were ruptured. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. What? Well, there's a notation about the carcass. Cremated on the premises? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's see. The accident happened Sunday night. Cremated same night. Why so fast, Doctor? Ben Abbott wanted it that way. Can't blame him, I guess. Well, maybe not. But it'll make my job a little more complicated. Unless some x-rays were taken of the injury. There was no need for me to go into x-rays. Paralysis had already set in by the time I got there. Yeah, but that doesn't help me much, does it? Hmm? What do you mean? No carcass, no proof of the extent of injury to the animal. Lord, man, the animal was in a bad way. It was a mortal injury. How was he destroyed? Shotgun. Could he have lived? I mean, long enough for me you to... You don't have... understand, Mr. Dollar. It had been wrong not to destroy him with injuries like that. Mr. Abbott called you in right after the accident happened, did he? Yes. I got out there maybe 15 minutes later. Ben was alone with the horse. The minute I laid eyes on that animal, I knew he was finished, that he'd have to be destroyed. You advised Mr. Abbott that the horse had to be destroyed? I didn't have to. He knew it. He knows horse flesh as good as any vet alive. 
Well, did you consider calling in someone else? What? Another doctor for consultation. I tell you, man, there was no use in going into anything like that. Did Mr. Rabbit ask you to call in another vet? No, he did not. Who else was there? Nobody. No stable hand? No member of Mr. Abbott's family? No. Well, who saw the accident? Mr. Abbott. Who else? I don't know, Mr. Dollar. Like I said, just Ben was there when I got there. I haven't any proof that the animal was injured. You just read my report? I've got $65,000 to worry about, Dr. Gorey. I'll need more than just a report. Young man. I've been in business here over 30 years. I've done business with Ben Abbott over 20 years. You come here asking me if I called in another vet. If I did this, if I did that. There isn't a man around here who won't take my word. Why don't you? Part of my job, Dr. Gorey. Huh? I can't take anybody's word for anything. Mr. Dollar, I'd be obliged if you'd get out of here. I obliged Dr. Gorey. I got out of there. Driving back to San Pietro on my terraplane, it struck me as odd that Gorey, certainly aware of the value of the injured horse, had not taken so much as a photograph to verify the story of the accident. For that reason, I decided to verify Dr. Gorey himself. Well, hello. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you can help me. All right, try me. Well, it's Dr. Gorey. Is he new around here? <laughs> You're joking. No, I'm not. He's a fixture. He's been in this part of the country 30 or 40 years. They say he's the best vet this side of Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> that takes in quite a bit of real estate. Is he loaded? I think he could retire and give advice over the phone. These horse racing people make new parents look like indifferent vegetables. They do? You don't know. A horse sneezes once and they're ready to call the Mayo brothers. <laughs> Dr. Gorey's practically the whole Mayo clinic in horsey circles. Say, how did you know about him? The insurance report. Oh, of course. Well, I suppose you'd want to talk to him. Look, I'm driving out that way. I'd be glad to give you a lift. Oh, that's mine out there. <laughs> that? Yeah, rented it from a filling station man down the street. Oh. Well, you just drive right on past the filling station for about three miles and you'll see Dr. Gorey's place. Oh, thanks, but I've already been there. Huh? Yeah, just left him. Well, then why are you asking me about him? Heavens. Just asking. <laughs> You're a funny one. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Judy Brown. About finished here for the day? As a matter of fact, yes. Well, Judy Brown, let you and I go get something to eat and drink. How do you know I haven't got a husband? I don't. Have you? No. Well, how about it? Give me five minutes. Judy, I'm going to get right to the point. How long have you worked for Mr. Abbott? A year and a half. Why? You're from San Pietro? No, San Francisco. I answered an ad. I wanted to get out in the country for a while, away from the city life. Mm hmm. All right. What happened between Monroe and Abbott? They had a quarrel. A loud, loud quarrel. Mr. Abbott's very good with a quarrel. Oh, is he? Yes. You know, even I've wondered about that. What? Mr. Monroe quarreling with Mr. Abbott and then just leaving all of a sudden. Probably went to San Francisco. I don't know where else he... Oh. What's the matter, Judy? That looks like Mr. Monroe now. Monroe? Yes, end of the bar. I thought he was away. It's him, all right. Well, I'd like to talk to him. You'll have to hurry. Looks like he's getting ready to leave. Yeah. Excuse me. Sure. Hey. Hey, just a minute. You calling me? Yes. Mr. Monroe? Yes? Johnny Dollar, Universal Adjustment Bureau. I'm in town about the claim on Duke Red. But I heard you'd left town. I had. You talked to Mr. Abbott about that claim. Well, you had power of attorney for him and signed the claim. I wonder if I could talk to you. I'm leaving town again. Right away. Well, look, can I just have a minute of your time? It wasn't my horse. It belonged to Ben Abbott. Talk to him. Now, get out of my way. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Let him handle his own dirty business. Look, Mr. Monroe. Get out of my way. Hmm. 
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there's proof that things are just about as wrong in this case and as dangerous as they can get. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Mr. Pearson in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, thanks, operator. Hold on, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Johnny? Yeah. I got your wire. Hold up payment on the Abbott claim? That's right. Anything wrong? I haven't talked to Abbott yet. The people I have talked to are all wrong. The veterinarian who handled a horse, a secretary in Abbott's office, and an office manager he fired... There's something cockeyed around here. Any ideas? Not yet. Okay. We'll hold up the claim on your say-so, and if there was anything wrong about that horse's death, you better find out about it. No. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red Matter in San Pietro, California. Expense account item three, 48 cents, postage. I sent a registered letter containing a copy of Dr. Gorey's injury report on the racehorse Duke Red to a veterinarian service in Cleveland, asking them to verify the extent of injuries to the animal. Item 4, 25 cents, toll call to the Abbott's branch outside of San Pietro. Whoever answered the phone told me that Mr. Abbott was busy somewhere in the grounds. I didn't bother to leave my name. Instead, I drove right on out. The Abbott breeding farm was complete with white fences, rolling green hills, bluegrass, and a stately old colonial residence set at the end of a long roadway among towering trees. From the porch of the house, I was able to see the stables and a trainer working with a horse out on the ranch track. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'd like to see Mr. Abbott, please. Uh, yes, sir. Come in, please, sir. I'll try to find Mr. Dollar. You want to wait here, sir? Thank you. He left me standing in one of the biggest living rooms I'd ever seen in my life. I took a plant in front of the fireplace, lit up a cigarette, and began to look at the pictures and statues of racing horses lining the mantelpiece. Pretty soon things started. A blonde girl in a yellow suit walked in, having an argument with a gray-haired man in Jotfrey's. They didn't see me as they entered, or they just didn't pay any attention to me. You aren't old Pardon, enough, 
to have brains enough to live as you please. I forbid oh, you Oh, to... I know what you're going to say. Oh, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. about how you forbid it and it can't go on. Well, let me tell you, it can go on just as long as I want it to go on, and I don't care what you do. Now, you listen to me, young lady. As long as you're in this house and under this roof, you will conduct yourself according to the way I dictate. Dictate? Yes. Who are you, Hitler or somebody? Don't whatever you do interfere with me again. Ever. Terry. I'm sick of it. Do you hear me? Sick of it. That was as much as I heard. But then it didn't last long. I saw them go out and walk around the garden once, shake fists at each other, finally part. He disappeared up a narrow stairway. And then, about a minute later... Wait a minute. Hello. Hello. How long have you been here? Uh, too long. Oh. Why didn't you speak up? <laughs> well, I cleared my throat a couple of times, but no good. Then I I tried to look like I didn't hear anything. Nothing seemed to work. If it helps any, I'll keep it all under my hat. I won't tell a soul. He doesn't like the company I keep. What do you think of that? I don't know anything about it. Give me a general viewpoint at least. Well, I've run into a lot of parents who don't approve of the kind of company their sons or daughters keep. In my court of human relations, parents don't always know what kind of company their daughters and sons need. When those daughters and sons reach the age when they need company. Good. You're on my side. I didn't finish. On the other hand, daughters and sons have the same problem. They don't seem to know either. You're a coward. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. I'm here to see Mr. Abbott about insurance. Was that Mr. Abbott? Yes, You're not an insurance salesman. You're here about Duke Red, about what happened to him, aren't you? That's right. I'm Terry Abbott. Glad to know you. How much money did Daddy have Red insured for? $65,000. I, um, I don't suppose you have a cigarette? Sure. Thank you. Has the claim been paid yet? No, not yet. If Red had made the tracks this year, he would have doubled that. Tripled it, probably. There's not enough money in the world to replace that horse. He was a great running horse. I've heard that before. Dr. Gorey mentioned it. Look, I'm sorry all this happened. Dad shouldn't have shot Red. We understand he was injured beyond hope. That's a lie. That's a what? Dad shouldn't have shot him. He just shouldn't have done it. Red was the only horse in the whole stables worth anything. The only thing around here worth anything. Wasn't the horse injured? Injured? Oh, that's what you'll hear. They'll all tell you that. But I can tell you something else. Terry, what are you talking about, anyhow? He's an insurance man, Dad, and I can tell him the whole thing, and I will. Go to your room, Terry. It was a terrible thing to do, shooting Red. It it was just like murder, and you know it. Be quiet and go to your room. It was murder. 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 Stop it. (laughs) Now, go to your room. Thank you for the cigarette, Mr. Dollar. Oh, she's been terrible about all this. Very upset. Any time I've had to destroy an animal around here, she gets like that. Been that way ever since she was a little girl. I see. I knew I'd have to put up with her acting like this, but... I'm reluctant to apologize to you for her actions or for mine... Jim Gorey told me you were in to see him yesterday afternoon. I wish Dr. Gorey hadn't told you that. I intended to tell you myself, Mr. Abbott. If I've offended you, I'm sorry for it. Makes me look I'm doing doing something shady. You could have come right to me instead of going to Dr. Gorey. I tried to. You were out. Then you could have waited till I came in. If this is the way that insurance company operates, I might have to find a different one. Look, Mr. Abbott... There's quite a bit of money at stake here. We have to go to everybody during an investigation. Dr. Gorey ordered the horse destroyed. It seemed very reasonable to go to him and ask why he took that action. We want to know all the circumstances. If you talk to Gorey, you know them. Why are you bothering me? What do you want? I want all the information you can give me about the accident. The time, date, people who saw it, exactly what happened, where it happened. Do you always handle a case this way? It's the way I'm handling this one. I don't like it very much, sneaking around behind my back. No matter what you think of me or my methods, Mr. Abbott, I'm the man assigned to handle this claim. My report has to be completed before the matter can be settled. They don't know what they're doing, sending a man like you out here. You filed a claim. What did you expect? A little decency and respect and courtesy. That's what I expected. 
That fool Monroe filed the claim. I understand he had power of attorney as your office manager to do that. Well, he did it too soon. I would have waited until things calmed down around here a bit. What do you mean? Well, you saw how my daughter acts. Losing a fine racing animal like Red can have a bad moral effect on the entire ranch. That's what I mean. Monroe didn't use his head. So you find him? Well, that's one of the reasons, yes. Well, the reason is I don't like him. Never did like him. But what business is that of yours? Are you here to accuse me of something? <sighs> Mr. Abbott, we'll pay off your claim when we're satisfied the circumstances were proper. We're not satisfied now. Let's discuss those circumstances. I'm not afraid of you, Dollar, or your insurance company. I don't like you snooping around my office in town, talking to my friends about me, talking to my daughter about me. No man would. If I don't get my information from you, Mr. Abbott, I'll get it somewhere else. That'll drag this whole matter out. What I've seen of you so far and what information I do have isn't exactly in your favor. I don't like that kind of talk. You don't seem to like anything about this. Now, how about it? Do we keep this up or do we get down to business? The trainer was bringing Red back from his afternoon exercise. Outside the stall, Red got scared. A mouse or something. He reared back and jammed into the blade of the tractor we use out of the track. It cut into his Achilles tendon, hamstrung him. When Dr. Gorey got here, he said that Red didn't have a chance, so I shot him. I'd like to talk to the trainer. What's his name? Tom Warner. Where can I find him? He isn't around anymore. I fired him right then and there. Told him to get off my property and stay off. Where'd he go, Mr. Evan? I don't know. He took his things and cleared out as fast as he could. He knew better than to hang around here. Well, what do you mean by that? What I said. He knew better. That's what I mean. Well, I'll have to find him and talk to him. Who else was there when it happened? No one. Just me. The rest of them were up at the house having dinner. No stable hands, your boy? I just told you. No one. How about right afterwards? I went to the office in the stable and called Dr. Gorey. Before or after you fired Tom Warner? After I fired him. You were there alone with an injured horse? You didn't call up to the house for help, send for anyone up there? You went in and called Dr. Gorey? Yes, we handled it together. Any objections? It would have been better. Perhaps we could have avoided all this unpleasantness if you'd left the remains for us to examine. Dollar. I've got maybe 150 head on this farm. Now and then accidents happen. If one of my stock is dead, I get rid of it as fast as I can with as few people as involved as possible. I do that for a number of reasons. That's the way I operate. Nevertheless, you were aware the insurance company would ask you for proof of loss in this matter, and if the you... The insurance only... company does not run my farm. I run a dollar, and I take orders from no one. Look, I'm trying to tell you the problem we face. We have no carcass to examine. Therefore, we have to ascertain the facts from other sources. Did your daughter see any of this? The accident or destroying the horse? Terry. Yeah. Of course not. You mean those crazy things she was saying when I walked into the room? Well, in view of the crazy circumstances, what she was saying might be worth listening to, Mr. Abbott. Huh. I had the impression that she saw the accident. Pipe dreams. She wasn't even around. I'd like to talk to her just the same. Collie. Collie. You talk to anybody you like, Dollar. I don't care. But I hope you made notes today because you've already got all the information you're going to get from me. Yes, sir, Mr. Abbott. Yes, sir. Collie, I want you to look at this man. Yes, sir. His name's Johnny Dollar. Yes, sir. If he comes knocking at this door again, if he even comes to the front gate, if you see him on the grounds ever again, throw him out. I don't want him around here. Yes, sir, Mr. Abbott. And right now, Cully, you can just show him out. You're being foolish about this, Mr. Abbott. Show him out, Cully. This way, Mr. Dollar, sir. Never mind. I can find my own way. Dollar, sir. Mr. Dollar. Huh? Uh, just a minute, sir, if you please, sir. Uh, sorry about that in there, sir. I, I don't believe Mr. Abbott really meant it. Sounded that way to me, Cully. I know how it sounds. He's just, well, not himself. You understand. Sir. Not quite, no. Uh, losing the horse and all. Sounds to me more like he's losing his mind. Does it, sir? Huh? Do you think Mr. Abbott's losing his mind? Do you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, sometimes I do.
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the whole case starts to fall apart like a man full of bullet wounds, which is just about the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Who? Johnny Dollar, the insurance investigator. This is Miss Abbott, isn't it? Yes. What are you doing in the stable office? Waiting for you to call me. Your father threw me off the farm a few minutes ago. A man named Cully, who works for your dad, said he really didn't mean it. Said he'd fix it up for me to talk to you. Cully? I guess that's why he asked me to phone the stable office. You told me the horse wasn't injured, shouldn't have been destroyed. Oh, I hope you didn't believe all that, Mr. Dollar. Well, now, look, I've got to settle a $65,000 claim on the death of a racehorse. The carcass was cremated, and I have no evidence that the horse was destroyed or even injured. I don't know what to believe yet, but I can tell you this. Don't ever talk to an insurance investigator the way you did earlier today, not unless you can back it up. My, you sound grim. You sound like it's a laughing matter. Hardly anything's a laughing matter. I'll be right down. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Pietro, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. Fifteen minutes after I spoke with Terry Abbott on the phone, I looked out the window of the stable office and saw her starting down toward the stables. She'd changed clothes. This time, she was wearing blue jeans and riding boots. She carried a quart in one hand, a cigarette in the other. There was a scarf or some such tied around her hair. All in all, it was a classic impression. Rich girl, racing horses, and fast cars. She wore a disdainful pout, also classic. Hi. I do. Father asked me where I was going, and I told him I was going for a ride. Why'd he throw you out? He didn't like questions I asked him, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I won't like the questions you ask me. Possibly. Probably. <laughs> You don't really work very hard trying to please anyone, do you? Industrial hazard in my business. Hope it doesn't bother you too much, Miss Abbott. Nope, I like it. You're so darn sure of yourself, and you know so darn little, and you look like you might be thinking all kinds of things. How tall are you? No, 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 let me guess. Six one? Not quite. Well, you're tall enough, I suppose. Do you like this office? I suppose you've been opening the files and going through all of Father's papers... That's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? Nope. Well, unless you know something about horses, the papers around here wouldn't mean much to you. Times, weights, whole schedule and chart for every bit of stock on the place. Do you know anything about horses? 
Just one. Duke Red. Oh. He was insured for $65,000. And he's dead now. You know, I didn't think I'd ever see you again. I wanted to talk to you before I left. What about? I didn't insure Duke Red. My father insured him. Your business is with my dad, not me, Mr. Dollar. Pardon me if I seem a little confused, but earlier today you were very anxious to tell me something about all that. Was I? Yes, you were. Hey, what is this anyway? I wish we hadn't met. But we did, and you mentioned there was no need to destroy Duke Red after he'd been injured. Now, did you say something like that to me because you were angry at your father? Or did you say it because there was some truth to it? Well, now, what's that supposed to mean? Do you just stand around and pout when people ask you questions? Did you mean that horse wasn't injured or that he was injured but that he could have been saved? Well, did you have any reason at all for saying the things you did? I... I've been very upset lately. All of us around here have been very upset. Yeah, I'm getting that way myself. Duke Red was the best horse we've had around these stables in five years. His father was a real champion, Earl Red. Maybe you've heard of him. He earned $190,000. We've all been counting on Duke Red since he was a colt. He had it then. This was going to be his big year. When this stupid accident happened, it it just turned all of us upside down. Uh Uh-huh. Is that your explanation for the things you said to me? Yes, for the moment. Now, please, don't ask me any more questions right now. One more. What? Your father fired a couple of people I wanted to talk with. One of them was a Howard Monroe. Dad's office manager? Yes, I met him a couple of nights ago. He wouldn't talk. He was too mad. Said something about letting your father handle his own dirty business. What? Now, I don't know what that meant, and I don't think I care just now. But the other man who was fired was a horse trainer named Warner, Tom Warner. According to your father, it was Warner's neglect that caused the horse to stumble and back into the tractor blades. What? Warner isn't around here now, but he must be somewhere, and I want to talk to him. Now, where can I find out his address? He's from Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. What about his address? Well, it'd be in the personnel files. You can get those at the office in town in San Pietro. Okay. Do you think he went there? I don't know. I don't know. And what's more, I don't care. The Abbots, father and daughter, were turning out to be a real peachy pair to deal with. I left them in their racing farm and drove back into San Pietro in the offices where I obtained the Baltimore address on Thomas Warner. Expense account item four, one dollar and five cents, one telegram. To Hartford in the office of Niles Pearson, requesting a complete record of Benjamin Abbott's financial status. Item five, one dollar and sixty cents, another telegram. To Thomas Warner, horse trainer requesting him to contact me as soon as possible at the San Pietro Hotel. Meanwhile, I did what I could to establish Abbott's local credit standing. I started with the bank. Dollar? That's right. What's it about? I'm an insurance investigator. I'm working for Universal Adjustment Bureau. We have a claim in on a property of Benjamin Abbott. Duke Red? That's right. $65,000. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a load. What can the bank do for you? Tell me about Abbott's credit situation, for one thing. Oh. He does bank here, I presume. Yeah, for years. My name's Dale Ryan. We better go in my office. Sure. Grab a chair, Dollar. Thanks. Miss White? Yes, Mr. O'Ryan. Bring in Mr. Abbott's file, please. Up to date. Yes, sir. It'll take a few minutes, Dollar. All right. Maybe you can give me a rundown on how things are generally. Maybe. This is all confidential, I suppose. Absolutely, Mr. Orion. I have no axe to grind. You must have something to grind or you wouldn't be here. People usually try to cheat insurance companies for money reasons, don't they? Well, usually, yes. Have you been cheated? I don't know. I don't know if there's any reason for us to be cheated. Look, maybe it'll put your mind at ease if I just tell you that a man with a $65 claim has his financial situation checked as a matter of course. You're a careful bunch of cut-ups, aren't you? Well, business being the way it is, yeah. Well, I don't think you'll find too much to raise an eyebrow about with old Ben. He's got one of the largest balances in town. Roughly, it'd be in the $100,000 area. Yeah, racing horses is quite a business, and he knows what he's doing. I doubt very much if he'd try to bamboozle you people out of a tiny little 65000 Well, that's small change to Ben Abbott. That ranch, the stock, his investment there must come to well over a million dollars. He meets a weekly payroll in the $10,000 class. Terry must run him a couple of thousand a month or so. You mean his daughter? Yeah. You met her? Yeah. Well, 
And when Terry wants a new car, she just parks the old one she's been driving and takes a plane to San Francisco and buys a new one. She might even feel like having a vacation and fly over to Honolulu. She's very expensive that way. <laughs> if what you say is true, she must be. No doubt about it. Well, she'll probably be marrying somebody one of these days as soon as she can find a guy who can stand the freight charges. I figure it'll be one of that Los Angeles oil gang or somebody from Texas. Oil's her best bet, don't you think? Well, that is, if she wants to stay in her social circle. It isn't very wide, naturally. Naturally. Oh, yes? Mr. O'Ryan. Oh, come in, come in. Mr. Abbott's folder. Oh, thanks. Well, here it is. See for yourself. Yeah. There's a lot to it. You want to take that office over there and look this over, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Dollar? Yeah, I think I'd better. I spent the rest of the afternoon going over Benjamin Abbott's local bank standing. It confirmed in detail what Mr. Orion had sent in general. His assets were many, his cash on hand plentiful. Also, and this has a bearing, the activities of his daughter Terry were indicated in some of the expenditures. There was only one item I had to question Orion about when I'd finished looking it all over. Yes, Dollar? I, uh, I noticed a check was drawn five days ago payable to Howard T. Monroe, $5,500. Yes? It's marked bonus. Monroe handled business affairs for Abbott a year or two, and Monroe left a few days ago. Probably severance and things like that. Yeah. Now, anything wrong? I don't know. For all I can gather, they didn't part company under the best of terms. As a matter of fact, they had kind of a row. It seems strange he'd pay Monroe a balance after he kicked him out. He's a strange guy. Check cleared all right. No question on it. Oh, yeah, I noticed. Something else, then. Hmm? Monroe was fired last Tuesday. Monday, a man named Thomas Warner was fired, too. Tom Warner? The trainer? Yeah. Abbott told me Warner was responsible for the accident with Duke Red. Huh. Funny. What? Well, according to these books, Abbott should still owe Thomas Warner a month's salary, $700. Well, let me see. Hmm. Oh, yes. No bonus, no salary, no severance. Seems to me Tom Warner's got a kick coming. Why doesn't he kick, Mr. O'Ryan? I don't know. I would. Most anybody would. I rechecked Abbott's local office in San Pietro and learned that Warner had not left any kind of forwarding address. As a matter of fact, he told no one he was leaving. Expense account item six, dollar ninety-eight, dinner, alone, in the dining room adjacent to the lobby of the San Pietro Hotel. I wasn't enjoying my chef's special with a limp green salad when the clerk came in. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? I uh, thought you might be in here. A long distance call for you, Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, yeah, fine. Where can I take you? Use the lobby phone, Mr. Dollar. I'll plug you in from the switchboard. Yeah, uh, go ahead. They're on the line now. Good, thanks. Thanks very much. Hello? Hello? Uh, hello. Is this Johnny Dollar, the man who sent the telegram? Yes. Who's this? Uh, this is Thomas Warner's father. Uh, the wire I opened it, it said it was important for Thomas to get in touch with you. I thought I'd better call and tell you where you could reach him, Mr. Dollar. Well, that's very kind of you, sir. I come home from work. I think this is best. Uh, you call him in San Pietro. He worked near there for a man named Benjamin Abbott. Uh, ben Abbott, training horses. You you get in touch with Thomas oh, and Mr. Oh, wait Abbott. a minute. I'm in San Pietro now, Mr. Warner. Your son left here four days ago. Didn't he come home? No. Are you sure Thomas is not at Mr. Benjamin Abbott's farm? Positive. Do you have any other ideas where he could be? No. Not sound like Thomas, though, Mr. Dollar. He would not go off away with, without letting his mother and me know. Are you sure? I am sure, certain. Thomas, my son, he always let my wife and I know where he is so we don't worry. Something is wrong, Mr. Dollar? What? Is something wrong? Yeah. Maybe there is. Yeah. Plenty. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, sometimes a dead man can answer a lot of questions. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You placed a call to the Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford, Connecticut? Yes, I did. We have Mr. Pearson on the line now. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Hello. Johnny? Niles. Ben Abbott's rating with Dunn and Bradstreet is very good. He doesn't need any money. I still haven't determined if there was really an accident. Oh, and uh, no one seems to know what happened to Thomas Warner. Who's that? The trainer who was supposed to be with a horse when Abbott destroyed it. One his father called me from Baltimore. He doesn't know where he is either. Is that so? Something just occurred to me, Niles. What? Abbott's claim was filed over a week ago, yet he hasn't threatened to sue us or go to the insurance commission. I uh, no. And that's usually pretty standard procedure with a man like Abbott. It is. If he has a just claim. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Pietro, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. I had a strong suspicion that the death of Duke Red, a racehorse, had not happened as reported. The one man who could possibly answer my questions was missing. He had left the Abbott Ranch in San Pietro without collecting a month's back pay and without telling anybody about his forwarding address. Just a minute there, sir. Hi. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Kelly. Mr. Dollar, you can make this pretty hard for me. Mr. Abbott told me I shouldn't let you on the ground. Well, now, you didn't strike me as the kind of fellow who took that order too seriously. What do you want, sir? I want Thomas Warner, wherever he is. Well, he isn't here. I know that, Kelly. I want to find out where he is. Probably went home. I talked to his father in Baltimore. His father hasn't heard from him. Oh. Wouldn't you like to know where he is? Men come and go, Mr. Dollar. You're friends with them for a little while, and you never hear from them again. I reckon that's the way we have to look at it. Now, maybe you better go now, Mr. Dollar. Suppose he didn't want to go without saying goodbye. Suppose he didn't have a choice. What do you mean? I mean a man doesn't pass up a month's pay just to make a fancy exit. We can't talk here, sir. Where did Thomas want to stay? He had a room off the stables, his own place. How about there? All right, Mr. Dollar. You wait for me, sir. I walked on down to the stables again and found the little apartment Thomas Warner had used for living quarters. The door was locked and I waited outside, looking over the workout tracks and the acres of rolling green turf that made Abbott Farms. A little while, Cully appeared. I shouldn't be doing this, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Abbott would skin me alive if he knew I was having any truck with you after that big row you had with him yesterday. Well, I'm not about to tell, Mr. Abbott, Kelly. I appreciate your help. This is where Mr. Warren stayed all the time he worked for Mr. Abbott. 
Uh huh. You can see for yourself, it's all cleaned out, not a stitch left. Yeah. Did you happen to see Warner leave here that night? Right after the accident, he was gone. Mr. Abbott came up to the house about nine o'clock. He told us all that Duke Red had been hurt, he had to shoot him, and that he had taken care of the rest. You mean destroying the carcass? Yes, sir. That's a pretty big job for one man. Well, I believe Dr. Gorey helped him with it, sir. He he was with Mr. Abbott. Oh. Then Mr. Abbott told us that Mr. Warner was to blame for the accident and that Mr. Warner wasn't with us anymore. I wonder if any of the others saw him actually leave the premises. Well, now, we talked about that amongst ourselves. Nobody saw him go, Mr. Dollar. We thought it was kind of funny. Tom was a friendly, quiet sort of man, but he had a lot of friends here. Mm-hmm. It kind of disappointed us all, I guess. Did he have many things in this room? Clothes, mostly. He was a light traveler, Mr. Dollar. Horse training was just one thing. He worked on ships and in mining camps and lumber mills. I know that much. And he read a lot. Always seemed to be studying, finding himself. Did he have a temper? No, sir. No, sir. That's one thing Mr. Tom didn't have. Good horse trainer can't afford to have a temper. Even Mr. Abbott he could handle. All except that night, I guess. Mr. Abbott got powerful mad, I'm sure. Mr. Mr. Abbott is not an easy man to work for. How long have you been with him, Cully? Twenty-three years, sir. We were together in Maryland before he moved the stables to California. His bad temper hasn't bothered you. Mr. Abbott was different than he is now. I mean, when Miss Abbott was alive. But then when she died and raising Miss Terry, he hasn't had it so easy. I mean, easy with himself. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think so. I worry about Mr. Abbott, Mr. Dollar. He don't seem to run himself well sometimes. You know what I mean. Yeah. Maybe Duke Red being gone now will help. Mr. Abbott counted on that animal a lot. Counting on a racehorse is not just being anxious overnight or for a week, but being anxious for years, from the time they're colts to when they first step out. Now he don't have that worry at all. Maybe it'll do him some good. What about his other horses? Them? Well... None of them like Duke Red. Not the same at all. They'll race and make money, but nothing like Duke Red. Yeah. Mr. Warner said he was a fine horse. Tell me, what kind of a car did Mr. Warner drive? Well, he didn't have a car, Mr. Dollar. Well, how do you suppose he left here? He must have been carrying luggage. I reckon so. He could have lugged him out the highway and flagged himself a ride or waited for the bus. They come by all the time. Think he might have called a cab in town? Didn't use a house phone. Maybe the one down in the stable office. Maybe someone drove him in, Cully. Miss Terry might have, sir. Huh? Miss Terry drove Mr. Warren around now and then. Did Mr. Rabbit approve of that? No, sir. He did not. After my talk with Cully, I took a chance and hung around the stables trying to get a line on Thomas Warner. Ben Abbott's belligerent attitude seemed to permeate the whole farm. The horse handlers I talked with were grumbling and complaining. I was able to learn nothing from them. I decided to tackle Abbott himself again. He wasn't in, but his daughter was. Well, you came around just the right time, Mr. Dollar. We haven't had too much excitement around here all day long. I think they're supposed to toss you out on your ear when you show up. That should be interesting. Would you like a drink? No, not right now, thanks. Not right now, thanks. Now, isn't that the end, the bitter end? So precise, so efficient, so determined, so anxious to do a good job. To be a sober, steady, substantial expert boar. Now, what is it? Who are you mad at, Terry? Tom Warner? Why should I be mad at him? Horse trainer. Because he left and didn't say goodbye? Maybe. You know, when I first came in this house two days ago, you were arguing with your father. I couldn't help overhearing it. Was that about Tom Warner? Yes. Dad said he wasn't good enough for me. I'm all right now. Something else that day. That business you were telling me about before. It'll have to be looked into. Why, for heaven's sake? Because you intimated that your father and Dr. Gorey might be lying about the whole thing. Do you realize that if there's any truth to it, your father would be liable for criminal charges? I know. I was just trying to put Dad in a bad light with you. It was just for good old-fashioned first-class spite. Him telling me about not seeing Tom and all. We, we've been arguing for weeks about it. When I saw you the other day, I thought it was a good chance to get back at Dad. I see. Tell me about the trouble over Warner. Why tell you? Well, let's say I'm an interested party. 
I like you, Terry. Well, Tom and I saw quite a bit of each other, and Dad never liked it. I suppose because I'm all he has left. Mother and Bob, he was my older brother, were killed in an airplane accident a few years ago. Dad's always expected me to marry one of the Long Island horses set, the turf, something, I don't know. Anything but a horse trainer. He's been looking for an excuse to get rid of Tom. Your father doesn't strike me as the kind of man who'd have to give an excuse to fire someone he didn't want around. Well, he found an excuse. He blamed the accident on Tom. Do you think he's mad? What's that? Nothing. Do you suppose your father will ever calm down so I can talk to him? I don't know. The Abbots have always been a terribly angry group of people, very emotional. There doesn't seem to be much of a let-up these days. Terry, is that what you meant when you asked me if I thought your father was mad? I suppose so. It's almost as if he's been on the verge of, of something lately, something desperate. His moods frighten me sometimes. They didn't used to. I, I don't easily frighten. But looking back, two years ago, Daddy bought a new car. We were out driving one day right after he bought it, and something went wrong. The gear shifter, some little thing. Well, Daddy was so angry, he, he just backed the car up and smashed it into a cement wall and left it. That was when he first frightened me. The first time that I can remember. Have you been frightened much? Since then? Oh, yes, many times. That's why Tom was so nice to have around. He, he never became angry. Never did things like that. Like the men... The men I know. Tom sat quietly, and he let me sit beside him, reading, talking. I'm not that kind, really, of course, but I, I liked it with Tom. I liked it very much. You asked me about him, Johnny. Well, I'll tell you. If he'd come to say goodbye to me, there would have been no goodbye. I would have gone away with him anywhere. I was in love with him from the first day he came to work here. I still am. I always will be. Well, that's all there is to tell. Did he know this, Terry? Yes. And he knew I meant it. I do. Hi. What can I do for you? Constable in. I'm in. I'm the constable. Tad Pope. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. Mm-hmm. What's your trouble, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm worried, I guess, Mr. Polk. I, I walked around for a long time before I came in here. Yeah, sit down. And hardly anybody drops in this time of night, unless they're drunk. How about you? No. No, didn't think so. Mr. Polk, I'm an insurance investigator. I've been in San Pietro three days now, trying to get the facts about a claim filed by Benjamin Abbott. Mm-hmm. I suppose about his horse, Duke Red. That's right, Mr. Polk. I can't seem to locate a man named Warner. Thomas Warner. Worked as a trainer for Abbott up until the day of the accident. Go ahead, sir. Warner and Abbott had an argument over the accident. Warner left. He was fired. His folks in Baltimore haven't heard from him, and they're worried. I can't seem to get a line on him myself, and I need to talk to him. Yes, well, what exactly do you want me to do for you, son? Help me find him. You sure he's missing? He isn't around. You want to make out a missing persons complaint, that it? I suppose so, yes. Yes, all right. Now, we just signed here. All right. There. You guarantee results? I might surprise you, mister. I'll let you know what happens. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Well, it all hinges on a decent man who knows he's loved and never said goodbye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Dr. Gorey. You left word for me to call? Yes. Wonder if I could see you sometime today, Doctor. What about? About the Abbott matter. No. I'm kind of busy today. I talked to you once, Mr. Dollar. What else can I say to you? That's up to you, Doctor. Entirely up to you. I can tell you this. I have reason not to believe what you said before. Now, look here, young man. I have reason to believe that Duke Red wasn't destroyed exactly the way it was reported. I'm not going to listen to any tall tales about a horse. Then maybe you'll listen to one about a man. What? Thomas Warner, Duke Red's trainer, is missing. I've turned the matter over to the police. Oh. Oh. Yeah. How about it, Dr. Gorey? Do we talk? All right, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Pietro, California, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. Expense account item 8, 90 cents. Breakfast for me and coffee for Constable Tad Polk, San Pietro Police Department. Yes, sir. I'm glad we could get together this morning, Mr. Dollar. You know, I thought a long time about you reporting Tom Warner missing. Well, maybe I'm worried for nothing. But I do know I don't like the circumstances of his disappearance. You using me, Mr. Dollar? What? You know I got a police force of four men. We can't conduct any sizable investigation into a disappearance. Just aren't equipped for it. I thought it might be something like that. I don't want to be spending civic money to satisfy some doubts in the mind of your organization. It's not my province, Mr. Dollar. Look, the man's missing. Nobody knows where he is. He didn't leave a trace. He did leave a month's pay behind him. He left after an argument with Abbott. Nobody saw him leave that farm, Constable. No one knows where he is now. Now, just hold on to your britches, boy. I didn't say I wouldn't do anything about it. Huh? I'm going out and have a talk with Ben Abbott, Mr. Dollar. I've known him for a long time. Think maybe I can find out something about this. We'll see what happens there first, then make some plans. That sounds fair enough, Constable. Where can I get in touch with you in case I have to? I'm going over to see Dr. Gorey this morning. After that, I'll be at my hotel. Fine. Dollar? Yeah? You think something might have happened to Tom Warner? Yeah, Constable. I sure do. Expense account item nine, $2.50. One long-distance phone call to Hartford. I explained the matter of Tom Warner and requested Niles Pearson to have a man in Baltimore start checking with Warner's parents there in the event some lead as to his whereabouts might turn up there. After that, I drove out to see Dr. Gorey, veterinarian. You know, you have a way of not being very nice on the telephone. What is it now, Mr. Dollar? I just talked to my home office in Hartford, Dr. Gorey. They aren't very happy with the way this case has been going. They're too bad about them in Hartford. How does it affect me? Well, they're just about at the point where they might close it and call me back home. All this fuss and... They're going to pay the claim? No, no, not at all. I don't mean they're going to pay at all. What? They can do one of two things. They can appeal to the insurance commission for a judgment... They'd have a point. No reliable or cooperative witnesses saw the accident to the horse or the circumstances of it. What's more, there's no carcass. For all we know, the horse may be down in Mexico. Now, look or here. they can institute proceedings against Abbott. Charge him with attempt to defraud. That's ridiculous. Why would a man worth almost a million dollars worry about an insurance policy? Well, of course, it's ridiculous to you and me, Doctor. But then, legally, it's not ridiculous at all. I can pretty well put some things together. Abbott didn't even want to file a claim for the loss of that horse. As a matter of fact, he fired his office manager, Monroe, for filing the claim. Fired him and paid him a bonus to get out and stay out so Monroe wouldn't have to answer any questions, true? Possibly. Abbott blamed the accident on Thomas Warner and fired him, too. Warner hasn't been seen or heard of since. Now, you said on the phone... I didn't say it, but I'll say it now. Abbott hated Warner because Warner was seeing his daughter... I'll also say Abbott never struck me as a man who could control his hates. Tom Warner's nothing to me. I don't know anything about him. But Ben Abbott is something to you. Now, look, Doctor. I spent some time checking you out because you're one of the parties who can help settle this thing. You've been in practice around here for a good long time. People seem to think a lot of you. I hate to see a nice guy like you get the book. 
I think I can stop that if you cooperate. Now, look here. Forget I'm an insurance investigator. I'm just a guy giving you some information. When I said my company's ready to turn the matter over to the insurance commission or file charges, it means that Abbott will have to sue for settlement. And that's just what we'd want him to do. In court, he'd have to produce Thomas Warner and prove his story of the accident. I don't think he can produce Thomas Warner. With what we have so far, Abbott would lose the suit and the insurance company wouldn't fool around then. There's no outfit tougher than an insurance company when somebody's trying to cheat them, whether it's inadvertent or not. You'd have to be in court too, Doctor. Oh. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about it? Can you give me the real story now? I've been... Ben Abbott's friend for 20 years. And he asked you to lie for him. That's understandable to me. In a court, though, it's perjury. What did they do to him? That's up to the company. I'll have to hear your part of it first. Duke Red was dead when I got out there that night. Ben had shot him. Duke Red hadn't had any accident. Ben made me promise to tell you that he had. Ben had just shot him. Shot him? But why? Duke Red wasn't the horse Ben counted on or thought he was. He had good confirmation, but he just wouldn't run. Couldn't run, I think. Ben got mad about that and shot him. And Tom Warner saw it happen, is that it? Yeah. Ben told me Warner saw him shoot the horse. He gave Warner some money and told him to go away. Uh, I don't know. Ben's... Losing his mind, I think. I've heard that about him before. From who? His daughter. Terry, yeah. Poor Terry. Yes, she'd have reason to say that. Huh? Now what? I'll have to talk to Abbott. Sure. One thing still worries me. What's that? I went over his bank record. He paid out money to Monroe, but he didn't pay out anything to Thomas Warner. He told me that he did. Okay, then. I'll ask him about that, too. Expense account item 10, 35 cents. I lost it in a payphone trying to get in touch with Ben Abbott. No one answered, so I drove on out to the farm. The short winter day was over when I got there. Darkness had already come over the fields. Darkness and loneliness. Hey. Hey in there, open up. Open up. Open up, somebody. Open up. Mr. Dollar, sir. Good evening. Hello, Kelly. Didn't you hear me? Uh, Mr. Dollar, sir, maybe this isn't such a good time to be coming around. Is Mr. Abbott here? Yes, sir, he is. But Constable Polk was out here this afternoon asking him questions, and he got powerful mad. There's no telling what he might do. He's awful mad. Well, I'm a little mad myself. I'd like to see him. Tell him I'm here. Mr. Dollar, please. Hey, all right, Kelly. You go ahead. All right, Miss Terry. I'll find Mr. Abbott, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Johnny. Hi. Oh, don't. Don't come any closer. Well, what is it? Why is it so dark in here? I'd rather you didn't see me just now. Huh? Terry. Vanity. A woman always has that first, they say. Oh, John. Who did this to you? Dad. He's crazy. I just don't seem to do anything to here, please him. Here, here now. Oh, Johnny, I think it's the end. Here, here, now. Take Johnny. your hands off her. What? I said take your hands off her. I'll kill you with this. Oh, Johnny, be careful. Wait a minute. I'll show you. I'll no. show you. I yes. killed a man. Please stop it. Stop it. Terry. Terry, baby. No. No, don't touch me. Oh, Johnny. Johnny. Oh, oh. oh that's, a, that's a pretty heavy cane he uses. Oh, lie still. I'll phone a doctor. No, no. Where'd he go? I don't know. Out that way. Johnny, did you hear? About killing someone else? He was talking about Tom Warner. Johnny, I know it. He was talking about Tom. I placed a call to Constable Polk's office, told him what happened. He said he'd start right away. After that, I took a walk around the grounds. All the cars were still in the garages. Then I heard some sort of disturbance down by the stables. Father! 
I'll come any closer. I've got a shotgun this time. I have a gun too, Mr. Abbott. Go away from here. Get in your car and go away from here. The police will be here in a few minutes. Look, this won't do you any good. Abbott, did you hear me? It'll be better for you if you're in the house ready to make a statement for them when they come. I know that Dr. Corey lied for you, Abbott. I know that you killed that horse deliberately. Abbott! I told you to get away from me. You said you'd kill someone. You were talking about Tom Warner, weren't you? You killed him because of Terry. Last one. Go away. I won't go away. But you'd better throw that gun away and come on out here. I'm not afraid of you. The whole bunch of you. You're just being foolish, Abbott. Like you were the day you smashed up a new car because some little thing on it didn't work. The way you killed that valuable horse because you didn't like his running. The way you killed Tom Warner without reason. You're smashing your whole life now this way. Put down that gun and come out. Abbott! That's enough! Abbott. Abbott. Oh, you didn't have to do it this way, Abbott. Lie still. Warner's body. Under this floor. All his things with it. You know about Duke Red. I know. Don't try to talk. Warner tried to stop me from killing him. He said I was crazy, darling. Easy. I'm not crazy, am I, daughter? Don't know. Am I? Am I? No. You're not crazy. Not anymore. They found the body of Thomas Warner where Abbott had said it was. He'd been shot to death. Terry was still in the hospital when I packed up and left San Pietro. Expense account item 11, $65.30. Hotel and board at the San Pietro Hotel. Item 12, $175. Airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Item 13, $43 even. Miscellaneous. Expense account total, $802.65. No remarks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Flight 6 matter. A story involving a girl so beautiful that men were willing to kill for her. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Barbara Fuller, Barbara Eiler, Herb Butterfield, John Stevenson, Parley Bear, Will Wright, Robert Bruce, and Forrest Lewis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete 
Cardley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line, Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do, find out why it crashed? Oh, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. Item 1, $173.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries, and more inquiries, and then some more. And after the 14th, Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for and the... you found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. <laughs> is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. Mac Macklin. One time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Or what were you expecting? <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt, a black silk tie, and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side mick with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of it you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Oh, I've got a good man in charge up there, Juno Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes, and you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job. But this one's different. You know, it's detective work, your kind of job. And Gino Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope at about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. Pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? Well, so far, nothing. We're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out who might benefit by having any one of them dead. Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued, and the names are in the reports here. Somewhere. Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. Now, there's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo... Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Or worth destroying for the insurance, you mean? No, it was done by somebody who deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. 
And who didn't mind killing nine others to get that one? It was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General, the Department of... Yes, that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, anything. Who are you? And what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here... De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the... Yes. Guys. Look, uh, are you related to... Maria de Lagos. My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance? I'm sorry, there were no survivors. No. Oh, no. I, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. Well, I, I didn't know you were here in the city or I'd have, I'd have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks. Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No. I know, it's, it's a rough deal. I, I, I am sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Later, sir. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. What is the use, senor? It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital. And I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, senor. No, no, let's see. I, I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Reyes. Yes, he is. But I am at the Monte Casino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Casino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry, I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. Know anything about him, Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban. Residence and business address, Havana. In the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming a brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary. I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Now, look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. I'll let Gino know you're coming. And you check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who'd been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail, cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile and a half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching, with the age-old sadness in their eyes. Uh, you are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, not of importance, but it's certain now this. It was caused by one explosion which has occurred in the baggage compartimento. Uh, venga, say, uh, come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified. Uh, can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Uh, toward the front, these pieces are more large. But in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here, uh, you look. These are pieces of the baggage, uh, muy pequeño, hmm? uh, very tiny. Oh, yeah, the crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. And look, it's burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. 
Here, uh, you smell this one. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Oh, dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Was dynamite. Any idea how much? How big a charge? One of the soldados, uh, Pascual, who have used most explosive, is think maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, you know. Plenty tough to... They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge. And one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery. Death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Madre de Dios, may they find peace. Then, for the first time, I noticed the girl, standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. You are observing the senorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quien sabe? She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. But it's like she always have the charm. Death has never find her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see, she's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her all right. And I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men. Both of whom had named as beneficiary Marvel Terrence. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break. And then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. McMacklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean strange? 
Parker. They say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane and set just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her. A kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool. Detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I have not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes on some jobs. Other times it's only dirty and disgusting. Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look. Beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke? Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now, get going. Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problem. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, and that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies. And that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I I wasn't with them, exactly. At least, not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. It's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. Then sometime you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. How many partners? Just the three of you? Yes, yeah, just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like that. Bill, I said I... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Suit yourself. Dollar, just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. 
Yeah. You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. It's nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence, beside play the game? That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play too, huh? No, I meant it. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. Well, that's a very attractive offer. Outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. You can call me at my hotel. The Monte Cassino. That's where Delagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed on that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name Delagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. Another? Just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here. To see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. Could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl with an air of aloneness about her, an air that I felt would be with her even in the crowd. Strange, but also compelling, exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plane, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. (laughs) Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, senor, playing the game. (laughs) Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under a spell. Que dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I didn't... It's all right, that... forget it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not a thing she will do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. Yes, Possible, but I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Bla- uh, Blakely. I see he would look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. (laughs) 
Gino dropped me at my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. At about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see all shy again. The snow piling up along the loop, and the wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? Uh, 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. And two of them, McMacklin, was flying in them. On one side or the other. Oh, what of it? Well, you know, Uncle Sam frowns on that kind of thing, Johnny, so we've got a sort of an understanding. I stay the heck away, and he forgets about me. I see. <laughs> I've got no complaints, actually. I'm I, I'm doing all right here, but, but sometimes I sure do get homesick for the old town. Of course, it's probably changed so much that I... Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, con permiso de telephone, uh, Senor Macri. Oh, thanks. I uh, plug it in. Hello, yeah? What? All right. Well, well, have you told the federal police? Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Adios. Well, we just lost our best angle, Johnny. What do you mean? That baggage handler, the one I figured slipped the dynamite on board the plane. The boys just now located him. His throat has been cut. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bereaved relative lies. A frustrated lover comes up fighting. And a lovely lady in the case just vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Oh? We have not met, Senor Dollar. No, all right, I've been sure to remember the name. Don Serrano... Oh, wait a minute. You're Maria Delago's brother. That is correct. I was planning to call on you this morning, Don Serrano. Well, that will not be necessary, Senor, since I am taking the liberty of calling on you. I am downstairs in your hotel at this moment. Oh, I see. I believe I may be able to cast some light on the unfortunate tragedy which overtook my poor sister and the other passengers of that ill-fated airplane. Do you know something that hasn't come out? Rather a great deal, senor. I know the crash which resulted in the deaths of ten innocent people was the evil work of a diabolical maniac. Yes, well... A product of the warped mind of a scheming, worthless, unspeakable dog, a sneaking, money-hungry snake, a scurrilous, unprincipled... Don Serrano! Si, senor. Come on up! <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 5, $3.90, room service. Breakfast for myself and a pot of coffee for my visitor. Don Serrano de Almeido y Pico, I think. He was a thin, straight man with a small goatee and the face of a hawk. Stiff, formal, unbending. A classy grande type from an old school long out of business. And a man of much suppressed violence and hate. Once upon a time, senor, there existed a gentleman's code for the settlement of such matters as this. The duelo, as it was called. But we are living now in lesser and more decadent times. A man is no longer permitted to kill his enemies. He must suffer interference by the police, the Civil Air Transport Department, the government. And even special investigators from the States, huh? Is that what you mean? I was not speaking personally, Senor Dollar. You are as much a victim of the times as I am. Well, it doesn't seem to be irritating me as much. More coffee, Don Serrano? Uh, gracias, no. Perhaps it is because uh, you have not lost your dearly beloved sister, Senor. Oh, maybe. In that, at least, you have my sympathy. But let's get to the point... You've done quite a lot of talking about wanting to kill somebody, but I'm still not too sure who or why or what. It is very simple, senor. Not to me. Suppose we start at the beginning. As you like. But who can ever say what is the beginning of anything? All right, then let's be arbitrary about it. Let's start three weeks ago when your sister Maria came here from Havana to join her husband, Ramon de Lagos. I believe you said Ramon had been here for a month at that time on uh, some kind of a business deal. A business deal? Do I look like a fool, senor? Oh, now, let's stick to the point. Women. That is his business, senor. Women with money. Then a week ago, Maria wired you, said she was terribly unhappy, and asked you to come at once. And when you got here, she told you what was the matter. She said Ramon was carrying on with an American girl named Marvel Terrence. A Jezebel, senor. So you took over. You got Maria an airline reservation back to Havana. On flight six, the one that crashed. And told her you'd handle Ramon. Oh, she was putty in his hands. He lied to her every day since they were married. And she always ended up by believing him. I told her in the beginning he was interested only in her wealth. Which amounts to how much? Oh, much. Even after Ramon's foolish dissipation over the last few years. What happens to her estate now? Half of it she was permitted to dispose of as she wished. She made a will some time ago in favor of Ramon. Against my advice, I may say. What about the other half? Now that reverts to me, senor. Oh? It is a matter of family tradition. Who managed your sister's estate before Ramon came into the picture? I did, senor. And quite profitably. I did not waste my energies on illicit follies and ludicrous intrigue. All right, all right. Night before last, then, you took Maria to the airport and saw her off on the plane. See. Si. What was she planning to do when she got back to Havana? Was she going to divorce Ramon? My sister was a very pious woman. May she rest in peace. A religion would never permit such an act. I see. And, of course, there was the matter of family tradition. Oh, naturally. Did Ramon go to the airport with you? I had not seen Ramon since the night before, nor had Maria. We had uh, quarreled violently over his disgraceful conduct. Did Ramon know that his wife was taking Flight 6? I informed him the night before. Did you or Maria see him at the airport? Oh, no, senor. He was much too clever. He managed to keep out of sight. Then how can you be sure he was there? Senor Dollar, who else would be so vile as to place an explosive on board the plane? Oh, well, now I can follow your reasoning, but... The matter is self-evident. Well, look, I'm afraid we need more than self-evidence, Don Serrano. Uh, the problem of evidence is your responsibility, senor. I have told you who committed the deed. No, you've told me who you suspect. Do you doubt my word? Not as far as it goes. Sure you won't have some more coffee? No, gracias. Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, by sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, si, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane. But after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes, to some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35. See, si, he would fit that description. Blakely. Did you see her talking to anyone else? Uh, any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. 
Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. Well, I considered it a, a mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Ramon wasn't the only one with a motive. Wasn't the only one who will profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. Expense account item six, $12.60. Taxi fares in and around Mexico City. I checked with the federal police first. They had their best men working on the murder of the baggage handler at the airport. And so far, they turned up nothing. They didn't have a single lead. I went through their files on the other seven people who died on the plane. Nothing. Nothing. The two pilots and the stewardess were Cuban and apparently had no close friends or enemies in Mexico City. Two of the passengers were Brazilians and were only traveling through en route from the States. And as far as the other two were concerned, there seemed to be no motive. So it came right back again to the three I was already working on. Maria Delagos and the two business partners, Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke. The three people who'd bought flight insurance policies. And that left me with four possible suspects. Ramon Delagos, Maria's husband, Don Serrano, her brother, Marvel Terrence, and Bill Blakely, the partner of Palmer and Rourke. I checked with Inspector Mocklin, but he'd made no progress. With Gina Romero, no progress. I tried to reach Blakely, but he hadn't shown up at his office. I phoned Marvel Terrence and got a reluctant agreement from her to meet me for lunch. I waited for her at the Vendome for an hour. She didn't show up. Finally, at one o'clock, I went to her hotel. Si, senor. What can I do for you? I'd like to see Miss Marvel Terrence. I wonder if you... Ah, Miss Terrence. Que senorita tan bonita, tan hermosa. Yeah, well, if you'll... She's the most beautiful woman where I ever stay at this hotel. Yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, all right. Would you mind Sometimes telling... I think everybody in the world is in love with this senorita. All day long, it is one man after another which call up to talk to Miss Terrence. Well, would you ring her and tell her I'm Two waiting... Two times so many calls we get on the switchboard while the senorita is living. That's very interesting. And now would you We please... must forgive me, amigo. When I think of Miss Terrence, I lose all sense in my head. All right, all right. You're forgiven. Now, if you... What is it you wish, senor? Will you ring Miss Terrence and tell her I'm waiting down here in the lobby? Immediately, senor. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. Johnny... Leo L. Leo... How you spell it, please? D O L L A R. L A R. Gracias. I will tell her at once that you. Sacre nombre. I had forgot. Forgot what? She's not here no more, senor. What? She has checked out of hotel at 11 o'clock this morning. Expense account item 7, $2.10. Lunch at the Monte Casino Hotel alone. I was sorry she'd skipped. I guess I was secretly hoping Marvel would turn out to be in the clear. But if she were, then why run out? It didn't add up. I paid my check and started to leave the dining room. And at the entrance, I ran square into a man I was planning to see later in the day. He didn't seem very happy about it. Senor Dollar. How are you, Roman? It is a pleasure to see you again, senor. And I'd now, like to talk to you a couple me. of minutes. Come on, uh, let's step into the bar. But I have a most important engagement, senor. Oh, this is important, too. I understand you're a friend of Marvel Terrence's. I see. It is my honor and pleasure. Well, she's checked out of the hotel here. Do you know where she went? Oh, senor, I do not discuss the private affairs of my friends. Oh, knock it off, Ramon. This isn't a tea party. Ten people have been murdered by an explosion aboard a plane. One of them was your wife, remember? I cannot help you. I know nothing of Miss Terrence's plans. And now... I talked to your brother-in-law this morning, Ramon. Don Serrano. He tells me you're the one who put the explosive on board the what? plane. It is a lie. He seemed pretty certain of it. He tells me you stand to inherit half of your wife's estate. Then he is better informed as to the details of the matter than I am. 
I do not know what happens to the estate, senor. He seems to think you wanted to get your wife out of the way in order to have a free hand with Miss Terrence. Don Serrano, as you may have noticed, is a bigoted and jealous old fool who thinks only of money. He knows better than that. What do you mean? Maria was different from the women of your country, senor. She understood such matters as my friendship with Miss Terrence. And accepted them? Except such times as Don Serrano goaded her into being foolish, yes. It is a difference of the Latin temperament, senor. I see. Then there was no trouble between you and Maria. None of importance. The trouble was Don Serrano. He has hated me from the day of our marriage. Because from that moment on, he no longer had any control over Maria's fortune. If you wish to discuss this further, senor, I will be happy to do so later. But I must leave now. Con su permiso. I watched him hurry out of the hotel. I had no real reason to stop him and no authority to. On sudden impulse, I crossed the lobby to the public phones, called the Hotel Regis, and asked for Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Don Serrano had checked out. No forwarding address. I called the Del Prado and asked for Bill Blakely. Mr. Blakely had checked out. No forwarding address. I left the phone booth and hurried back to the desk. The clerk was very sorry. Ramon de Lagos had checked out earlier in the day. No forwarding address. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a rendezvous in a tropic port. And a lot of things come together. Things like romance, desire, and death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Macklin's office. Gino Romero. Oh, Gino. What did you find out? Did you locate any of them? Beneficiaries of the crash of Flight 6? Si, senor. It was an affair most simple. A matter of making a telephone call to the airport. Then they've left Mexico City. Si, senor. The senorita Marvel Terrence has taken the 10 o'clock plane this morning to Acapulco. Oh. Senor Blakely has taken the 11.30 plane to Acapulco. Senor Ramon de Lagos has taken the 2 o'clock... Plane to Acapulco. And what about Don Serrano? Oh, with him, he's different. At 2.45, he's depart from Mexico City in a special charter plane. Look, Gino, is there another flight to Acapulco this afternoon? But, of course, at 4.30. Already, I have two reservations. Good. I'll meet you at the airport. What's the flight number? Gino. I'm uh, scared to think of it. This one is also called Flight 6. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. 
Item 9, $63.45, incidentals in Mexico City and plane fare to Acapulco. One more of the sharp contrasts of Mexico. We left the stiff formality of the city behind us, the cool, thin air of the high plateau, and 50 minutes later, we stepped off the plane and into the steaming heat of the tropics. Barefoot tourists in shorts and barefoot natives in white cotton dungarees. Soft brown skins and flashing teeth. Mangoes, papayas, and the heady scent of tropical flowers. Blue sky, blue Pacific, and a burning sun. And a bay so bright and beautiful it breaks your heart. Acapulco. Gino Romero of the Department of Civil Air Transport knew his way around. So I waited for him while he checked his contacts. Airport police, custom agents, limousine drivers. And in a few minutes, he'd made his rounds and rejoined me in front of the terminal. It is an affair more simple, senor. A merely matter of ask the question and listen to the answer. What did you find out, Gino? The senorita Miss Turns is there at the Hotel Los Flamingos. So? Senor Blakely is also stayed there. Ramon de Lagos is go to the Hotel Caleta. And Don Serrano is stay at the Club de Pesca. So you see? Yeah, I see. All right, Gino, let's get going. And uh, where we are going is to the... Uh... We'll put up at the Los Flamingos. That is what I expect. Oh, she's very beautiful, senor. True, but there are even better reasons for staying there. ¿Qué dice? Well, in some way, I mean, I'm not sure how. I think this whole thing centers right around Marvel Terrence. You think it's possible she's guilty of the crash of the flight six to collect the insurance? Maybe. Or she might have been used. Or maybe... Oh, I don't know, Gino. But it's about time we found out. <laughs> Expense account, item 10, $1.50. Limousine fare from the airport to the hotel. The Flamingos is built on a point near the far end of the peninsula, set on a headland high above the white smother of surf below. And there, just before dusk, with the western sky, a yellow blaze of glory beyond the far rim of the Pacific, I found her. She was sitting on the open terrace by the edge of the cliff. And once again, she was alone. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. I suppose I should be surprised. But I'm not, really. I guess I rather expected you. Well, then wasn't it a waste of time to run away from Mexico City? I've always run away, I guess. And most of the time, I imagine you've been followed. Or maybe I wanted to face you here, where it's so beautiful. Where perhaps you'd be able to understand me a little better. Is that what you want, Marble? To be understood? Doesn't every woman? I thought it was more often the man. And usually it's his wife who doesn't understand him, isn't it? I see this isn't going to be just a social chat. <laughs> oh, I doubt if it could ever be just a social chat. Not with you. Now, you've got too much impact for that. A compliment? That's no, a fact. There's no place else in the world with sunsets like the ones here. Every evening. It's like there's another land way off there in the West. It's a strange, bright, golden land. And it keeps calling, coaxing. Only in a little while, it'll disappear. And everything will be dark off there in the West. Maybe you do understand me, Johnny. Maybe that's why I'm half afraid of you. <laughs> another reason I ran, maybe. I can be a fool, easy. Sort of hereditary defect, you might say. Oh, that's a common affliction. Rarely fatal. Rarely doesn't help. Once is enough. You know something? When I die, I want to be buried up there in the middle of a sunset. It'd be kind of lonely, wouldn't it? I think I've always been lonely. Do you know I haven't a single living relative in the world? Not one. I was 14 when my parents were killed in an auto accident. I stayed in a boarding school, and the bank handled the estate. When I was 21, they turned it over to me. And since then, I've... I guess that's not what you want to know, though, is it? Not exactly. Want to tell me about it, Marvel? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It would be better if you would. For whom? For me? I doubt it. I feel dirty, Johnny. Telling wouldn't change that. It might... Anything I'd tell you would be only suspicion, not fact. What in? Unless, of course, you're expecting a confession. Do you have one to make? No. But you know who caused Flight 6 to blow up and why, don't you? No. I can make a guess, that's all. Like to tell me that guess? 
You'll find out soon enough, Johnny, and I'd rather it didn't come from me. Eleven people have died, Marvel. I know. Ten on the plane that crashed and the baggage handler who was murdered later and You whoever... don't have to remind me of it. I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. I told you how I felt, now drop it, Johnny. All right, all right. I didn't know. That's all I can claim. I just didn't know. What do you mean? Nothing. Look. It's dark out there now. And sunset's gone. There's always another one. I wonder. Have you ever met Don Serrano, brother-in-law of Ramon de Lagos? No, but he was pointed out to me. Did you see him at the airport the night Flight 6 was blown up? I don't remember. I don't think so. Did you see Ramon? No. Did he know you'd canceled your reservation that night? He didn't even know I had one. Have Ramon and Bill Blakely ever met? <laughs> yes, they met. And detested each other on sight. Well, that's understandable in view of the circumstances. Oh, I guess, but... Why are people like they are? Did you arrange for Blakely to follow you here? I didn't tell anybody I was coming. And he was a good guesser. So was Ramon and Don Serrano. I know. They're all here. Why? They don't even know me. They don't want to know me. Not in any real way. But they're here. Oh, yeah, they're here. And I think you ought to tell me what you know, Marvel. Tomorrow, maybe. Not tonight. Let me have just one night, Johnny. All right. Take me to dinner. Dance with me. Laugh with me. Give me just one evening. Will you, Johnny? Sure. And thank my lucky star for the chance. You're sweet. I'm saying it now. Without any strings. No matter how things work out. I'll still mean it. You're a sweet guy, Johnny. Give me time to change. I went to my room and made two phone calls while I waited for her. The operator at the club, De Pesca, informed me that Don Serrano was not in. The clerk at the hotel, Caleta, said the same thing about Ramon de Lagos. I didn't leave my name with either of them. Bill Blakely was staying in room 23, a few doors on down the terrace, so I decided to go have a talk with him before I went out to dinner with Marvel Terrence. But as it happened, I didn't have to go to that much trouble. Yeah, who is it? Blakely, I'd like to talk to you. Come on in. Do you always cover your visitors with a gun? Only when I spot them listening outside my door. I don't know I what I saw you're... your shadow against the shutter there. You've been standing outside for the last five minutes, Blakely. You listened to me make a couple of phone calls. Did you learn anything you wanted to know? Dollar, suppose you were suspected of sabotaging an airliner and killing ten people. Wouldn't you want to know what kind of a case was being built up against you? What makes you think you're under suspicion, Blakely? I know I am. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were my partners. When they died on that plane, I became sole owner of the firm. There's the motive. I've got a warehouse full of dynamite in Mexico City. There's the method. I can go even farther than that. What do you mean? You mentioned one motive. Why didn't you mention the other one? What other one? Marvel Terrence. That crash not only eliminated a pair of business partners, it wiped out a couple of rivals. <laughs> Just one thing wrong with that dollar. Marvel had a reservation on that plane herself. She only decided at the last minute not to go. I wouldn't have been gaining much if I'd killed her along with my rivals, as you call them. Uh-huh. Maybe that's why you cornered her at the airport and argued her out of going. Yes, I... I did talk her out of the trip. But not because I'd planted an explosive on board. How do you feel about her, Blakely? I'd give my left arm. It wouldn't do any good. I'm just not the guy. I never have been and never will be. Maybe you are. She says she's having dinner with you tonight. That's right. She is. How do you feel about her, Dollar? I don't know. Expense account item 11, $26.40. Taxis, dinner, drinks, and dancing for two. The Copacabana with its blue lights and the surf right at your feet and a million stars low enough to touch the warm water of the bay lapping softly at the pilings. The Las Americas, the Casablanca, music, champagne, and the tropic night. And then finally, much later. Good night, Johnny, and thank you. Tonight, for the first time I can remember, I wasn't alone. 
And then, only an hour afterward, I was waking out of a sound sleep. Senor Dollar. Right with you, Gino. What was it? It's a senorita, I think. She's a number eight. Come on. But she wasn't a number eight. Her door was standing open and the room was empty. We searched the terrace out toward the edge of the cliff where I talked with her at sunset. We saw the broken section of railing and found one of her slippers and a pack of her cigarettes lying nearby. In pitch darkness, we slid and scrambled down the steep path to the beach. And there by the edge of the surf, we found her. The warm foam reached out for her, as though to carry her away. To that last sunset she'd loved so much. She looked very beautiful, but very much alone. As alone and as lonely as death. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... A desperate killer is cornered and strikes back in a deadly counterattack. Final showdown. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here is your call to Mexico City, senor. Oh, thanks. Hello? Macklin, Department of Civil Air Transport. Hi, Mac. Dollar, what have you learned in Acapulco? Uh, Not very much, I'm afraid. But you said you were following the girl down there. Marvel Terrence. Yeah, and a few others who might have had a hand in the explosion aboard Flight 6. Beneficiaries of the insured on that flight. What others? Ramon Lagos, whose wife died in the crash. Don Serrano, her brother. Bill Blakely, whose business partners were aboard. Well, have you and Gino learned anything from them? From the girl? Not yet. But you said she might know who caused that explosion aboard the plane. Right, and she promised to talk. Well? Your little helper, Gino, and I just pulled her body out of the surf down below the hotel here. Johnny. Murder? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Acapulco, Mexico, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for the phone call to Mac Macklin in Mexico City. I had to get Mac out of bed to tell him what had happened. That Marvel Terrence had been murdered. That somebody had silenced the girl around whom the whole case had seemed to center since Flight 6 had exploded in midair three nights before and carried the passengers and crew to their deaths. Mac was shocked and offered any additional help I might need. 
But he had no new information at his end, and it was obvious now that any answers would have to be found right here in Acapulco. As I hung up the phone, Gino Romero came rushing in from the hotel terrace. Senor Dollar. What is it, Gino? A prowler is out on the hotel grounds. The police car has got to block off the road at the bottom of this slope. Good, come on. The stairs are over this way, senor. Right with you. A little light wouldn't hurt anything down here. It's no time. This way, into the brush is a footpath. All right, lead the way. Over there is only 100 feet to the cliff. The other side is the road for the hotel. It is the only place anybody can go. It's down this slope. Yeah, but there are plenty of places to hide. I see, senor, but it's a matter... Oh, wait. Huh? Listen. Listen. We could hear someone moving through the jungle growth a few yards away, moving swiftly but cautiously. Then a sudden silence. Whoever it was, it also stopped and was listening for Gino and me. We waited for the fugitive to move again, straining our ears, trying to tag the location. Seconds passed. Then a slight rustle ahead of us. Gino nudged me and we slipped quietly toward the sound. Get your hands up. Well, well. Well, it's not your senor daughter. You seem to be quite a night owl, Don Serrano. You're not ordinarily, senor. The circumstances which place me in this rather awkward position are not usual ones, I assure you. You were up there prowling around the hotel. Why? I was looking for my unmentionable brother-in-law. Armando Lagos? Why? What made you think he'd be here? I went to his hotel... He was not in his room. I knew he had not been able to see Miss Terrence since she had spent the evening with you. So I assumed he might be waiting for her here, at her hotel. And my assumption has, of course, been proven correct. Did you see him? No, but I heard the police discussing the murder of Miss Terrence. It was obviously Ramon's handiwork. Still after him, huh? My feeling about Ramon is not a secret, senor. Nor his about you. So why did you go to his hotel? To kill him. Why else? Time was running out, so we took Don Serrano back to the hotel to the police. One very important person hadn't put in an appearance. Gina went down to Bill Blakely's room, knocked on the door, then opened it with a passkey and went in. Blakely wasn't there. We searched the room. The bed has been sleeping, senor. Yeah, yeah, I notice. But for how long, that's the question. It's possible he was wake up when the senorita screams before she escaped. He might have been... He must have dressed. His pajamas are there on the floor. I wonder. Sorry if it was a quarrel of lovers, the jealousy. He did not like it when the senorita was go with you tonight. I don't think it's that simple, Gino. Let's get this bag open. Have a look inside. Maybe we can. Oh, it's not even locked. He seems to have been traveling light. He... There on the top, senor. Yeah, I see. What is it? A box of thirty-eight caliber cartridges spilled open. And that piece of oilcloth. He had a gun packed in here. No, it's gone. He got up, loaded a gun and left, took the gun with him. If it was before the scream, that's one thing. But if it was afterward, then... What are you thinking, senor? I think we'd better take the police with us, get over to the Hotel Caleta and check up on our third suspect. Ramon? But Don Serrano said he is not there. Don Serrano could say anything. I think we'd better get over there, Gino, and do it fast. Clerk said room 34. That's the second door down. Let's see. Let's go. Ramon. Ramon. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Open up. Watch yourself, Gino. See. Si. Come on in, Dollar. You're Blakely. Yeah. Better hand over the gun, Blakely. You won't get a chance to use it now. The police are out in the lobby. Okay. All right, thanks. Ramon didn't show up, huh? I wish he had. That's all I was asking, just one clear shot at him. Are you sure he's the one who killed her? Sure enough. Did you see him? No, but he's the one. She was scared of him, Dollar. She told me earlier in the afternoon, before you got down here to Acapulco. Told you what? She said Ramon had followed her here from Mexico City. That he'd been acting strange. She said she was glad I was staying at the same hotel. 
and that she didn't want to see him or talk to him. Yeah, it figures all right. It checks with what she said to me last night. If she'd only given me a little more to go on. She was a real great kid, Dollar. The greatest as far as I was concerned. Yeah. As soon as I realized what had happened, I loaded my gun and came here to wait for him. I figured he'd try to get back to his room. But he didn't show. It's too bad. She was a real great kid. And I'd have died for her if she asked me to. I loved her. She was the... Ahí está. There he is. Come on, Chino. Si, senor. Roman had been spotted. He started to enter the hotel, saw the police turn and ran. He was armed with a pistol. He fired a shot at one of the police officers and then jumped over the balustrade and disappeared into the dark curve of Calita Beach. The police cars quickly threw a cordon along the Bayfront Street and blocked off both ends of the stretch of shoreline. For the moment, Roman was trapped somewhere on that beach. He tipped his hand now, and he was desperate and dangerous, and he had a gun. Gino and I went out on the beach after him. There is many place to hide here. Not for long. They'll have some more police here within a few minutes. Come on. It's maybe better we wait, senor. I do not think Ramon is planned to be taken alive. I can still see that girl, Gino, lying at the foot of the cliff. Si, senor. I remember. I... I swear to God. Oh, what is it? There, by the water, is... Oh, no, I am wrong, senor. It's only a boat pulled up on the sand. Yeah, it's a cattle boat. Well, I think it's better maybe we separate, senor. I look in the pavilion, the cabanas. You stay close by the water. In this way, we'll have him between us. Good idea, Gino. But you've got the rough end of it. Take care of yourself. Yes, senor. Well. Not much cover along the shoreline here. Do not move, senor. Do not make a sound. Well, Roman. So you were hiding behind that boat. I have nothing to lose now, senor. If you make one move or try to call out, I will kill you. Yeah, I think you would. All right, then, what comes next? This boat. You will push it into the water. But be very careful. If you make any noise, even by accident, I will kill you. Quickly now. Hurry. Relax, Roman. You don't have a chance anyway. We will see. Careful now. Be quiet. Good. Now get in, quickly. Sure. Take the paddle, head out across the bay, and be very quiet, or I will kill you. All right, Ramon. You're just wasting your time. They'll have a police launch out here within ten minutes. I do not think so. They will not go. Quiet! Quiet! One more sound from that paddle and I will shoot. Marvel Terrence. Why did you kill her, Ramon? He made me crazy. So beautiful. And with so very much money. I thought she would be most easy once Maria, my wife, was dead. Then it was you who blew up the airliner in order to kill your wife and have a clear field to go after Marvel. Marvel did not know I was married and Maria was going to tell so her. So you sabotaged a plane and killed her along with ten other innocent people. And what happened tonight? Did Marvel turn you down? He said she was suspicious of me. And she was going to tell you about it in the morning. And she said she was falling in love with you. She made me crazy. I wish you had got back into that hotel, Ramon. I wish you'd got there before I did, while Bill Blakely was still waiting for you with a loaded gun in his hand. Be quiet. And paddle faster. We must get farther up the coast in order... What is that? Police launch. What did you think? I told you you didn't have a chance. No, they could not get here so soon. Well, I forgot to mention the fact that they'd already phoned for one. And then they do not know yet we are out here. Good. Keep paddling. Quickly. He half turned his head to look back toward the launch. He took a chance and swung the paddle. <laughs> his shot went wild and he didn't get a second try. I caught him back in the air and he dropped like a log. Police located our boat a few minutes later and hauled him over the gunnel and into the launch. And that should have been the end of it. But none of us realized Ramon's insane desperation. He'd only been pretending unconsciousness. On board the launch, he snatched a gun from one of the officers and tried to take over the boat. He didn't have a chance. He took a full volley of shots from three police pistols square in the chest.
expense account item 13, $312.20. Hotel and incidentals in Acapulco and Mexico City and plane fare back to the States. Expense account total, $608.10. End of expense account, end of report. Remarks? I'll never see another sunset now without thinking of her somewhere out beyond it. I hope she doesn't feel alone anymore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a dead girl comes to life in a case that's packed with lies. Yet every one of them comes true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, Russ Thorson, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Taylor down at Tri-State, Johnny. Hello, Don. Happy New Year. Belated, of course. Same to you, Johnny. Listen, would you like to come over to my office and meet a pretty girl? Sure. Is she interesting? Very. As a matter of fact, she just told me the most interesting thing I've ever heard. Oh, what's that? She just told me that she was dead. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item one, one buck. Cab fare to the international building and Don Taylor's office. He was sitting behind his desk when I walked in, talking to a tall, dark-haired girl in her late twenties who was standing casually looking out the window at the street below. She was pretty, she was quiet, and she was well-dressed. Hello, Johnny. Thanks for coming right over. Glad to have you meet Mrs. McLean. How do you do? Hello. Sit down, Johnny. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, take my desk. Uh -huh. How are you going? I'm going to let Mrs. McLean talk to you alone. She has a most unusual story. Yeah, something about being dead, isn't that what you said? Yes, yes, something about being dead. Mrs. McLean, Mr. Dollar will be handling this matter for Tri-State. I wish you'd tell him exactly what you've just told me. Uh, ring the buzzer when you're through, Johnny. Oh, sure. sure. Um... Would you like to sit down? He thinks I'm crazy. That's what he thinks. Well, isn't it? <laughs> well, I doubt that. Well, uh, sit down. Let's talk it over. Of course he does. It's the first I've told it to anybody. It's fantastic. 
What do you say your name was? Johnny Dollar. Dollar. What do you do? I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. For him? For anybody who hires me. Here. Try one of these, Mrs. McLean. Thank you. I suppose I'll be put in jail, don't you? Look, Mrs. McLean, why don't you try to tell me some of the facts about, uh, well, about whatever it is. The facts are, I'm legally dead, Mr. Dollar, and my husband collected on my insurance policy. Mm -hmm. When did all this happen? Two years ago in Los Angeles. How much money did your husband collect on your insurance policy? Ten thousand dollars. Where is your husband? In Los Angeles. I suppose you tell me how it worked, Mrs. McLean. My husband's a doctor, Mr. Dollar. His name's Dave McLean. One night he had a patient come in, a girl. Well, she was in pretty bad shape. She'd been drinking somewhere, and she just came in off the street. Saw his shingle outside the office. I was there helping Dave as a receptionist. Oh. Dave took her into one of the examining rooms to see what the matter was. She had a heart attack. She died on the table. Well, there was nothing he could do for her. Nothing anybody could do for her. Mm -hmm. She died on the table, and then what? Well, Dave came out and told me what had happened. We looked in her purse to find out who she was and where she lived. There wasn't anything but an address in Jersey City. No Los Angeles address? No. Her name was Teresa Corbett. She was from Jersey City, and that's all. Then what? Well, Dave called long distance to the place in Jersey City. It was an apartment. He talked to the manager there. I see. Go on. Well, uh, well, Dave didn't say anything about Teresa Corbett being dead. He, well, he didn't have a chance, really. The, the manager was very upset. He told Dave that Teresa's mother had died very suddenly two days before. He said he'd been trying to locate her there in Los Angeles. Oh, he was very frantic. Well, Go on. It, it was just one of those crazy things. The, the apartment house manager was just about out of his mind. Teresa's mother had died in one of his apartments on his premises. He himself had, had assumed responsibility for the body. He didn't know what to do about a funeral or, or anything else. He told Dave that Teresa was all the old woman had in the world. Nobody else. And Teresa Corbett was dead in your office at the time? Yes. Well, Dave hung up. I... I didn't know what he was thinking at first, and and then he said to me, we're in luck. Mm. I asked him what he meant by that, and, and he said that the girl who had died in our office didn't have anyone in the world, and no one would know the difference. Then he told me we'd use her body. Just like that, huh? Yeah, just like that. He said it was the chance of a lifetime. Well, go on. Well... Dave called up Dr. Reed. He had an office across the hall from Dave. He waited a while, and and then I hid when Dr. Reed came in. Dave told him that I had had a heart attack. He took him back in the examining room and showed him the body of Teresa Corbett and told Dr. Reed it was me. It was awful. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I, I hid there in the back office and listened to them talk. They tried oxygen on the girl and shots and everything else. But it was too late. Dave knew it was too late. But, well, Dr. Reed signed my death certificate. Two days later, they buried Teresa Corbett under my name. And then what did you do? Well, I, I took a hotel room that first night, and then I went down to Palm Springs... Dave said he'd meet oh, me there. Oh, wait a minute. Dr. Reed had the office across from your husband's? Yes. Well, didn't this Dr. Reed know you? Hadn't he seen you around? You said you were acting as a receptionist for your husband. I, I'd never met Dr. Reed. He, he was just new. Okay. So you went to Palm Springs? Yes. After the funeral, Dave came down and he said I'd have to disappear for a while. To give him the time to collect the insurance money and straighten out some things. He collected the money? Yes. Yes, he did. All of it. Then what happened? I came to New York to live. Dave was going to close his practice in Los Angeles and come to New York and we'd be together again. He... He never met me in New York. Do you know why he never met you in New York? No. Did he write to you? Yes, for a while. For about three months after I left, he wrote me once or twice a week and, and said that he'd be in New York any day. And then he stopped writing. Do you have any of those letters? No. No, I'm sorry, I, I don't. 
Do you know why he stopped writing to you? No. I had no way of finding out. I, I couldn't call anyone in Los Angeles and ask them to look into it for me, could I? Tell me, uh, what is it you feel now, Mrs. McLean? What? Well, just what is it you want us to do? What? Well, I don't know. What do you do in, in a case like this? I've never had a case like this. Why did you come to us? Well, I... I've had this thing on my mind almost two years. It was wrong to begin with. It's wrong now. I suppose it's because this insurance company was wronged mostly. My my husband and I cheated them out of $10,000. At least my husband did. What about this Dr. Reed? Well, he didn't have anything to do with it. I, I mean, he just signed the death certificate, but he didn't know the difference. Are you sure about that? Quite sure about that. I don't want to get anyone into trouble. I, I mean anyone. Including Dr. Reed. Yes. Well, I... I know how, how fantastic all of this must sound, but... But it's the truth. Do you think I'm crazy? You don't look crazy to me. What's the saying? What saying? Oh, something about how you can leave home, but eventually you have to come back to count the spoons. I guess that's what I'm doing now. Telling you all this. Mm-hmm. It's good to tell it to someone after all this time. Did you get any of the insurance money, Mrs. McLean? Not a dime. Were you supposed to? I suppose so, yes. If Dave had met me... Would you say the whole thing was his idea? Yes. Yes, I would. I didn't know what he had in mind that night after he hung up the phone. You've been living in New York for the last couple of years since it happened, is that right? Yes. 2257 Street. Apartment 23. What have you been doing? How do you live? I've been working. I took a job in a medical lab. Under your own name? No. I used the name of Patricia Kennedy. Is there any way you can prove you're actually Doris McLean? I could in Los Angeles. How? Well, people there know me. Friends I've had all my life. Were you ever fingerprinted there? No, I... I don't think so. During the war, did you work in a defense plant, maybe? No. How about a California driver's license? I don't drive, no. Would you be willing to furnish me with a list of names of people who might be able to identify you? People in... in Los Angeles? Yeah, sure, anywhere. Well, yes. Yes, I would, if... If it's necessary. It's necessary. Don't you believe me? All of this has to be checked, Mrs. McLean. Now, what was the reason for trying to cheat the insurance company? Well, Dave was badly in debt. He, oh, he needed so many things. That, well, it, it seemed a good way to, to get them without too much trouble. You mean burying a girl named Teresa Corbett under your name? Yes. A girl without any family anywhere, with a mother who died two days before. Yes, very few people in this world are without somebody somewhere, Mrs. McLean. Teresa Corbett didn't have anybody, Mr. Dollar. I know that. Do you know any more about her than what the apartment house manager said on the telephone to your husband? No. Do you remember the name of the apartment house manager in Jersey City? No. The address? No. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me about all this? Well, I... I can't think of anything. No. Before I ask Mr. Taylor to come back in here, I want to ask you again. Why did you come to the insurance company? What? Why did you come here to Hartford to the insurance company? You asked me that once, and I told you. The insurance company were the people that were wrong. Now look, and... obviously you've been living and working in New York and getting along. No one knows anything about this. There was no need for anyone to know anything about it. No need for us to know about it. Now, you'll pardon me, but you don't seem like the type of person who wakes up one morning with a big pain in the conscience. Not at all. Now, you sat here and told me about your husband, how your husband thought of the idea, how your husband hung up the phone, how your husband called in a Dr. Reed to sign a death certificate, how, how your Dollar. husband handled every detail, all of it. Not you, Mrs. McLean, your husband. He's the one you want us to get, isn't he? Yes. He, he didn't have to meet me in New York once he got his hands on that money. He didn't have to do anything about me. I was dead. On paper. And I couldn't go back. I... I buy a Los Angeles newspaper now and then, and... I saw a notice yesterday that he's going to get married again. I see. But I'm still his wife. He tricked me. You helped him to do it? Who's he going to marry there? I didn't recognize her How name. How old are you? I'll be 30 next June. I'm going to ask you something else, Mrs. McLean. Have you ever been in trouble before? No. Well, you're in trouble now, if all this is true. Well, it is true. Now, Did I just told you... Did you be willing to sign that... a statement in front of witnesses containing all the information you've given me here today? Yes. Yes, I would. Okay. Yeah, Johnny? You can phone your legal department, Don. Mrs. McLean is willing to make a statement regarding this whole matter. 
All right. Mrs. McLean, you can make your statement in front of Mr. Taylor and whatever witnesses he wants to use. I'll see you in about an hour or so, Don. Good. You're, you're all through with me? No, there's one more thing, Mrs. McLean. Do you realize that if what you've told me is true, both you and your husband will be criminally charged? Oh, yes. Yes, I realize that. Oh, I... <laughs> Johnny, for heaven's sake, oh, you're trying to scare us. I just Johnny. wanted that part understood. I'll see you. Hey, Johnny, wait a minute. Don't worry. I'll be around. Plenty. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some well-thought-out lies. Well, believe it or not, they come true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Don Taylor. What do we do about Doris McLean? Find out if she's telling the truth about being legally dead and having her husband collect her insurance, Don? No, no, Johnny. I mean right now. You can't press any charges against her or him until we get some facts. Well, she gave us a statement admitting everything. Can't we file charges on that? Uh, I'd rather not. Huh? Why? Oh, just a feeling. Call it a hunch if you like. Now, wait a minute. Don, I don't think she's told us the truth. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. A dead girl who was very much alive. Expense account, item two, five dollars. Lunch at a little place called the Copper Kettle for myself and Don Taylor. I think we should act, Johnny. Yeah, well, I don't. Not yet. Look, I listened to her whole story. You listened only a part of it, so get this. She was married to a doctor in Los Angeles, Dr. David McLean. Yeah, yeah. One night, two years ago, a girl named Teresa Corbett walked into his office, a little drunk and a little sick. She had a heart attack. She died. The doctor found a name and a Jersey City address in the girl's purse. He called up the New Jersey address, and an apartment house manager told him the girl's mother, her only living relative, died two days before. Dr. McLean hangs up and tells his wife he'll bury the other girl under her name and collect the insurance. No sense in going into all this, Johnny. Now, wait a minute. Doris McLean agreed to this. Her husband calls in another doctor and has the death certified. Doris McLean goes to New York. Her husband collects the insurance. But didn't meet her in New York, as he said he would. Two years ago, this happened, Don. Today, she comes in and says, I'm tired of waiting for him. We cheated you. Do something to us. She also said she'd read a notice that her husband's going to marry some other girl. Makes sense to me. Yeah, well, not to me, Don. At least not all of it. Why? Why not? What are you looking for? The holes, the holes, and there are plenty of them, Don. 
Look, for one reason, she told it the same way both times. For the second reason, if all this happened on the spur of the moment in Los Angeles, that is, the girl came into the doctor's office off the street and died suddenly, why would the doctor bother to call New Jersey? Why wouldn't he call the Los Angeles police, for instance? Because he had the insurance thing in mind? Well, what do you think? Now, look, Johnny, I think you're pushing too hard in here. I'm trying to tell you what we're up against. All we have to do is verify her story. Yeah, well, there's something cockeyed in the way it comes out. According to Mrs. McLean's statement, the doctor thought of the insurance trick as he went along. That is, after he called Jersey City and found out the dead girl in his office had no one else in the world because her mother had died a couple of days before. After he saw he had a good chance. Yeah? He wouldn't have known he had a chance to pull the trick if he'd done what he was supposed to do and called the Los Angeles police. Yes, but... Now, that's important. And look, here's another thing. Mrs. McLean says she was acting as receptionist in his office when this strange girl came in. Now, I don't know about you, but every receptionist I've ever seen in a doctor's office will ask you your name and address before you see the doctor. Mrs. McLean didn't do that uh, at all. But... They'll get your name and address unless they already know it. Where's Mrs. McLean now? Over at the New Hartford Hotel. I asked Sam Benson to keep an eye on her until we file charges and take her into custody. Well, then you can call him off. Now, look here, Johnny. Every word she has told us will have to be verified before we can take any action like that. Every word. I don't know whether I want you to handle this or not. It's okay with me. Either way, Johnny. Now, wait, Johnny. Yeah. Want some more coffee? No, thanks. Let's not argue anymore. Okay, let's not. Mrs. McLean admitted she helped her husband cheat us out of $10,000. We've got that on paper. Look here. I made a check on the policy. We issued a straight-life policy in Doris Mary McLean in Los Angeles, April 23rd, 1945. According to our records, Mrs. McLean passed away February 1st, 1954. Yeah, yeah. Claim was filed by the beneficiary, husband, David Earl McLean, M.D., February 4th, and paid off on the 10th. $10,000 full claim. Here you are. Uh-huh. Uh, that's a photo stand of the death certificate attached. Yeah. Cause... Coronary thrombosis. Now, look at that signature. Dr. Willis Reed. That's the same doctor she said her husband called in. I know, I know. What else? A business about her living and working in New York in a medical lab. And this is the name of the place. Mm-hmm. She said she'd use the name of Patricia Kennedy. Well, I put in a call to their personnel manager. and described Mrs. McLean to him, and he said that sounded like her. Checked out. They'd been with him almost two years. Well, that's about it. Well, I call the airport and they'll get me out to Los Angeles by tomorrow morning. Thought it'd take a few hours in New York to check some other things out. Joe, sure. that looks pretty definite to me, especially with her statement and all the things she said. So what have you got to worry about, Johnny? All the things she didn't say. Expense account item three, $38.14. Transportation, Hartford, Connecticut to New York, New York. I checked my bag at Idlewild and took the limousine in as far as the Waldorf. Expense account item four, three dollars, cab fare and tip. Number 22, 57th Street. Doris McLean's residence, where she'd lived as Patricia Kennedy, apartment 23. I talked to the manager. This is her apartment, Mr. Dollar. I see. How long has she lived here? Moved in, uh, two years ago next month, uh, March 1954. Good tenant. Very. Why? Ever talk to her? Not much. Christmas time, we had a drink together down in my apartment uh, with my wife. First time I knew she worked in a medical laboratory. Mm hmm. Does she have any friends in the building that I could talk to? Not that I know about. She keeps to herself, minds her own business. May I ask where she is now? In Hartford, Connecticut, at the New Hartford Hotel, if you want to talk to her about anything. I might want to talk to her about you. So? You knock on my door and say you're an insurance investigator and you want to look at her apartment. I saw your credentials and all that, but I don't know about you now. She asked me to investigate a matter. This is part of the investigation. Well, if you feel any better, why don't you telephone her long distance, tell her I'm here. I'll pay the charges. Oh, that's okay. Do you mind if I look around? I'll have to stay with you, Mr. Dollar. An hour later, I located a Mr. Platt at the Hyde Park Laboratories where Doris McLean had been working using the name Patricia Kennedy. His answers concerning her conduct, habits, and attitude were identical with those of the apartment house manager. I talked to three people who had been working with her in the lab. Same result. 
Expense account item five, $2.25. Long distance phone call to Don Taylor in Hartford. Yeah? What'd you find out, Johnny? All clear here. Her story checks out about living in New York. I talked to the coroner's office in Jersey City. Oh? According to their records, a Constance May Corbett, age 61, died there January 27th, 1954. Body unclaimed. County buried her. Coroner's office unable to locate the next of kin, a daughter, Teresa Mary Corbett, believed living in Los Angeles. Well? Well, what do you want me to say? Coincidence or not, this part of it all checks out. Yeah, I'll admit that. Thank you. You're welcome. Expense account item six, $113.65. Transportation, New York to Los Angeles. We landed at International Airport in a heavy fog at 8.35 in the morning. By 9.35, I was in my room at the Statler Hotel sleeping. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I got up and showered and shaved and had something to eat. There was a special delivery airmail folder for me at the desk from Don Taylor. It contained a flash picture of Doris McLean, a sample of her fingerprints and handwriting, along with the names and addresses of several people in Los Angeles Mrs. McLean thought might be able to identify her. Expense account item seven, 50 bucks. Deposit on a rented car to get around Los Angeles. The first three addresses furnished by Mrs. McLean were blanks. No one home or whoever had been there had moved a long time ago. It was beginning to get dark by the time I got to the fourth one, an address on Berendo Street in Hollywood. Hello? Hello, I'm looking for Pauline Henderson. What do you want? I want to talk to her for a minute. My name's Johnny Dollar. Well, I'm Pauline Henderson. Oh, may I come in? What's your business? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, I don't have any insurance, and I don't want any. Well, it's about a case. Uh, wait a minute, I'll put on a robe. Yeah, sure. Hope you aren't going to try to talk me into buying an annuity or something like that. No, no, nothing like that, Miss Henderson. Oh, all right. Johnny Dollar, huh? Yeah, that's right. Insurance investigated, you say? Yes. Uh, come in. I thought maybe you could help me. Well, I'll try. I'm in something of a hurry. Only take a minute, Miss Henderson. I'd like to have you look at this. Mm hmm. Have you ever seen the woman in that picture before, Miss Henderson? It looks terribly familiar. Oh, is the light all right? Yeah, I can see it. My Lord, yes, I know her. Who is she? Well, that was Doris McLean. You're positive. Yeah, she was married to Dave McLean. He's a doctor here in Los Angeles. She died a year or so ago, very suddenly. Yes, so I understand. How well did you know Mrs. McLean, Miss Henderson? Oh, we were friends. I mean, we worked together in a medical lab here before she married Dave. How long did you know her? Five or six years. What is all this? Just wanted to make sure this was Mrs. McLean. My picture's of her, all right. Yes. You know, I don't think you've been exactly telling me the truth. <laughs> Well, I just had your name on a list, Miss Henderson. I was told that you might be able to recognize a picture of Doris McLean if you saw one. Who told you that? I'd rather not say. My, so mysterious. Well, I don't mean to be. You look nice enough. Is that all you want to know? Yes. Uh, well, one more thing. When did you hear about Mrs. McLean's death? The day after it happened. I read about it in the paper. It was quite a shock. Doris was always so healthy. How, uh... How did Dr. McLean take it? What? How did her husband take her death? Looking at a picture and saying yes or no is one thing. I, I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. Let's say I wanted to make sure this was Doris McLean, and I wanted to make sure she died two years ago. Well, if I'm any authority, you can be sure of it. How about the other part? Dave McLean? Yeah. Well, he got over it, I suppose. Don't you know? Well, I haven't seen him since the funeral. Uh, what's your name again? Johnny Dollar. Where do you live? Hartford, Connecticut. I'm at the Stapler Hotel here right now. Why? It just occurred to me, if you wanted someone to look at the picture and identify it, you'd go to Dave McLean and ask him. After all, he was married to her. You'd go to him. I would. Yeah. you go to him before anybody else. I think I'll call him and tell him about you. What do you think of that? That's all right with me, Miss Henderson. Expense account item eight, three dollars and fifteen cents. Long distance phone call, Los Angeles to Hartford. Don Taylor. Hi, Johnny Dollar. Doris McLean still at the New Hartford Hotel? Yeah, why? 
Better call your private eye pal, Sam Benson, and tell him to keep an eye on her 24 hours a day. Huh? What are you talking about? The cat's getting out of the bag here. What? I could be wrong, Don. But if I'm right, somebody might want to kill her. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bit of information about a girl who had a date to die. That's right. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the desk, Mr. Dollar. Your number's ringing now. Good. Hello? Hello. I want to talk to Dr. McLean. Who's calling, please? I'm not a patient. I just want to talk to him. This is Dr. McLean. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I want to see you. What about? About life and death, Doctor. You must be drunk, whoever you are. Do I come to your office or do I meet you? You come to my office, I'll call the police. Get busy, then. I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 10, $4, gasoline for my rented car. I was in the filling station at the Stadler Hotel having it filled up when George Riley stepped out from the lobby entrance. Hey, Dollar. Huh, Riley. I came down here to see you. What about what do you think? What about? All right, get in. I got to thinking after you left me today about my girl, Terry. And you know what happened? No. The police came to see me. They told me practically the same thing you did. They said they were getting up a court order to exhume the body. Her body, they don't know for sure yet. They'll have a job making the identification. My girl, Dollar. Yeah, you mentioned that. We both know it'll be her, don't we? Sure we do. They have to go through with all this legal stuff, huh? This has to be right. That has to be right before they can do anything. That's right. Yeah. Hey, where are you driving? Around the block. Dollar, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get my hands on the bird or put it down on the ground that way with somebody else's name. He was a doctor, wasn't he? That's what it looks like. Doctor who? You'll find out soon enough. 
let me ask you something. How would you feel if you got the kind of news I got today, huh? You'd feel pretty lousy. Well, I feel pretty lousy. I was going to marry Teresa Corbett a couple of years ago. I built her a nice house on a hill, and she disappeared. Just walked out. Yesterday, you come in, and you say she didn't walk out. She walked into a doctor's office one night and had a heart attack. You say this doctor gave her another name, his wife's name. He buried her and collected some insurance. And that's how she disappeared. Now, what about me? Huh? They came around to see me after she disappeared. They came around a lot asking questions. And now they think they found her. You and me know they found her, don't we? Yeah, I guess we do. I spent two years waiting to find her, and now she's dead. Why is she dead? I can't answer that yet. But this doctor, he can't answer it, can he? He took her and buried her under another name, just took her like she was some sort of clay doll, something used and something no one wanted anymore. He took her and buried her, and that was supposed to be that. Now, what's his name? (sighs) Riley, you better go home for a while. Yeah, sure. I'll phone you later. Dollar. She wasn't any clay doll. She wasn't something you give a phony name to and put in the ground. She was what I loved and wanted and needed. Did she walk into his office and die with her heart trouble, or did it happen another way? I don't know. You got ideas? I don't know. I don't know. Dollar. You gonna find out? Yes. If you don't find out, I will. I stayed right there and watched George Riley lurch across the street in a hail a cab. Then I turned back and found the freeway, rode it out to Sunset and all the way to the Pacific Palisades in the office of David E. McLean, M.D. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, sit down. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man in his early 30s. I shook hands with him and sat down. Well, that was a pretty startling telephone call, Mr. Dollar. I confess I was intrigued by it. You said you'd call the police. Well, I didn't. I don't know why I said that, really. <laughs> Tell me, what is on your mind? I'm an insurance investigator, Doctor. Or didn't a woman named Pauline Henderson call you and tell you I was in town? Pauline Henderson? Pauline Henderson. Well, I don't believe that A I... friend of your wife's, Doctor. An old friend who worked with her once. The kind of a woman who would recognize a picture if she saw it. I don't believe I remember her. Then she didn't call you and tell you I was in town. Well, that's all right, too. She said she might do that, though. Don't you want to know why, Doctor? Well, I suppose so. Yes. Why? Because I went over to see this Pauline Henderson the night I got in. She was one on a list of names of people who might know your wife on sight. Oh? She got kind of upset about my going there and asking her questions. I don't blame her. I'm a stranger to her. She finally said she'd tell you about it. I said, go ahead and tell you. And so... You just don't have any questions about anything, do you? (laughs) I'm completely baffled by this whole thing. What's your point? Don't you really know why I'm here, Dr. McLean? I haven't the least idea, but I can't tell you we're wasting a lot of time. This is a nice office, Doctor. How long have you been here? A year or so. Why? Starting out, it costs quite a bit of money for equipment like this. Rental in a building like this, doesn't it? I don't think that's any concern of yours, Mr. Dollar. I do wish that you'd say what you have to say or do what you have to do and get it over with, hmm? I don't know whether you're so anxious at that. Try me. I've been pretty patient with you. You come here and talk about a lot of vague things that I have no connection with at all. You make a strange phone call. You appear as though you're trying to intimidate me. You mention an old friend of my wife's... Pauline Henderson. Yes. What has she got to do with it? Nothing, really, except possibly as a witness... Oh? Witness to what? To an identification. She said she might call you. She was worried about an investigation I'm handling. What investigation is that? I understand you once treated a patient named Teresa Corbett. Teresa Corbett? Last treatment two years ago, February 1954. I had offices over in Hollywood in 1954. Are you quite sure that you have the right doctor? I am. I don't remember a patient by that name. What did I treat her for? A heart condition. Oh? Well, we'll soon find out. Corbett, eh? Teresa Corbett. 
Uh, when was this now? February, 1954. Mm -hmm. well, I don't have anyone by that name in my files, Mr. Dollar, but it must be important if you came all the way to Hartford to ask about it. It's pretty important. Well, she might have come in for some little thing. and In that case, I wouldn't necessarily have a history on her. I understand she came to see you quite a few times. Could it have been another, Dr. McLean? It was you. Well, that's funny. Oh, now, wait a minute. Two years ago. My wife was my receptionist then. She wasn't too good at keeping records. Do you suppose I could talk to her and ask her? My wife is dead, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Sorry I can't be of more help. I thought every doctor kept a record of all his patients if they just came in with a nosebleed. Well... Now you see that you're wrong. <sighs> now that we've gone through all this, let's get down to business. What do you mean by that? I'll come right out and say it, Doctor. You should have kept a file on Teresa Corbett. You should have kept that one above all things. The fact that you don't have one is going to make me believe a lot of things I haven't really believed up until now. What things? What are you talking I'm about? I'm talking to you about your wife, who isn't dead at all. What? Four days ago, she came to me in Hartford, Connecticut. She said that Teresa Corbett died in your office one night and that you identified the body as your wife's. What and what's you... more, you collected $10,000 worth of life insurance on her. Here's a picture of the woman who gave me that statement. Is this your wife? Well? All right, I'll tell you. It is your wife, Doris McLean. And she's still very much alive. And the story she told me in Hartford is pretty much the truth. I've never seen the woman in that picture in my life. I ran into one person here in Los Angeles who recognized her right away. I've got a list of eight more people who'd probably recognize her. I can go to every one of them and get their statements to that effect, but I don't think I need to. I've got a pretty long statement from Doris McLean herself. It tells the whole story. Would you like to read it? No. Then maybe you'd like to make a statement yourself. I have nothing to say, Mr. Dollar. I didn't think you would, Doctor. <laughs> On the strength of the evidence already assembled, I preferred charges against Dr. David McLean. He was taken into custody and arraigned for defrauding an insurance company. He refused to talk at the arraignment and afterwards when he was held in the city jail. Expense account item 11, $2.20 telegram. I wired Hartford advising Don Taylor of the events in Los Angeles. The following morning, I received an answer from him to the effect that he was bringing Doris McLean to Los Angeles. That should have made the case complete. That and the fact that the coroner's office had exhumed the body and it had been identified as Teresa Corbett. Well. Hello, McLean. What now? Oh, I thought we could talk. We can't, so that's that. We have your wife's statement how the whole thing worked. The coroner's man identified the body of Teresa Corbett. So? Your wife will be here tomorrow sometime. Her testimony will cinch it. Will it? You know it will. I want a statement from you. <laughs> Look, we aren't in a courtroom now, McLean, but we will be. It'll be a tough case from top to bottom, but we'll get you, and we'll get you good. A statement from you right now might save you some trouble, save you two years on your sentence. Oh, you're here to give me a break. No, I'm here because my job says I'm supposed to be here. I wouldn't want to save you anything, brother. The longer they send you up, the better I'm going to like it. But I'm not going to push too hard for a statement from you. I'm just giving you the chance to have your say-so right now and suggest that you go into court with a guilty plea. It's up to you. You know something? You'll never get me into a courtroom. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, one morning newspaper, which carried a complete story of the McLean case as well as the information that Dr. McLean had denied all charges and was freed on bail. That, along with his remark about not appearing in court, worried me. An hour later, I was out in the Palisades looking for a San Vincent home address. It happened to be a two-story building, but I didn't get up to his apartment soon enough. Hold it! Stop! Riley. You don't have to worry about your doctor friend anymore. You fool, you crazy fool. The court would have taken care of him. No. I wanted to do it personally. Oh, Riley. For my girl, Johnny. <laughs> For my girl. <laughs> now, 
here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a brand new, a rather startling statement from Mrs. McLean. Without lies. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny Don Taylor. Are you here in L.A.? With Mrs. McLean. Why didn't you meet my plane? Dr. McLean's been shot. What? Teresa Corbett's boyfriend, a guy named Riley, pumped three slugs in him this afternoon. He was afraid McLean might get off. McLean's still alive? He's hanging on, but they don't give him much of a chance. I'm on my way to the hospital right now, L.A. General. Meet you there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 13, $10, rental, for a tape recording machine, which I took with me to the hospital room of Dave McLean. Don Taylor met me in the hall. Hi. Hi. Where's Mrs. McLean? I turned her over to the police. Do you know about this? No. Who's this man, Riley? Oh, just a lonely guy who lost his girlfriend. Let's go. Wait a minute. There's something else, isn't there, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. I think there is, Don. I'm going to try to get it from McLean now. That's why I brought this thing. What'll happen to Riley? He's being held for assault with a deadly weapon intent to kill. If McLean dies, it'll be changed to murder. Mr. Dollar? Yes? You can go in now. This is Mr. Taylor. I'd like him to come in, too. It's all right. This way, please. The nurse led us down to the end of the hallway and into McLean's room. Transfusion equipment was rigged up on one side of him and intravenous on the other. He watched us walk in without a word until he saw me set up the recording equipment. What do you think that's for? You, McLean. That <laughs> statement we were talking about. What statement? You know how bad off you are. It doesn't make any difference now. <laughs> Who's this man? My name's Taylor. Police. I'm with Tri State Underwriters. Oh. <laughs> you must be a close friend of Doris. She that? came out here with him, McLean. How is Doris these days? She's made her statement. <laughs> Squeeze play. How about you? No. I'm not going to say a thing. Oh, now, McLean. T tell you what I'll do. We'll talk about it later. There may not be a later. I think there will be. <coughs> I'm going to bet on it that way. It's tough, Dal. You struck out again. There's always your wife. She won't tell you anymore. She's got her own troubles. I think you'd better leave now, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. McLean's chances for recovery were one in ten. That isn't very good odds. But as he said, he was going to bet on himself. 
And he won. Three days later, he took a turn for the better. Within a week, he was walking around the hospital. The trial date was set for him to answer charges of defrauding an insurance company. Mrs. McLean was named co-defendant. All set. When do you take off, Don? About five minutes. Good night for flying. Yeah. Now, what's the matter, John? Oh, I don't know. This whole case, the people in it, I I just don't know. You ought to be satisfied. You've certainly done your job. McLean's are going to stand trial, and there's no doubt they'll be convicted. You testify in court, and that's about it. I know. Don. Yeah? There's more to it. Why? I know there is. There has to be. McLean's slick enough not to open his mouth. He hasn't admitted anything. His wife's done all the talking. Sure, that's true. But what she said was enough for us. Was it? Well, wasn't it? Not for me, Don. Johnny, what is it? <sighs> Riley, I suppose, and that poor girl, Teresa Corbett. A couple of little people walked into it. Riley's suffering worse than the McLean's. Then they'll suffer. He lost somebody he loved. She died naturally. He would have lost her sooner or later. The McLean's had nothing to do with that. Didn't they? No. Well, I've been thinking about it. Just go in and testify in court and come home and try to forget about it, will you? Maybe you're right. Flight 913, Chicago, New York, and well, Boston now boarding. Seen a few days, Johnny. Okay. Bye. One thing, Don. Yeah? Suppose go Teresa board. Corbett had been my girl. So long, kid. John Taylor went back to Hartford and left me to wrap up the details and testify in court. The day before the trial, I went over to the county jail to interview Mrs. McLean just once more. Hello. Hello. The uniform isn't too attractive, but they say it's a very healthy life in here. I mean, the regular hours and all. I suppose I should try to get used to it. Yeah. How, how long will I have to go to prison? Well, that's hard to say exactly, Mrs. McLean. Well, my lawyer said not over three years if they convict us. Three years isn't too long. No. Sit down. Where's my husband? Uh, where's Dave? He was transferred to the county jail today. Is he all right? Seems to be getting along fine. I haven't seen him, you know. You'll see him in court. Oh, I wish it were all over. So do I. But it isn't, is it? Practically. Not at all. Well, what do you mean? So far, we have enough evidence to prove conspiracy against you and your husband, and we'll prosecute to the limit on that. There'll be some other charges against him, the business with the body and so on. Let's not go into that now. But there's something else here I want to get straightened out. This is your statement. Yes. Let me read you this. A girl, whom we later found out to be Teresa Corbett, walked into the office on the night of February 1st, 1954, and complained of feeling ill. She had been drinking. My husband took her into the examining room where she died a few minutes later of a heart condition. Those are your own words on this sworn statement, Mrs. McLean. Yes. Let me go on. I had never seen or heard of Teresa Corbett until that night. I was with my husband when he placed a call to her residence in Jersey City. He spoke with a man there who managed an apartment house and so on. Mrs. McLean, that call was never made. I was in the room when Dave made it. The phone company has no record of it, no bill for it. I mention this to you because we are going to mention it at the trial tomorrow. You have my statement. Are you trying to make a liar out of me? The fact remains that call wasn't made. Were you in the examining room when Teresa Corbett died? No, I was in the front office. Isn't it a fact that she was a patient of your husband's before that night? No. I found out, I'll tell you. Teresa Corbett was one of your husband's patients. Why, she... She came here to live in Los Angeles because of a heart condition she had. He was the doctor she went to see. She just didn't walk in that night and drop dead. If that's true, I didn't know it. That night you said you were acting as a receptionist in your husband's office. When Teresa Corbett walked in, she must have given you her name when she asked to see the doctor. Well, she didn't. Frankly, I, I thought she was just a little drunk. She, she'd been drinking. I, I could smell it. And you just took her right on back to your husband without asking a name where she lived, anything about her? Yes. Now, look, Mrs. McLean, a lot of things you've told me and put into this statement are true. They've all been checked and rechecked. That's my job. But some of them just don't make sense. What are you trying to do? You wouldn't have known anything about it if I hadn't come to the insurance company. Maybe that's so. Maybe it would have just gotten by. But you did come to us. And whether you knew it or not, we have to know everything now. Everything, Mrs. McLean. Why do you think we've gone to all the trouble and expense of checking all this? I'll tell you. Because your story was too good to be real. It couldn't happen that way, even though the facts seem to say it could. Why, a girl you... alone and friendless in Los Angeles dying of a heart attack in a doctor's office. A doctor who needs money and has a wife who's heavily insured. That's too much for me to take. 
Teresa Corbett was a patient of your husband. She had been for several months. She came in like anybody else. You or your husband took her personal history. And you noticed that she had only one living relative, a mother in Jersey City. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? I'm talking about premeditated, carefully planned murder. That's what I'm talking about. When Teresa Corbett's mother died suddenly, there was nobody left to worry about her. Nobody to ask questions about her anymore, right? That's what you thought, anyhow. But there was a man, George Riley. But he didn't know where to go or who to ask. He didn't know about him. All right. Teresa came in several times, and you and your husband got to know more about her. She was the patsy right from the beginning. Wasn't she? Wasn't she? Yes. Do you want to tell me about it? She had been in to see Dave several times. He knew all about her, where she was from, what family she had. That night, when she came in the office, she wasn't drunk. She hadn't even been drinking. She'd had a telegram. She, she'd just received word that her mother had died suddenly. She was terribly upset about it. She, she asked Dave for something to help her sleep. Go on. Well, he took her in the examination room and... He came out a few minutes later to get some drugs, and, and he said something about her case being a terminal. Terminal? You mean it was hopeless? Well, that's what he said. He said he didn't give her more than six months. It wasn't true, Mr. Dollar. She wasn't that sick. Then what? Well, Dave went back to the examination room. I, I just sat there and waited. I guess I knew what he had in mind. Had you talked about it? Well, we talked... Oh, no, not about what happened then. A few minutes later, he, he buzzed me to come back to the room. I went back there, and Teresa was lying on the table. She was dead. Uh-huh. I knew it when I walked in there. Dave looked very strange. He said that she had had a sudden heart attack and died before he could do anything to help her. You know it wasn't so. Well, there was a hypodermic on the stand. He'd given her something. Well, I just didn't think he'd go that far. Are you sure you hadn't discussed this before? No. I swear he hadn't said a word to me before that night. But he had it all planned. That is what to do and everything when I came back to the room. He called Dr. Reed. Dave showed him Teresa and said it was me. Reed signed the death certificates? Yes. When did you leave town? The same night. Dave made me. He said he'd handle everything. I accused him of killing her, and, and he said that she just died there. Well, I guess I was kind of hysterical, but but then he said, all right, I did kill her. She didn't have long anyhow. I killed her, and you helped me kill her. Now get out of here and stay out of here. If you ever open your mouth about it, you'll go to the gas chamber with me. Do you want a cigarette? Yes, please. Here you go. Thanks. I told you that story. I mean about the phone call and all. To get back at him. I never thought that I'd tell you this part, too. Oh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad it's all over. Expense account item 14, $85.40. Hotel and board while in Los Angeles. Item 15, $205. Plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $798.60. Remarks? Murder charges have been filed against the McLeans, and they stand trial next month. George Riley received three years and a suspended sentence for assault with a deadly weapon. I was wrong about practically everything in this case. All the lies came true, but so did the facts. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, cui bono. That's Latin for who benefits. And believe me, it isn't the killer in the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. 
Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Betty Lou Gerson, John Stevenson, Bob Bruce, Victor Perrin, Tony Barrett, and Herb Ellis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Don Hancock, Johnny. Surety Mutual. Hi, Don. What's on your mind? Qui bono. Qui who? It's Latin, kiddo. Qui bono. Who benefits? All right, I'll bite. Who does? A little doll named Luann Parker down in Green Pass, Virginia. A hundred thousand dollars worth, Johnny. Double indemnity. Wow. What did she do? Answer the question? She sure did. With a thirty-eight. Two bullseyes right in her foster papa's heart. Well, then if it's an open and shut case, you don't Oh, need... it's that all right. She's the gal what done it. She admits it. But the coroner is about to call it an unavoidable accident. Seems little old Magnolia Blossom thought papa was a prowler. And what do you think? Just what I said. Qui bono. So? I think you'd better put yourself on the payroll. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Qui Bono matter. Item 1, $78.45. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Green Pass, which was a village of some 12,000 people, hidden among quiet wooded hills, and located, as I discovered on arrival, some three miles from the railroad station. Nice weather we're having. Yeah, it's fine. You from New York? Well, near there, Hartford. Bet you ain't been having weather like this up there. No, no, it's been pretty cold. You say your name was Dollar? Yeah, Johnny Dollar. I'm Jake Deagley. You here on business? That's right. Well, I wouldn't count on finding much here. Green Pass is what you might call a one-horse town. One hotel, one bank, one taxi, that's me. One newspaper. And one county attorney. Yep, just one... Oh, and you've heard about our tragedy, about Dan Parker getting shot. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm an investigator for an insurance company. I see. Well, it was a terrible thing. It was... Oh, doggone it, doggone it. If old man Hawley don't fix up them fences, he's going to be short a cow one of these days. That's the third time this week they've been out the road. How do people around here feel about Dan Parker? Was he well-liked? Well, he'd been re-elected for five straight terms. No personal enemies? Not a one. There ain't a man in Green Pass that... Hey, what difference does it make whether he was well-liked? You know how he was killed, don't you? Yeah, I understand he was shot accidentally by his stepdaughter. That's right. And what difference does it make whether he had any enemies? Well, none, probably. But when an insurance company holds a policy as large as the one they carried on Dan Parker, they want to know the full circumstances surrounding the death. Well, there ain't no mystery about it, Mr. Dollar. That poor girl took him for a burglar and shot him, that's all. And it mighty near broke her up. Say, what about her, Jake? Is she well-liked? Well, let me put it this way. I'm 52 years old. I got a grandson, 17. And we're both in love with Lou Ann Parker. I see. 
And there's 5,000 other males in Green Pass that feel the same way. She get along all right with her stepfather? They worshipped each other. She was all Dan had since Mrs. Parker died nine years ago. They was thicker than thieves, them two. Rode horseback together, went fishing, took trips together. Well, then it's understandable that she'd be pretty broken up. It was terrible for her. She went clean out of her mind when she realized what she'd done. So tell me, was Dan Parker a wealthy man? No, fairly well to do for these parts, but no way as wealthy, the way you'd think of it in New York, for instance. Then I imagine the Parker girl would think of a hundred thousand dollars as being a pretty sizable fortune. Mr. Dollar, let me give you a little advice. Oh? You got a job to do, fine. But if I was you, I'd be mighty careful how I went about doing it. Why so? Well, people up here in the hills are kind of standoffish at best. And if you go around hitting what you seem to be hitting at, you're going to get yourself a mess of trouble. <laughs> I don't deal in hints, Jake. All I'm trying to do is dig up all the information possible, let the company know exactly what happened. That sounds fair enough, Mr. Dollar. But you take my advice. Dig easy. Jake Digley's one-man taxi service dropped me off at the town's one-man hotel. I signed in, left my bags, and did a quick resume of the case which Don Hancock had given me in New York. I tried pumping the hotel proprietor, but when he found out who I was, he frosted up like a mid-julep on a sultry day. But he did tell me I could find the sheriff across the square at the town's one pool room. It turned out to be a one-man place, too. And at the moment, Sheriff Jim Peterson was the one man. Glad to know you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, just a second now. Uh, watch me get that uh, three ball down there. <laughs> Good shot. No, that was a setup. You couldn't miss one like that if you wanted to. Uh, that something on your mind, sir? Yes. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm here in connection with the Parker case. I'll see. Oh, God. Well, I don't think I'd call it a case exactly. It was an accident. There ain't no mystery about it, as far as I can see. I didn't mean to imply that there was, Sheriff. As it stands now, this is a routine investigation, nothing more. I just like to get the facts, find out exactly what happened, in order to furnish my company with the report they need to pay the claim. I'd uh, appreciate your cooperation if you've got the time. Oh, I got the time, all right, sir. <laughs> you know, how much you know about it? Well, uh, not much. Dan Parker, as I understand it, was your county attorney here. His stepdaughter, Luann Parker, who is the beneficiary under our policy, mistook him for a prowler, shot him, and killed him. Now, that's about it. Uh, well, a thing happened three nights ago. Dan had been up to Richmond on business. He'd come back in on a midnight train. He walked down from the station. Walked three miles at that time of night? Well, it's a little over two to his place. It's outside of town a ways. Well, that's still quite a walk. Why didn't he call this uh, taxi driver, Jake Digley? Yeah, well, he probably did try to, but Jake wasn't expecting any business, so he took a night off. He was out at Happy Hollis. See, that's a kind of a roadhouse about five miles up the highway. Does Dan's daughter have a car? Yeah, she does. But I figure he didn't want to bother her at that time of night. See, he wasn't due in until the next afternoon. But it appears like he finished up his business and decided to come on back at night without letting Lou Ann know or anybody else. Now, let me see here. Was he in the habit of coming back unexpectedly from trips? Mm, no, I wouldn't say he was. Well, go on. Huh? Oh, well, uh, Dan didn't take many trips. And when he did, he most always made arrangements with Jake or Lou Ann to meet him at the station. I see. So, anyway, he walked home that night, and he took a shortcut through the lane and come on in the back way across the terrace. And right there was his fatal act. Oh, what do you mean? He bumped against the lawn chair. And the sound woke up Lou Ann. And then she heard him fumbling with the lock of the back door and heard him come on in the house. She took a thirty-eight pistol from a drawer of her night table and went to the head of the stairs. When she heard him start up, she fired twice and... Killed him. Mm-hmm. Were there any lights on in the house? No, she was afraid to turn on any light. And I reckon Dan was trying to keep from waking her up. 
Two shots, two bullets in the heart, firing down a stairway in pitch darkness. <laughs> That's pretty good shooting, Sheriff. Oh, well, she can out, out shoot me, Mr. Dollar. And I'm known as one of the best in these here parts. Uh, who taught her? Well, Dane taught her himself. He figured a girl ought to be able to protect herself. So tell me something, Sheriff. Did she have any reason to think it might be a prowler? Have you have you had any trouble of that kind around town? Oh, three weeks ago, there was a house broke into over on the south side. And twice since then, Dan called me in the night to come out and take a look around his place. Oh, why? Well, seems Lou Ann thought she had somebody trying to break in. And did you find anybody? Nope. Was Lou Ann alone in the house the night of the shooting? Well, Mary Jackson was there. Who, uh... Well, she'd been housekeeper for the Parker for the last 15 years. Uh-huh. What's her version? Same as I told you. She heard the shots, saw the lights in the hall come on, and heard Blue Ann scream, Father! How did the girl and her father get along? Well, couldn't have been any closer. She pretty broke up about it. Uh, you talked to her yet, Miss Dollar? No, not yet. No, I didn't think so. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Well, I mean, if you had, you wouldn't be asking a lot of these questions. Or at least you wouldn't be asking them in the way that you are. What way, Sheriff? Well, like you figured the Parker girl was actually guilty of something. Well, she did pull the trigger, didn't she? And with sufficient reason. She was nervous. She'd heard prowlers around before, or at least thought she did, which adds up the same thing. She thought she heard somebody break in. She knew she couldn't count on Mary for any help. She had a gun, knew how to use it, so she got up her courage and done a natural and normal thing. She used it. And she'll regret her mistake the rest of her life. Yeah. And yeah, that's the way the picture seems to work out. At the moment, at least. You got any reason to doubt it? I get paid to doubt things, Sheriff. Until I satisfy myself that there's no reason to doubt them. And that's all I'm trying to do. It's all the insurance company expects me to do. I'm not out to pin anything on this girl or to get out of paying her claim. Provided it's legitimate. It is. Well, then she's got nothing to worry about. If the thing happened as you just told me it did, then I have as much sympathy for her as you do. It'll be a pretty rough memory to live with. I just want to be sure, that's all. All right, Miss Dollar. You look around. You talk to people. Ask any questions you have a mind to, but you're going to come out right back where you started at. You're probably right. Dan and me have been friends for years. Good friends. Now, if I thought there was the slightest doubt about this, I would be the first one to kick up a fuss and go after the truth. Even if the evidence pointed toward Luann Parker? No matter where it pointed to. Well, now, look, I want to talk to the housekeeper and to Miss Parker herself, and I'd like to attend the coroner's inquest, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. But you're a little late. Huh? It was hailed this morning. What was the verdict? Death by misadventure, unavoidable accident, with no recommendation for prosecution. I see. Would it be possible for me to see a copy of the transcript? It would. I'll ring the coroner and tell him to expect you. But let me give you a little piece of advice, Mr. Dollar. All right. Folks in these here parts love that girl. So when you start walking around asking questions, walk easy. I went over the coroner's report and found nothing. Lou Ann had been called as a witness and appeared to have answered all questions in a frank and a straightforward manner. I checked her school record. She was regarded as an unusually bright girl and had stood at the head of a class all through high school. She'd been elected cheerleader in her junior year, won the lead in the class play, had been chosen queen of the senior prom. She was the town's darling. They worshipped her. And I could see that casting any aspersions on her would be like an attack on the crown jewels. I began to feel like a peeping Tom, like a louse, like I was wrong. And yet, qui bono? Who benefits? Two bullets in a man's heart and a hundred thousand dollar payoff. I had to be sure. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, beauty is as beauty does. And an idol is found to be made of flesh and blood. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Bates, Mr. Dollar. Tom... I'm acting county attorney since Dan Parker's death. Oh, yes. I was looking for you earlier. So Sheriff Peterson said. What was it you wanted to see me about? Didn't Peterson tell you why I'm in town? Yes, of course. You're an insurance investigator. You're here in connection with Parker's accident. Accident, did you say? I thought the sheriff straightened you out on that. He tried his best. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you any Mr. more... Mr. Bates, than... are you in your office at the moment? Yes, I am. Stay there, then. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the Home Office Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the qui bono matter. Expense account continued. Item four, five cents, for a copy of the Green Pass Weekly Sentinel. I glanced through it as I walked across the square from the hotel of the courthouse. The big news, of course, was the tragic death of longtime county attorney Dan Parker. And two columns of the editorial page were devoted to eulogy and sympathy for the dead man's adopted daughter, Luann, who had mistaken her father for a prowler and shot him to death with his own gun. But neither the editorial nor the front page mentioned the fact that Luann, because of her mistake, stood to collect $100,000 worth of insurance. Come in. Are you Tom Bates? That's right. My name is Dollar. I just talked to you on the phone. And I told you I had nothing to say. Um, Mind if I sit down? Now, look here. You look, Mr. Bates. I've been in the business of insurance investigation for quite a while. And I probably know the legal rules and responsibilities of your office about as well as you do. Get out, Dollar. For two cents, that's exactly what I'd do. And if I did, you'd find yourself in a real tight spot. What are you talking about? The company would have a battery of high-powered legal eagles in town by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And they'd have a subpoena, a restraining order, an order to show cause so quick it'd make your eyes bug out. And that's where it would start to get embarrassing, Mr. Bates. When you tried to explain to the court why you were withholding evidence and refusing to cooperate. What do you mean, refusing to cooperate? I haven't refused a thing. It sounded that way to me. I don't care how it sounded. I... Look, I know what you're up to. Peterson told me why you're here. Oh, You're out to muddy this thing up. You're trying to pin something on Miss Parker so you can get out of paying the insurance claim. And subpoena or no subpoena, you'll get no help from my office on a crooked deal like that. Any reason for you to think something could be pinned on her, Mr. Bates? Of course there's no reason. You saw the transcript of the coroner's inquiry, didn't you? I did. Well, did you find one single hint of suspicion anywhere in it? No, no. Not much of anything else for that matter. Are you always as gentle with your witnesses as you were with Miss Parker? The girl was half out of her mind with grief, on the verge of a breakdown. We got the facts. What more do you want? Maybe we should have thrown her in jail, beat her up with a rubber hose, starved her till she thought of something to confess. Is that the way you'd have done it? Oh, relax, Mr. Bates. You're not in the courtroom. No, and by heaven, I'm not going to be. Not on this case. Because there's no reason. How long have you been in love with the Parker girl? Ever since I... What difference that make? It might help to account for your attitude about this. What is it you're thinking? That I'm helping her get away with something? Covering something up for her? Or that all of us are, maybe? Everybody at the inquest? (laughs) Well, it wouldn't surprise me too much, the way this whole town gets up on its high horse the minute you ask a simple question about the girl. Well, what do you expect? When you go around insinuating... Insinuating nothing, Mr. Bates. I haven't accused Miss Parker of a thing. I have no reason to. And regardless of what you think or Sheriff Peterson thinks, I didn't come here to frame her, to pen something on her. I want just one thing. The complete detailed story of Dan Parker's death. And I'm going to get it one way or another. Well, nobody's trying to prevent you. I'm glad to hear it. Then how about some cooperation? What do you want to know? How long have you been Mr. Parker's assistant? Almost three years. And now you automatically become county attorney, is that it? Yes, until the next general election. Do you intend to run for the office at that time? Possibly. I don't see... How did you and Parker get along? Fine. Why? Well, did he approve of your interest in his daughter? 
Well, he certainly preferred me to... Well, anybody else in the run. Who else is in the running? Nobody, actually. Are you engaged to her? Not officially. She doesn't think she's quite ready to settle down. Uh Uh-huh. But if she had been ready, you... You think Mr. Parker would have welcomed you as a son-in-law, huh? I think so. I didn't kill him, Mr. Dollar. (laughs) Ever have any arguments with him? No. None of any importance. Who were his enemies, Mr. Bates? He didn't have any. A county attorney without a single enemy? That's a little remarkable, don't you think? That was the type of man he was. He'd usually let sleeping dogs lie. Easy going. Too much so, maybe. That was half the... Half the reason the two of you argued? Is that what you started to say? There were times when he should have gotten tough, or at least let me do it. Well, you'll have your chance now. And I'm going to take advantage of it. In one case, at least. Oh, what case is that? The Happy Hollow Roadhouse. That place should have been closed two years ago. But Mr. Parker wouldn't hear of it. And the sheriff wouldn't touch it without Parker's okay. Who runs it? A dirty little... His name's Sammy Drake. A cheap 30-cent crook. Why should the place be closed, Mr. Bates? Because it's a menace to the community. Drake's got everything going out there, wide open. He ought to be run out of town. And before the month's up, he will be. Was Drake a friend of Mr. Parker's? Hmm. Hardly. Is Miss Parker acquainted with him? She knows him, of course. In a town this small, everybody knows everybody else. Doesn't mean anything. I see. You see what? What are you driving at, anyway? The complete detailed story, that's all. Fine. But what bearing does this stuff have on the story? Oh, none, probably. The sheriff tells me Miss Parker is a dead shot with a pistol. Do you know if that's true? Absolutely. She can outshoot me any day of the week, along with most of the other men in the county. That's one of the tragic... One of the ironies of the thing. It was her own father who taught her to shoot. Was she given a paraffin test the night of the accident to determine whether she'd fired a gun? Of course not. In the first place, we're not set up for it. And in the second place, there was no doubt but what she had. The housekeeper heard the shots and ran out in the hall and saw her standing there with a gun in her hand. And she admits she fired him. What more do you want? I guess that ought to satisfy any reasonable person. Well, thanks a lot for your cooperation, Mr. Bates. You're welcome. And I'll frankly admit I don't have the slightest idea what line of thought it is you're trying to follow. It's the same one I've been following ever since I left Hartford. Do you know the Latin phrase, qui bono? Sure. Means who benefits. It was an old principle of Roman law. And it's still a good one. Who benefits here? Well, Luann Parker, of course, to the tune of $100,000. But maybe she's not the only one. There are different ways of benefiting, you know. It still comes back to the same thing. She's the one who mistook her father for Prowler that night. She's the one who pulled the trigger and fired the shots that killed him. Apparently so. But it's possible that somebody might have used her, Mr. Bates. Expense account item five, six dollars even. Flat rate payment to Jake Deagley for a couple of hours' use of his battered old taxi. I stopped at the telephone office and I talked with the supervisor. I talked with the editor of the local paper and with a waitress who'd gone to school with Luann Parker. With a boy in a service station who dated her in high school. And all of their remarks fit the same picture. A sweet, fresh, all-American girl. With an adored father who'd showered her with gifts and attention. And now her own personal tragedy was the town's public one. And they all wept for her. Not a fact out of line. So finally I decided I'd filled in the background enough for the moment, and it was high time I met the little princess face to face. Yes, sir? Good afternoon. I'd like to see Miss Parker, please. I'm sorry, sir, but she ain't here. Oh? She's been staying in with Dr. Praley and his wife. Seems like she just couldn't face this place after what happened here. Are you the housekeeper, Mary Jackson? That's right, sir. Well, I'd like to talk to you, too, Mary, if you don't mind. What about, sir? Just a routine question or two. I'm with the insurance company that carries the policy on Mr. Parker's life. Well, I don't think I ought to go around talking. Well, it's quite all right. Sheriff Peterson and Tom Bates are both cooperating with me, so you can be sure there's nothing wrong about it. Well, if them two say it's all right... They do. Then I reckon it is. Won't you come in, sir? 
In a few minutes' conversation, I learned that Mary Jackson had practically raised the Parker girl and worshipped both her and her father. She showed me the terrace where Dan Parker had bumped into the chair and wakened both his daughter and Mary. The back door where he'd entered the house that night. And then finally the main stairway where the shooting had taken place. When I heard the shots, all I could think was, oh, my poor baby, and I come running out in the hall. Hmm. Your room is the third door there, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, just then Miss Luann turned on the lights, that switch right there beside you, and I saw her standing here at the top of the stairs with a gun in her hand. Then we both looked, saw it was Mr. Parker. We run down there. Miss Luann tore off his tie and pulled his shirt open. But he'd already passed on. Yeah, it must have been a terrible thing for both of you. Yes, sir. It was. Mr. Parker seems to have been a very generous man, especially with his daughter. Oh, he always gave her anything she wanted. Bought her another new car just last month. Yeah, I saw it in the driveway. Well, this is a very attractive house. Must be worth twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Mr. Parker bought it just two years ago. He thought with Miss Lou Ann growing up, she ought to have a better place to live. What's your salary here, Mary? Ninety-five a month, sir. And my keep, of course. I wonder how he did it. Sir? Well, Dan Parker made $5,000 a year as county attorney. There's less than 600 in his bank account. The manager said it's never been much higher. And yet, this house, new cars, those clothes of Miss Parker's that you showed me, a $50,000 life insurance policy. How about that, Mary? I don't know nothing about it, sir. And still, with all this, they were always quarreling. How'd you find that out? Why, Mary? What did they quarrel about? Well, it, it's only been the last six months, and it wasn't her fault. It wasn't like her. It was that Sammy that put those ideas in her head. Sammy Drake, the fellow who owns the Happy Hollow? And she was a restless one with nothing to do, and he took advantage of it. Filled a head full of crazy notions. I know it was him. What crazy notions, Mary? Oh, going off to New York, getting on the stage, or dancing in some nightclub. It's the only thing Mr. Parker ever refused her. But he sure put his foot down on that. He said the only way she'd do it would be over... <laughs> over his dead body. <laughs> oh, sir. Thanks, Mary. You've been a lot of help. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the net tightens. A rat runs for cover. Then the whole thing blows wide open. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Tom Bates. Oh, how are you? Dr. Praley just called me, Mr. Dollar. He says you've been threatening him. Oh, I wouldn't call it a threat, Mr. Bates. I simply told him that if he won't let me question Miss Parker, then I'll have to get a court order to do it anyway. Well, as acting county attorney here, I think I could block that order, Mr. Dollar. Maybe. 
But I doubt if it would be a very smart move. Now, you look here. She's in no shape to answer questions. She's under doctor's care. It's been five days now since the shooting. She's still very upset, nervous. She might say things that could be misconstrued, that she didn't mean. Oh, what things? How would I know? I just thought you might. Since you've already questioned her once, right after she killed her father, wasn't she upset then? Did she say anything you misconstrued? I'm warning you, darling. And I'm warning you. I'm going to talk to that girl one way or another. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the qui bono matter. Qui bono, Latin for who benefits. <laughs> Item 8, $1, transportation out to Sammy Drake's Happy Hollow Roadhouse on the highway north of town. On the way there, I thought over what I'd learned so far, and I realized it wasn't much. On the face of it, the thing was simple enough, no mystery at all. Five nights ago, Dan Parker, the local county attorney, had returned from a business trip and entered his sleeping house. His adopted daughter, Luann, mistaking him for a prowler, had shot him to death in the darkness. There it was, an accident, pure and simple. The coroner said so, the sheriff agreed, and the whole town was determined to keep it that way. But I still couldn't buy it quite that easily. Not when there was a $100,000 life insurance policy payable to Lou Ann Parker, the girl who'd pulled the trigger. Maybe I'd find some answers at the roadhouse. The Happy Hollow was like a thousand other places of its kind. A neon-lighted barn set 50 yards off the road. Inside, a jukebox, a raucous bar, and a scattering of tables around a splintery dance floor. Saturday night's a four-piece band. Probably a game or two going on in the back room, and whatever else the local sports might demand. It was early yet, and the joint hadn't started to jump. What's the word, Mac? Save your money and buy booze. Yeah, man. Out of town, huh? Depends on which town. Any town but this one, man. Here it's for the birds. Oh, I don't know. Looks to me like you got a good setup here. I'm eating. But it ain't easy, man. It's rough. Oh, it'll be rougher, Sammy. With a new county attorney. What's the pitch, Mitch? That's your name, isn't it? Sammy Drake? That's a crime, maybe? Oh, it might be. I don't know yet. You with the feds? No. Syndicate man? No, I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance? You mean protection? <laughs> Not the kind you're talking about, Sammy. I'm here in connection with Dan Parker's death. You mean you're legit? That's right. Well, tie me up and mail me off. I thought you were somebody putting a bite on me. I am. Yeah? Yeah. I got some questions, Sammy. And I want some answers. About that Parker rubber? Right. Well, you're out of luck, Chuck. I don't know nothing from nothing about nothing. See what I mean? I got reason to think different. How so? Somebody been passing the word? Maybe. Two get your five. It was that Bates character. Am I in? I couldn't say. <laughs> sure it was. The new county attorney. He's got a big deal now. And he'd give his left eyeball to put the finger on me. Why so? Why has he got it in for you, Sammy? Because he thinks his doll has been... You mean the Parker girl? I forget. You want to do it the hard way, Sammy? No speaking English. I can get Tom Bates to wish you a warrant, you know. He'd love to have that chance. So you can either talk to me here and now, or you can talk to him and the sheriff in the basement of the courthouse. Rough and tough, huh? If that's what it takes, yes. Come on back to the office. All right. What'd you say your name was, Buzz? I didn't. It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, huh? Yeah, it rhymes with collar. I always like to be wise to who's putting the slug on me. Come on in. Thanks. How about a drink? No, uh, no, no, thanks. Well, I guess I'll have a short one for my health. You hungry? Like a steak? Later, maybe. They're the most. This is a crummy joint, strictly for the sticks. But the food's good. Well... 
Here's a go. Yeah. Maybe you think I'm trying to stall. <laughs> I know you are, Sammy. No, no, not really. Not now, anyway. Because when I stop and think about it, I can't see where I got anything to worry about. You see what I mean? You haven't. Unless you had something to do with Dan Parker's death. Now, now, let's relax, Max. The, word, the way I get the word, nobody had anything to do with it except that doll. Could be. Could be nothing. Did she blast him or didn't she? Apparently she did. <laughs> Thought he was a burglar. <laughs> That's a rich one. And she's halfway right at that. Meaning? Look, Dollar, I'm on a level with you. If you got any idea that I wanted Dan Parker knocked off, you're way out there. You want to know why? I can probably guess. I'll tell you why. He was my fix in this town. Three years I've had this place open, and I've never been touched. So why would I want to put myself out of business? Oh. How much was the payoff? Grand and a half a month. Maybe you figured you could make a better deal with somebody else. Yeah? Who? Not with that stuffed shirt Bates. He's just been itching to get at me. But Parker kept the lid on him. How about the sheriff? Who knows? I'm going to give him a pitch, of course. It's my only chance now to stay in business. But I don't know if he'll play. See what I mean? <laughs> All right, Sammy. Let's go back to the question I asked you outside there. Why does Bates have it in for you? Because he's got the drooling goose for that Parker kid. And he didn't like it much when she kept hanging around me. Well, how'd you feel about it? You want the truth? I didn't like it much either. Why not? She was too wired up and spoiled. Used to get in her own way. Oh, this town's treated her like a queen or something. She figured she could do as she pleased. Well, that don't go in a joint like this. What do you mean? Well, these lads come in here, get a few shots under their belt. Dame like that starts to mean trouble. I didn't want her hanging around. I had a good thing going here, and I wasn't about to get it lost step. But it was no use. I couldn't keep her out. What did her father think about it? He didn't like the idea, but he couldn't do much about it. She got her own way with him, the same as with everybody else. Except when she wanted to go to New York. Well, nobody can win them all. I understand you put that idea in her head, Sammy. Then you better take a different understand. Yeah? Yeah. She was bugged up on that idea before I ever met her. That's why she started coming in here. She wanted me to put her hep on how it was in the big, wild city. She wanted to know how to get in. What was the names of all the spots, including the rough ones? How the rackets worked. <laughs> How would I know how the rackets work? <laughs> I didn't say a word, Sammy. You know some. In some ways, that kid's as smart as a mink. But underneath, she's a regular hick, just like the rest of them around here. She thinks that stuff is glamour, the big time, hot stuff. And she was busting her braces to get at it. Even this place, this, this crummy clip joint. The herd was wicked and exciting. Oh, man, how square can you get? I suppose you're trying to talk her out of going to New York. Do I look crazy or something? I was all for it anywhere. As long as it got her off my neck. Oh, a beautiful girl like Luann Parker on your neck and you were trying to shake her off? Oh, Sammy, I'm losing you. Oh, look, Dollar, when it comes to dames, I've got as fast an eye as the next guy. But with that chick, oh, man, I unpack my toothbrush and I stay home. Why? Why? She's got this whole town fooled. Everybody but me. A sweet little thing in ruffled rompers, bucking for a halo. Well, I got news for you, brother. She ain't. And you're the only one who really knows her. Is that what you're claiming, Sammy? Sure. It's a big laugh. But that kid's smart. And inside, she's colder than a fish. I'm a fairly tough baby, Dollar, but I'll tell you something straight. I'm scared of that girl. Expense account out of nine, $6.90. Steak and incidentals at the Happy Hollow Roadhouse. And Sammy Drake was right. The steak was good. Item 10, $1.75. Transportation out to the Green Pass Railroad Depot, three miles east of town. I tried to see that night station agent earlier in the day, but he was sleeping then. But it was nearly midnight now, and I figured he'd be on duty. He was. Good evening, sir. I... Uh... Hold it, son. Got a message come in here. Yes, sir. Old number eight's going to be right on time. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I want to... Hold it, uh... son. Got to answer it, you know. Mighty important business getting these here trains through. Yes, I imagine it is. I... Hold it! Yes, sir. Right on time. Be here in about two minutes now. Well, son, what's on your mind? I wondered if you were on duty the night Dan Parker got back in from Richmond. The night he was killed. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, you must be that fellow Sheriff Jim Peterson was telling me about. That fellow from the insurance company. Yes, that's right. Well, then I guess it's all right to talk to you. At least, why, that's what Jim said. Nice of him. 
It's a mighty terrible thing. A downright tragedy for that poor motherless girl making a mistake like that, shooting her own father. Yeah, a rough deal. Did you notice Mr. Parker when he got off the train that night? Well, of course I did. I always notice anybody getting off. It's part of my job, son. Yeah, well, I, uh... It was right about this same time of night. He come in on number eight at the same one it's doing now. Did you talk with him? Of course I talked with him. I know Dan Parker since we both pups. <laughs> he, said, he said, hi, Willie. And I said, fine. And he said, how's the family? And I said, fine. And he said, well, you know, we, we talked. We had to talk more, too, but there, there's some fellow with him. Oh, well, I didn't I, know that. I reckon it was just some passenger he struck up the time of day with. Dan was all... There. You hear that, son? She's uh, coming across the Briar Creek Bridge right now, right on time. Well, uh, look, what happened to this stranger? Did he and Dan Parker leave the station together? Oh, no. No, they just talked while the engine was taking on water. The fella got back on the train before it pulled out. He's just going through. Did you hear what they were talking about? No, can't say that it did, son. Most likely didn't amount to nothing, though. No, I suppose not. By golly, I did hear one thing. Oh, uh, what? Just when the train was starting up, the fella leaned out and yelled, Thanks a lot, I'll be seeing you. Dan just grinned, waved back, and went on down the platform to the telephone booth. You uh, don't know what he meant by that remark. Oh, nothing, more than likely. Just one of them things you say, you know. But that's life for you, because he won't be seeing him after all. See, she's coming around the bend there, son. I've got to get the mail sack out. You got any more questions, you're going to have to ask him on a run. The mail's got to get through. Oh, I wouldn't think of stopping it. Hey, look, uh, you said Dan Parker made a call from that telephone booth over there. You know who he talked to? Nobody, son. What do you mean? Well, he come back and said get a busy signal. I guess he'd have to walk home. And that's what he done. That was his mistake. That was one of them anyway. Well, you got any more questions? I reckon they'll have to wait. I haven't got any more. How's that, son? I said thanks a lot. Uh, what were? Well, there you got me. I don't know. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a tense interview, a subtle attack by a shrewd and dangerous opponent, and complete surrender. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.